The Introduction of the Prairie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Peck. The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. Introduction. The geological formation of that portion of the American Union which lies between the Alleghanies and the Rocky Mountains has given rise to many ingenious theories. Virtually the whole of this immense region is a plain. For a distance extending nearly 1,500 miles east and west and 600 north and south, there is scarcely an elevation worthy to be called a mountain. Even hills are not common though a good deal of the face of the country has more or less of that rolling character which is described in the opening pages of this work. There is much reason to believe that the territory which now composes Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and a large portion of the country west of the Mississippi lay formerly under water. The soil of all the former states has the appearance of an alluvial deposit, and isolated rocks have been found of a nature and in situations which render it difficult to refute the opinion that they have been transferred to their present beds by floating ice. This theory assumes that the Great Lakes were the deep pools of one immense body of fresh water, which lay too low to be drained by the eruption that lay bare the land. It will be remembered that the French, when masters of the Canadas and Louisiana, claimed the whole of the territory in question. Their hunters and advanced troops held the first communications with the savage occupants, and the earliest written accounts we possess of these vast regions are from the pens of their missionaries. Many French words have, consequently, become of local use in this quarter of America, and not a few names given in that language have been perpetuated. When the adventurers, who first penetrated these wilds, met in the center of the forest, immense plains, covered with rich verdure or rank grasses, they naturally gave them the appellation of meadows. As the English succeeded the French and found a peculiarity of nature, differing from all they had yet seen on the continent, already distinguished by a word that did not express anything in their own language, they left these natural meadows in possession of their title of convention. In this manner has the word prairie been adopted unto the English tongue. The American prairies are of two kinds. Those which lie east of the Mississippi are comparatively small, are exceedingly fertile, and are always surrounded by forest. They are susceptible of high cultivation, and are fast becoming settled. They abound in Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, and Indiana. They labor under the disadvantages of a scarcity of wood and water, evils of a serious character, until art had come to supply the deficiencies of nature. As coal is said to abound in all that region, and wells are generally successful, the enterprise of the immigrants is gradually prevailing against these difficulties. The second description of these natural meadows lies west of the Mississippi, at a distance of a few hundred miles from that river, and is called the Great Prairies. They resemble the steppes of Tartary, more than any other known portion of Christendom being in fact a vast country incapable of sustaining a dense population in the absence of the two great necessaries already named. Rivers abound, it is true, but this region is nearly destitute of brooks and the smaller watercourses which tend so much to comfort and fertility. The origin and date of the great American prairies form one of nature's most majestic mysteries. The general character of the United States, of the Canadas, and of Mexico is that of luxuriant fertility. It would be difficult to find another portion of the world of the same extent which has so little useless land as the inhabited parts of the American Union. Most of the mountains are arable, and even the prairies in this section of the Republic are of deep alluvian. The same is true between the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific. Between the two lies the broad belt of comparative desert, which is the scene of this tale appearing to interpose a barrier to the progress of the American people westward. The great prairies appear to be the final gathering place of the red men. The remnants of the Mohicans and the Delawares of the Creeks, Choctaws, and Cherokees are destined to fulfill their time on these vast plains. 
The entire number of the Indians within the Union is differently computed at between one and three hundred thousand souls. Most of them inhabit the country west of the Mississippi. At the period of the tale, they dwelt in open hostility, national feuds passing from generation to generation. The power of the Republic has done much to restore peace to these wild scenes, and it is now possible to travel in security where a civilized man did not dare to pass unprotected five and twenty years ago. The reader, who has perused the two former works, of which this is the natural successor, will recognize an old acquaintance in the principal character of the story. We have here brought him to his end, and we trust he will be permitted to slumber in the peace of the just. J. F. Cooper, Paris, June 1832 End of Introduction Chapter One of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. I pray thee, Shepherd, if that love or gold can in this desert place by entertainment bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed as you like it. Much was said and written at the time concerning the policy of adding the vast regions of Louisiana to the already immense and but half-tenanted territories of the United States. As the warmth of the controversy, however, subsided, and party considerations gave place to more liberal views, the wisdom of the measure began to be generally conceded. It soon became apparent to the meanest capacity that while nature had placed a barrier of desert to the extension of our population in the west, the measure had made us the masters of a belt of fertile country, which, in the revolutions of the day, might have become the property of a rival nation. It gave us the sole command of the great thoroughfare of the interior, and placed the countless tribes of savages who lay along our borders entirely within our control. It reconciled conflicting rights and quieted national distrust. It opened a thousand avenues to the inland trade and to the waters of the Pacific. And if ever time or necessity shall require a peaceful division of this vast empire, it assures us of a neighbor that will possess our language, our religion, our institutions, and, it is also to be hoped, our sense of political justice. Although the purchase was made in 1803, the spring of the succeeding year was permitted to open before the official prudence of the Spaniard, who held the province for his European master, admitted the authority or even of the entrance of its new proprietors. But the forms of the transfer were no sooner completed, and the new government acknowledged, than swarms of that restless people, which is ever found hovering on the skirts of American society, plunged into the thickets that fringed the right bank of the Mississippi with the same careless hardihood as had already sustained so many of them in their toils and progress from the Atlantic states to the eastern shores of the father of the rivers. The Mississippi is thus termed in several of the Indian languages. The reader will gain a more just idea of the importance of this stream if he recalls to mind the fact that the Missouri and the Mississippi are properly the same river. Their united lengths cannot be greatly short of four thousand miles. Time was necessary to blend the numerous and affluent colonists of the lower province with their new compatriots, but the thinner and more humble population above was almost immediately swallowed in the vortex which attended the tide of instant immigration. The inroad from the east was a new and sudden outbreaking of a people who had endured a momentary restraint after having been rendered nearly resistless by success. The toils and hazards of former undertakings were forgotten, as these endless and unexplored regions, with all their fancied as well as real advantages, were laid open to their enterprise. The consequences were such as might easily have been anticipated from so tempting an offering, placed as it was before the eyes of a race long trained in adventure and nurtured in difficulties. Thousands of elders of what were then called the new states, footnote, all the states admitted to the American Union since the Revolution, are called new states, with the exception of Vermont, that had claims before the war, which were not, however, admitted until a later day. Back to the text. 
broke up from the enjoyment of their hard-earned indulgences, and were to be seen leading long lines of descendants, born and reared in the forests of Ohio and Kentucky, deeper into the land in quest of that which might be termed, without the aid of poetry, their natural and more congenial atmosphere. The distinguished and resolute forester, who first penetrated the wilds of the latter state, was of the number. This adventurous and venerable patriarch was now seen making his last remove, placing the endless river between him and the multitude his own success had drawn around him, and seeking for the renewal of enjoyments which were rendered worthless in his eyes, when trammelled by the forms of human institutions. Footnote. Colonel Boone, the patriarch of Kentucky, this venerable and hardy pioneer of civilization, immigrated to an estate three hundred miles west of the Mississippi, in his ninety-second year, because he found a population of ten to the square mile inconveniently crowded. In the pursuit of adventures such as these, men are ordinarily governed by their habits or deluded by their wishes. A few, led by the phantoms of hope, and ambitious of sudden affluence, sought the mines of the virgin territory, but by far the greater portion of the immigrants were satisfied to establish themselves along the margins of the larger watercourses, content with the rich returns that the generous alluvial bottoms of the rivers never failed to bestow on the most desultory industry. In this manner were communities formed with magical rapidity, and most of those who witnessed the purchase of the empty empire have lived to see already a populous and sovereign state, parceled from its inhabitants and received into the bosom of the National Union on terms of political equality. The incidents and scenes which are connected with this legend occurred in the earliest periods of the enterprises which have led to so great and so speedy a result. The harvest of the first year of our possession had long been passed, and the fading foliage of a few scattered trees was already beginning to exhibit the hues and tents of autumn, when a train of wagons issued from the bed of a dry rivulet to pursue its course across the undulating surface of what in the language of the country of which we write is called a rolling prairie. The vehicles, loaded with household goods and implements of husbandry, the few straggling sheep and cattle, were herded in the rear in the rugged appearance and careless mien of the sturdy men who loitered at the sides of the lingering teams, united to announce a band of immigrants seeking for the El Dorado of the West. Contrary to the usual practice of the men of their caste, this party had left the fertile bottoms of the low country, and had found its way, by means only known to such adventurers, across glen and torrent, over deep morasses and arid waste, to a point far beyond the usual limits of civilized habitations. In their front were stretched those broad plains which extend, with so little diversity of character, to the bases of the Rocky Mountains, and many long and dreary miles in their rear foam the swift and turbid waters of La Platte. The appearance of such a train in that bleak and solitary place was rendered the more remarkable by the fact that the surrounding country offered so little that was tempting to the cupidity of speculation, and, if possible, still less that was flattering to the hopes of an ordinary settler of new lands. The meager herbage of the prairie promised nothing, in favor of a hard and unyielding soil over which the wheels of the vehicles rattled as lightly as if they traveled on a beaten road, neither wagons nor beasts making any deeper impression than to mark that bruised and withered grass which the cattle plucked from time to time, and as often rejected as food too sour, for even hunger to render palatable. Whatever might be the final destination of these adventures, or the secret causes of their apparent security, in so remote and unprotected a situation, there was no visible sign of uneasiness, uncertainty, or alarm among them. Including both sexes and every age, the number of the party exceeded twenty. At some little distance in front of the hole, marched the individual who, by his position and air, appeared to be the leader of the band. He was a tall, sunburnt man, past the middle age, of a dull countenance and listless manner. His frame appeared loose and flexible, but it was vast, and in reality of prodigious power. It was only at moments, however, as some slight impediment opposed itself to his loitering progress, 
that his person, which, in its ordinary gait, seemed so lounging and nerveless, displayed any of those energies which lay latent in his system, like the slumbering and unwieldy but terrible strength of the elephant. The inferior lineaments of his countenance were coarse, extended, and vacant, while the superior, or those nobler parts which are thought to affect the intellectual being, were low, receding, and mean. The dress of this individual was a mixture of the coarsest vestments of a husbandman with the leathern garments that fashion, as well as use, had in some degree rendered necessary to one engaged in his present pursuits. There was, however, a singular and wild display of prodigal and ill-judged ornaments, blended with his motley attire. In place of the usual deerskin belt, he wore around his body a tarnished silken sash of the most gaudy colors. The buckhorn haft of his knife was profusely decorated with plates of silver. The marten's fur of his cap was of fineness and shadowing that a queen might covet. The buttons of his rude and soiled blanket coat were of the glittering coinage of Mexico. The stock of his rifle was of beautiful mahogany, riveted and banded with the same precious metal, and the trinkets of no less than three worthless watches dangled from different parts of his person. In addition to the pack and the rifle which were slung at his back, together with the well-filled and carefully guarded pouch and horn, he had carelessly cast a keen and bright wood axe across his shoulder, sustaining the weight of the whole with as much apparent ease as if he moved unfettered in limb and free from encumbrance. A short distance in the rear of this man came a group of youths very similarly attired and bearing sufficient resemblance to each other and to their leader to distinguish them as the children of one family. Though the youngest of their number could not much have passed the period that, in the nicer judgment of the law, is called the age of discretion, he had proved himself so far worthy of his progenitors as to have reared already his aspiring person to the standard height of his race. There was one or two others of different mould, whose descriptions must, however, be referred to the regular course of the narrative. Of the females there were but two who had arrived at womanhood, though several white-headed, olive-skinned faces were peering out of the foremost wagon of the train, with eyes of lively curiosity and characteristic animation. The elder of the two adults was the sallow and wrinkled mother of most of the party, and the younger was a sprightly, active girl of eighteen, who in figure, dress, and mien, seemed to belong to a station in society several gradations above that of any one of her visible associates. The second vehicle was covered with a top of cloth so tightly drawn as to conceal its contents with the nicest care. The remaining wagons were loaded with such rude furniture and other personal effects as might be supposed to belong to one ready at any moment to change his abode, without reference to season or distance. Perhaps there was little in this train, or in the appearance of its proprietors, that is not daily to be encountered on the highways of this changeable and moving country, but the solitary and peculiar scenery in which it was so unexpectedly exhibited gave to the party a marked character of wildness and adventure. In the little valleys, which in the regular formation of the land occurred at every mile of their progress, the view was bounded on two sides by the gradual and low elevations which gave name to the description of prairie we have mentioned, while on the others the meager prospect ran off in long, narrow, barren perspectives, but slightly relieved by a pitiful show of course, though somewhat luxuriant vegetation. From the summits of the swells the eye became fatigued with the sameness and chilling dreariness of the landscape. The earth was not unlike the ocean, when its restless waters are heaving heavily after the agitation and fury of the tempest had begun to lessen. There was the same waving and regular surface, the same absence of foreign objects, and the same boundless extent to the view. Indeed, so very striking was the resemblance between the water and the land, that, however, much the geologist must sneer at so simple a theory, it would have been difficult for a poet not to have felt that the formation of the one had been produced by the subsiding dominion of the other. Here and there a tall tree rose out of the bottoms, stretching its naked branches abroad, like some solitary vessel. And, to strengthen a delusion, far in the distance appeared two or three rounded thickets, looming in the misty horizon like islands resting on the waters. 
It is unnecessary to warn the practice reader that the sameness of the surface and the low stands of the spectators exaggerated the distances, but, as swell appeared after swell, and island succeeded island, there was a disheartening assurance that long and seemingly interminable tracts of territory must be passed before the wishes of the humblest agriculturists could be realized. Still, the leader of the immigrants steadily pursued his way, with no other guide than the sun, turning his back resolutely on the abodes of civilization, and plunging, at each step, more deeply, if not irretrievably, into the haunts of the barbarous and savage occupants of the country. As the day drew nigher to a close, however, his mind, which was perhaps incapable of maturing any connected system of forethought beyond that which related to the interests of the present moment, became, in some slight degree, troubled with the care of providing for the wants of the hours of darkness. On reaching the crest of a swell that was a little higher than the usual elevations, he lingered a minute, and cast a half-curious eye on either hand in quest of those well-known signs which might indicate a place where the three grand requisites of water, fuel, and fodder were to be obtained in conjunction. It would seem that his search was fruitless, for after a few moments of indolent and listless examination he suffered his huge frame to descend the gentle declivity in the same sluggish manner that an over-fatted beast would have yielded to the downward pressure. His example was silently followed by those who succeeded him, though not until the young men had manifested much more of interest, if not of concern, in the brief inquiry which each, in his turn, made on gaining the same lookout. It was now evident, by the tardy movements both of beast and men, that the time of necessary rest was not far distant. The matted grass of the lower land presented obstacles which fatigue began to render formidable and the whip was becoming necessary to urge the lingering teams to their labor. At this moment, when, with the exception of the principal individual, a general lassitude was getting the mastery of the travelers, and every eye was cast, by a sort of common impulse, wistfully forward, the whole party was brought to a halt by a spectacle as sudden as it was unexpected. The sun had fallen below the crest of the nearest wave of the prairie, leaving the usual rich and glowing train on its track. In the center of this flood of fiery light a human form appeared, drawn against a gilded background as distinctly and seemingly as palpable as though it would come from within the grasp of any extended hand. The figure was colossal, the attitude musing and melancholy, and the situation directly in the route of the travelers. But embedded, as it was, in its setting of garish light, it was impossible to distinguish its just proportions or true character. The effect of such a spectacle was instantaneous and powerful. The man in front of the immigrants came to a stand, and remained gazing at the mysterious object with a dull interest that soon quickened into superstitious awe. His sons, so soon as the first emotions of surprise had a little abated, drew slowly around him, and, as they who governed the teams gradually followed their example, the whole party was soon condensed in one silent and wondering group. Notwithstanding the impression of a supernatural agency, was very general among the travelers, the ticking of gun locks was heard, and one or two of the bolder youths cast their rifles forward in readiness for service. "'Send the boys off to the right!' exclaimed the resolute wife and mother, in a sharp dissonant voice. "'I warrant me, Asa or Abner will give some account of the creature.' "'It may be well enough to try the rifle,' muttered a dull-looking man, whose features, both in outline and expression, bore no small resemblance to the first speaker, and who loosened the stock of his piece, and brought it dexterously to the front, while delivering this opinion. "'The Pawnee Loops are said to be hunting by hundreds in the plains. If so, they'll never miss a single man from their tribe.' "'Stay!' exclaimed a soft tone, but alarmed female voice which was easily to be traced to the trembling lips of the younger of the two women. "'We are not all together. It may be a friend.' "'Who is scouting now?' demanded the father, scanning at the same time the cluster of his stout sons, with a displeased and sullen eye. "'Put by the piece! Put by the piece!' he continued, diverting the other's aim with the finger of a giant, and with the air of one it might be dangerous to deny. "'My job is not yet ended. Let us finish!' the little that remains in peace. 
The man, who had manifested so hostile an attention, appeared to understand the other's illusion, and suffered himself to be diverted from his object. The sons turned their inquiring looks on the girl, who had so eagerly spoken to require an explanation, but, as if content with the respite she had obtained for the stranger, she sunk back in her seat, and chose to affect a maidenly silence. In the meantime, the hues of the heavens had often changed. In place of the brightness which had dazzled the eye, a gray and more sober light had succeeded, and as the setting lost its brilliancy, the proportions of the fanciful form became less exaggerated and finally distinct. Ashamed to hesitate, now that the truth was no longer doubtful, the leader of the party resumed his journey, using the precaution, as he ascended the slight acclivity, to release his own rifle from the strap, and to cast it into a situation more convenient for sudden use. There was little apparent necessity, however, for such watchfulness, from the moment when it had thus unaccountably appeared, as it were, between the heavens and the earth, the stranger's figure had neither moved nor given the smallest evidence of hostility. Had he harbored any such evil intention, the individual who now came plainly into view seemed but little qualified to execute them. A frame had endured the hardships of more than eighty seasons, was not qualified to awaken apprehension in the breasts of one so powerful as the emigrant. Notwithstanding his years and his look of emaciation, if not of suffering, there was that about this solitary being, however, which said that time and not disease had laid his hand heavily on him. His form had withered, but it was not wasted. The sinews and muscles, which had once denoted great strength, though shrunken, were still visible, and his whole figure had attained an appearance of induration, which, if it were not for the well-known frailty of humanity, would have seemed to bid defiance to the further approaches of decay. His dress was chiefly of skins, worn with the hair to the weather, a pouch and horn were suspended from his shoulders, and he leaned on a rifle of uncommon length, but which, like its owner, exhibited the wear of long and hard service. As the party drew nigher to this solitary being, and came within a distance to be heard, a low growl issued from the grass at his feet, and then a tall, gaunt, toothless hound arose lazily from his lyre, and shaking himself, made some show of resisting the nearer approach of the travellers. "'Down, actor, down,' said his master in a voice that was a little tremulous and hollow with age. "'What have ye to do, pup, with men who journey on their lawful callings?' "'Stranger, if you are much acquainted in this country,' said the leader of the immigrants, "'can you tell a traveller where he may find necessities for the night?' "'Is the land filled on the other side of the big river?' demanded the old man solemnly, and without appearing to hearken to the other's question, or why do I see a sight I had never thought to behold again? Why, there is no country left, it is true, for such as have money, and are not particular in the choice, returned the immigrant. But to my taste, it is getting crowdy. What may a man call this distance, from this place to the nighest point on the main river? A hundred deer could not cool his sides in the Mississippi without travelling a weary five hundred miles. And what may you name the district, hereaway? By what name, returned the old man, pointing significantly upward, would you call the spot where you see yonder cloud? The immigrant looked at the other, like one who did not comprehend his meaning, and who half suspected he was trifled with, but he contented himself by saying, you are but a new inhabitant like myself, I reckon, stranger. Otherwise you would not be backward in helping a traveller to some advice. Words cost but little, and sometimes lead to friendships. Advice is not a gift, but a debt that the old owe to the young. What would you wish to know? Where I may camp for the night. I'm no great difficulty maker, as to bed and board, but all journeyers, like myself, know the virtue of sweet water and a good browse for the cattle. Come then with me, and you shall be master of both, and little more is it that I can offer on this hungry prairie. As the old man was speaking, he raised his heavy rifle to his shoulder with a facility a little more remarkable for his years and appearance, and without further words led the way over the acclivity to the adjacent bottom. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. 
Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 2 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Up with my tent! Here will I lie tonight, but where tomorrow? Well, all's one for that. Richard the Third. The travelers soon discovered the usual and unerring evidences that the several articles necessary to their situation were not far distant. A clear and gurgling spring burst out of the side of the declivity, and joining its waters to those of other similar little fountains in its vicinity, their united contributions formed a run which was easily to be traced for miles along the prairie by the scattering foliage and verdure which occasionally grew within the influence of its moisture. Hither, then, the stranger held his way, eagerly followed by the willing teams, whose instinct gave them a prescience of refreshment and rest. On reaching what he deemed a suitable spot, the old man halted, and with an inquiring look he seemed to demand if it possessed the needed conveniences. The leader of the emigrants cast his eyes understandingly about him, and examined the place with the keenness of one competent to judge of so nice a question, though in that dilatory and heavy manner which rarely permitted him to betray precipitation. "'Ay, this may do,' he said, satisfied with his scrutiny. "'Boys, you have seen the last of the sun. Be stirring.' The young men manifested a characteristic obedience. The order, for such in tone and manner it was, in truth was received with respect. But the utmost movement was the falling of an axe or two from the shoulder to the ground, while their owners continued to regard the place with listless and incurious eyes. In the meantime, the elder traveller, as if familiar with the nature of the impulses by which his children were governed, disencumbered himself of his pack and rifle, and assisted by the man already mentioned as disposed to appeal so promptly to the rifle, he quietly proceeded to release the cattle from the gears. At length the eldest of the sons stepped heavily forward, and, without any apparent effort, he buried his axe to the eye, in the soft body of a cottonwood tree. He stood a moment, regarding the effect of the blow, with that sort of contempt with which a giant might be supposed to contemplate the puny resistance of a dwarf, and then flourishing the implement above his head, with the grace and dexterity with which the master of the art of offense would wield his nobler, though less useful weapon, he quickly severed the trunk of the tree, bringing its tall top crashing to the earth in submission to his prowess. His companions regarded the operation with indolent curiosity, until they saw the prostrate trunk stretched on the ground, when, as if a signal for a general attack had been given, they advanced in a body to the work, and in a space of time, and with a neatness of execution that would have astonished an ignorant spectator, they stripped the small but suitable spot of its burden of forest, as effectually and almost as promptly as if a whirlwind had passed along the place. The stranger had been a silent but attentive observer of their progress. As tree after tree came whistling down, he cast his eyes upwards at the vacancies they left in the heavens, with a melancholy gaze, and finally turned away, muttering to himself with a bitter smile, like one who disdained giving a more audible utterance to his discontent. Pressing through the group of active and busy children, who had already lighted a cheerful fire, the attention of the old man became next fixed on the movements of the leader of the emigrants and of his savage-looking assistant. These two had already liberated the cattle, which were eagerly browsing the grateful and nutritious extremities of the fallen trees, and were now employed about the wagon, which has been described as having its contents concealed with so much apparent care notwithstanding this particular conveyance appeared to be as silent and as tenantless as the rest of the vehicles the men applied their strength to its wheels and rolled it apart from the others to a dry and elevated spot near the edge of the thicket here they brought certain poles which had seemingly been long employed in such a service and fastening their larger ends firmly in the ground the smaller were attached to the hoops that supported the covering of the wagon Large folds of cloth were next drawn out of the vehicle, and after being spread around the hole, were pegged to the earth in such a manner as to form a tolerably capacious and exceedingly convenient tent. After surveying their work with inquisitive and perhaps jealous eyes, arranging a fold here and driving a peg more firmly there, 
the men once more applied their strength to the wagon, pulling it by its projecting tongue from the center of the canopy until it appeared in the open air, deprived of its covering and destitute of any other freight than a few light articles of furniture. The latter were immediately removed by the traveler into the tent with his own hands, as though to enter it with a privilege to which even his bosom companion was not entitled. Curiosity is a passion that is rather quickened than destroyed by seclusion, and the old inhabitant of the prairies did not view these precautionary and mysterious movements without experiencing some of its impulses. He approached the tent, and was about to sever two of its folds with the very obvious intention of examining more closely into the nature of its contents, when the man who had once already placed his life in jeopardy seized him by the arm, and with a rude exercise of his strength threw him from the spot he had selected as the one most convenient for his object. "'It's an honest regulation, friend,' the fellow dryly observed, though with an eye that threatened the volumes. "'And sometimes it is a safe one, which says, mind your own business.' "'Men seldom bring anything to be concealed into these deserts,' returned the old man, as if willing, and yet a little ignorant, how to apologize for the liberty he had been about to take. "'And I had hoped no offense in examining your comforts.' "'They seldom bring themselves, I reckon, though this has the look of an old country. To my eye it seems not to be overly peopled. The land is as aged as the rest of the works of the Lord. I believe, but you say true, concerning its inhabitants. Many months have passed since I have laid eyes on a face of my own color, before your own. I say again, friend, I meant no harm. I did not know, but there was something behind the cloth that might bring former days to mine.' As the stranger ended his simple explanation, he walked meekly away like one who felt the deepest sense of the right which every man has to the quiet enjoyment of his own, without any troublesome interference on the part of his neighbor, a wholesome and just principle that he had also most probably imbibed from the habits of his secluded life. As he passed towards the little encampment of the immigrants, for such the place had now become, he heard the voice of the leader calling aloud, in its hoarse tones, the name of Ellen Wade. The girl, who has been already introduced to the reader, and who was occupied with the others of her sex around the fires, sprang willingly forward at this summons, and passing the stranger with the activity of a young antelope, she was instantly lost behind the forbidden folds of the tent. Neither her sudden disappearance, nor any of the arrangements we have mentioned, seem, however, to excite the smallest surprise among the remainder of the party. The young men, who had already completed their task with the axe, were all engaged after their lounging and listless manner, some in bestowing equitable portions of the fodder among the different animals, others implying the heavy pestle of a movable hominy mortar. Footnote. Hominy is a dish composed chiefly of cracked corn or mace, and one or two in wheeling the remainder of the wagons aside, and arranging them in such a manner as to form a sort of outwork for their otherwise defenseless bivouac. These several duties were soon performed, and as darkness now began to conceal the objects on the surrounding prairie, the shrill-toned termagant, whose voice since the halt has been diligently exercised among her idle and drowsy offspring, announced, in tones that might have been heard at a dangerous distance, that the evening meal waited only for the approach of those who were to consume it. Whatever may be the other qualities of a border man, he is seldom deficient in the virtue of hospitality. The immigrant no sooner heard the sharp call of his wife than he cast his eyes about him in quest of the stranger, in order to offer him the place of distinction in the rude entertainment to which they were so unceremoniously summoned. "'I thank you, friend,' the old man replied to the rough invitation to take a seat nigh the smoking kettle. "'You have my hearty thanks, but I have eaten for the day, and am not one of them who dig their graves with their teeth. Well, as you wish it, I will take a place for it as long sin I have seen people of my color eating their daily bread.' "'You are an old settler in these districts, then?' the immigrant rather remarked than inquired, with a mouth filled nearly to overflowing with the delicious hominy prepared by his skillful, though repulsive, spouse. "'They told us below we should find settlers something thinnish here away, and I must say the report was mainly true, for unless we count the Canada traders on the big river, you are the first white face I have met in a good five hundred miles, 
that is calculating according to your own reckoning. Though I have spent some years in this quarter, I can hardly be called a settler, seeing that I have no regular abode, and seldom pass more than a month at a time on the same range. A hunter, I reckon, the other continued, glancing his eyes aside as if to examine the equipments of his new acquaintance. Your fixin' seem none of the best for such a calling. They are old, and nearly ready to be laid aside, like their master, said the old man, regarding his rifle with a look in which affection and regret were singularly blended. And I may say they are but little needed, too. You are a mistaken friend in calling me a hunter. I am nothing better than a trapper. Footnote. It is scarcely necessary to say that this American word means one who takes his game in a trap. It is of general use on the frontiers. The beaver, an animal too sagacious to be easily killed, is oftener taken in this way than in any other. If you are much of the one, I'm bold to say you are something of the other, for the two callings go mainly together in these districts. To the shame of the man who is able to follow the first, be it so said, returned the trapper, whom in future we shall choose to designate by his pursuit. For more than fifty years did I carry my rifle in the wilderness, without so much as setting a snare for even a bird that flies the heavens, much less a beast that has nothing but legs for its gifts. "'I see but little difference whether a man gets his peltry by the rifle or by the trap,' said the ill-looking companion of the immigrant in his rough manner. "'The earth has made for our comfort, and for that matter, so are its creatures.' "'You seem to have but little plunder, stranger.' Footnote, the cant word for luggage in the western states of America is plunder. The term might easily mislead one as to the character of the people, who, notwithstanding their pleasant use of so expressive a word, are, like the inhabitants of all new settlements, hospitable and honest. Knavery of the description conveyed by plunder is chiefly found in regions more civilized. For one who is far abroad bluntly interrupted the immigrant, as if he had a reason for wishing to change the conversation. I hope you are better off for skins. I make but little use of either, the trapper quietly replied. At my time of life, food and clothing be all that is needed, and I have little occasion for what you call plunder, unless it may be now and then to barter for a horn of powder or a bar of lead. You are not, then, of these parts by nature, friend? the immigrant continued, having in his mind the exception, which the other had taken to the very equivocal word which he himself, according to the custom of the country, had used for baggage or effects. I was born on the seashore, though most of my life has been passed in the woods. The whole party now looked up at him, as men are apt to turn their eyes on some unexpected object of general interest. One or two of the young men repeated the words, seashore, and the woman tendered him one of those civilities, with which, uncouth as they were, she was little accustomed to grace her hospitality, as if in deference to the travel dignity of her guest. After a long and seemingly a meditating silence, the immigrant, who had, however, seen no apparent necessity to suspend the functions of his masticating powers, resumed the discourse. "'It is a long road, as I have heard, from the waters of the west to the shores of the main sea.' It is a weary path indeed, friend, and much have I seen, and something I have suffered, in journeying over it. A man would see a good deal of hard travel in going its length. Seventy and five years have I been upon the road, and there are not half the number of leagues in the whole distance, after you leave the Hudson, on which I have not tasted venison of my own killing. But this is vain boasting. Of what use are former deeds, when time draws to an end? "'I once met a man that had boated on the river he names,' observed the eldest son, speaking in a low tone of voice, like one who distrusted his knowledge, and deemed it prudent to assume a becoming diffidence in the presence of a man who had seen so much. "'From his tell, it must be considerable stream, and deep enough for a keel-boat from top to bottom.' "'It is a wide and deep water course, and many sightly towns are growing on its banks.' returned the trapper, and yet it is but a brook to the waters of the endless river. "'I call nothing a stream that a man can travel round,' exclaimed the ill-looking associate of the immigrant. 
A real river must be crossed, not headed, like a bear in a country hunt. Footnote. There is a practice in the new countries to assemble the men of a large district, sometimes of an entire county, to exterminate the beast of prey. They form themselves into a circle of several miles in extent, and gradually draw nearer, killing all before them. The allusion is to this custom, in which the hunted beast is turned from one to another. "'Have you been far towards the sundown, friend?' interrupted the immigrant, as if he desired to keep his rough companion as much as possible out of the discourse. "'I find it is a wide tract of clearing, this into which I have fallen.' "'You may travel weeks, and you will see it the same. I often think the Lord has placed this barren belt of prairie behind the states, to warn men to what their folly may yet bring the land. I, weeks, if not months, may you journey in these open fields in which there is neither dwelling nor habitation for man or beast. Even the savage animals travel miles on miles to seek their dens, and yet the wind seldom blows from the east. But I conceit the sounds of axes, and the crash of falling trees are in my ears." As the old man spoke, with the seriousness and dignity that age seldom fails to communicate, even to the less striking sentiments, his auditors were deeply attentive, and as silent as the grave. Indeed, the trapper was left to renew the dialogue himself, which he soon did by asking a question, in the indirect manner so much in use by the border inhabitants. "'You find it no easy matter to ford the water courses?' and to make your way so deep into the prairies, friend, with the teams of horses and herds of horned beasts? I kept the left bank of the main river, the immigrant replied, until I found the stream leading too much to the north, when we rafted ourselves across without any great suffering. The women lost a fleece or two from the next year's shearing, and the girls have one cow less to their dairy. Since then we have done bravely by bridging a creek every day or two. It is likely you will continue west until you come to land more suitable for a settlement. Until I see reason to stop, or to turn it again, the immigrant bluntly answered, rising at the same time, and cutting short the dialogue by the suddenness of the movement. His example was followed by the trapper, as well as the rest of the party, and then, without much deference to the presence of their guest, the travelers proceeded to make their dispositions to pass the night. Several little bowers, or rather huts, had already been formed of the tops of trees, blankets of coarse country manufacture, and the skins of buffaloes, united without much reference to any other object than temporary comfort. Into these covers the children, with their mother, soon drew themselves, and where it is more than possible, they were all speedily lost in the oblivion of sleep. Before the men, however, could seek their rest, they had sundry little duties to perform, such as completing their works of defense, carefully concealing the fires, replenishing the fodder of their cattle, and setting the watch that was to protect the party in the approaching hours of night. The former was effected by dragging the trunks of a few trees into the intervals left by the wagons, and along the open space between the vehicles and the thicket on which, in military language, the encampment would be said to have rested, thus forming a sort of chevaux de frise on three sides of the position. Within these narrow limits, with the exception of what the tent contained, both man and beast were now collected, the latter being far too happy in resting their weary limbs, to give any undue annoyance to their scarcely more intelligent associates. Two of the young men took their rifles, and the first, renewing the priming and examining the flints with the utmost care, they proceeded, the one to the extreme right and the other to the left of the encampment, where they posted themselves within the shadows of the thicket, but in such positions as enabled each to overlook the portion of the prairie. The trapper loitered about the place, declining to share the straw of the emigrant, until the whole arrangement was completed, and then, without the ceremony of an adieu, he slowly retired from the spot. It was now on the first watch of the night, and the pale, quivering, and deceptive light from a new moon was playing over the endless waves of the prairie tipping the swells with gleams of brightness, and leaving the interval land in deep shadow. Accustomed to scenes of solitude like the present, the old man, as he left the encampment, proceeded alone into the waste, like a bold vessel leaving its haven to enter on the trackless field of the ocean. He appeared to move for some time without object, or indeed without any apparent consciousness, whether his limbs were carrying him. At length, on reaching the rise of one of the undulations, he came to a stand, 
and for the first time since leaving the band, who had caused such a flood of reflections and recollections to crowd upon his mind, the old man became aware of his present situation. Throwing one end of his rifle to the earth, he stood leaning on the other, again lost in deep contemplation for several minutes, during which time his hound came and crouched at his feet. A deep, menacing growl from the faithful animal first aroused him from his musing. "'What now, dog?' he said, looking down at his companion, as if he addressed a being of an intelligence equal to his own, and speaking in a voice of great affection. "'What is it, pup? Huh? Hector, what is it, nosy now? "'It won't do, dog. It won't do. The very fans play in open view of us, without minding so worn-out curs as you and I. Instinct is their gift, Hector, and they have found out how little we are to be feared. They have.' The dog stretched his head upward, and responded to the words of his master by a long and plaintive whine, which he even continued after he had again buried his head in the grass, as if he held an intelligent communication with one who so well knew how to interpret dumb discourse. "'This is a manifest warning, Hector,' the trapper continued, dropping his voice to the tones of caution and looking warily about him. "'What is it, pup? Speak plainer, dog. What is it?' The hound had, however, already laid his nose to the earth, and was silent, appearing to slumber. But the keen, quick glances of his master soon caught a glimpse of a distant figure, which seemed through the deceptive light, floating along the very elevation on which he had placed himself. Presently its proportions became more distinct, and then an airy female form appeared to hesitate, as if considering whether it would be prudent to advance. Though the eyes of the dog were now to be seen glancing in the rays of the moon, opening and shutting lazily, he gave no further signs of displeasure. "'Come, Nyer, we are friends,' said the trapper, associating himself with his companion by long use, and, probably, through the strength of the secret tie that connected them together. "'We are your friends. None will harm you.' Encouraged by the mild tones of his voice, and perhaps led on by the earnestness of her purpose, the female approach, until she stood at his side. When the old man perceived his visitor to be the young woman with whom the reader has already become acquainted by the name of Ellen Wade. "'I had thought you were gone,' she said, looking timidly and anxiously around. "'They said you were gone, and that we should never see you again. I did not think it was you.' "'Men are no common objects in these empty fields,' returned the trapper and I humbly hope, though I have so long consorted with the beasts of the wilderness, that I have not yet lost the look of my kind. Oh, I knew you to be a man, and I thought I knew the whine of the hound too, she answered hastily, as if willing to explain she knew not what, and then checking herself, like one fearful of having already said too much. I saw no dogs among the teams of your father, the trapper remarked. Father, exclaimed the girl, feelingly, I have no father. I had nearly said, no friend. The old man turned towards her with a look of kindness and interest that was even more conciliating than the ordinary, upright, and benevolent expression of his weather-beaten countenance. Why, then, do you venture in a place where none but the strong should come? He demanded. Did you not know that when you crossed the big river, you left a friend behind that is always bound to look to the young and feeble like yourself? "'Of whom do you speak?' "'The law. "'Tis bad to have it, "'but I sometimes think it is worse to be entirely without it. "'Age and weakness have brought me to feel such weakness at times. "'Yes, yes, the law is needed "'when such as have not the gifts of strength and wisdom "'are to be taken care of. "'I hope, young woman, if you have no father, "'you have at least a brother.' "'The maiden felt the tacit reproach conveyed in this convert question.' and for a moment she remained in an embarrassed silence. But catching a glimpse of the mild and serious features of her companion, as he continued to gaze on her with a look of interest, she replied firmly, and in a manner that left no doubt she comprehended his meaning. "'Heaven forbid that any such as you have seen should be a brother of mine, or anything else near or dear to me. But tell me, do you then actually live alone? Is this desert district, old man?' Is there really none here besides yourself? 
There are hundreds, nay, thousands, of the rightful owners of the country, roving about the plains, but few of our own color. "'And have you then met none who are white but us?' interrupted the girl, like one too impatient to await the tardy explanations of age and deliberation. "'Not in many days. Hush, Hector, hush!' he added in reply to a low and nearly inaudible growl from his hound. "'The dog scents mischief in the wind. The black bears from the mountains sometimes make their way even lower than this. The pup is not apt to complain of the harmless game. I am not so ready and true with the peace as I used to it could be. Yet I have struck even the fiercest animals of the prairie in my time, so you have little reason for fear, young woman." The girl raised her eyes in that peculiar manner which is so often practiced by her sex, when they commence their glances, by examining the earth at their feet, and terminate them by noting everything within the power of human vision. But she rather manifested the quality of impatience than any feeling of alarm. A short bark from the dog, however, soon gave a new direction to the looks of both, and then the real object of his second warning became dimly visible. Chapter 3 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Come, come, thou art as hot a jack in thy mood as any in Italy, and as soon moved to be moody and as soon moody to be moved. Romeo and Juliet Though the trapper manifested some surprise when he perceived that another human figure was approaching him, and that, too, from a direction opposite to the place where the immigrant had made his encampment, it was with the steadiness of one long accustomed to scenes of danger. "'This is the man,' he said, "'and one who has white blood in his veins, or his step would be lighter.' It will be well to be ready for the worst, as the half and halves. Footnote: Half breeds, men born of Indian women by white fathers. This race has much of the depravity of civilization without the virtues of the savage. That one meets in these distant districts are altogether more barbarous than the real savage. He raised his rifle while he spoke and assured himself of the state of its flint as well as of the priming by manual examination. But his arm was arrested, while in the act of throwing forward the muzzle of the piece, by the eager and trembling hands of his companion. "'For God's sake, be not too hasty,' she said. "'It may be a friend, an acquaintance, a neighbor.' "'A friend?' the old man repeated, deliberately releasing himself at the same time from her grasp. Friends are rare in any land, and less in this, perhaps, than in another, and the neighborhood is too thinly settled to make it likely that he who comes towards us is even an acquaintance. But though a stranger, you would not seek his blood? The trapper earnestly regarded her anxious and frightened features, and then he dropped the butt of his rifle on the ground, like one whose purpose had undergone a sudden change. No! he said, speaking rather to himself than to his companion. She is right. Blood is not to be spilt, to save the life of one so useless and so near his time. Let him come on. My skins, my traps, and even my rifle shall be his, if he sees fit to demand them. He will ask for neither. He wants neither, returned the girl. If he be an honest man, he will surely be content with his own and ask for nothing that is the property of another." The trapper had not time to express the surprise he felt at this incoherent and contradictory language, for the man who was advancing was already within fifty feet of the place where they stood. In the meantime, Hector had not been an indifferent witness of what was passing. At the sound of the distant footsteps he had arisen from his warm bed at the feet of his master, and now, as the stranger appeared in open view, he stalked slowly towards him, crouching to the earth like a panther, about to take his leap. "'Call in your dog,' said a firm, deep manly voice in tones of friendship, rather than a menace. "'I love a hound, and should be sorry to do an injury to the animal.' "'You hear what is said about you, pup?' the trapper answered. "'Come hither, fool. His growl and his bark are all that is left of him now. You may come on, friend.' The hound is toothless. 
The stranger profited by the intelligence. He sprang eagerly forward, and at the next instant stood at the side of Ellen Wade. After assuring himself of the identity of the latter, by a hasty but keen glance, he turned his attention, with a quickness and impatience, that proved the interest he took in the result, to a similar examination of her companion. "'From what cloud have you fallen, my good old man?' he said in a careless, off-hand, heedless manner that seemed too natural to be assumed. "'Or do you actually live, hereaway, in the prairies?' "'I have been long on earth, and never, I hope, nigher to heaven, than I am at this moment,' returned the trapper. "'My dwelling, if dwelling I may be said to have, is not far distant. Now may I take the liberty with you that you are so willing to take with others? Whence do you come, and where is your home?' "'Softly, softly, when I have done with my catechism, it will be time to begin with yours. What sport is this you follow by moonlight? You are not dodging the buffaloes at such an hour?' "'I am, as you see, going from an encampment of travellers, which lies over yonder swell in the land, to my own wigwam. In doing so I wrong no man.' "'All fair, and true.' "'And you got this young woman to show you the way, "'because she knows it so well "'and you know so little about it yourself?' "'I met her, as I have met you, by accident. "'For ten tiresome years have I dwelt on these open fields, "'and never before tonight have I found human beings "'with white skins on them at this hour. "'If my presence here gives offence, I am sorry, "'and will go my way. "'It is more than likely that when your young friend has told her story, you will be better given to believe mine. Friend, said the youth, lifting a cap of skins from his head, and running his fingers leisurely through a dense mass of black and shaggy locks. If I have ever laid eyes on the girl before tonight, may I— You've said enough, Pa, interrupted the female, laying her hand on his mouth, with a familiarity that gave something very like the lie direct to his intended asservation. Our secret will be safe with this honest old man. I know it by his looks and kind words. Our secret? Ellen, have you forgot? Nothing. I have not forgotten anything I should remember. But still, I say, we are safe with this honest trapper. Trapper? Is he then a trapper? Give me your hand, father. Our trades should bring us acquainted. There is little call for handicrafts in this region, returned the other, examining the athletic and active form of the youth as he leaned carelessly and not ungracefully on his rifle. The art of taking the creatures of God in traps and nefts is one that needs more cunning than manhood, and yet I am brought to practice it in my age. But it would be quite as seemly in one like you to follow a pursuit better becoming your years and courage. I, I never took even a slinking mink or a paddling muskrat in a cage, though I admit having peppered a few of the dark-skinned devils, when I had much better have kept my powder in the horn and the lead in its pouch. Not I, old man, nothing that crawls the earth is for my sport. What then may you do for a living friend? For little profit is to be made in these districts if a man denies himself his lawful right in the beasts of the fields. I deny myself nothing. If a bear crosses my path, he is soon the mere ghost of Bruin. The deer begin to nose me, and as for the buffalo, I have killed more beef, old stranger, than the largest butcher in all Kentuck. You can shoot, then, demanded the trapper, with a glow of latent fire glimmering about his eyes. Is your hand true, and your look quick? The first is like a steel trap, and the last nimbler than a buckshot. I wish it was hot noon now, grandfather, and that there was an acre or two of your white swans, or of black feathered ducks going south, over our heads. You are Ellen. Here might set your heart on the finest flock, and my character against the horn of powder, that the bird would be hanging head downwards in five minutes, and that too with a single ball. I scorn a shotgun. No man can say he ever knew me to carry one, a rod. The lad has good in him. I see it plainly by his manner, said the trapper, turning to Ellen with an encouraging air. I will take it on myself to say that you are not unwise in meeting him as you do. Tell me, lad, did you ever strike a leaping buck atwixt the antlers? Hector, quiet, pup, quiet. The very name of venison quickens the blood of the cur. 
Did you ever take an animal in that fashion on the long leap? You might just as well ask me, did you ever eat? There is no fashion, old stranger, that a deer has not been touched by my hand unless it was when asleep. Ay, ay, you have a long and a happy and an honest life abhor you. I am old, and I suppose I might also say, worn out and useless. But if it was given to me to choose my time and place again, as such things are not and ought not ever to be given to the will of man, though if such a gift was to be given me, I would say twenty and the wilderness. But tell me, how do you part with the peltry? With the pelts? I never took a skin from a buck nor a quill from a goose in my life. I knocked them over, now and then, for a meal, and sometimes to keep my finger true to the touch, but when hunger is satisfied, the prairie wolves get the remainder. No, no, I keep to my calling, which pays me better than all the fur I could sell on the other side of the big river. The old man appeared to ponder a little, but shaking his head, he soon continued. I know of but one business that can be followed here with profit. He was interrupted by the youth who raised a small cup of ten, which dangled at his neck before the other's eyes, and springing its lid, the delicious odor of the finest flavored honey, diffused itself over the organs of the trapper. "'A bee-hunter,' observed the latter, with a readiness that proved he understood the nature of the occupation, though not without some little surprise at discovering one of the other spirited men engaged in so humble a pursuit. "'It pays well in the skirts of the settlements.' but I should call it a doubtful trade in the more open districts. You think a tree is wanting for a swarm to settle in? But I know differently, and so I have stretched out a few hundred miles farther west than common to taste your honey. And now I have baited with your curiosity, stranger. You will just move aside while I tell the remainder of my story to this young woman. It is not necessary. I'm sure it is not necessary that he should leave us said Ellen, with a haste that implied some little consciousness of the singularity, if not of the impriety of the request. "'You can have nothing to say that the whole world might not hear.' "'No. Well, may I be stung to death by drones, if I understand the buzzings of a woman's mind. For my part, Ellen, I care for nothing nor any body, and am just as ready to go down to the place where your uncle, if uncle you can call one, who I'll swear is no relation, has hoppled his teams, and tell the old man my mind now, as I shall be a year hence. You have only to say a single word, and the thing is done. Let him like it or not. You are ever so hasty and so rash, Pa Hover, that I seldom know when I am safe with you. How can you, who know the danger of our being seen together, speak of going before my uncle and his sons? Has he done that of which he has reason to be ashamed? demanded the trapper, who had not moved an inch from the place he first occupied. "'Heaven forbid! But there are reasons why he should not be seen just now, that could do him no harm if known, but which may not yet be told. And so, if you will wait, father, near yonder willow-bush, until I have heard what Paul can possibly have to say, I shall be sure to come and wish you a good night before I return to the camp.' The trapper drew slowly aside, as if satisfied with the somewhat incoherent reason Ellen had given why he should retire. When completely out of earshot of the earnest and hurried dialogue that instantly commenced between the two he had left, the old man again paused, and patiently awaited the moment when he might renew his conversation with beings in whom he felt a growing interest, no less from the mysterious character of their intercourse than from a natural sympathy in the welfare of a pair so young, and who, as in the simplicity of his heart he was also fain to believe, were also so deserving. He was accompanied by his indolent but attached dog, who once more made his bed at the feet of his master, and soon lay slumbering as usual, with his head nearly buried in the dense fog of the prairie grass. It was a spectacle so unusual to see the human form amid the solitude in which he dwelt, that the trapper bent his eyes on the thin figures of his new acquaintances, with sensations to which he had long been a stranger. Their presence awakened recollections and emotions to which his sturdy but honest nature had latterly paid but little homage, and his thoughts began to wander over the varied scenes of a life of hardships that had been strangely blended with scenes of wild and peculiar enjoyment. The train taken by his thoughts had, already, conducted him, in imagination, far into an ideal world, when he was, once more suddenly, recalled to the reality of his situation, 
by the movements of the faithful hound. The dog, who, in submission to his years and infirmities, had manifested such a decided propensity to sleep, now arose, and stalked from out the shadow cast by the tall person of his master, and looked abroad into the prairie, as if his instinct apprised him of the presence of still another visitor. Then, seemingly content with his examination, he returned to his comfortable post and disposed of his weary limbs with the deliberation and care of one who was no novice in the art of self-preservation. "'What again, Hector?' said the trapper in a soothing voice, which he had the caution, however, to utter in an undertone. "'What is it, dog? Tell it all to his master, pup. What is it?' Hector answered with another growl, but was content to continue in his lair. These were evidences of intelligence and distress, to which one as practiced as the trapper could not turn an inattentive ear. He again spoke to the dog, encouraging him to watchfulness by a low guarded whistle. The animal, however, as if conscious of having already discharged his duty, obstinately refused to raise his head from the grass. A hint from such a friend is far better than man's advice muttered the trapper as he slowly moved towards the couple who were yet too earnestly and abstractedly engaged in their own discourse to notice his approach and none but a conceited settler would hear it and not respect it as he ought children he added when nigh enough to address his companions we are not alone in these dreary fields there are others stirring and therefore to the shame of our kind be it said danger is nigh if one of the lazy sons of skirting Ishmael is prowling out of his camp tonight, said the young bee hunter, with a great vivacity and in tones that might easily have been excited to a menace, he may have an end put to his journey sooner than either he or his father is dreaming. My life on it! They are all with the teams, hurriedly answered the girl. I saw the whole of them asleep, myself, except the two on watch, and their natures have greatly changed. If they, too, are not both dreaming of a turkey hunt or a courthouse fight, at this very moment. Some beast with a strong scent has passed between the wind and the hound, father, and it makes him uneasy, or perhaps he too is dreaming. I had a pup of my own in Kentuck that would start upon a long chase from a deep sleep, and all upon the fancy of some dream. Go to him and pinch his ear, that the beast may feel the life within him. Not so, not so, returned the trapper, shaking his head as one who better understood the qualities of his dog. Youth sleeps, ay, and dreams too, but age is awake and watchful. The pup is never false with his nose, and long experience tells me to heed his warnings. Did you ever run him upon the trail of carrion? Why, I must say that the ravenous beasts have sometimes tempted me to let him loose, for they are as greedy as men after the venison in its season. But then I knew the reason of the dog would tell him the object. No, no, Hector is an animal known in the ways of man, and will never strike a false trail when a true one is to be followed. Hi, hi, the secret is out. You have run the hound on the track of a wolf, and his nose has a better memory than his master, said the bee-hunter, laughing. I have seen the creature sleep for hours, with pack after pack and open view. A wolf might eat out of his tray without a snarl, unless there was a scarcity. Then, indeed, Hector would be apt to claim his own. There are panthers down from the mountains. I saw one make a leap at a sick deer as the sun was setting. Go, go, you back to the dog, and tell him the truth, father. In a minute, I— He was interrupted by a long, loud, and piteous howl from the hound, which rose on the air of the evening, like the wailing of some spirit of the place, and passed off into the prairie, in cadences that rose and fell, like its own undulating surface. The trapper was impressively silent, listening intently. Even the reckless bee-hunter was struck with the wailing wildness of the sounds. After a short pause, the former whistled the dog to his side, and turning to his companions he said with the seriousness which in his opinion the occasion demanded, They who think man enjoys all the knowledge of the creatures of God will live to be disappointed if they reach, as I have done, the age of fourscore years. I will not take upon myself to say what mischief is brewing, nor will I vouch that even the hound himself knows so much. But that evil is nigh, and that wisdom invites us to avoid it. I have heard from the mouth of one who never lies. 
I did think the pup had become unused to the footsteps of man, and that your presence made him uneasy. But his nose has been on a long scent the whole evening, and what I mistook as a notice of your coming has been intended for something more serious. If the advice of an old man is, then, worth hearkening to children, you will quickly go different ways to your places of shelter and safety. "'If I quit Ellen at such a moment,' exclaimed the youth, "'may I—' "'You said enough,' the girl interrupted, by again interposing a band that might, both by its delicacy and color, have graced a far more elevated station in life. "'My time is out, and we must part at all events. So good night, Pa. Father, good night.' "'Hist!' said the youth, seizing her arm, as she was in the very act of tripping from his side. "'Hist! Do you hear nothing? There are buffaloes playing their pranks at no great distance. That sound beats the earth like a herd of the mad scampering devils.' His two companions listened, as people in their situation would be apt to lend their facilities to discover the meaning of any doubtful noises, especially when heard after so many and such startling warnings. The unusual sounds were unequivocally, though still faintly, audible. The youth and his female companion had made several hurried and vacillating conjectures concerning their nature, when a current of the night air brought the rush of trampling footsteps too sensibly to their ears to render mistake any longer possible. "'Am I right?' said the bee-hunter. "'A panther is driving a herd before him. Or maybe there is a battle among the beasts.' "'Your ears are cheats,' returned the old man, who, from the moment his own organs had been able to catch the distant sounds, stood like a statue made to represent deep attention. "'The leaps are too long for the buffalo, and too regular for terror. Hish! Now they are in the bottom, where the grass is high, and the sound is deadened. Ay, there they go on the hard earth, and now they come up the swell, dead upon us. They will be here afore you can find a cover. "'Come, Alan,' cried the youth, seizing his companion by the hand. "'Let us make a trail for the encampment.' "'Too late, too late!' exclaimed the trapper. "'For the creatures are in the open view, and a bloody band of accursed Sioux they are, by their thieving luck and the random fashion in which they ride.' "'Sues or devils, they shall find us, men,' said the bee-hunter, with a mien as fierce as if he had led a party of superior strength and of a courage equal to his own. "'You have a piece, old man, and will pull a trigger in behalf of a helpless christened girl?' "'Down, down into the grass, down with ye both,' whispered the trapper, intimating to them a turn aside to the tall weeds, which grew in a denser body than common near the place where they stood." You have not the time to fly, nor the numbers to fight, foolish boy. Down into the grass, if you prize the young woman, or value the gift of life. His remonstrance, seconded as it was by a prompt and energetic action, did not fail to produce the submission to his order, which the occasion seemed, indeed, imperiously to require. The moon had fallen behind a sheet of thin, fleecy clouds, which skirted the horizon, leaving just enough of its faint and fluctuating light to render objects visible, dimly revealing their forms and proportions. The trapper, by exercising that species of influence over his companions, which experience and decision usually assert in cases of emergency, had effectually succeeded in concealing them in the grass, and by the aid of the feeble rays of the luminary, he was enabled to scan the disorderly party which was riding like so many madmen directly upon them. A band of beings who resembled demons rather than men, sporting in their nightly revels across the bleak plain, was in truth approaching at a fearful rate, and in a direction to leave little hope that some one among them, at least, would not pass over the spot where the trapper and his companions lay. At intervals the clattering of hoofs was borne along by the night wind quite audibly in their front, and then again their progress through the fog of the autumnal grass was swift and silent adding to the unearthly appearance of the spectacle. The trapper, who had called in his hound, and bidden him crouch at his side, now kneeled in the cover also, and kept a keen and watchful eye on the root of the band, soothing the fears of the girl, and restraining the impatience of the youth in the same breath. "'If there is one, there is thirty of the miscreants,' he said, in a sort of episode to his whispered comments. "'Ay, ay, they are edging towards the river. Peace, pup, peace!' No, here they come this way again. The thieves don't seem to know their own errand. 
If there were just six of us, lad, what a beautiful ambushment we might make upon them from this very spot. It won't do. It won't do, boy. Keep yourself closer, or your head will be seen. Besides, I'm not altogether strong in the opinion it would be lawful, as they have done us no harm. There they bend again to the river. No, here they come up the swell. Now is the moment to be as still, as if the breath had done its duty and departed the body. The old man sunk into the grass while he was speaking, as if the final separation to which he alluded had, in his own case, actually occurred, and, at the next instant, a band of wild horsemen whirled by them, with the noiseless rapidity in which it might be imagined a troop of spectres would pass. The dark and fleeting forms were already vanished, when the trapper ventured again to raise his head to a level with the top of the bending herbage motioning at the same time to his companions to maintain their positions and their silence. "'They are going down the swell towards the encampment,' he continued in his former guarded tones. "'No, they halt in the bottom, and are clustering together like deer in a council. By the Lord they are turning again, and we are not yet done with the reptiles.' Once more he sought his friendly cover, and at the next instant the dark troop were to be seen riding in a disorderly manner on the very summit of the little elevation on which the trapper and his companions lay. It was now soon apparent that they had returned to avail themselves of the height of the ground in order to examine the dim horizon. Some dismounted, while others rode to and fro, like men engaged in a local inquiry of much interest. Happily for the hidden party, the grass in which they were concealed not only served to screen them from the eyes of the savages, but opposed an obstacle to prevent their horses, which were no less rude and untrained than their riders, from trampling on them in their irregular and wild paces. At length an athletic and dark-looking Indian, who by his air of authority would seem to be the leader, summoned his chiefs about him to a consultation which was held mounted. This body was collected on the very margin of that mass of herbage in which the trapper and his companions were hid. As the young man looked up and saw the fierce aspect of the group, which was increasing at each instant by the accession of some countenance and figure, apparently more forbidding than any which had preceded it, he drew his rifle, by a very natural impulse, from beneath him and commenced putting it in a state for service. The female at his side buried her face in the grass, by a feeling that was possibly quite as natural to her sex and habits, leaving him to follow the impulses of his hot blood, but his aged and more prudent adviser whispered sternly in his ear, The tick of the lock is as well known to the knaves as the blast of a trumpet to a soldier. Lay down the piece, lay down the piece. Should the moon touch the barrel, it could not fail to be seen by the devils whose eyes are keener than the blackest snakes. The smallest motion now would be sure to bring an arrow among us. The bee-hunter so far obeyed as to continue immovable and silent, but there was still sufficient light to convince his companion, by the contracted brow and threatening eye of the young man, that a discovery would not bestow a bloodless victory on the savages. Finding his advice disregarded, the trapper took his measures accordingly, and awaited the result with a resignation and calmness that were characteristic of the individual. In the meantime, the Sioux, for the sagacity of the old man was not deceived in the character of his dangerous neighbors, had terminated their council and were again dispersed along the ridge of land as if they sought some hidden object. "'The imps have heard the hound,' whispered the trapper, "'and their ears are too true to be cheated in the distance. Keep close, lad, keep close. Down with your head to the very earth like a dog that sleeps.' "'Let us rather take to our feet and trust to manhood,' returned his impatient companion. He would have proceeded, but feeling a hand laid rudely on his shoulder, he turned his eyes upward and beheld the dark and savage countenance of an Indian gleaming full upon him. Notwithstanding the surprise and a disadvantage of his attitude, the youth was not disposed to become a captive so easily. Quicker than the flash of his own gun, he sprang upon his feet and was throttling his opponent with the power that would soon have terminated the contest when he felt the arms of the trapper thrown around his body, confining his exertions by a strength very little inferior to his own. Before he had time to reproach his comrade for this apparent treachery, a dozen Sioux were around them, and the whole party were compelled to yield themselves as prisoners. End of chapter 3
Chapter Four of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. With much more dismay I view the fight than those that make the fray. Merchant of Venice. The unfortunate bee hunter and his companions had become the captives of a people who might without exaggeration be called the Ishmaelites of the American deserts. From time immemorial, the hands of the Sioux have been turned against their neighbors of the prairies, and even at this day, when the influence and authority of a civilized government are beginning to be felt around them, they are considered a treacherous and dangerous race. At the period of our tale, the case was far worse. Few white men, trusting themselves in the remote and unprotected regions, where so false a tribe was known to dwell. Notwithstanding the peaceable submission of the trapper, he was quite aware of the character of the band into whose hands he had fallen. It would have been difficult, however, for the nicest judge to have determined whether fear, policy, or resignation formed the secret motive of the old man in permitting himself to be plundered as he did without a murmur. So far from opposing any remonstrance to the rude and violent manner in which his conquerors performed the customary office, he even anticipated their caputity by tendering to the chiefs such articles as he thought might prove the most acceptable. On the other hand, Paul Hover, who had been a literally a conquered man, manifested the strongest repugnance to submit to the violent liberties that were taken with his person and property. He even gave several exceedingly unequivocal demonstrations of his displeasure during the summary process, and would more than once have broken out in open and desperate resistance but for the admonitions and entreaties of the trembling girl who clung to his side in a manner so dependent as to show the youth that her hopes were now placed no less on his discretion than on his disposition to serve her. The Indians had, however, no sooner deprived the captives of their arms and ammunition, and stripped them of a few articles of dress of little use, and perhaps of less value, then they appeared disposed to grant them a respite. Business of greater moment pressed on their hands, and required their attention. Another consultation of the chiefs was convened, and it was apparent, by the earnest and vehement manner of the few who spoke, that the warriors conceived their success as yet to be far from complete. "'It will be well,' whispered the trapper, who knew enough of the language he heard to comprehend perfectly the subject of the discussion. If the travellers who lie near the willow break are not awoke out of their sleep by a visit from these miscreants, they are too cunning to believe that a woman of the pale faces is to be found so far from the settlements without having a white man's inventions and comforts at hand. If they will carry the tribe of wandering Ishmael to the Rocky Mountains, said the young bee hunter, laughing at his vexation with a sort of bitter merriment, I may forgive the rascals. "'Paul! Paul!' exclaimed his companion in a tone of reproach. "'You forget all. Think of the dreadful consequences.' "'I, it was thinking of what you call consequences, Ellen, that prevented me from putting the matter at once to yonder red devil, and making it a real knock-down and drag-out. Old trapper, the sin of this cowardly business lies on your shoulders. But it is no more than your daily calling, I reckon, to take men as well as beasts and snares.' "'I implore you, Paul.' to be calm, to be patient. Well, since it is your wish, Ellen, returned the youth, endeavoring to swallow his spleen, I will make the trial, though, as you ought to know, it is part of the religion of a Kentuckian to fret himself a little at a mischance. I fear your friends in the other bottom will not escape the eyes of the imps, continued the trapper, as coolly as though he had not heard a syllable of the intervening discourse. They sent plunder and it would be as hard to drive a hound from his game as to throw the varmints from its trail. "'Is there nothing to be done?' asked Ellen, in an imploring manner, which proved the sincerity of her concern. "'It would be an easy matter to call out in so loud a voice as to make old Ishmael dream that the wolves were among his flock,' Paul replied. "'I can make myself heard a mile in these open fields, and his camp is but a short quarter from us.' "'And get knocked on the head for your pains?' returned the trapper. "'No, no, cunning must match cunning, or the hounds will murder the whole family.' "'Murder? No, murder? 
Ishmael loves traveled so well that there would be no harm in his having a look at the other sea. But the old fellow is in bad condition to take the long journey. I would try a lock myself, before he should be quite murdered. His party is strong in number, and well armed. Do you think it will fight? Look here, old trapper. Few men love Ishmael Bush and his seven sledgehammer sons, less than one paw hover. But I scorn to slander even a Tennessee shotgun. There is as much of the true stand-up courage among them, as there is in any family that was ever raised in Kentuck itself. They are a long-sided and a double-jointed breed. And let me tell you, that he who takes the measure of one of them on the ground must be a workman at a hug. Hiss! The savages have done their talk, and are about to set their accursed devices in motion. Let us be patient. Something may yet offer in favor of your friends. Friends! Call none of the race a friend of mine, Trapper, if you have the smallest regard for my affection. What I say in their favor is less from love than honesty. I did not know but the young woman was of the kin, returned the other a little dryly, but no offense should be taken where none was intended. The mouth of Paul was again stopped by the hand of Ellen, who took on herself to reply in her conciliating tones, We should be all of a family when it is in our power to serve each other. We depend entirely on your experience, honest old man, to discover the means to appraise our friends of their danger. There will be a real time of it, muttered the bee-hunter laughing, if the boys get at work in good earnest with these redskins. He was interrupted by a general movement which took place among the band. The Indians dismounted to a man, giving their horses in charge to three or four of the party, who were also entrusted with the safekeeping of the prisoners. They then formed themselves in a circle around a warrior who appeared to possess the chief authority, and at a given signal the whole array moved slowly and cautiously from the center in straight and consequently in diverging lines. Most of their dark forms were soon blended with the brown covering of the prairie, though the captives, who watched the slightest movement of their enemies with vigilant eyes, were now and then enabled to discern a human figure drawn against the horizon as someone more eager than the rest rose to his greatest height in order to extend the limits of his view. But it was not long before even these fugitive glimpses of the moving and constantly increasing circle were lost, and uncertainty and conjecture were added to apprehension. In this manner passed many anxious and weary minutes, during the close of which the listeners expected at each moment to hear the whoop of the assailants and the shrieks of the assailed, rising together on the stillness of the night. But it would seem that the search which was so evidently making was without a sufficient object, for at the expiration of a half-hour the different individuals of the breed began to return singly, gloomy, and sullen, like men who were disappointed. "'Our time is at hand,' observed the trapper, who noted the smallest incident or the slightest indication of hostility among the savages. "'We are now to be questioned, and if I know anything of the policy of our case, I should say it would be wise to choose one among us to hold the discourse, in order that our testimony may agree. And furthermore, if an opinion from one as old and as worthless as a hunter of fourscore is to be regarded, I would just venture to say that man should be the one most skilled in the nature of an Indian, and that he should also know something of their language. Are you acquainted with the tongue of the Sioux's friend? Swarm your own hive, returned a discontented bee-hunter. You are good at buzzing, old trapper, if you are good at nothing else. "'Tis the gift of youth to be rash and heady," the trapper calmly retorted. "'The day has been, boy, when my blood was like your own, too swift and too hot to run quietly in my veins. But what will it profit to talk of silly risk and foolish acts at this time of life? A gray head should cover a brain of reason, and not the tongue of a boaster." "'True, true,' whispered Ellen and we have other things to attend to now. Here come the Indian to put his questions." The girl, whose apprehensions had quickened her senses, was not deceived. She was yet speaking when a tall, half-naked savage approached the spot where they stood, and after examining the whole party as closely as the dim light permitted, for more than a minute in perfect stillness, he gave the usual salutation in the harsh and guttural tones of his own language. The trapper replied as well as he could, which it seemed was sufficiently well to be understood. In order to escape the imputation of pedantry, 
we shall render the substance, and, so far as it is possible, the form of the dialogue that succeeded, into the English tongue. Have the pale faces eaten their own buffaloes, and taken the skins from their own beavers? continued the savage, allowing the usual moment of decorum to elapse, after the words of greeting, before he again spoke. That they come to count how many are left among the Pawnees? Some of us are here to buy, and some to sell, returned the trapper, but none will follow, if they hear it is not safe to come nigh the lodge of a Sioux. The Sioux are thieves, and they live among the snow. Why do we talk of a people who are so far, when we are in the country of the Pawnees? If the Pawnees are the owners of this land, then white and red are here by equal right. Have not the pale faces stolen enough from the red men, that you come so far to carry a lie? I have said this is a hunting ground of my tribe. My right to be here is equal to your own, the trapper rejoined, with undisturbed coolness. I do not speak as I might. It is better to be silent. The Pawnees and the white men are brothers. But a Sioux dare not show his face in the village of the Loops. The Dakotas are men, exclaimed the savage fiercely, forgetting in his anger to maintain the character he had assumed, and using the appellation of which his nation was most proud. The Dakotas have no fear. Speak! What brings you so far from the villages of the Pale Faces? I have seen the sun rise, and set on many councils, and have heard the words of wise men. Let your chiefs come, and my mouth shall not be shut. I am a great chief, said the savage, affecting an air of offended dignity. Do you take me for an acid of bone? Wooka is a warrior often named, and much believed. Am I a fool not to know a burnt wood teton? demanded the trapper, with a steadiness that did great credit to his nerves. Go! It is dark, and you do not see that my head is gray. The Indian now appeared convinced that he had adopted too shallow an artifice to deceive one so practiced as the man he addressed, and he was deliberating what fiction he should next invent in order to obtain his real object when a slight commotion among the band put an end at once to all his schemes. Casting his eyes behind him, as if fearful of a speedy interruption, he said in tones much less pretending than those he had first resorted to, Give Wooka the milk of long knives, and he will sing your name in the ears of the great men of his tribe. Go, repeated the trapper, motioning him away with strong disgust. Your young men are speaking of Matori. My words are for the ears of a chief. The savage cast a look at the other, which, notwithstanding the dim light, was sufficiently indicative of implacable hostility. He then stole away among his fellows, anxious to conceal the counterfeit he had attempted to practice, no less than the treachery he had contemplated against a fair division of the spoils, from the man named by the trapper, whom he now also knew to be approaching, by the manner in which his name passed from one to another in the band. He had hardly disappeared before a warrior of powerful frame advanced out of the dark circle, and placed himself before the captives with that high and proud bearing for which a distinguished Indian chief is ever so remarkable. He was followed by all the party, who arranged themselves around his person, in a deep and respectful silence. "'The earth is very large,' the chief commenced, after a pause of that true dignity which his counterfeit had so miserably affected. "'Why can the children of my great white father never find room on it?' "'Some among them have heard that their friends in the prairies are in want of many things,' returned the trapper. "'And they have come to see if it be true. Some want in their turns what the red men are willing to sell, and they come to make their friends rich with powder and blankets.' "'Do traders cross the big river with empty hands?' "'Our hands are empty because your young men thought we were tired.' and they have lightened us of our load. They were mistaken. I am old, but I am still strong. It cannot be. Your load has fallen in the prairies. Show my young men the place, that they may pick it up before the Pawnees find it. The path to the spot is crooked, and it is night. The hour has come for sleep, said the trapper, with a perfect composure. Bid your warriors go over yonder hill. There is water, and there is wood. 
let them light their fires and sleep with warm feet. When the sun comes again, I will speak to you. A low murmur, but one that was clearly indicative of dissatisfaction, passed among the attentive listeners, and served to inform the old man that he had not been sufficiently wary in proposing a measure that he intended should notify the travellers in the break of the presence of their dangerous neighbours. Matori, however, was without betraying in the slightest degree the excitement which was so strongly exhibited by his companions, continued the discourse in the same lofty manner as before. "'I know that my friend is rich,' he said, "'that he has many warriors not far off, and that horses are plentier with him than dogs among the redskins.' "'You see my warriors and my horses?' "'What? Has the woman the feet of a Dakota, that she can walk for thirty nights in the prairies and not fall? I know the red men of the woods make long marches on foot, but we, who live where the eye cannot see from one ledge to another, love our horses.' The trapper now hesitated in his turn. He was perfectly aware that deception, if detected, might prove dangerous and, for one of his pursuits and character, he was strongly troubled with an unaccommodating regard for the truth. But, recollecting that he controlled the fate of others as well as of himself, he determined to let things take their course, and to permit the Dakota chief to deceive himself if he would. "'The women of the Sioux and of the white men are not of the same wigwam,' he answered evasively. "'Would a Teton warrior make his wife greater than himself?' I know he would not, and yet my ears have heard that there are lands where the councils are held by squalls. Another slight movement in the dark circle apprised the trapper that his declaration was not received without surprise, if entirely without distrust. The chief alone seemed unmoved, nor was he disposed to relax from the loftiness and high dignity of his air. "'My white fathers who live on the Great Lakes have declared,' he said, that their brothers towards the rising sun are not men, and now I know they did not lie. Go! What is a nation whose chief is a squaw? Are you the dog and not the husband of this woman? I am neither. Never did I see her face before this day. She came into the prairies because they had told her a great and generous nation called the Dakotas live there, and she wished to look on men. The women of the pale faces, like the women of the Sioux, open their eyes to see things that are new. But she is poor, like myself, and she will want corn and buffaloes if you take away the little that she and her friends still have. "'My ears listen to many wicked lies!' exclaimed the Teton warrior, in a voice so stern that it startled even his red auditors. "'Am I a woman? Has not a Dakota eyes? Tell me, white hunter!' Who are the men of your color that sleep near the fallen trees? As he spoke, the indignant chief pointed in the direction of Ishmael's encampment, leaving the trapper no reason to doubt that the superior industry and sagacity of this man had effected a discovery which had eluded the search of the rest of his party. Notwithstanding his regret at an event that might prove fatal to the sleepers, and some little vexation at having been so completely outwitted in the dialogue just related, the old man continued to maintain his air of inflexible composure. "'It may be true,' he answered, "'that white men are sleeping in the prairie. If my brother says it, it is true. But what men does trust to the generosity of the Tetons, I cannot tell. If they be strangers asleep, send your young men to wake them up, and let them say why they are here. Every pale face has a tongue.' The chief shook his head with a wild and fierce smile answering abruptly as he turned away to put an end to the conference. The Dakotas are a wise, and Batori is their chief. He will not call to the strangers that they may rise and speak to him with their carabines. He will whisper softly in their ears. When this is done, let the men of their own color come and awake them. As he uttered these words and turned on his heel, a low and approving laugh passed among the dark circle, which instantly broke its order and followed him to a little distance from the stand of the captives, where those who might presume to mingle opinions with so great a warrior again gathered about him in consultation. Wooka profited by the occasion to renew his importunities, but the trapper, who had discovered how great a counterfeit he was, shook him off in displeasure. 
An end was, however, more effectually put to the annoyance of this malignant savage by a mandate for the whole party, including men and beasts, to change their positions. The movement was made in dead silence, and with an order that would have done credit to more enlightened beings. A halt, however, was soon made, and when the captives had time to look about them, they found they were in view of the low, dark outline of the corpse, near which lay the slumbering party of Ishmael. Here another short but grave and deliberate consultation was held. The beasts, which seemed trained to such covert and silent attacks, were once more placed under the care of keepers, who, as before, were charged with the duty of watching the prisoners. The mind of the trapper was in no degree relieved from the uneasiness, which was at each instant getting a stronger possession of him, when he found Wooka was placed nearest to his own person and as it appeared, by the air of the triumph and authority he assumed, at the head of the guard also. The savage, however, who doubtless had his secret instructions, was content for the present with making a significant gesture with his tomahawk, which menaced death to Ellen. After admonishing in this expressive manner his male captives of the fate that would instantly attend their female companion, on the slightest alarm proceeding from any of the party, he was content to maintain a rigid silence. This unexpected forbearance on the part of Wooka enabled the trapper and his two associates to give their undivided attention to the little that might be seen of the interesting movements which were passing in their front. Matori took the entire disposition of the arrangements on himself. He pointed out the precise situation he wished each individual to occupy, like one intimately acquainted with the qualifications of his respective followers, and he was obeyed with the deference and promptitude with which an Indian warrior is wont to submit to the instructions of his chief, in moments of trial. Some he dispatched to the right, and others to the left. Each man departed with the noiseless and quick step peculiar to the race, until all had assumed their allotted stations with the exception of the two chosen warriors who remained nigh the person of their leader. When the rest had disappeared, Matori turned to these select companions, and intimated by a sign that the critical moment had arrived, when the enterprise he contemplated was to be put in execution. Each man laid aside the light fowling piece, which, under the name of a carabine, he carried in virtue of his rank, and divesting himself of every article of exterior or heavy clothing, he stood resembling a dark and fierce-looking statue, in the attitude and nearly in the garb of nature. Matori assured himself of the right position of his tomahawk, felt that his knife was secure in its sheaf of skin, tightened his girdle of wampum, and saw that the lacing of his fringed and ornamental leggings was secure, and likely to offer no impediment to his exertions. Thus prepared at all points, and ready for his desperate undertaking, the Teton gave the signal to proceed. The three advanced in a line with the encampment of the travellers until, in the dim light by which they were seen, their dusky forms were nearly lost to the eyes of the prisoners. Here they paused, looking around them like men who deliberate and ponder long on the consequences before they take a desperate leap. Then, sinking together, they became lost in the grass of the prairie. It is not difficult to imagine the distress and anxiety of the different spectators of these threatening movements. Whatever might be the reasons of Ellen for entertaining no strong attachment to the family in which she has first been seen by the reader, the feelings of her sex, and, perhaps some lingering seeds of kindness, predominated. More than once she felt tempted to brave the awful and instant danger that awaited such an offense, and to raise her feeble and, in truth, impotent voice in warning. So strong indeed, and so very natural was the inclination, that she would most probably have put it in execution, but for the often repeated, though whispered remonstrances of Paul Hover. In the breast of the young bee-hunter himself, there was a singular union of emotions. His first and chiefest solicitude was certainly in behalf of his gentle and dependent companion. But the sense of her danger was mingled, in the breast of the reckless woodsman, with a consciousness of a high and wild, and by no means an unpleasant, excitement. Though united to the immigrants by ties still less binding than those of Ellen, he longed to hear the crack of their rifles, and had occasion offered, he would gladly have been amongst the first to rush to their rescue. There were, in truth, moments when he felt in his turn an impulse, that was nearly resistless, to spring forward and awake the unconscious sleepers. 
but a glance at Ellen would serve to recall his tottering prudence and to admonish him of the consequences. The trapper alone remained calm and observant as if nothing that involved his personal comfort or safety had occurred. His ever-moving, vigilant eyes watched the smallest change, with the composure of one too long inured to scenes of danger to be easily moved, and with an expression of cool determination which denoted the intention he actually harbored of profiting by the smallest oversight on the part of the captors. In the meantime, the Teton warriors had not been idle. Profiting by the high fog which grew in the bottoms, they had wormed their way through the matted grass like so many treacherous serpents stealing on their prey, until the point was gained, where an extraordinary caution became necessary to their further advance. Matari alone had occasionally elevated his dark, grim countenance above the herbage, straining his eyeballs to penetrate the gloom which skirted the border of the brake. In these momentary glances he gained sufficient knowledge, added to that he had obtained in his former search, to be the perfect master of the position of his intended victims, though he was still profoundly ignorant of their numbers and of their means of defense. His efforts to possess himself of the requisite knowledge concerning these two latter and essential points were, however, completely baffled by the stillness of the camp, which lay in a quiet as deep as if it were literally a place of the dead. Too wary and distrustful to rely, in circumstances of so much doubt, on the discretion of any less firm and crafty than himself, the Dakota bade his companions remain where they lay, and pursued the adventure alone. The progress of Matari was now slow, and to one less accustomed to such a species of exercise, it would have proved painfully laborious. But the advance of the wily snake itself is not more certain or noiseless than was his approach. He drew his form foot by foot through the bending grass, pausing at each movement to catch the small sound that might betray any knowledge on the part of the travelers of his proximity. He succeeded, at length, in dragging himself out of the sickly light of the moon into the shadows of the brake, where not only his dark person was much less liable to be seen, but where the surrounding objects became more distinctly visible to his keen and active glances. Here the Teton paused long and warily to make his observations before he ventured further, his position enabled him to bring the whole encampment with its tent, wagons, and lodges into a dark but clearly marked profile, furnishing a clue by which the practiced warrior was led to a tolerably accurate estimate of the force he was about to encounter. Still, an unnatural silence pervaded the spot, as if men suppressed even the quiet breathings of sleep in order to render the appearance of their confidence more evident. The chief bent his head to the earth and listened intently. He was about to raise it again, in disappointment, when the long-drawn and trembling respiration of one who slumbered imperfectly met his ear. The Indian was too well skilled in all the means of deception to become himself the victim of any common artifice. He knew the sound to be natural by its peculiar quivering, and he hesitated no longer. A man of nerves less tried than those of the fierce and conquering Matori would have been keenly sensible of all the hazard he incurred. The reputation of those hardy and powerful white adventurers, who so often penetrated the wilds inhabited by his people, was well known to him. But while he drew nigher, with the respect and caution that a brave enemy never fails to inspire, it was with the vindictive animosity of a red man, jealous and resentful of the inroads of the stranger. Turning from the line of his former route, the Teton dragged himself directly towards the margin of the thicket. When this material object was effected in safety, he arose to his seat and took a better survey of his situation. A single moment served to apprise him of the place where the unsuspecting traveler lay. The reader will readily anticipate that the savage has succeeded in gaining a dangerous proximity to one of those slothful sons of Ishmael, who were deputed to watch over the isolated encampment of the travelers. When certain that he was undiscovered, the Dakota raised his person again and, bending forward, he moved his dark visage above the face of the sleeper in that sort of wanton and subtle manner with which the reptile is seen to play about its victim before it strikes. Satisfied at length not only of the condition but of the character of the stranger, Matori was in the act of withdrawing his head when a slight movement of the sleeper announced the symptoms of reviving consciousness. The savage seized the knife which hung at his girdle, and in an instant it was poised above the breast of the young immigrant. 
Then, changing his purpose, with an action as rapid as his own flashing thoughts, he sunk back behind the trunk of the fallen tree, against which the other reclined, and lay in its shadow, as dark, as motionless, and apparently as insensible as the wood itself. The slothful sentinel opened his heavy eyes, and gazing upwards for a moment at the hazy heavens, he made an extraordinary exertion, and raised his powerful frame from the support of the log. Then he looked about him, with an air of something like watchfulness suffering his dull glances to run over the misty objects of the encampment, until they finally settled on the distant and dim field of the open prairie. Meeting with nothing more attractive than the same faint outlines of swell and interval, which everywhere rose before his drowsy eyes, he changed his position so as completely to turn his back on his dangerous neighbor, and suffered his person to sink sluggishly down into its former recumbent attitude. A long, and, on the part of the Teton, an anxious and painful silence succeeded, before the deep breathing of the traveler again announced that he was indulging in his slumbers. The savage was, however, far too jealous of a counterfeit to trust to the first appearance of sleep. But the fatigues of a day of unusual toil lay too heavily on the sentinel to leave the other long in doubt. Still, the motion with which Matori again raised himself to his knees was so noiseless and guarded that even a vigilant observer might have hesitated to believe he stirred. The change was, however, at length effected, and the Dakota chief then bent again over his enemy, without having produced a noise louder than that of the cottonwood leaf which fluttered at his side in the currents of the passing air. Matori now felt himself master of the sleeper's fate, at the same time that he scanned the vast proportions and athletic limbs of the youth in that sort of admiration which physical excellence seldom fails to excite in the breast of a savage, he coolly prepared to extinguish the principle of vitality which could alone render them formidable. After making himself sure of the seat of life, by gently removing the folds of the intervening cloth, he raised his keen weapon and was about to unite his strength and skill in the impending blow, when the young man threw his brawny arm carelessly backward, exhibiting in the action the vast volume of its muscles. The sagacious and wary Teton paused. It struck his acute faculties that sleep was less dangerous to him at that moment than even death itself might prove. The smallest noise, the agony of a struggling, with which such a frame would probably relinquish its hold of life, suggested themselves to his rapid thoughts, and were all present to his experienced senses. He looked back into the encampment, turned his head into the thicket, and glanced his glowing eyes abroad into the wild and silent prairies. Bending once more over the respited victim, he assured himself that he was sleeping heavily, and then abandoned his immediate purpose in obedience alone to the suggestions of a more crafty policy. The retreat of Matori was as still and guarded as had been his approach. He now took the direction of the encampment, stealing along the margin of the break as a cover into which he might easily plunge at the smallest alarm. The drapery of the solitary hut attracted his notice in passing. After examining the whole of its exterior, and listening with painful intensity, in order to gather counsel from his ears, the savage ventured to raise the cloth at the bottom and to thrust his dark visage beneath. It might have been a minute before the Teton chief drew back, and seated himself with the whole of his form without the linen tenement. Here he sat, seemingly brooding over his discovery for many moments, in rigid inaction. Then he resumed his crouching attitude, and once more projected his visage beyond the covering of the tent. His second visit to the interior was longer, and, if possible, more ominous than the first. But it had, like everything else, its termination, and the savage again withdrew his glaring eyes from the secrets of the place. Matori had drawn his person many yards from the spot in his slow progress towards the cluster of objects which pointed out the center of the position before he again stopped. He made another pause, and looked back at the solitary little dwelling he had left, as if doubtful whether he should not return. But the chevaux de frise of branches now lay within reach of his arm, and the very appearance of precaution it presented, as it announced the value of the effects it encircled, tempted his cupidity and induced him to proceed. The passage of the savage, through the tender and brittle limbs of the cottonwood, could be likened only to the sinuous and noiseless winding of the reptiles which he imitated. When he had effected his object, and had taken an instant to become acquainted with the nature of the localities within the enclosure, the Teton used the precaution to open a way through which he might make a swift retreat. Then, raising himself on his feet, 
he stalked through the encampment like a master of evil, seeking whom and what he should first devote to his fell purposes. He had already ascertained the contents of the lodge in which were collected the woman and her young children, and had passed several gigantic frames stretched on different piles of brush which happily for him lay in unconscious helplessness, when he reached the spot occupied by Ishmael in person. It could not escape the sagacity of one like Matori, that he had now within his power the principal man among the travellers. He stood long hovering above the recumbent and herculean form of the immigrant, keenly debating in his own mind the chances of his enterprise, and the most effectual means of reaping its richest harvest. He sheathed the knife, which, under the hasty and burning impulse of his thoughts, he had been tempted to draw, and was passing on, when Ishmael turned in his lair, and demanded roughly who was moving before his half-open eyes. Nothing short of the readiness and cunning of a savage could have evaded the crisis. Imitating the gruff tones and nearly unintelligible sounds he heard, Matori threw his body heavily on the earth, and appeared to dispose himself to sleep. Though the whole movement was seen by Ishmael, in a sort of stupid observation, the artifice was too bold and too admirably executed to fail. The drowsy father closed his eyes, and slept heavily, with this treacherous inmate in the very bosom of his family. It was necessary for the Teton to maintain the position he had taken for many long and weary minutes, in order to make sure that he was no longer watched. Though his body lay so motionless, his active mind was not idle. He profited by the delay to mature a plan, which he intended should put the whole encampment, including both its effects and their proprietors, entirely at his mercy. The instant he could do so, with safety, the indefatigable savage was again in motion. He took his way towards the slight pen which contained the domestic animals, worming himself along the ground in his former subtle and guarded manner. The first animal he encountered among the beasts occasioned a long and hazardous delay. The weary creature, perhaps conscious, through its secret instinct, that in the endless waste of the prairies its surest protector was to be found in man, was so exceedingly docile as quietly to submit to the close examination it was doomed to undergo. The hand of the wandering Teton passed over the downy coat, the meek countenance, and the slender limbs of the gentle creature, with untiring curiosity but he finally abandoned the prize, as useless in his predatory expeditions, and offering too little temptation to the appetite. As soon as, however, as he found himself among the beasts of burden, his gratification was extreme, and it was with difficulty that he restrained the customary ejaculations of pleasure, that were more than once on the point of bursting from his lips. Here he lost sight of the hazards by which he had gained access to his dangerous position and the watchfulness of the wary and long-practiced warrior was momentarily forgotten in the exultation of the savage. Chapter 5 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Why, worthy father, what have we to lose? The law protects us not. Then why should we be tender? to let an arrogant piece of flesh thread us. Play judge and executioner. Cymbeline. While the Teton thus enacted his subtle and characteristic part, not a sound broke the stillness of the surrounding prairie. The whole band lay at their several posts, waiting, with the well-known patience of the natives, for the signal which was to summon them to action. To the eyes of the anxious spectators who occupied the little eminence already described as the position of the captives, the scene presented the broad, solemn view of a waste dimly lighted by the glimmering rays of a clouded moon. The place of the encampment was marked by a gloom deeper than that which faintly shadowed out the courses of the bottoms, and here and there a brighter streak tinged the rolling summits of the ridges. As for the rest, it was the deep, imposing quiet of a desert. But to those who so well knew how much was brooding beneath this mantle of stillness a night, it was a scene of high and wild excitement. Their anxiety gradually increased, as minute after minute passed away, and not the smallest sound of life arose out of the calm and darkness which enveloped the break. The breathing of Paul grew louder and deeper, and more than once Ellen trembled at she knew not what, as she felt the quivering of his active frame, while she leaned dependently on his arm for support. 
The shallow honesty, as well as the besetting infirmity of Wuka, have already been exhibited. The reader, therefore, will not be surprised to learn that he was the first to forget the regulations he had himself imposed. It was at the precise moment when we left Matori, yielding to his nearly ungovernable delight, as he surveyed the number and quality of Ishmael's beasts of burden, that the man he had selected to watch his captives chose to indulge in the malignant pleasure of tormenting those it was his duty to protect. Bending his head nigh the ear of the trapper, the savage rather muttered than whispered. If the Tetons lose their great chief by the hands of the long knives, footnote, the whites are so called by the Indians from their swords, old shall die as well as young. Life is the gift of the Wakanda, was the unmoved reply. The burnt wood warrior must submit to his laws, as well as his other children. Men only die when he chooses, and no Dakota can change the hour. Look, returned the savage, thrusting the blade of his knife before the face of his captive. Wooka is the Wakanda of a dog. The old man raised his eyes to the fierce visage of his keeper, and, for a moment, a gleam of honest and powerful disgust shot from their deep cells, but it instantly passed away, leaving in its place an expression of commiseration, if not of sorrow. Why should one made in the real image of God suffer his nature to be provoked by a mere effigy of reason? He said in English, and in tones much louder than those in which Wooka had chosen to pitch the conversation. The latter profited by the unintentional offense of his captive, and, seizing him by the thin, gray locks that fell from beneath his cap, was on the point of passing the blade of his knife in malignant triumph around their roots, when a long, shrill yell rent the air, and was instantly echoed from the surrounding waste, as if a thousand demons opened their throats in common at the summons. Wooka relinquished his grasp and uttered a cry of exultation. "'Now!' shouted Paul, unable to control his impatience any longer. "'Now, old Ishmael, is the time to show the native blood of Kentucky. Fire low, boys!' Level into the swales, for the redskins are settling to the very earth. His voice was, however, lost, or rather unheeded, in the midst of the shrieks, shouts, and yells that were by this time bursting from fifty miles on every side of him. The guards still maintained their posts at the side of the captives, but it was with that sort of difficulty with which deeds are restrained at the starting post when expecting the signal to commence the trial of speed. They tossed their arms wildly in the air, leaping up and down more like exulting children than sober men, and continued to utter the most frantic cries. In the midst of this tumultuous disorder a rushing sound was heard, similar to that which might be expected to precede the passage of a flight of buffaloes, and then came the flocks and the cattle of Ishmael in one confused and frightened drove. "'They have robbed the squatter of his beast,' said the attentive trapper. The reptiles have left him as hoofless as a beaver. He was yet speaking when the whole body of the terrified animals rose the little acclivity and swept by the place where he stood, followed by a band of dusky and demon-like looking figures who pressed madly on their rear. The impulse was communicated to the Teton horses, long accustomed to sympathize in the untutored passions of their owners, and it was with difficulty that the keepers were enabled to restrain their impatience. At this moment, when all eyes were directed to the passing whirlwind of men and beast, the trapper caught the knife from the hands of his inattentive keeper, with a power that his age would seem to contradict, and at the single blow severed the thong of hide which connected the whole of the drove. The wild animals snorted with joy and terror, and tearing the earth with their heels, they dashed away into the broad prairies in a dozen different directions. Wooka turned upon his assailant with the ferocity and agility of a tiger. He felt for the weapon of which he had been so suddenly deprived, fumbled with impotent haste for the handle of his tomahawk, and at the same moment glanced his eyes after the flying cattle with the longings of a western Indian. The struggle between thirst for vengeance and cupidity was severe but short. The latter quickly predominated in the bosom of one whose passions were proverbially groveling, and scarcely a moment intervened between the flight of the animals and the swift pursuit of the guards. The trapper had continued calmly facing his foe, during the instant of suspense that succeeded his hearty act, and now that Wooka was seen following his companions, he pointed after the dark train, saying, with his deep and nearly inaudible laugh, Red nature is red nature. Let it show itself on a prairie or in the forest. 
A knock on the head would be the smallest reward to him who takes such liberty with a Christian sentinel. But there goes the Teton after his horses as if he thought two legs as good as four in such a race, and yet the imps will have every hoof of them afore the day sets in, because it's reason, age, and instinct. Poor reason, I allow, but still there is a great deal of the man in an Indian. Ah's me! Your Delawares were the redskins of which America might boast, but few and scattered is that mighty people now. Well, the traveller may just make his pitch where he is. He has plenty of water, though. Nature has cheated him of the pleasure of stripping the earth of its lawful trees. He has seen the last of his four-footed creatures, or I am but little skilled in Sioux cunning. Had we not better join the party of Ishmael? said the bee-hunter. There will be a regular fight about this matter, or the old fellow has suddenly grown chicken-hearted. No, 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 hastily exclaimed Ellen. She was stopped by the trapper, who laid his hand gently on her mouth as he answered. Hiss! Hiss! The sound of voices might bring us into danger. Is your friend, he added, turning to Paul, a man of spirit enough? Don't call the squatter a friend of mine, interrupted the youth. I never yet harbored with one who could not show hand and zeal for the land which fed him. Well, well, let it then be acquaintance. Is he a man to maintain his own stoutly by dent of powder and lead? His own? Aye, and that which is not his own, too. Can you tell me, old trapper, who held the rifle that did the deed for the sheriff's deputy, that thought to rout the unlawful settlers who had gathered nigh the buffalo lick in old Kentucky? I had lined a beautiful swarm that very day into the hollow of a dead beach, and there lay the people's officer at its roots, with a hole directly through the grace of God, which he carried in his jacket pocket covering his heart, as if he thought a bit of sheepskin was a breastplate against a squatter's bullet. Now, Ellen, you needn't be troubled, for it never strictly was brought home to him, and there were fifty others who had pitched in that neighborhood with just the same authority from the law. The poor girl shuddered struggling powerfully to suppress the sigh which arose in spite of her efforts, as if from the very bottom of her heart. Thoroughly satisfied that he understood the character of the immigrants, by the short but comprehensive description conveyed in Paul's reply, the old man raised no further question concerning the readiness of Ishmael to revenge his wrongs, but rather followed the train of thought which was suggested to his experience by the occasion. "'Each one knows the ties which bind him to his fellow-creatures best,' he answered, "'though it is greatly to be mourned that color and property and tongue and learning "'should make so wide a difference in those who, after all, are but the children of one father. "'Howsomever,' he continued, by a transition not a little characteristic of the pursuits and feelings of the man, "'as this is a business in which there is much more likelihood of a fight than need for a sermon.' It is best to be prepared for what may follow. Hush! There is a movement below. It is an equal chance that we are seen. The family is stirring, cried Owen, with a tremor that announced nearly as much terror at the approach of her friends as she had before manifested at the presence of her enemies. Go, Paul, leave me. You at least must not be seen. If I leave you, Owen, in this desert before I see you safe in the care of old Ishmael, at least may I never hear the hum of another bee or, what is worse, fail in sight to line him to his hive. You forget this good old man. He will not leave me, though I am sure, Paul, we have parted before, where there has been more of a desert than this. Never! These Indians may come whooping back, and then where are you? Halfway to the Rocky Mountains, before a man can fairly strike the line of your flight. What think you, old trapper? How long may it be before these Tetons, as you call them, will be coming for the rest of old Ishmael's goods and shadows? "'No fear of them,' returned the old man, laughing in his own peculiar and silent manner. "'I warrant me the devils will be scampering after their beasts these six hours yet. Listen, you may hear them in the willow-bottoms at this very moment. Aye, your real Sioux cattle will run like so many long-legged elks. Hiss! Crouch again into the grass. Down with ye both. As I am a miserable piece of clay, I heard the ticking of a gun-lock.' The trapper did not allow his companions time to hesitate, but dragging them both after him, he nearly buried his own person in the fog of the prairie, while he was speaking. It was fortunate that the senses of the aged hunter remained so acute, and that he had lost none of his readiness of action. The three were scarcely bowed to the ground, when their ears were saluted with the well-known sharp, short reports of the western rifle, 
and instantly the whizzing of the ragged lead was heard, buzzing within dangerous proximity of their heads. "'Well done, young chips! Well done, old block!' whispered Paul, whose spirits no danger nor situation could entirely depress. "'As pretty a volley as one would wish to bear on the wrong end of a rifle. What do you say, Trapper? Here is likely to be a three-cornered war. Shall I give em as good as they send?' "'Give them nothing but fair words,' returned the other hastily, "'or you are both lost.' "'I'm certain it would be much men the matter if I were to speak with my tongue instead of the peace,' said Paul, in a tone half jocular, half bitter. "'For the sake of heaven, do not let them hear you,' cried Owen. "'Go, Paul, go. You can easily quit us now.' Several shots in quick succession, each sending its dangerous messenger, still nearer than the preceding discharge, cut short her speech no less in prudence than in terror. "'This must end,' said the trapper, rising with the dignity of one bent on the importance of his object. "'I know not what need ye may have, children, to fear those you should both love and honour, but something must be done to save your lives. A few hours more or less can never be missed from the time of one who has numbered so many days. Therefore I will advance. Here is a clear space around you. Profit by it as you need.' and may God bless and prosper each of you as ye deserve. Without waiting for any reply, the trapper walked boldly down the declivity in his front, taking the direction of the encampment, neither quickening his pace in trepidation, nor suffering it to be retarded by fear. The light of the moon fell brighter for a moment on his tall, gaunt form, and served to warm the immigrants of his approach. Indifferent, however, to this unfavorable circumstance, he held his way, silently and steadily, towards the copse until a threatening voice met him with a challenge of, "'Who comes, friend or foe?' "'Friend,' was the reply, "'one who has lived too long to disturb the close of life with quarrels.' "'But not so long as to forget the tricks of his youth,' said Ishmael, rearing his huge frame from beneath the slight covering of a low bush, and meeting the trapper face to face. "'Old man, you have brought this tribe of red devils upon us, and to-morrow you will be sharing the booty.' "'What have you lost?' calmly demanded the trapper. Eight as good mares as traveled in gears. Besides a fowl, it is worth thirty of the brightest Mexicans that bear the face of the King of Spain. Then the woman has not a cloven hoof up for her dairy, or her loom, and I believe even the grunters, footsore as they may be, are plowing the prairie. And now, stranger,' he added, dropping the butt of his rifle on the hard earth with a violence and clatter that would have intimidated one less firm than the man he addressed." How many of these creatures may fall to your lot? Horses that I never craved nor even use, though few have journeyed over more of the wide lands of America than myself, old and feeble as I am. But little use is there for a horse among the hills and woods of York. That is, as York was, but as I greatly fear, York is no longer. As for woolen covering and cow's milk, I covet no such womanly fashions. The beasts of the field give me food and raiment. No, I crave no cloth better than the skin of a deer, nor any meat richer than his flesh. The sincere manner of the trapper, as he uttered this simple vindication, was not entirely thrown away on the immigrant, whose dull nature was gradually quickening into a flame, that might speedily have burst forth with dangerous violence. He listened like one who doubted, not entirely convinced, and he muttered between his teeth the denunciation with which a moment before he intended to proceed the summary vengeance he had certainly meditated. "'That is brave talking,' he at last grumbled. "'But to my judgment, too lawyer-like, for a straightforward fair-weather and foul-weather hunter, I claim to be no better than a trapper,' the other meekly answered. "'Hunter or trapper, there is little difference. I have come, old man, into these districts because I found the law sitting too tight upon me and am not over-fond of neighbors who can't settle a dispute without troubling a justice and twelve men. But I didn't come to be robbed of my plunder, and then to say thank ye to the man who did it. He who ventures far into the prairies must abide by the ways of its owners. Owners? echoed the squatter. I am as rightful an owner of the land I stand on as any governor in the States. Can you tell me, stranger, where the law or the reason is to be found, which says that one man shall have a section, or a town, or perhaps a county to his use, and another have to beg for earth to make his grave in? This is not nature, and I deny that it is law, that is, your legal law. I cannot say that you are wrong, 
returned the trapper, whose opinions on this important topic, though drawn from very different premises, were in singular accordance with those of his companion. And I have often thought and said as much, when and where I have believed my voice could be heard. But your beasts are stolen by them who claim to be masters of all they find in the deserts. They had better not dispute the matter with a man who knows better, said the other in a pretentious voice, though it seemed deep and sluggish as he who spoke. I call myself a fair trader, and one who gives his chaps as good as he receives. You saw the Indians? I did. They held me a prisoner, while they stole into your camp. It would have been more like a white man and a Christian to have let me known as much in better season, retorted Ismail, casting another ominous sidelong glance at the trapper, as if still meditating evil. I am not much given to call every man I fall in with cousin, but color should be something when Christians meet in such a place as this. But what is done is done, and cannot be mended by words. Come out of your ambush, boys. Here is no one but the old man. He has eaten of my bread, and should be our friend, though there is such good reason to suspect him of harboring with our enemies. The trapper made no reply to the harsh suspicion, which the other did not scruple to utter without the smallest delicacy, notwithstanding the explanations and denials to which he had just listened. The summons of the unnurtured squatter brought an immediate accession to their party. Four or five of his sons made their appearance from beneath as many covers, where they had been posted under the impression that the figures they had seen on the swell of the prairie were a part of the Sioux band. As each man approached and dropped his rifle into the hollow of his arm, he cast an indolent but inquiring glance at the stranger, though neither of them expressed the least curiosity to know whence he had come or why he was there. This forbearance, however, proceeded only in part from the sluggishness of their common temper, for long and frequent experience in scenes of a similar character had taught them the virtue of discretion. The trapper endured their sullen scrutiny with the steadiness of one as practiced as themselves, and with the entire composure of innocence. Content with the momentary examination he had made, the eldest of the group, who was in truth the delinquent sentinel by whose remissness the wily Matori had so well profited, turned towards his father and said bluntly, "'If this man is all that is left of the party I saw in the upland yonder, we haven't altogether thrown away our ammunition.' "'Essa, you are right,' said the father, turning suddenly on the trapper. A lost idea being recalled by the hint of his son. "'How is it, stranger? There were three of you, just now, or there is no virtue in moonlight.' If you had seen the Tetons racing across the prairies like so many black-looking evil ones on the heels of your cattle, my friend, it would have been an easy matter to have fancied them a thousand. I, for a town-bred boy or a scary woman, though for that matter there is old Esther, she has no more fear of a redskin than of a suckling cub, or of a wolf pup, I warrant thee. Had your thievish devils made their push by the light of the sun, the good woman would have been smartly at work among them, and the Sioux would have found she was not given to part with her cheese and her butter without a price. But there will come a time, stranger, right soon, when justice will have its dues, and that too without the help of what is called the law. We are of a slow breed, it may be said, and it is often said of us, but slow is sure, and there are few men living who can say they ever struck a blow that they did not get one as hard in return from Ishmael Bush. Then has Ishmael Bush followed the instinct of the beast rather than the principle which ought to belong to his kind? returned the stubborn trapper. I have struck many a blow myself, but never have I felt the same ease of mind that of the right belongs to a man who follows his reason, after slaying even a fawn when there was no call for his meat or hide, as I have felt at leaving a mingo unburied in the woods, when following the trade of open and honest warfare. What? Have you been a soldier? Have you, trapper? I made a forage or two among the Cherokees when I was a lad myself, and I followed Mad Anthony. Footnote. Anthony Wayne, a Pennsylvania distinguished in the War of the Revolution, and subsequently against the Indians of the West, for his daring as a general, by which he gained from his followers the title of Mad Anthony. General Wayne was the son of the person mentioned in the life of West as commanding the regiment which excited his military ardor. One season through the beaches, but there was altogether too much tattooing and regulating among his troops for me, so I left him without calling on the paymaster to settle my arrearages, though, as Esther afterwards boasted, she had made such use of the pay ticket that the states gained no great sum by the oversight. You have heard of such a man as Mad Anthony, if you tarried long among the soldiers. 
I fought my last battle, as I hope, under his orders, returned the trapper, a gleam of sunshine shooting from his dim eyes, as if the event was recollected with pleasure, and then a sudden shade of sorrow succeeding, as though he felt a secret admonition against dwelling on the violent scenes in which he had so often been an actor. I was pressing from the states on the seashore into these far regions, when I crossed the trail of his army, and I fell in on his rear just as a looker-on but when they got to blows the crack of my rifle was heard among the rest though to my shame it may be said i never knew the right of the quarrel as well as a man of threescore and ten should know the reason of his acts afore he takes mortal life which is a gift he never can return come stranger said the immigrant his rugged nature a good deal softened when he found that they had fought on the same side in the wild warfare of the west it is of small account what may be the groundwork of the disturbance when it's a christian age and a savage we shall hear more of this horse stealing to-morrow to-night we can do no wiser or safer thing than to sleep so saying ishmael deliberately led the way back towards his rifled encampment and ushered the man whose life a few minutes before had been in real jeopardy from his resentment into the presence of his family here with a very few words of explanation mingled with scarce but ominous denunciations against the plunderers he made his wife acquainted with the state of things on the prairie, and announced his own determination to compensate himself for his broken rest, by devoting the remainder of the night to sleep. The trapper gave his ready assent to the measure, and adjusted his gaunt form on the pile of brush that was offered him, with as much composure as a sovereign could resign himself to sleep, in the security of his capital and surrounded by his armed protectors. The old man did not close his eyes, however, until he had assured himself that Ellen Wade was among the females of the family, and that her relation, or lover, whichever he might be, had observed the caution of keeping himself out of view, after which he slept, though with the peculiar watchfulness of one long accustomed to vigilance, even in the hours of deepest night. CHAPTER Six OF THE PRAIRIE BY JAMES FENIMORE COOPER This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck he is too picked, too spruce, too affected, too odd, as it were too peregranti, as I may call it, Shakespeare. The Anglo-American is apt to boast, and not without reason, that his nation may claim a descent more truly honorable than that of any other people whose history is to be credited. Whatever might have been the weaknesses of the original colonists, their virtues have rarely been disputed. If they were superstitious, they were sincerely pious, and, consequently, honest. The descendants of these simple and single-minded provincials have been content to reject the ordinary and artificial means by which honors have been perpetuated in families, and have substituted a standard which brings the individual himself to the ordeal of the public estimation, paying as little deference as may be to those who have gone before him. This forbearance, self-denial, or common sense, or by whatever term it may be thought proper to distinguish the measure, has subjected the nation to the imputation of having an ignoble origin. Were it worth the inquiry, it would be found that more than a just proportion of the renowned names of the mother country are, at this hour, to be found in her sedevant colonies, and it is the fact well known to the few who have wasted sufficient time to become the masters of so unimportant a subject, that the direct descendants of many a failing line, which the policy of England has seen fit to sustain by collateral supporters, are now discharging the simple duties of citizens in the bosom of this republic. The hive has remained stationary, and they who flutter around the venerable straw are wont to claim the empty distinction of antiquity, regardless alike of the frailty of their tenement and the enjoyments of the numerous and vigorous swarms that are culling the fresher sweets of a virgin world. But as this is a subject which belongs rather to the politician and historian than to the humble narrator of the home-bred incidents we are about to reveal, we must confine our reflections to such matters as have an immediate relation to the subject of the tale. Although the citizen of the United States may claim so just an ancestry, he is far from being exempt from the penalties of his fallen race. Like causes are well known to produce like effects. That tribute, which it would seem nations must ever pay, by way of a weary probation, around the shrine of Ceres, before they can be indulged in her fullest favors, is in some measure exacted in America, from the descendant instead of the ancestor. 
The march of civilization with us has a strong analogy to that of all coming events which are known to cast their shadows before. The gradations of society, from that state which is called refined to that which approaches as near barbarity as connection with an intelligent people will readily allow, are to be traced from the bosom of the states, where wealth, luxury, and the arts are beginning to seat themselves to those distant and ever-receding borders which mark the skirts and announce the approach of the nation as moving mists precede the signs of day. Here, and here only, is to be found that widely spread, though far from numerous class, which may be at all likened to those who have paved the way for the intellectual progress of nations in the old world. The resemblance between the American borderer and his European prototype is singular, though not always uniform. Both might be called without restraint, the one being above, the other beyond the reach of the law. Brave, because they were inured to dangers, proud because they were independent and vindictive, because each was the avenger of his own wrongs. It would be unjust to the borderer to pursue the peril much farther. He is irreligious because he has inherited the knowledge that religion does not exist in forms, and his reason rejects mockery. He is not a knight because he has not the power to bestow distinctions, and he has not the power because he is the offspring and not the parent of a system. In what manner these several qualities are exhibited, in some of the most strongly marked of the latter class, will be seen in the course of the ensuing narrative. Ishmael Bush has passed the whole of a life of more than fifty years on the skirts of society. He boasted that he never dwelt where he might not safely fell every tree he could view from his own threshold, that the law had rarely been known to enter his clearing, and that his ears had never willingly admitted the sound of a church bell. His exertions seldom exceeded his wants, which were peculiar to his class, and rarely failed of being supplied. He had no respect for any learning except that of the leech, because he was ignorant of the application of any other intelligence than such as met the senses. His deference to this particular branch of science had induced him to listen to the application of a medical man, whose thirst for natural history had led him to the desire of profiting by the migratory propensities of the squatter. The gentleman he had cordially received into his family, or rather under his protection, and they had journeyed together thus far through the prairies in perfect harmony, Ishmael often felicitating his wife on the possession of a companion who would be so serviceable in their new abode, wherever it might chance to be, until the family were thoroughly acclimated. The pursuits of the naturalist frequently led him, however, for days at a time, from the direct line of the root of the squatter, who rarely seemed to have any other guide than the sun. Most men would have deemed themselves fortunate to have been absent on the perilous occasion of the Sioux inroad, as was Obed Bat, or as he was fond of hearing himself called, Battius, M. D., and fellow of several cis-Atlantic learned societies, the adventurous gentleman in question. Although the sluggish nature of Ishmael was not actually awakened, it was sorely pricked by the liberties which had just been taken with his property. He slept, however, for it was the hour he had allotted to that refreshment, and because he knew how impotent any exertions to recover his effects must prove in the darkness of midnight. He also knew the danger of his present situation too well to hazard what was left in pursuit of that which was lost. Much as the inhabitants of the prairies were known to love horses, their attachment to many other articles, still in the possession of the travelers, was equally well understood. It was a common artifice to scatter the herds, and to profit by the confusion, but Matori had, as it would seem in this particular, undervalued the acuteness of the man he had assailed. The phlegm with which the squatter learned his loss has already been seen, and it now remains to exhibit the results of his more mature determinations. Though the encampment contained many an eye that was long unclosed, and many an ear that listened greedily to catch the faintest evidence of any new alarm, it lay in deep quiet during the remainder of the night. Silence and fatigue finally performed their accustomed offices, and before the morning all but the sentinels were again buried in sleep. How well those indolent watchers discharged their duties after the assault has never been known, inasmuch as nothing occurred to confirm or to disprove their subsequent vigilance. Just as day, however, began to dawn, and a gray light was falling from the heavens on the dusky objects of the plain, 
the half-startled, anxious, and yet blooming countenance of Ellen Wade was reared above the confused mass of children, among whom she had clustered on her stolen return to the camp. Arising warily, she stepped lightly across the recumbent bodies, and proceeded with the same caution to the utmost limits of the deferences of Ishmael. Here she listened, as if she doubted the propriety of venturing further. The pause was only momentary, however, and long before the drowsy eyes of the sentinel, who overlooked the spot where she stood, had time to catch a glimpse of her active form, it had glided along the bottom, and stood on the summit of the nearest eminence. Ellen now listened intently, anxious to catch some other sound, than the breathing of the morning air, which faintly rustled the herbage at her feet. She was about to turn in disappointment from the inquiry, when the tread of human feet making their way through the matted grass met her ear. Springing eagerly forward, she soon beheld the outlines of a figure advancing up the eminence on the side opposite to the camp. She had already uttered the name of Paul, and was beginning to speak in the hurried and eager voice with which female affection is apt to greet a friend, when drawing back the disappointed girl closed her salutation by coldly adding, "'I did not expect, doctor, to meet you at this unusual hour.' "'All hours and all seasons are alike, my good Ellen, to the genuine lover of nature.' returned a small, slightly made, but exceedingly active man, dressed in an odd mixture of cloth and skins, a little past the middle age, and who advanced directly to her side with the familiarity of an old acquaintance. And he, who does not know how to find things to admire by this grey light, is ignorant of a large portion of the blessings he enjoys. Very true, said Ellen, suddenly recollecting the necessity of accounting for her own appearance abroad that unreasonable hour. I know many who think the earth has a pleasanter look at night than when seen by the brightest sunshine. Ah, their organs of sight must be too convex. But the man who wishes to study the active habits of the feline race, or the variety, albinos, must indeed be stirring at this hour. I dare say there are men who prefer even looking at objects by twilight, for the simple reason that they see better at that time of day. And this is the cause why you are so much abroad in the night? I am abroad at night, my good girl, because the earth is in its diurnal revolutions, leaves the light of the sun but half the time on any given meridian, and because what I have to do cannot be performed in twelve or fifteen consecutive hours. Now have I been off two days from the family in search of a plant that is known to exist on the tributaries of La Platte, without seeing even a blade of grass that is not already enumerated and classed. You have been unfortunate, doctor, but— Unfortunate? echoed the little man, sidling nigher to his companion, and producing his tablets with an air in which exultation struggled, strangely, with an affection of self-abasement. No, no, Ellen, I am anything but unfortunate, unless indeed a man may be so called, whose fortune is made, whose fame may be said to be established forever, whose name will go down to posterity with that of Buffon. Buffon, a mere compiler, one who flourishes on the foundation of the other men's labors. No, Parsi Passu with Salander, who bought his knowledge with pain and privations. Have you discovered a mine, Dr. Bat? More than a mine, a treasure coin, a fit for instant use, girl. Listen, I was making the angle necessary to intersect the line of your uncle's march after my fruitless search when I heard sounds like the explosion produced by firearms. Yes, exclaimed Owen eagerly, we had an alarm and thought I was lost, continued the man of science, too much bent on his own ideas to understand her interruption. Little danger of that. I made my own base, knew the length of the perpendicular by calculation, and to draw the hypotenuse had nothing to do but to work my angle. I suppose the guns were fired for my benefit, and changed my course for the sounds. Not that I think the sense more accurate, or even as accurate as a mathematical calculation, but I feared that some of the children might need my services. They are all happily— Listen, interrupted the other, already forgetting his affected anxiety for his patients, in the greater importance of the present subject. I had crossed a large tract of prairie, for sound is conveyed far when there is little obstruction, when I heard the trumpling of feet, as if bisons were beating the earth. Then I caught a distant view of a herd of quadrupeds, rushing up and down the swells, animals which would have still remained unknown and undescribed, had it not been for a most felicitous accident. One, and he a noble specimen of the whole, was running a little apart from the rest. The herd made an inclination in my direction, in which the solitary animal coincided, and this brought him within fifty yards of the spot where I stood. 
I profited by the opportunity, and by the aid of steel and taper, I wrote his description on the spot. I would have given a thousand dollars, Ellen, for a single shot from the rifle of one of the boys. You carry a pistol, doctor. Why didn't you use it? said the half inattentive girl, anxiously examining the prairie, but still lingering where she stood, quite willing to be detained. Ay, but it carries nothing but the most minute particles of lead, adapted to the destruction of the larger insects and reptiles. No, I did better than to attempt waging a war in which I could not be the victor. I recorded the event, noting each particular with the precision necessary to science. You shall hear, Ellen, for you are a good and improving girl, and by retaining what you learn in this way may yet be of great service to learning, should any accident occur to me. Indeed, my worthy Ellen, mine is a pursuit, which has its dangers as well as that of the warrior. This very night, he continued, glancing his eye behind him, this awful night has the principle of life itself been in great danger of extinction. By what? By the monster I have discovered. It approached me often, and ever as I receded it continued to advance. I believe nothing but the little lamp I carried was my protector. I kept it between us whilst I wrote making it serve the double purpose of luminary and shield. But you shall hear the character of the beast, and you may then judge of the risk we promoters of science run in behalf of mankind. The naturalist raised his tablets to the heavens, and disposed himself to read as well as he could by the dim light they yet shed upon the plain, premising with saying, Listen, girl, and you shall hear, with what a treasure it has been my happy lot to enrich the pages of natural history. Is it then a creature of your forming? said Ellen, turning away from her fruitless examination, with a sudden lighting of her sprightly blue eyes, that showed she knew how to play with the foible of her learned companion. Is the power to give life to an inanimate matter the gift of man? I would it were. You should speedily see a Historia Naturalis Americana that would put the sneering imitators of the Frenchmen deep upon to shame. A great improvement might be made in the formation of all quadrupeds, especially those in which velocity is a virtue. Two of the inferior limbs should be on the principle of the lever, wheels, perhaps, as they are now formed, though I have not yet determined whether the improvement might be better applied to the anterior or posterior members, inasmuch as I am yet to learn whether dragging or shoving requires the greatest muscular exertion. A natural exudation of the animal might assist in overcoming the friction, and a powerful momentum he obtain, but all this is hopeless, at least for the present he added, raising his tablets again to the light, and reading aloud. October 6, 1805, that's merely the date, which I dare say you know better than I, mem. Quadruped, seen by starlight, and by the aid of a pocket lamp in the prairies of North America. See journal for latitude and meridian. Genus, unknown, therefore named after the discoverer, and from the happy coincidence of being seen in the evening. Vespertillo horribilis americanus. Dimensions, by estimation, greatest length, eleven feet, height, six feet, head erect, nostrils expansive, eyes expressive and fierce, teeth serrated and abundant, tail horizontal, waving and slightly feline, feet large and hairy, talons long, curvated, dangerous, ears inconspicuous, Horns, elongated, diverging, and formidable. Color, plumbeous ashy, with fiery spots. Voice, sonorous, martial, and appalling. Habits, gregarious, carnivorous, fierce, and fearless. There, exclaimed Obed, when he had ended this sententious but comprehensive description, there is an animal, which will be likely to dispute with the lion his title to be called the king of the beast. I know not the meaning of all that you have said, Dr. Battius, returned the quick-witted girl, who understood the weakness of the philosopher, and often indulged him with a title he loved so well to hear. But I shall think it dangerous to venture far from the camp, if such monsters are prowling over the prairies. You may well call it prowling, returned the naturalist, nestling still closer to her side, and dropping his voice to such low and undignified tones of confidence as conveyed a meaning still more pointed than he had intended. I have never before experienced such a trial of the nervous system. There was a moment, I acknowledge, when the fortier in refaltered before so terrible an enemy. But the love of natural science bore me up and brought me off in triumph. You speak a language so different from that we use in Tennessee, 
said Ellen, struggling to conceal her laughter, that I hardly know whether I understand your meaning. If I am right, you wish to say you are chicken-hearted? An absurd simile drawn from an ignorance of the formation of the biped. The heart of a chicken has a just proportion to its other organs, and a domestic fowl is, in a state of nature, a gallant bird. Ellen, he added, with a countenance so solemn as to produce an impression on the attentive girl, I was pursued, hunted, and in danger that I scorn to dwell on. What's that? Ellen started, for the earnestness and simple sincerity of her companion's manner had produced a certain degree of credulity even on her buoyant mind. Looking in the direction indicated by the doctor, she beheld, in fact, a beast coursing over the prairie, and making a straight and rapid approach to the very spot they occupied. The day was not yet sufficiently advanced to enable her to distinguish its form and character, though enough was discernible to induce her to imagine it a fierce and savage animal. "'It comes! It comes!' exclaimed the doctor, fumbling, by a sort of instinct, for his tablets, while he fairly tottered on his feet under the powerful efforts he made to maintain his ground. "'Now, Ellen, has fortune given me the an opportunity to correct the errors made by starlight? Hold! Ashy Polumbias! No ears! Horns! Excessive!' His voice and hand were both arrested by a roar, or rather a shriek from the beast that was sufficiently terrific to appall even a stouter heart than that of the naturalist. The cries of the animal passed over the prairie in strange cadences, and then succeeded a deep and solemn silence that was only broken by an uncontrolled fit of merriment from the more musical voice of Ellen Wade. In the meantime the naturalist stood like a statue of amazement, permitting a well-grown ass, against whose approach he no longer offered his boasted shield of light, to smell about his person without a comment or hindrance. "'It is your own ass!' cried Ellen, the instant she found breath for words. "'Your own patient, hard-working hack!' The doctor rolled his eyes from the beast to the speaker, and from the speaker to the beast, but gave no audible expression of his wonder. "'Do you refuse to know an animal that has labored so long in your service?' continued the laughing girl. "'A beast that I had heard you say a thousand times has served you well, and whom you love like a brother?' "'Asinius Domesticus!' ejaculated the doctor, drawing his breath like one who had been near suffocation. "'There is no doubt of genius, and I will always maintain that the animal is not of the species Equus. This is undeniably Asinius himself, Ellen Wade. But this is not the Vespertilio Horribilius of the prairies. Very different animals, I can assure you, young woman, and that differently characterized in every important particular. That carnivorous,' he continued, glancing his eye at the open page of his tablets, "'this granivorous habits, fierce, dangerous, habits, patient, abstemious, ears, inconspicuous, ears elongated, horns diverging, and so on, horns none.' He was interrupted by another burst of merriment from Ellen, which served in some measure to recall him to his recollection. "'The image of the Vespertilio was on the retina,' the astounded inquirer into the secrets of nature observed, in a manner that seemed a little apologetic. "'And I was silly enough to mistake my own faithful beast for the monster, though even now I greatly marvel to see this animal running at large.' Ellen then proceeded to explain the history of the attack and its results. She described, with an accuracy that might have raised suspicion of her own movements in the mind of one less simple than her auditor, the manner in which the beast burst out of the encampment, and the headlong speed with which they had dispersed themselves over the open plain. Although she forbore to say as much in terms, she so managed as to present before the eyes of her listener the strong probability of his having mistaken the frightened drove for savage beast, and then terminated her account by a lamentation for their loss and some very natural remarks on the helpless condition in which it had left the family. The naturalist listened in silent wonder, neither interrupting her narrative nor suffering a single exclamation of surprise to escape him. The keen-eyed girl, however, saw that as she proceeded the important leaf was torn from the tablets in a manner which showed that their owner had gotten rid of his delusion at the same instant. From that moment the world had heard no more of the Vespertillo Horribilis Americanus and the natural sciences have irretrievably lost an important link in that great animated chain which is said to connect earth and heaven, and in which man is thought to be so familiarly complicated with the monkey. When Dr. Bat was put in full possession of all circumstances of the inroad, his concern immediately took a different direction. 
he had left sundry folios and certain boxes well stored with botanical specimens and defunct animals under the good keeping of Ishmael, and it immediately struck his acute mind that marauders as subtle as the Sioux would never neglect the opportunity to despoil him of these treasures. Nothing that Ellen could say to the contrary served to appease his apprehensions, and consequently they separated, he to relieve his doubts and fears together, and she to glide as swiftly and silently as she had just before passed it into the still and solitary tent. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. What? Fifty of my followers at a clap? Lear. The day had now fairly opened on the seemingly interminable waste of the prairie. The entrance of Obed at such a moment into the camp, accompanied as it was by vociferous lamentations over his anticipated loss, did not fail to rouse the drowsy family of the squatter. Ishmael and his sons, together with the forbidding-looking brother of his wife, were all speedily afoot, and then, as the sun began to shed his light on the place, they became gradually apprised of the extent of their loss. Ishmael looked around upon the motionless and heavily loaded vehicles with his teeth firmly compressed, cast a glance at the amazed and helpless group of children which clustered around their solemn but desponding mother, and walked out upon the open land as if he found the air of the encampment too confined. He was followed by several of the men, who were attentive observers, watching the dark expression of his eye as the index of their own future movements. The whole proceeded in profound and moody silence to the summit of the nearest swell, whence they could command an almost boundless view of the naked plains. Here nothing was visible but a solitary buffalo that gleaned a meager subsistence from the decaying herbage at no great distance, and the ass of the physician who profited by his freedom to enjoy a meal richer than common. "'Yonder is one of the creatures left by the villains to mock us,' said Ishmael, glancing his eye towards the latter. "'And that the meanest of the stock! This is a hard country to make a crop in, boys, and yet food must be found to fill many hungry mouths.' "'The rifle is better than the hoe in such a place as this,' returned the eldest of his sons, kicking the hard and thirsty soil on which he stood with an air of contempt. "'It is good for such as they who make their dinner better on beggars' beans than on hominy.' A crow would shed tears if obliged by its errand to fly across the district. "'What you say, trapper?' returned the father, showing the slight impression his powerful heel had made on the compact earth, and laughing with frightful ferocity. "'Is this the quality of land a man would choose, who never troubles the county clerk with title deeds?' "'There is richer soil in the bottoms,' returned the old man calmly and you have passed millions of acres to get to this dreary spot where he who loves to till the earth might have received bushels in return for pints and that too at the cost of no very grievous labor if you have come in search of land you have journeyed hundreds of miles too far or as many leagues too little there is then a better choice towards the other ocean demanded the squatter pointing in the direction of the pacific there is and i have seen it all was the answer of the other, who dropped his rifle to the earth, and stood leaning on its barrel, like one who recalled the scenes he had witnessed with melancholy pleasure. "'I have seen the waters of the two seas. On one of them was I born, and raised to be a lad like yonder tumbling boy. America has grown, my men, since the days of my youth, to be a country larger than I once had thought the world itself to be. Near seventy years I dwelt in York, province and state together. You've been in York, tis like. Not I, not I. I never visited the towns, but often have heard the place you speak of name. Tis a wide clearing there, I reckon. Too wide, too wide. They scourge the very earth with their axes. Such hills and hunting grounds as I have seen stripped of gifts of the Lord, without remorse or shame. I tarried till the mouths of my hounds were defeated by the blows of the chopper, and then I came west in search of quiet. It was a grievous journey that I made, a grievous toil to pass through falling timber and to breathe the thick air of smoky clearings, week after week as I did. 
"'Tis a far country, too, that state of York from this. "'It lies again the outer edge of old Kentuck, I reckon, "'though what the distance may be I never knew. "'A gull would have to fan a thousand miles of air to find the eastern sea, "'and yet it is no mighty reach to hunt across when shade and game are plenty. "'The time has been when I followed the deer in the mountains of the Delaware and Hudson, "'and took the beaver on the streams of the upper lakes in the same season.' but my eye was quick and certain at that day, and my limbs were like the legs of a moose. The dam of Hector, dropping his look kindly to the aged hound and crouched at his feet, was then a pup, and apt to open on the game the moment she struck the scent. She gave me a deal of trouble, that slut she did. Your hound is old, stranger, and the rap on the head would prove a mercy to the beast. The dog is like his master returned the trapper, without appearing to heed the brutal advice the other gave, and will number his days when his work amongst the game is over, and not before. To my eye things seem ordered to meet each other in this creation. Tis not the swiftest running deer that always throws off the hounds, nor the biggest arm that holds the truest rifle. Look round, you men. What will the Yankee choppers say, when they have cut their path from the eastern to the western waters, and find that a hand which can lay the earth bare at a blow, has been there and swept the country, in very mockery of their wickedness. They will turn on their tracks like a fox that doubles, and then the rank smell of their own footsteps will show them the madness of their waste. Howsomever, these are thoughts that are more likely to rise in him, who has seen the folly of eighty seasons, than to teach wisdom to men still bent on the pleasures of their kind. You have need yet of a stirring time, if you think to escape the craft and hatred of the burnt wood Indians, they claim to be the lawful owners of this country, and seldom leave a white more than a skin he boasts of, when once they get the power, as they always have the will, to do him harm. "'Old man,' said Ishmael sternly, "'to which people do you belong? You have the color and speech of a Christian, while it seems that your heart is with the redskins.' "'To me there is little difference in nations.' The people I love most are scattered as the sands of the dry river beds fly before the fall hurricanes. Then life is too short to make use and custom with strangers, as one can do with such as he has dwelt amongst for years. Still I am a man without the cross of Indian blood, and what is due from a warrior to his nation is owing by me to the people of the states. Though little need have they, with their militia and their armed boats, of help from a single arm of fourscore. Since you own your kin, I may ask a simple question. Where are the Sioux who has stolen my cattle? Where is the herd of buffaloes which was chased by the panther across the plain, no later than the morning of yesterday? It is as hard. Friend, said Dr. Battius, who had hitherto been an attentive listener, but who now felt a sudden impulse to mingle in the discourse. I am grieved when I find a venerator or hunter of your experience and observation following the current of vulgar error. The animal you describe is in truth a species of the bus fetus, or bois sylvestris, as he has been happily called by the poets. But though of close affinity, it is altogether distinct from the common bubulus. Bison is the better word, and I would suggest the necessity of adopting it in the future when you shall have occasion to allude to the species." Bison or buffalo, it makes but little matter. The creature is the same, called by what name you will, and— Pardon me, venerable venerator, as classification is the very soul of the natural sciences, the animal or vegetable must of necessity be characterized by the peculiarities of its species, which is always indicated by the name— Friend, said the trapper, a little positively, would the tail of a beaver make the worst dinner for calling it a mink? Or could you eat of the wolf? with relish, because some bookish man had given it the name of Venison. As these questions were put with no little earnestness and some spirit, there was every probability that a hot discussion would have succeeded between two men, of whom one was so purely practical and the other so much given to theory, had not Ishmael seen fit to terminate the dispute, by bringing into view a subject that was much more important to his own immediate interests. Beavers, tails, and minks! "'Flesh may do to talk about before a maple fire and a quiet hearth,' interrupted the squatter, without the smallest deference to the interested feelings of the disputants. 
but something more than farm words or words of any sort is now needed. Tell me, trapper, where are your sous skulking? It would be as easy to tell you the colors of the hawk that is floating beneath yonder white cloud. When a redskin strikes his blow, he is not apt to wait until he is paid for the evil deed in lead. Will the beggarly savages believe they have enough when they find themselves master of all the stock? Nature is much the same. Let it be covered by what skin it may. Do you ever find your longings after riches less when you have made a good crop than before you were master of a kernel of corn? If you do, you differ from what the experience of a long life tells me is the common cravings of man. Speak plainly, old stranger, said the squatter, striking the butt of his rifle heavily on the earth, his dull capacity finding no pleasure in a discourse that was conducted in so obscure allusions. I have asked a simple question, and one I know well that you can answer. You are right, you are right. I can answer, for I have too often seen the disposition of my kind to mistake it. When evil is stirring, when the Sioux have gathered in the beast, and have made sure that you are not upon their heels, they will be back nibbling like hungry wolves to take the bait they have left, or it may be, they'll show the temper of the great bears that are found at the falls of the long river, and strike at once with the paw, without stopping to nose their prey. You have then seen the animals you mention? exclaimed Dr. Battius, who had now been thrown out of the conversation quite as long as his impatience could well brook, and who approached the subject with his tablets ready open, as a book of reference. Can you tell me if what you encountered was of the species Ursus horribilis, with the ears rounded, front arquated, eyes, destitute of the remarkable supplemental lid, with six incisors, one false, and four perfect molars? "'Trapper, go on, for we are engaged in reasonable discourse,' interrupted Ishmael. "'You believe we shall see more of the robbers?' "'Nay, nay, I do not call them robbers, for it is the usage of their people, and what may be called the prairie law. "'I have come five hundred miles to find a place where no man can ding the words of the law in my ears,' said Ishmael fiercely. "'And I am not in a humor to stand quietly at a bar while a redskin sits in judgment.' I tell you, Trapper, if another Sioux is seen prowling around my camp, whatever it may be, he shall feel the contents of old Kentuck, slapping his rifle in a manner that would be easily misconstrued, though he wore the Medal of Washington himself. Footnote. The American government creates chiefs among the western tribes, and decorates them with silver medals hearing the impression of the different presidents. That of Washington is the most prized. I call the man a robber who takes that which is not his own. The Teton and the Pawnee and the Konza and men of a dozen other tribes claim to own these naked fields. Nature gives them the lie in their teeth. The air, the water, and the ground are free gifts to man, and no one has the power to portion them out in parcels. Man must drink and breathe and walk, and therefore each has a right to his share of earth. Why do not the surveyors of the state set their compasses and run their lines over our heads as well as beneath our feet? Why do they not cover their shining sheepskins with big words, giving to the landholder, or perhaps he should be called airholder? So many rods of heaven, with the use of such a star for a boundary mark, and such a cloud to turn a mill. As the squatter uttered his wild conceit, he laughed from the very bottom of his chest in scorn that the riding but frightful merriment passed from the mouth of one of his ponderous sons to that of the other, until it had made the circuit of the whole family. "'Come, trapper,' continued Ishmael, in a tone of better humor, like a man who feels that he has triumphed. "'Neither of us, I reckon, has ever had much to do with title deeds or county clerks or blazed trees. Therefore we will not waste words on fooleries. You are a man that has tarried long in this clearing.' And now I ask your opinion, face to face, without fear or favor. If you had the lead in my business, what would you do? The old man hesitated, and seemed to give the required advice with deep reluctance. As every eye, however, was fastened on him, in whichever way he turned his face, he encountered a look riveted on the lineaments of his own working countenance. He answered in a low, melancholy tone, I have seen too much mortal blood poured out in empty quarrels, to wish ever to hear an angry rifle again. Ten weary years have I sojourned alone on these naked plains, waiting for my hour, 
and not a blow have I struck again an enemy more humanized than the grizzly bear. Ursus Horribilis, muttered the doctor. The speaker paused at the sound of the other's voice, but perceiving it was no more than a sort of mental ejaculation, he continued in the same strain. More humanized than the grizzly here, or the panther of the Rocky Mountains. Unless the beaver, which is a wise and knowing animal, may be so reckoned. What would I advise? Even the female buffalo will fight for her young. It never then shall be said that Ishmael Bush has less kindness for his children than the bear for her cubs. And yet this is but a naked spot for a dozen men to make head in, again five hundred. Aye, it is so, returned the squatter, glancing his eye towards his humble camp. But something might be done with the wagons and the cottonwood. The trapper shook his head incredulously and pointed across the rolling plain in the direction of the west, as he answered, A rifle would send a bullet from these hills into your very sleeping cabins. Nay, arrows from the thicket in your rear would keep you all barreled, like so many prairie dogs. It wouldn't do, it wouldn't do. Three long miles from this spot is a place where, as I have often thought in passing across the desert, a stand might be made for days and weeks together, if there were hearts and hands ready to engage in the bloody work. Another low, deriding laugh passed among the young men, announcing, in a manner sufficiently intelligible, their readiness to undertake a task even more arduous. The squatter himself eagerly seized the hint, which had been so reluctantly extorted from the trapper, who by some singular process of reasoning had evidently persuaded himself that it was his duty to be strictly neutral. A few direct and pertinent inquiries served to obtain the little additional information that was necessary in order to make the contemplated movement, and then Ishmael, who was, on emergencies, as terrifically energetic as he was sluggish in common, set about effecting his object without delay. Notwithstanding the industry and zeal of all engaged, the task was one of great labor and difficulty. The loaded vehicles were to be drawn by hand across a wide distance of plain, without track or guide of any sort, except that which the trapper furnished by communicating his knowledge of the cardinal points of the compass. In accomplishing this object, the gigantic strength of the men was taxed to the utmost, nor were the females or the children spared a heavy proportion of the toil. While the sons distributed themselves about the heavily loaded wagons, and drew them by main strength up the neighboring swell, their mother and Ellen, surrounded by the amazed group of little ones, followed slowly in the rear, bending under the weight of such different articles as were suited to their several strengths. Ishmael himself superintended and directed the whole, occasionally applying his colossal shoulder to some lagging vehicle, until he saw that the chief difficulty, that of gaining the level of their intended route, was accomplished. Then he pointed out the required course, cautioning his sons to proceed in such a manner that they should not lose the advantage they had with so much labor obtained, and beckoning to the brother of his wife, they returned together to the empty camp. Throughout the whole of this movement, which occupied an hour of time, the trapper had stood apart, leaning on his rifle, with the aged hound slumbering at his feet, a silent but attentive observer of all that passed. Occasionally, a smile lighted his hard, muscular but wasted features, like a gleam of sunshine flitting across a ragged ruin, and betrayed the momentary pleasure he found in witnessing from time to time the vast power the youth discovered. Then, as the train drew slowly up the ascent, a cloud of thought and sorrow threw all into the shade again, leaving the expression of his countenance in its usual state of quiet melancholy. As vehicle after vehicle left the place of the encampment, he noted the change with increasing attention, seldom failing to cast an inquiring look at the little neglected tent, which, with its proper wagon, still remained as before, solitary and apparently forgotten. The summons of Ishmael to his gloomy associate had, however, as it would now seem, this hitherto neglected portion of his effects for its objects. First casting a cautious and suspicious glance on every side of him, the squatter and his companion advanced to the little wagon, and caused it to enter within the folds of the cloth, much in the manner that it had been extricated the preceding evening. They both then disappeared behind the drapery, 
and many moments of suspense succeeded, during which the old man, secretly urged by a burning desire to know the meaning of so much mystery, insensibly drew nigh to the place, until he stood within a few yards of the prescribed spot. The agitation of the cloth betrayed the nature of the occupation of those whom it concealed, though their work was conducted in rigid silence. It would appear that long practice had made each of the two acquainted with his particular duty, for neither sign nor direction of any sort was necessary from Ishmael in order to apprise his surly associate of the manner in which he was to proceed. In less time than has been consummated in relating it, the interior portion of the arrangement was completed, when the men reappeared without the tent. Too busy with his occupation to heed the presence of the trapper, Ishmael began to release the folds of the cloth from the ground, and to dispose of them in such manner around the vehicle as to form a sweeping train to the new form the little pavilion had now assumed. The arch roof trembled with the occasional movement of the light vehicle, which, it was now apparent, once more supported its secret burden. Just as the work was ended, the scowling eye of Ishmael's assistant caught a glimpse of the figure of the attentive observer of their movements. Dropping the shaft, which he had already lifted from the ground, preparatory to occupying the place that was usually filled by an animal less reasoning and perhaps less dangerous than himself, he bluntly exclaimed, "'I am a fool, as you often say. But look for yourself. If that man is not an enemy, I will disgrace father and mother, call myself an Indian, and go hunt with the Sioux.' The cloud, as it is about to discharge a subtle lightning, is not more dark nor threatening than the look with which Ishmael greeted the intruder. He turned his head on every side of him, as if seeking some engine sufficiently terrible to annihilate the offending trapper at a blow, and then, possibly recollecting the further occasion he might have for his counsel, he forced himself to say with an appearance of moderation that nearly choked him, "'Stranger, I did not believe this prying into concerns of others was the business of women in towns and settlements, and not the manner in which men, who are used to live where each has room for himself, deal with the secrets of their neighbors to what lawyer or sheriff do you calculate to sell your news i hold but little discourse except with one and then chiefly of my own affairs returned the old man without the least observable apprehension and pointing imposingly upward a judge and judge of all little does he need knowledge from my hands and but little will your wish to keep anything secret from him profit you even in this desert the mounting tempers of his unnurtured listeners were rebuked by the simple, solemn manner of the trapper. Ishmael stood sullen and thoughtful, while his companions stole a furtive and involuntary glance at the placid sky, which spread so wide and blue above his head, as if he expected to see the almighty eye itself beaming from the heavenly vault. But impressions of a serious character are seldom lasting on minds long indulged in forgetfulness, the hesitation of the squatter was consequently of short duration. The language, however, as well as the firm and collected air of the speaker, were the means of preventing much subsequent abuse, if not violence. "'It would be showing more of the kindness of a friend and comrade,' Ishmael returned, in a tone sufficiently sown to betray his humor, though it was no longer threatening." Had your shoulder been put to the wheel of one of our yonder wagons, instead of edging itself in here, where none are wanted but such as are invited? I can put the little strength that has left me, returned the trapper, to this as well as to another of your loads. Do you take us for boys? exclaimed Ishmael, laughing half in ferocity and half in derision, applying his powerful strength at the same time to the little vehicle, which rolled over the grass with as much seeming facility as if it were drawn by its usual team. The trapper paused and followed the departing wagon with his eye, marveling greatly as to the nature of its concealed contents, until it had also gained the summit of the eminence, and in its turn disappeared behind the swell of the land. Then he turned to gaze at the desolation of the scene around him, the absence of human forms would have scarce created a sensation in the bosom of one so long accustomed to solitude, had not the sight of the deserted camp furnished such strong memorials of its recent visitors, and as the old man was quick to detect, of their waste also. He cast his eyes upwards, with a shake of the head, at the vacant spot in the heavens which had so lately been filled by the branches of those trees that now lay stripped of their verdure, worthless and deserted logs at his feet. 
Ay, he muttered to himself, I might have known it, I might have known it. Often have I seen the same before, and yet I brought them to the spot myself, and have now sent them to the only neighborhood of their kind within many long leagues of the spot where I stand. This is man's wish, and pride, and waste, and sinfulness. He tames the beasts of the field to feed his idle wants, and having robbed the brutes of their natural food, he teaches them to strip the earth of its trees to quiet their hunger. A rustling in the low bushes which still grew, for some distance, along the swale that formed the thicket on which the camp of Ishmael had rested, caught his ear at the moment, and cut short the soliloquy. The habits of so many years, spent in the wilderness, caused the old man to bring his rifle to a poise, with something like the activity and promptitude of his youth. But, suddenly recovering his recollection, he dropped it into the hollow of his arm again, and resumed his air of melancholy resignation. "'Come forth, come forth,' he said aloud. "'Be bird, or be beast, ye are safe from these old hands. I have eaten, and I have drunk. Why should I take life?' when my wants call for no sacrifice. It will not be long before the birds will peck up eyes that shall not see them, and perhaps light on my very bones, for if things like these are only made to perish, why am I to expect to live forever? Come forth, come forth, you are safe from harm at these weak hands. Thank you for the good word, old trapper, cried Paul Hover, springing actively forward from his place of concealment. There was an air about you, when you threw forward the muzzle of the piece, that I did not like, for it seemed to say that you were master of all the rest of the motions. "'You are right, you are right,' cried the trapper, laughing with inward self-complacency at the recollection of his former skill. "'The day has been when few men knew the virtues of a long rifle. Like this I carry better than myself, old and useless as I now seem. "'You are right, young man.' and the time was when it was dangerous to move a leaf within an earshot of my stand. Or, he added, dropping his voice and looking serious, for a red mingo to show an eyeball from his ambushment. You have heard of the red mingos? I have heard of minks, said Paul, taking the old man by the arm, and gently urging him towards the thicket as he spoke, while at the same time he cast quick and uneasy glances behind him, in order to make sure he was not observed of your common black minks, but none of any other color. Lord, Lord, continued the trapper, shaking his head, and still laughing in his deep but quiet manner, the boy mistakes a brute for a man, though a mingo is a little better than a beast, or for that matter he is worse, when rum and opportunity are placed before his eyes. There was that accursed Huron from the upper lakes, that I knocked from his perch among the rocks in the hills, back of the hoary his voice was lost in a thicket into which he had suffered himself to be led by Paul while speaking, too much occupied by thoughts which dwelt on scenes and acts that had taken place half a century earlier in the history of the country to offer the smallest resistance. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. Now they are clapper clawing one another. I'll go look on. That dissembling abominable varlet Diomed has got that same scurvy, doting, foolish young knave in his helm, Troilus and Cressida. It is necessary, in order that the thread of the narrative should not be spun to a length which might fatigue the reader, that he should imagine a week to have intervened between the scene with which the preceding chapter closed and the events with which it is our intention to resume its relation in this. The season was on point of changing its character, the verdure of summer giving place more rapidly to the brown and party colored livery of the fall. Footnote. The Americans call the autumn the fall from the fall of the leith. The heavens were clothed in driving clouds, piled in vast masses one above the other, which whirled violently in the gust, opening occasionally to emit transient glimpses of the bright and glorious sight of the heavens, dwelling in a magnificence by far too grand and durable to be disturbed by the fitful efforts of the lower world. Beneath, the wind swept across the wild and naked prairies with a violence that is seldom witnessed in any section of the continent less open. 
it would have been easy to imagine, in the ages of fable, that the god of the winds had permitted his subordinate agents to escape from their den, and that they now rioted in wantonness across waste, where neither tree, nor work of man, nor mountain, nor obstacle of any sort opposed itself to their gambols. Though nakedness might, as usual, be given as pervading character of the spot, whither it is now necessary to transfer the scene of the tale, it was not entirely without the signs of human life. Amid the monstrous rolling of the prairie, a single naked and ragged rock arose on the margin of a little watercourse, which found its way, after winding a vast distance through the plains, into one of the numerous tributaries of the Father of Rivers. A swale of low land lay near the base of the eminence, and as it was still fringed with a thicket of elders and sumac, it bore the signs of having once nurtured a feeble growth of wood. The trees themselves had been transferred, however, to the summit and crags of the neighboring rocks. On this elevation, the signs of man to which the illusion just made applies were to be found. Seen from beneath, there were visible a breastwork of logs and stones, intermingled in such a manner as to save all unnecessary labor. A few low roofs made of bark and bow of trees, an occasional barrier, constructed like the defenses on the summit, and placed on such points of the acclivity as were easier of approach than the general face of the eminence, and a little dwelling of cloth, perched on the apex of a small pyramid, that shot up at one angle of the rock, the white covering of which glimmered from the distance like a spot of snow, or, to make the simile more suitable to the rest of the subject, like a spotless and carefully guarded standard, which was to be protected by the dearest blood of those who defended the citadel beneath. It is hardly necessary to add that this rude and characteristic fortress was the place where Ishmael Bush had taken refuge after the robbery of his flocks and herds. On the day to which the narrative is advanced, the squatter was standing near the base of the rocks, leaning on his rifle, and regarding the sterile soil that supported him with a look in which contempt and disappointment were strongly blended. "'Tis time to change our natures,' he observed to the brother of his wife, who was rarely far from his elbow, and to become ruminators instead of people used to the fare of Christians and free men. I reckon, Abram, you could glean a living among the grasshoppers. You are an active man, and might outrun the nimblest skipper of them all. The country will never do, returned the other, who relished but little the forced humor of his kinsman, and it is well to remember that a lazy traveler makes a long journey. Would you have me draw a cart at my heels, across this desert for weeks? Aye, months!" retorted Ishmael, who, like all of his class, could labor with incredible efforts on emergencies, but who too seldom exerted continued industry, on any occasion, to brook a proposal that offered so little repose. It may do for your people, who live in settlements, to hasten on to their houses. But thank heaven, my farm is too big for its owner ever to want a resting place. Since you like the plantation, then, you have only to make your crop. That is easier said than done, on this corner of the estate. I tell you, Abram, there is need of moving for more reasons than one. You know I am a man that very seldom enters into a bargain, but who always fulfills his agreements better than your dealers in worldly contracts written on rags of paper. If there's one mile, there are a hundred still needed to make up the distance for which you have my honor. As he spoke, the squatter glanced his eye upward at the little tenement of cloth which crowned the summit of his ragged fortress. The look was understood and answered by the other, and by some secret influence which operated either through their interests or feelings, it served to re-establish that harmony between them, which had just been threatened with something like a momentary breach. I know it, and feel it in every bone of my body, but I remember the reason why I have set myself on this accursed journey too well to forget the distance between me and the end. Neither you nor I will ever be the better for what we have done, unless we thoroughly finish what is so well begun. Ay, that is the doctrine of the whole world, I judge. I heard a traveling preacher, who was skirting it down the Ohio, a time since, say, if a man should live up to the faith for a hundred years, and then fall from his work a single day, he would find the settlement was to be made for the finishing blow that he had put to his job, and that all the bad and none of the good would come into the final account. "'And you believe the hungry hypocrite?' "'Who said that I believed it?' retorted Abram, with a bullying look that betrayed how much his fears had dwelt on the subject he affected to despise. 
Is it believing to tell what a roguish, and yet, Ishmael, the man might have been honest after all? He told us that the world was, in truth, no better than a desert, and that there was but one hand that could lead the most learned man through all its crooked windings. Now, if this be true of the whole, it may be true of a part. Abraham, out with your grievances like a man, interrupted the squatter with a hoarse laugh. You want to pray? But of what use will it be, according to your own doctrine, to serve God five minutes and the devil an hour? Hark ye, friend, I'm not much of a husbandman, but this I know to my cost, that to make a right good crop, even on the richest bottom, there must be hard labor. And your snufflers liken the earth to a field of corn, and the men who live on it to its yield. Now I tell you, Abram, that you are no better than a thistle or a mullen. Yea, you are wood of too open a pore to be good, even to burn. The malign glance, which shot from the scowling eye of Abram, announced the angry character of his feelings. But as the furtive look quailed, immediately before the unmoved steady countenance of the squatter, it also betrayed how much the bolder spirit of the latter had obtained the mastery over his craven nature. Content with his ascendancy, which was too apparent, and had been too often exerted on similar occasions, to leave him in any doubt of its extent, Ishmael coolly continued a discourse, by adverting more directly to his future plans. "'You will own the justice of paying every one in kind,' he said. "'I have been robbed of my stock, and I have a scheme to make myself as good as before, by taking a hoof for hoof. Or, for that matter, when a man is put to the trouble of bargaining for both sides, he is a fool if he doesn't pay himself something in the way of commission.' As the squatter made this declaration in a tone which was a little excited by the humor of the moment, four or five of his lounging sons, who had been leaning against the foot of the rock, came forward with the indolent step so common to the family. "'I have been calling Ellen Wade, who was on the rock, keeping a lookout to know if there is anything to be seen,' observed the eldest of the young men, "'and she shakes her head for an answer. Ellen is sparing of her words for a woman, and might be taught manners at least.' without spoiling her good looks. Ishmael cast his eye upward to the place where the offending but unconscious girl was holding her anxious watch. She was seated at the edge of the uppermost crag by the side of the little tent and at least two hundred feet above the level of the plain. Little else was to be distinguished at that distance, but the outline of her form, her fair hair streaming in the gusts beyond her shoulders, and the steady and seemingly unchangeable look that she had riveted on some remote point of the prairie. "'What is it now?' cried Ishmael, lifting his powerful voice a little above the rushing of the element. "'Have you got a glimpse of anything bigger than a burrowing barker?' The lips of the attentive Ellen parted. She rose to the utmost height her small stature admitted, seeming still to regard the unknown object. But her voice, if she spoke at all, was not sufficiently loud to be heard amid the wind. "'It are a fact that the child sees something more uncommon than a buffalo or a prairie dog,' continued Ishmael. "'Why, now, girl, are ye deaf? No, I say. I hope it is an army of redskins she has in her eye, for I should relish the chance to pay them for their kindness under the favor of these logs and rocks.' As the squatter accompanied his vaunt with corresponding gestures, and directed his eyes to the circle of his equally confident sons while speaking, he drew their gaze from Ellen to himself. But now, when they turned together to note the succeeding movements of their female sentinel, the place which had so lately been occupied by her form was vacant. "'As I am a sinner!' exclaimed Massa, usually one of the most phlegmatic of the youths. "'The girl is blown away by the wind!' Something like a sensation was exhibited among them, which might have denoted that the influence of the laughing blue eyes, flaxen hair, and glowing cheeks of Ellen had not been lost on the dull natures of the young men and looks of amazement mingled slightly with concern, passed from one to the other as they gazed, in dull wonder, at the point of the naked rock. "'It might well be,' added another. "'She sat on a silvered stone, and I've been thinking of telling her she was in danger for more than an hour.' "'Is that a ribbon of the child dangling from the corner of the hill below?' cried Ishmael. "'Ha! Who is moving about the tent? Have I not told you all—' "'Ellen! Tis Ellen!' interrupted the whole body of his sons in a breath and at that instant she reappeared, to put an end to their different surmises, and to relieve more than one sluggish nature from its unwanted excitement. As Ellen issued from beneath the folds of the tent, she advanced with a light and fearless step to her former giddy stand, and pointed toward the prairie, appearing to speak in an eager and rapid voice to some invisible auditor. "'Now is mad,' 
said Asa, half in contempt, and yet not a little in concern. The girl's dreaming with her eyes open, and thinks she sees one of them fierce creatures, with hard names, with which the doctor fills her ears. Can it be? The child has found a scout of the Sioux? said Ishmael, bending his look toward the plain. But a low, significant whisper from Abram drew his eyes quickly upward again, where they were turned just in time to perceive that the cloth of the tent was agitated by a motion very evidently different from the quivering occasioned by the wind. "'Let her, if she dare,' the squatter muttered in his teeth. "'Abram, they know my temper too well to play the prank with me. Look for yourself. If the curtain is not lifted, I can see no better than the owl by daylight.' Ishmael struck the breech of his rifle violently on the earth, and shouted in a voice that might easily have been heard by Ellen, had not her attention still continued wrapped on the object which so unaccountably attracted her eyes in the distance. No, continued the squatter. Away with you, fool! Will you bring down punishment on your own head? Why, now? She has forgotten her native speech. Let us see if she can understand another language. Ishmael threw his rifle to his shoulder, and at the next moment it was pointed upward at the summit of the rock. Before time was given for a word of remonstrance, it had sent forth its contents in its usual streak of bright flame. Ellen started like the frightened chamois, and uttering a piercing scream, she darted into the tent, with a swiftness that left it uncertain whether terror or actual injury had been the penalty of her offense. The action of the squatter was too sudden and unexpected to admit of prevention, but the instant it was done, his sons manifested, in an unequivocal manner, the temper with which they witnessed the desperate measure. Angry and fierce glances were interchanged, and a murmur of disapprobation was uttered by the whole in common. "'What has thou done, father?' asked Asa, with a degree of spirit which was the more striking from being unusual. "'That she should be shot like a straggling deer, or a hungry wolf!' "'Mischief!' deliberately returned the squatter, but with a cool expression of defiance in his eye that showed how little he was moved by the ill-concealed humor of his children. "'Mischief, boy, mischief! Take you heed that the disorder don't spread!' It would need a different treatment in a man than in yon screaming girl. Asa, you are a man, as you have often boasted, but remember I am your father and your better. I know it well, and what sort of a father. Harky boy, I more than half believe that your drowsy head led in the Sioux. Be modest in speech, my watchful son, or you may have to answer yet for the mischief your own bad conduct has brought upon us. I'll stay no longer to be hectored like a child in petticoats. You talk of law, as if you knew of none, and yet you keep me down, as though I had not life and wants of my own. I stay no longer to be treated like one of your meanest cattle. The world is wide, my gallant boy, and there's many a noble plantation on it, without a tenant. Go! You have a title deed, signed and sealed to your hand. Few fathers portion their children better than Ishmael Bush. You will say that for me, at least, when you get to be a wealthy landholder. Look, father, look! exclaimed several voices at once seizing with avidity an opportunity to interrupt a dialogue which threatened to become more violent. Look, repeated Abraham in a voice which sounded hollow and warning, if you have time for anything but quarrels, Ishmael, look. The squatter turned slowly from his offending son, and cast an eye that still lowered with deep resentment upward, but which, the instant it caught a view of the object that now attracted the attention of all around him, changed its expression to one of astonishment and dismay. A female stood on the spot from which Ellen had been so fearfully expelled. Her person was of the smallest size that is believed to comport with beauty, and which poets and artists have chosen as the beau ideal of feminine loveliness. Her dress was of a dark and glossy silk, and fluttered like gossamer around her form. Long, flowing, and curling tresses of hair, still blacker and more shining than her robe, fell at times about her shoulders completely enveloping the whole of her delicate bust in their ringlets, or at others streaming in the wind. The elevation at which she stood prevented a close examination of the lineaments of a countenance which, however, it might be seen was youthful, and at the moment of her unlooked-for appearance, eloquent with feeling. So young, indeed, did this fair and fragile being appear, that it might be doubted whether the age of childhood was entirely past. One small and exquisitely molded hand was pressed on her heart, while with the other she made an impressive gesture, which seemed to invite Ishmael, if further violence was meditated, to direct it against her bosom. 
The silent wonder with which the group of boarders gazed upwards at so extraordinary a spectacle was only interrupted as the person of Ellen was seen emerging with timidity from the tent, as if equally urged by apprehensions in behalf of herself and the fears with which she felt on account of her companion, to remain concealed and to advance. She spoke, but her words were unheard by those below, and unheeded by her to whom they were addressed. The latter, however, as if content with the offer she had made of herself as a victim to the resentment of Ishmael, now calmly retired, and the spot she had so lately occupied became vacant, leaving a sort of stupid impression on the spectators beneath, not unlike that which it might be supposed would have been created had they just been gazing at some supernatural vision. More than a minute of profound silence succeeded, during which the sons of Ishmael still continued gazing at the naked rock in a stupid wonder. Then, as I met I, an expression of novel intelligence passed from one to the other, indicating that to them, at least, the appearance of this extraordinary tenant of the pavilion was as unexpected as it was incomprehensible. At length, Asa, in right of his years, and moved by the rankling impulse of the recent quarrel, took on himself the office of interrogator. Instead, however, of braving the resentment of his father, of whose fierce nature, when aroused, he had too frequent evidence to excite it wantonly, he turned upon the cowering person of Abram, observing with a sneer, "'This, then, is the beast you were bringing into the prairies for a decoy. I know you to be a man who seldom troubles truth, when anything worse may answer. But I never knew you to outdo yourself so thoroughly before. The newspapers of Kentuck have called you a dealer in black flesh a hundred times. But little did they reckon that you drove the trade into white families.' "'Who is a kidnapper?' demanded Abram, with a blustering show of resentment. "'Am I to be called account for every lie they put in print throughout the States? "'Look to your own family, boy. Look to yourselves. "'The very stumps of Kentucky and Tennessee cry out agent in ye. "'I, my tonguey gentleman, I have seen father and mother and three children, "'yourself for one, published on the logs and stubs of the settlements, "'with dollars enough for reward to have made an honest man rich.' for he was interrupted by a backhanded but violent blow on the mouth that caused him to totter and which left the impression of its weight in the starting blood and swelling lips assa said the father advancing with a portion of that dignity with which the hand of nature seems to have invested the parental character you have struck the brother of your mother i have struck the abuser of the whole family returned the angry youth and unless he teaches his tongue a wiser language he had better part with it altogether as the unruly member I'm no great performer with the knife, but, on an occasion, could make out myself to cut off a slant. Boy, twice have you forgotten yourself today. Be careful that it does not happen the third time. When the law of the land is weak, it is right the law of nature should be strong. You understand me, Asa, and you know me. As for you, Abram, the child has done you wrong, and it is my place to see you righted. Remember, I tell you justice shall be done. It is enough. But you have said hard things, agent of me and my family. If the hounds of the law had put their bills on the trees and stumps of the clearings, it was for no act of dishonesty, as you know, but because we maintain the rule that earth is common property. No, Abram, could I wash my hands of things done by your advice as easily as I can of the things done by the whisperings of the devil? My sleep would be quieter at night, and none who bear my name would need blush to hear it mentioned. Peace, Asa, and you too, man. Enough has been said. Let us all think well before anything is added that may make what is already so bad still more bitter. Ishmael waved his hand with authority as he ended and turned away with the air of one who felt assured that those he had addressed would not have the temerity to dispute his commands. Asa evidently struggled with himself to compel the required obedience, but his heavy nature quietly sunk into its ordinary repose, and he soon appeared again the being he really was dangerous only at moments, and one whose passions were too sluggish to be maintained at the point of ferocity. Not so with Abram. While there was an appearance of personal conflict between him and his colossal nephew, his mien had expressed the infallible evidences of engrossing apprehension. But now that the authority as well as gigantic strength of the father were interposed between him and his assailant, his countenance changed from paleness to a livid hue that bespoke how deeply the injury he had received rankled in his breast. 
Like Asa, however, he acquiesced in the decision of the squatter, and the appearance, at least, of harmony was restored again among a set of beings, who were restrained by no obligations more powerful than the frail web of authority with which Ishmael had been able to envelop his children. One effect of the quarrel had been to divert the thoughts of the young men from their recent visitor. With the dispute that succeeded the disappearance of the fair stranger, all recollection of her existence appeared to have vanished. A few ominous and secret conferences, it is true, were held apart, during which the direction of the eyes of the different speakers betrayed their subject. But these threatening symptoms soon disappeared, and the whole party was again seen broken into its usual listless, silent, and lounging groups. "'I will go upon the rock, boys, and look abroad for the savages,' said Ishmael shortly after, advancing towards them with a mien which he intended should be conciliating, at the same time that it was authoritative. "'If there is nothing to fear, we will go out on the plain. The day is too good to be lost in words, like women in the towns wrangling over their tea and sugar cakes.' Without waiting for approbation or dissent, the squatter advanced to the base of the rock, which formed a sort of perpendicular wall, nearly twenty feet high around the whole acclivity. Ishmael, however, directed his footsteps to a point where, on the ascent, might be made through a narrow cleft, which he had taken the precaution to fortify with a breastwork of cottonwood logs, and which, in its turn, was defended by a chevaux de frise of the branches of the same tree. Here an armed man was usually kept, as at the key of the whole position, and here one of the young men now stood, indolently leaning against the rock, ready to protect the pass, if it should prove necessary, until the whole party could be mustered at the several points of defense. From this place the squatter found the ascent still difficult, partly by nature, and partly by artificial impediments, until he reached the sort of terrace, or, to speak more properly, the plain of the elevation, where he had established the huts in which the whole family dwelt. These tenements were, as already mentioned, of that class which are so often seen on the borders, and such as belong to the infancy of architecture, being simply formed of logs, bark, and poles. The area on which they stood contained several hundred square feet, and was sufficiently elevated above the plain, greatly to lessen if not to remove all danger from Indian missiles. Here Ishmael believed he might leave his infants in comparative security, under the protection of their spirited mother, and here he now found Esther engaged at her ordinary domestic employments, surrounded by her daughters, and lifting her voice in declamatory censure, as one or another of the idle fry incurred her displeasure, and far too much engrossed with the tempest of her own conversation, to know anything of the violent scene which had been passing below. "'A fine windy place you have chosen for the camp, Ishmael,' she commented, or rather continued by merely diverting the attack from a sobbing girl of ten at her elbow to her husband. "'My word! If I haven't to count the young ones every ten minutes to see they are not flying away among the buzzards or the ducks, why do you all keep hovering around the rock like lolloping reptiles in the spring, when the heavens are beginning to be alive with birds, man? Do you think mouths can be filled and hunger satisfied by laziness and sleep? You'll have your say, Esther.' said the husband, using the provincial pronunciation of America for the name, and regarding his noisy companions with a look of habitual tolerance rather than of affection. But the birds you shall have, if your own tongue don't frighten them to take too high a flight. Aye, woman, he continued, standing on the very spot whence he had so rudely banished Ellen, which he had by this time gained. And buffalo, too, if my eye can tell the animal at the distance of a Spanish league. Come down, come down, and be doing instead of talking. A talking man is no better than a barking dog. I shall hang out the cloth, if any of the redskins show themselves, in time to give you notice. But, Ishmael, what have you been killing, my man? For it was your rifle I heard a few minutes agone, unless I have lost my skill in sounds. Po, t'was to frighten the hawk you see sailing above the rock. Hawk, indeed! At your time of day to be shooting at hawks and buzzards, with eighteen open mouths to feed? Look at the bee, and at the beaver, my good man, and learn to be a provider. Why, Ishmael! I believe my soul, she continued, dropping the toe she was twisting on a distaff. The man is in that tent again. More than half his time is spent about the worthless, good-for-nothing. The sudden reappearance of her husband closed the mouth of the wife, and, as the former descended to the place where Esther had resumed her employment, she was content to grumble forth her dissatisfaction, instead of expressing it in more audible terms. The dialogue that now took place between the affectionate pair was sufficiently succinct and expressive. The woman was at first a little brief and sullen in her answers, but care for her family soon rendered her more complacent. 
as the purport of the conversation was merely an engagement to hunt during the remainder of the day, in order to provide the chief necessary of life, we shall not stop to record it. With this resolution, then, the squatter descended to the plain, and divided his forces into two parts, one of which was to remain as a guard with the fortress, and the other to accompany him to the field. He warily included Asa and Abram in his own party, well knowing that no authority short of his own was competent to repress the fierce disposition of his headlong son, if fairly awakened. When these arrangements were completed, the hunters sallied forth, separating at no great distance from the rock, in order to form a circle about the distant herd of buffaloes. Chapter 9 of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Prishian a little scratched, twill serve, love's labor lost. Having made the reader acquainted with the manner in which Ishmael Bush had disposed of his family, under circumstances that might have proved so embarrassing to most other men, we shall again shift the scene a few short miles from the place last described, preserving, however, the due and natural succession of time. At the very moment that the squatter and his sons departed in the manner mentioned in the preceding chapter, two men were intently occupied in a swale that lay along the borders of a little run, just out of cannon shot from the encampment, discussing the merits of a savory bison hump that had been prepared for their palates with the utmost attention to the particular merits of that description of food. The choice morsel had been judiciously separated from the adjoining and less worthy parts of the beast, and, enveloped in the hairy coating provided by nature, it had duly undergone the heat of the customary subterraneous oven, and was now laid before its proprietors in all the culinary glory of the prairies. So far as richness, delicacy, and wildness of flavor, and substantial nourishment were concerned, the viand might well have claimed a decided superiority over the matriculous cookery, and labor compounds of the most renowned artists though the service of the dainty was certainly achieved in a manner far from artificial. It would appear that the two fortunate mortals, to whose happy lot it fell, to enjoy a meal in which health and appetite lent so keen a relish to the exquisite food of the American deserts, were far from being insensible of the advantage they possessed. The one, to whose knowledge in the culinary art the other was indebted for his banquet, seemed the least disposed of the two to profit by his own skill. He ate, it is true, and with relish, but it was always with the moderation with which age is apt to temper the appetite. No such restraint, however, was imposed on the inclination of his companion. In the very flower of his days and in the vigor of manhood, the homage that he paid to the work of his more aged friend's hands was of the most profound and engrossing character. As one delicious morsel succeeded another, he rolled his eyes towards his companion, and seemed to express that gratitude which he had not speech to utter, in looks of the most benignant nature. "'Cut more into the heart of it, lad,' said the trapper, for it was the venerable inhabitant of those vast wastes who had served the bee-hunter with the banquet in question. "'Cut more into the center of the piece. There you will find the genuine riches of nature.' and that without need from spices, or any of your biting mustard to give it a foreign relish. "'If I had but a cup of metheglin,' said Paul, stopping to perform the necessary operation of breathing, "'I should swear this was the strongest meal that was ever placed before the mouth of man.' "'Ay, ay, well, you may call it strong,' returned the other, laughing after his peculiar manner, in pure satisfaction at witnessing the infinite contentment of his companion. Strong it is, and strong it makes him who eats it. Here, Hector, tossing the patient hound, who was watching his eye with a wistful look, a portion of the meat. You have now need of strength, my friend, in your old days as you well as your master. Now, lad, there is a dog that has eaten and slept wiser and better, ay, and that of richer food, than any king of them all. And why? Because he had used and not abused the gifts of his maker. He was made a hound, and like a hound has he feasted. Then did he create men, but they have eaten like famished wolves. A good and prudent dog has Hector proved, and never have I found one of his breed false in nose or friendship. Do you know the difference between the cookery of the wilderness 
and that which is found in the settlements? No, I see plainly you don't, by your appetite. Then I will tell you. The one follows man, the other nature. One thinks he can add to the gifts of the Creator, while the other is humble enough to enjoy them. Therein lies the secret. I tell you, Trapper, said Paul, who was very little edified by the morality with which his associates saw fit to season their repast, that every day while we are in this place, and they are likely to be many, I will shoot a buffalo, and you shall cook his hump. I cannot say that. I cannot say that. The beast is good. Take him in what part you will, and it was to be food for men that he was fashioned. But I cannot say that I will be a witness and a helper to the waste of killing one daily. The devil a bit of waste shall there be, old man. If they all turn out as good as this, I will engage to eat them clean myself, even to the hoofs. How now, who comes here? Someone with a long nose? I will answer. And one that has led him on a true scent, if he is following the trail of a dinner. The individual who interrupted the conversation, and who had elicited the foregoing remark of Paul, was seen advancing along the margin of the run with a deliberate pace in a direct line for the two revelers. As there was nothing formidable nor hostile in his appearance, the bee-hunter, instead of suspending his operations, rather increased his efforts, in a manner which would seem to imply that he doubted whether the hump would suffice for the proper entertainment of all, who were now likely to partake of the delicious morsel. With the trapper, however, the case was different. His more tempered appetite was already satisfied and he faced the newcomer with a look of cordiality that plainly evinced how very opportune he considered his arrival. "'Come on, friend,' he said, waving his hand as he observed the stranger to pause a moment, apparently in doubt. "'Come on, I say, if hunger be your guide. It has led you to a fitting place. Here is meat, and this youth can give you corn, parched till it be whiter than the upland snow. Come on, without fear.' We are not ravenous beasts, eating of each other, but Christian men, receiving thankfully that which the Lord hath seen fit to give. "'Venerable hunter,' returned the doctor, for it was no other than the naturalist, on one of his daily exploring expeditions, "'I rejoice greatly at this happy meeting. We are lovers of the same pursuits, and should be friends.' "'Lord, Lord!' said the old man, laughing, without much deference to the rules of decorum, in the philosopher's very face. It is man who wanted to make me believe that the name could change the nature of a beast. Come, friend, you are welcome, though your notions are a little blinded with reading too many books. Sit ye down, and after eating of this morsel tell me, if you can, the name of the creature that has bestowed on you its flesh for a meal. The eyes of Dr. Battius, for we deem it decorous to give the good man the appellation he most preferred, sufficiently denoted the satisfaction with which he listened to this proposal. The exercise he had taken, and the sharpness of the wind, proved excellent stimulants, and Paul himself had hardly been in better plight to do credit to the trapper's cookery than was the lover of nature when the grateful invitation met his ears. Indulging in a small laugh, which his exertions to repress reduced nearly to a simper, he took the indicated seat by the old man's side, and made the customary dispositions to commence his meal without further ceremony. "'I should be ashamed of my profession,' he said, swallowing a morsel of the hump, with evident delight, slyly endeavouring at the same time to distinguish the peculiarities of the singed and defaced skin. "'I ought to be ashamed of my profession, were there beast or bird on the continent of America, that I could not tell by some one of the many evidences which science has elicited in her cause. This, then, the food is nutritious and savoury, a mouthful of your corn, friend, if you please.' Paul, who continued eating with increasing industry, looking askant not unlike a dog when engaged in some agreeable pursuit, threw him his pouch, without deeming it at all necessary to suspend his own labors. "'You were saying, friend, that you have many ways of telling the creature,' observed the attentive trapper. "'Many, many, and infallible. Now the animals that are carnivorous are known by their incisors.' "'They are what?' demanded the trapper. The teeth with which nature has furnished them for defense, and in order to tear their food. Again, look you then for the teeth of this creature, interrupted the trapper, who was bent on convincing a man who had presumed to enter into competition with himself, in matters pertaining to the wilds of gross ignorance. Turn the piece around and find your inside overs. The doctor complied, and of course without success, 
though he profited by the occasion to take another fruitless glance at the wrinkled hide. "'Well, friend, do you find the things you need before you can pronounce the creatures a duck or a salmon?' "'I apprehend the entire animal's not here.' "'You may as well say as much,' cried Paul, who was now compelled to pause from pure repletion. "'I will answer for some pounds of the fellow, weighed by the truest steel yards west of the Alleghanies. Still, you may make out to keep soul and body together, with what is left,' reluctantly eyeing a piece large enough to feed twenty men, but which he felt compelled to abandon from satiety. "'Cut in nigher to the heart, as the old man says, and you will find the riches of the piece.' "'The heart?' exclaimed the doctor, inwardly delighted to learn that there was a distinct organ to be submitted to his inspection. "'Aye, let me see the heart. It will at once determine the character of the animal. Certes, this is not the core, eh? Sure enough it is. The animal must be of the order Bellu A from its obese habits.' He was interrupted by a long and hearty but still a noiseless fit of merriment from the trapper which was considered so ill-timed by the offended naturalist as to produce an instant cessation of speech, if not a stagnation of ideas. "'Listen to his beasts, habits, and belly orders,' said the old man, delighted with the evident embarrassment of his rival. "'And then he says it's not the core. Why, man, you are farther from the truth than you are from the settlements, with all your bookish laming and hard words, which I have, once for all, said cannot be understood by any tribe or nation east of the Rocky Mountains. Beastly habits are no beastly habits. The creatures are to be seen cropping the prairies by tens of thousands, and a piece in your hand is the core of as juicy a buffalo hump as stomach need crave. My aged companion, said Obed, struggling to keep drown a rising irascibility that he conceived would ill comport with the dignity of his character, your system is erroneous from the premises to the conclusion, and your classification so faulty as utterly to confound the distinctions of science. The buffalo is not gifted with a hump at all, nor is his flesh savory and wholesome. As I must acknowledge, it would seem the subject before us may well be characterized. There I'm dead against you, and clearly with the trapper, interrupted Paul Hover. The man who denies that buffalo beef is good should scorn to eat it. Footnote. It is scarcely necessary to tell the reader that the animal so often alluded to in this book, and which is vulgarly called the buffalo, is in truth the bison. Hence so many countertramps between the men of the prairies and the men of science. The doctor, whose observation of the bee-hunter had hitherto been exceedingly cursory, stared at the new speaker with a look which denoted something like recognition. "'The principal characteristics of your countenance, friend,' he said, "'are familiar.' Either you, or some other specimen of your class, is known to me. I am the man you met in the woods east of the big river, and whom you tried to persuade to line a yellow hornet to his nest. As if my eye was not too true to mistake any other animal for a honey-bee in a clear day. We tarried together a week, as you may remember, you at your toads and lizards, and I at my high holes and hollow trees. And a good job we made of it between us. I filled my tubs with the sweetest honey I ever sent to the settlements, besides housing a dozen hives, and your bag was near bursting with a crawling museum. I never was bold enough to put the question to your face, stranger, but I reckon you are a keeper of curiosities. Footnote. The pursuit of a bee-hunter is not uncommon on the skirts of American society, though it is a little embellished here. When the bees are seen sucking the flowers, their pursuer contrives to capture one or two. He then chooses a proper spot, and suffering one to escape, the insect invariably takes its flight towards the hive. Changing his ground to a greater or less distance according to circumstances, the bee-hunter then permits another to escape. Having watched the course of the bees, which is technically called lining, he is enabled to calculate the intersecting angle of the two lines, which is the hive. "'Aye, that is another of their wanton wickednesses,' exclaimed the trapper. "'They slay the buck and the moose and the wildcat and all the beasts that range the woods.' and stuffing them with worthless rags and placing eyes of glass into their heads that they set them up to be stared at, and call them the creatures of the Lord, as if any mortal effigy could equal the works of his hand. "'I know you well,' returned the doctor, on whom the pliant of the old man produced no visible impression. "'I know you,' offering his hand cordially to Paul. "'It was a prolific week, as my herbal and catalogue shall one day prove.' 
Aye, I remember well, young man. You are of the class Mammalia, order Primates, genus Homo, species Kentucky. Pausing to smile at his own humor, the naturalist proceeded. Since our separation, I have journeyed far, having entered into a compactum or agreement with a certain man named Ishmael. Bush, interrupted the impatient and reckless Paul. By the Lord Trapper, this is the very blood letter that Ellen told me of. Then Nelly has not done me credit for what I trust I deserve, returned the single-minded doctor, for I am not of the phlebotomizing school at all, greatly preferring the practice which purifies the blood instead of abstracting it. It was a blunder of mine, good stranger. The girl called you a skillful man. Therein she may have exceeded my merits, Dr. Battius continued, bowing with sufficient meekness. But Ellen is good and kind, and a spirited girl, too. A kind and a sweet girl I have ever found no wade to be. The devil you have, cried Paul, dropping the morsel he was sucking, from sheer reluctance to abandon the hump, and casting a fierce and direct look into the very teeth of the unconscious physician. I reckon, stranger, you have a mind to bag Ellen, too. The riches of the whole vegetable and animal world united would not tempt me to harm a hair of her head. I love the child with what may be called amor naturalis, or rather paternus, the affection of a father. Ay, that indeed is more befitting the difference in your years, Paul coolly rejoined, stretching forth his hand to regain the rejected morsel. You would be no better than a drone at your time of day, with a young hive to feed and swarm. Yes, there is reason, because there is nature in what he says, observed the trapper, but friend, you have said you were a dreller in the camp of one Ishmael Bush. True, it is in the virtue of compactum. I know but little of the virtue of packing, though I follow trapping in my old age for a livelihood. They tell me that skins are well kept in the new fashion, but it is long since I have left off killing more than I need for food and garments. I was an eyewitness myself of the manner in which the Sioux broke into your encampment and drove off the cattle, stripping the poor man you call Ishmael of his smallest hoofs, counting even the cloven feet. Asinius accepted, muttered the doctor, who by this time was discussing his portion of the hump in utter forgetfulness of all its scientific attributes. Asinius Domesticus Americanus accepted. I'm glad to hear that so many of them are saved, though I know not the value of the animals you name, which is nothing uncommon, seeing how long it is that I have been out of the settlements. But can you tell me, friend, what the traveller carries under the white cloth he guards with teeth as sharp as a wolf that quarrels for the carcass the hunter has left? You heard of it? exclaimed the other, dropping the morsel he was conveying to his mouth in manifest surprise. Nay, I have heard nothing, but I have seen the cloth, and had liked to have been bidden for no greater crime than wishing to know what it covered. Bitten? Then, after all, the animal must be carnivorous. It is too tranquil for Ursus Heridus. If it were the Canis Latrans, the voice would betray it, nor would Nellie Wade be so familiar with any of the genus Fere. Venerable hunter, the solitary animal confined in that wagon by day and in the tent at night has occasioned me more perplexity of mind than the whole catalogue of quadrupeds besides, and for this plain reason I did not know how it to class it. You think it a ravenous beast? I know it to be quadruped. Your own danger proves it to be carnivorous. During this broken explanation, Paul Hover had sat silent and thoughtful, regarding each speaker with deep attention. But suddenly, moved by the manner of the doctor, the latter had scarcely time to utter his positive assertion, before the young man bluntly demanded, And pray, friend, what may you call a quadruped? A vagary of nature, wherein she has displayed less of her infinite wisdom than is usual. Could rotary levers be substituted for two of the limbs? agreeably to the improvement in my new order of Flangercura, which might be rendered into the vernacular as lever-legged. There would be a delightful perfection and harmony in the construction, but as the quadruped is now formed, I call it a mere vagary of nature, no other than a vagary. Harky, stranger, in Kentucky we are but small dealers in dictionaries. Vagary is a hard word to turn into English as quadruped. A quadruped is an animal with four legs, a beast. A beast? Do you then reckon that Ishmael Bush travels with a beast caged in that wagon? I know it, and lend me your ear, not literally, friend, observing Paul to start and look surprised, but figuratively through its functions, and you shall hear. 
I have already made known that in the virtue of a compactum I journey with the aforesaid Ishmael Bush. But though I am bound to perform certain duties while the journey lasts, there is no condition which says that the said journey shall be sepiternum, or eternal. Now though this region may scarcely be said to be wedded to science, being to all intents a virgin territory as respects the inquire into natural history, still it is greatly destitute of the treasures of the vegetable kingdom. I should therefore have tarried some hundreds of miles more to the eastward, were it not for the inward propensity that I feel to have the beast in question inspected and suitably described and class. For that matter, he continued, dropping his voice, like one who imparts an important secret, I am not without hopes of persuading Ishmael to let me dissect it. You have seen the creature? Not with the organs of sight, but with much more infallible instruments of vision the conclusions of reason and the deductions of scientific premises. I have watched the habits of the animal young man, and can fearlessly pronounce, by evidence that would be thrown away on ordinary observers, that it is of vast dimensions, inactive, possibly torpid, of voracious appetite, and as it now appears, by the direct testimony of this venerable hunter, ferocious and carnivorous. I should be better pleased, stranger said Paul, on whom the doctor's description was making a very sensible impression, to be sure the creature was a beast at all. As to that, if I wanted the evidence of a fact which is abundantly apparent by the habits of the animal, I have the word of Ishmael himself. A reason can be given for my smallest deductions. I am not troubled, young man, with a vulgar and idle curiosity, but all my aspirations after knowledge, as I humbly believe are, first, for the advancement of learning, and secondly, for the benefit of my fellow creatures. I pine greatly in secret to know the contents of the tent, which Ishmael guarded so carefully, and which he had covenanted it that I should swear, Ure per deos, not to approach nigher than a defined number of cubits, for a definite period of time. Your just gerundum, or oath, is a serious matter, and not to be dealt in lightly. But, as my expedition depended on complying, I consented to the act, reserving to myself at all times the power of distant observation. It is now some ten days since Ishmael, pitting the state in which he saw me, a humble lover of science, imparted the fact that the vehicle contained a beast, which he was carrying into the prairies as a decoy, by which he intends to untap others of the same genus, or perhaps species. Since then my task has been reduced simply to watch the habits of the animal and to record the results. When we reach a certain distance where these beasts are said to abound, I am to have the liberal examination of the specimen." Paul continued to listen in the most profound silence, until the doctor concluded his singular but characteristic explanation. Then the incredulous bee-hunter shook his head, and saw fit to reply by saying, "'Stranger, old Ishmael has burrowed you in the very bottom of the hall tree, where your eyes will be of no more use than the sting of a drone. I too know something of that very wagon, and I may say that I have lined a squatter down into a flat line. Hark ye, friend, do you think the girl like Ellen Wade would become the companion of a wild beast?' "'Why not? Why not?' repeated the naturalist. Nellie has a taste, and often listens with pleasure to the treasures that I am sometimes compelled to scatter in this desert. Why should she not study the habits of any animal, even though it were a rhinoceros? Softly, softly, returned the equally positive, and though less scientific, certainly, on this subject, better instructed bee-hunter. Ellen is a girl spirit, and one too that knows her own mind, or I'm much mistaken, but with all her courage and brave looks she is no better than a woman after all. Haven't I often had the girl crying? You are an acquaintance, then, of Nellie's? The devil a bit, but I know a woman is a woman, and all the books in Kentucky couldn't make Ellen Wade go into a tent alone with a ravenous beast. It seems to me, the trapper calmly observed, that there is something dark and hidden in this matter. I am a witness that the traveler likes none to look into the tent, and I have a proof more sure than what either of you can lay claim to, that the wagon does not carry the cage of a beast. Here is Hector, come of a breed with noses as true and faithful as a hand that is all-powerful has made any of their kind, and had there been a beast in the place, the hound would long since have told it to his master. Do you pretend to oppose a dog to a man? Brutality to learning? Instinct to reason? exclaimed the doctor in some heat. 
In what manner, pray, can a hound distinguish the habits, species, or even the genus of an animal, like reasoning, learned, scientific, triumphant man? In what manner, coolly repeated the veteran woodsman, listen, and if you believe that a schoolmaster can make a quicker wit than the Lord, you shall be made to see how much you're mistaken. Do you not hear something move in the brake? It has been crackling the twigs these five minutes. Now tell me what the creature is. I hope nothing ferocious, exclaimed the doctor, who still retained a lively impression of his re-encounter with the Vespertilio Horribilis. You have rifles, friends? Would it not be pertinent to prime them? For this fouling piece of mine is little to be depended on. There may be reason in what he says, returned the trapper so far complying as to take his piece from the place where it had been lain during the repast and raising its muzzle in the air. Now tell me the name of the creature. It exceeds the limits of earthly knowledge. Buffon himself could not tell whether the animal was a quadruped or is of the order serpents, a sheep, or a tiger. Then was your buffoon a fool to my Hector? Here, pup, what is it, dog? Shall we run it down, pup, or shall we let it pass? The hound, which had already manifested to the experienced trapper, by the tremulous motion of his ears, his consciousness of the proximity of a strange animal, lifted his head from his forepaws and slightly parted his lips, as if about to show the remnants of his teeth. But suddenly abandoning his hostile purpose, he snuffed the air a moment, gaped heavily, shook himself, and peaceably resumed his recumbent attitude. "'Now, doctor,' cried the trapper triumphantly, "'I am well convinced there is neither game nor ravenous beast in the thicket, and that I call substantial knowledge to a man who is too old to be a spendthrift of his strength, and yet who would not wish to be a meal for a panther.' The dog interrupted his master by a growl, but still kept his head crouched to the earth. "'It is a man!' exclaimed the trapper, rising. "'It is a man, if I am a judge of the creature's ways. There is but little said of twixt the hound and me, but we seldom mistake each other's meaning.' Paul Hover sprang to his feet like lightning, and throwing forward his rifle, he cried in a voice of menace, "'Come forward, if a friend, if an enemy, stand ready for the worst!' "'A friend, a white man, and I hope a Christian,' returned a voice from the thicket, which opened at the same instant, and at the next the speaker made his appearance. Chapter 10 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Go apart, Adam, and thou shalt hear how he will shake me up as you like it. It is well known that even long before the immense regions of Louisiana changed their masters for the second, and, as it is to be hoped, for the last time, its unguarded territory was by no means safe from the inroads of white adventurers. The semi-barbarous hunters from the Canadas, the same description of population, a little more enlightened, from the States, and the Matisse, or half-breeds, who claimed to be ranked in the class of white men, were scattered among the different Indian tribes, or gleaned a scanty livelihood in solitude, amid the haunts of the beaver and the bison, or to adopt the popular nomenclature of the country of the buffalo. Footnote. In addition to the scientific distinctions which mark the two species, it may be added, with due deference to Dr. Battius, that a much more important particular is the fact that while the former of these animals is delicious and nourishing food, the latter is scarcely edible. It was, therefore, no unusual thing for strangers to encounter each other in the endless wastes of the West. By signs, which an unpracticed eye would pass unobserved, these borderers knew when one of his fellows was in his vicinity, and he avoided or approached the intruder as best comported with his feelings or his interest. Generally, these interviews were pacific, for the whites had a common enemy to dread, in the ancient and perhaps more lawful occupants of the country. But instances were not rare, in which jealousy and cupidity has caused them to terminate in scenes of the most violent and ruthless treachery. The meeting of two hunters on the American desert, as we find it convenient sometimes to call this region, was consequently somewhat in the suspicious and weary manner in which two vessels draw together in the sea that is known to be infested with pirates. While neither party is willing to betray its weakness by exhibiting distrust, neither is disposed to commit itself by any acts of confidence 
from which it may be difficult to recede. Such was, in some degree, the character of the present interview. The stranger drew nigh deliberately, keeping his eyes steadily fastened on the movements of the other party, while he purposely created little difficulties to impede an approach which might prove too hasty. On the other hand, Paul stood playing with the lock of his rifle, too proud to let it appear that three men could manifest any apprehension of a solitary individual, and yet too prudent to omit entirely the customary precautions. The principal reason of the marked difference which the two legitimate proprietors of the banquet made in the receptions of their guests was to be explained by the entire difference which existed in their respective appearances. While the exterior of the naturalist was decidedly pacific, not to say abstracted, that of the newcomer was distinguished by an air of vigor, and a front and step which it would not have been difficult to have at once pronounced to be military. He wore a forge cap of fine blue cloth, from which depended a soiled tassel in gold, and which was nearly buried in a mass of exuberant, curling, jet-black hair. Around his throat he had negligently fastened a stock of black silk. His body was enveloped in a hunting shirt of dark green, trimmed with the yellow fringes and ornaments that were sometimes seen among the border troops of the Confederacy. Beneath this, however, were visible the collar and lapels of a jacket similar in color and cloth to the cap. His lower limbs were protected by buckskin leggings, and his feet by the ordinary Indian moccasins. A richly ornamented and exceedingly dangerous straight dirk was stuck in a sash of red silk network. Another girdle, or rather belt, of uncolored leather contained a pair of the smallest sized pistols in holsters nicely made to fit, and across his shoulder was thrown a short, heavy military rifle, its horn and pouch occupying the usual places beneath his arms. At his back he bore a knapsack, marked by the well-known initials that have since gained for the government of the United States the good-humored and quaint appellation of Uncle Sam. "'I come in amity,' the stranger said, like one too much accustomed to the sight of arms, to be startled at the ludicrously belligerent attitude which Dr. Battius had seen fit to assume. "'I come as a friend, and am one whose pursuits and wishes will not at all interfere with your own. Hark ye, stranger!' said Paul Hover bluntly. Do you understand lining a bee from this open place into a wood distant perhaps a dozen miles? The bee is a bird I have never been compelled to seek, returned the other laughing, though I have, too, been something of a fowler in my time. I thought as much, exclaimed Paul, thrusting forth his hand frankly, and with the true freedom of manner that marks an American border. Let us cross our fingers. You and I will never quarrel about the comb, since you set so little store by the honey. And now, if your stomach has an empty corner, and you know how to relish a genuine dewdrop when it falls into your very mouth, there lies the exact morsel to put into it. Try it, stranger, and having tried it, if you don't call it as snug as a fit as you may have since, how long are you from the settlement's prey? Tis many weeks, and I fear it may be you have many more before I can return. I will, however, gladly profit by your invitation for I have fasted since the rising of yesterday's sun, and I know too well the merits of a bison's bump to reject the food. Ah, you're acquainted with the dish? Well, therein you have the advantage of me in setting out, though I think I may say we could now start on equal ground. I should be the happiest fellow between Kentucky and the Rocky Mountains if I had a snug cabin near some old wood that was filled with hollow trees, just such a hump every day as that of for dinner, a load of fresh straw for hives, and little L little what demanded the stranger evidently amused with the communicative and frank disposition of the bee hunter something that i shall have one day and which concerns nobody so much as myself returned paul picking the flint of his rifle and beginning very cavalierly to whistle an air well known in the waters of the mississippi during this preliminary discourse the stranger had taken his seat by the side of the hump and was already making a serious inroad on its relics dr battius however watched his movements with a jealousy still more striking than the cordial reception which the open-hearted Paul had just exhibited. But the doubts, or rather apprehensions, of the naturalist were of a character altogether different from the confidence of the bee-hunter. He had been struck with the stranger's using the legitimate instead of the perverted name of the animal off which he was making his repast, and as he had been among the foremost himself to profit by the removal of the impediments which the policy of Spain had placed in the way of all explorers, of her transatlantic dominions, 
whether bent on the purposes of commerce, or, like himself, on the more laudable pursuits of science. He had a sufficiency of everyday philosophy to feel that the same motives which had so powerfully urged himself to his present undertaking might produce a like result on the mind of some other student of nature. Here, then, was the prospect of an alarming rivalry, which bade fair to strip him of at least a moiety of the just rewards of all his labors, privations, and dangers. Under these views of his character, therefore, it is not at all surprising that the native meekness of the naturalist disposition was a little disturbed, and that he watched the proceedings of the other with such a degree of vigilance as he believed best suited to detect his sinister designs. "'This is truly a delicious repast,' observed the unconscious young stranger, for both young and handsome he was fairly entitled to be considered. Either hunger has given a peculiar relish to the viand, or the bison may lay claim to the finest of the ox family. Naturalists, sir, are apt, when they speak familiarly, to give the cow the credit of the genus, said Dr. Battius, swelling with secret distrust, and clearing his throat before speaking, much in the manner that a duelist examines the point of the weapon he is about to plunge into the body of his foe. The figure is more perfect, as the boss, meaning the ox, is unable to perpetuate his kind, and the boss, in its most extended meaning, or vaca, is altogether the nobler animal of the two. The doctor uttered this opinion with a certain air, that he intended should express his readiness to come at once to any of the numerous points of difference which he doubted not existed between them. And he now awaited the blow of his antagonist, intending that his next thrust should be still more vigorous. But the young stranger appeared much better disposed to partake of the good cheer, with which he had been so providentially provided, than to take up the cudgels of argument on this or on any other of the knotty points which are so apt to furnish the lovers of science with the materials of a mental joust. "'I dare say you are very right, sir,' he replied, with a most provoking indifference to the importance of the points he conceded. "'I dare say you are quite right, and that vaca would have been the better word.' "'Pardon me, sir, you are giving a very wrong construction to my language, if you suppose I include, without many and particular qualifications, the Bibulus Americanus, in the family of the Vaca. For, as you well know, sir, or as I presume, I should say, doctor, you have the medical diploma, no doubt.' "'You give me credit for an honor I cannot claim,' interrupted the other. "'An undergraduate? Or perhaps your degrees have been taken in some other of the liberal sciences?' "'Still wrong, I do assure you.' Surely, young man, you have not entered on this important, I may say this awful service, without some evidence of your fitness for the task, some commission by which you can assert an authority to proceed, or by which you may claim an affinity and a communion with your fellow workers in the same beneficent pursuits. I know not by what means or for what purposes you have made yourself master of my objects, exclaimed the youth, reddening and rising with a quickness, which manifested how little he regarded the grosser appetites when a subject nearer his heart was approached. Still, sir, your language is incomprehensible. That pursuit, which in another might perhaps be justly called beneficent, is in me a dear and cherished duty. Though why a commission should be demanded or needed is, I confess, no less a subject of surprise. It is customary to be provided with such a document, returned the doctor gravely, and on all suitable occasions to produce it, in order that congenial and friendly minds may, at once, reject unworthy suspicions, and, stepping over what may be called the elements of discourse, come at once to those points which are desiderata to both. It is a strange request, the youth muttered, turning his frowning eye from one to the other, as if examining the characters of his companions, with a view to weigh their physical powers. Then, putting his hand into his bosom, he drew forth a small box, and extending it with an air of dignity towards the doctor, he continued, "'You will find by this, sir, that I have some right to travel in a country which is now the property of the American states.' "'What have we here?' exclaimed the naturalist, opening the folds of a large parchment. "'Why, this is the sign manual of the philosopher Jefferson, the seal of state, countersigned by the minister of war. Why, this is a commission creating Duncan Uncas Middleton a captain of artillery.' "'Of whom, of whom?' repeated the trapper, who had sat regarding the stranger during the whole discourse, with eyes that seemed greedily to devour each liniment. "'How is the name? Did you call him Uncas? Uncas? Was it Uncas?' "'Such is my name,' returned the youth, a little haughtily. "'It is the appellation of a native chief, that both my uncle and myself bear with pride, 
for it is the memorial of an important service done my family by a warrior in the old wars of the provinces. Uncas, did he call him Uncas? repeated the trapper, approaching the youth and parting the dark curls which clustered over his brow without the slightest resistance on the part of their wondering owner. Ah, my eyes are old and not so keen as when I was a warrior myself, but I can see the look of the father and the son. I saw it when he first came nigh but not so many things have since passed before my falling sight that I could not name the place where I had met his likeness. Tell me, lad, by what name is your father known? He was an officer of the States in the War of the Revolution, of my own name, of course. My mother's brother was called Duncan Uncas Hayward. Still Uncas, still Uncas, echoed the other, trembling with eagerness. And his father? Was called the same, without the appellation of the native chief, it was to him and to my grandmother that the service of which I have just spoken was rendered. I knowed it, I knowed it, shouted the old man in his tremulous voice, his rigid features working powerfully, as if the names of the other mentioned awakened some long dormant emotions, connected with the events of an interior age. I knowed it, son or grandson, it is all the same. It is the blood, and tis the look. Tell me, is he they call Duncan, without the Uncas, is he living? The young man shook his head sorrowfully, as if he replied in the negative. He died full of days and of honors, beloved, happy, and bestowing happiness. Full of days? repeated the trapper, looking down at his own meager but still muscular hands. Ah, he lived in the settlements, and was wise only after their fashions. But you have often seen him, and you have heard him discourse of Uncas and of the wilderness. Often! He was then an officer of the king, but when the war took place between the crown and her colonies, my grandfather did not forget his birthplace, but threw off the empty allegiance of names, and was true to his proper country. He fought on the side of liberty. There was a reason in it, and what is better, there was nature. Come, sit ye down beside me, lad, sit ye down, and tell me of what your grandfather used to speak when his mind dwelt on the wonders of the wilderness. The youth smiled no less at the importunity than at the interest manifested by the old man. But as he found there was no longer the least appearance of any violence being contemplated, he unhesitatingly complied. "'Give it all to the trapper by rule and by figures of speech,' said Paul, very coolly taking his seat on the other side of the young soldier. "'It is the fashion of old age to relish these ancient traditions, and for that matter I can say that I don't dislike to listen to them myself.' Middleton smiled again and perhaps with a slight air of derision. But, good-naturedly turning to the trapper, he continued, It is a long and might prove a painful story. Bloodshed and all the horrors of Indian cruelty and of Indian warfare are fearfully mingled in the narrative. I give it all to us, stranger, continued Paul. We are used to these matters in Kentuck, and I must say I think a story none of the worse for having a few scalps in it. But he told you of Uncas, did he? resumed the trapper, without regarding the slight interruptions of the bee-hunter, and which amounted to no more than a sort of by-play. "'And what thought he, and said he, of the lad in his parlour, with the comforts and ease of the settlements at his elbow?' "'I doubt not he used a language similar to that he would have adopted in the woods, and had he stood face to face with his friend. Did he call the savage his friend, the poor naked painted warrior? He was not too proud then to call the Indian his friend.' He even boasted of the connection, and, as you have already heard, bestowed a name on his firstborn, which is likely to be handed down as an heirloom among the rest of his descendants. It was well done, like a man, ay, and like a Christian, too. He used to say that Delaware was swift of foot. Did he remember that? As the antelope. Indeed, he often spoke of him by the appellation of Le Cerf Agile, a name he had obtained by his activity. And bold and fearless lad, continued the trapper, looking up into the eyes of his companion, with a wistfulness that bespoke the delight he received in listening to the praises of one whom it was so very evident he had once tenderly loved. Brave as a blooded hound, without fear, he always quoted Uncas and his father, who from his wisdom was called the great serpent, as models of heroism and constancy. He did them justice, he did them justice. Truer men were not to be found in tribe or nation, be their skins of what color they might. I see your grandfather was just, and did his duty, too, by his offspring. 
"'Twas a perilous time he had of it, among them hills, and nobly did he play his own part. Tell me, lad, or officer, I should say, since officer you be, was this all? Certainly not. It was, as I have said, a fearful tale, full of moving incidents and memories both of my grandfather and of my grandmother. Ah! exclaimed the trapper, tossing a hand into the air, as his whole countenance lighted with the recollections the name revived. They called her Alice, Elise or Alice, tis all the same. A laughing, playful child she was, when happy and tender and weeping in her misery. Her hair was shining and yellow as the coat of the young fawn, and her skin clearer than the purest water that drips from the rock. Well do I remember her. I remember her right well. The lip of the youth slightly curled, and he regarded the old man with an expression which might easily have been construed into a declaration that such were not his own recollections of his venerable and revered ancestor, though it would seem he did not think it necessary to say as much in words. He was content to answer. They both retain impressions of the dangers they had passed, by far too vivid easily to lose the recollection of any of their fellow actors. The trapper looked aside, and seemed to struggle with some deeply innate feeling. Then, turning again towards his companion, though his honest eyes no longer dwelt with the same open interest as before, on the countenance of the other, he continued, Did he tell you of them all? Were they all redskins but himself and the daughters of Monroe? No. There was a white man associated with the Delawares, a scout of the English army, but a native of the provinces. A drunken, worthless vagabond like most of his color who harbor with the savages, I warrant you. Old man, your gray hairs should caution you against slander. The man I speak of was of great simplicity of mind, but of sterling worth. Unlike most of those who live a border life, he united the better instead of the worse qualities of the two people. He was a man endowed with the choicest and perhaps rarest gift of nature, that of distinguishing good from evil. His virtues were those of simplicity, because such were the fruits of his habits, as were indeed his very prejudices. In courage he was the equal of his red associates, in warlike skill being better instructed their superior. In short, he was a noble shoot from the stock of human nature, which never could attain its proper elevation and importance for no other reason than because it grew in the forest. Such, old hunter, were the very words of my grandfather when speaking of the man you imagined so worthless. The eyes of the trapper had sunk to the earth as the stranger delivered his character in the ardent tones of generous youth. He played with the ears of his hound, fingered his own rustic garment, and opened and shut the pan of his rifle, with hands that trembled in a manner that would have implied their total unfitness to wield the weapon. When the other had concluded, he hoarsely added, your grandfather didn't then entirely forget the white man. So far from that, there are already three among us, who have also names derived from that scout. A name, did you say? exclaimed the old man, starting. What, the name of the solitary, unlearned hunter? To the great, and the rich, and the honored, and what is better still? The just, do they bear his very actual name? It is borne by my brother and by two of my cousins, whatever may be their titles, to be described by the terms you have mentioned. Do you mean the actual name itself, spelled with the very same letters beginning with an N and ending with an L? Exactly the same, the youth smilingly replied. No, no, we have forgotten nothing that was his. I have at this moment a dog brushing a deer, not far from this, who has come of a hound that very scout sent as a present after his friends and which was of the stock he always used himself. A truer breed in those in foot is not to be found in the wide union. Hector, said the old man, struggling to conquer an emotion that nearly suffocated him, and speaking to his hound in the sort of tones he would have used to a child. Do you hear that, pup? Your can of blood are in the prairies. A name, it is wonderful, very wonderful. Nature could endure no more. Overcome by a flood of unusual and extraordinary sensations, and stimulated by tender and long-dormant recollections, strangely and unexpectedly revived, the old man had just self-command enough to add, in a voice that was hollow and unnatural, through the efforts he made to command it. Boy, I am that scout. A warrior once, a miserable trapper now. 
when the tears broke over his wasted cheeks, out of fountains that had long been dried, and, sinking his face between his knees, he covered it decently with his buckskin garment, and sobbed aloud. The spectacle produced correspondent emotions in his companions. Paul Hover had actually swallowed each syllable of the discourse, as they fell alternately from the different speakers, his feelings keeping equal pace with the increasing interest of the scene. Unused to such strange sensations, he was turning his face on every side of him to avoid he knew not what, until he saw the tears and heard the sobs of the old man, when he sprang to his feet and grappling his guest fiercely by the throat, he demanded by what authority he had made his good companion weep. A flash of recollection crossing his brain at the same instant, he released his hold, and stretching forth an arm in the very wantonness of gratification, he seized the doctor by the hair, which instantly revealed its artificial formation by cleaving to his hand, leaving the white and shining pall of the naturalist with a covering no warmer than the skin. "'What think you of that, Mr. Buggather? he rather shouted than cried. "'Is not this a strange bee to line into his hole?' "'Tis remarkable, wonderful, edifying,' returned the lover of nature, good-humouredly recovering his wig, with twinkling eyes and a husky voice. "'Tis rare and commendable, though I doubt not in the exact order of causes and effects.' With this sudden outbreaking, however, the commotion instantly subsided, the three spectators clustering around the trapper with a species of awe, at beholding the tears of one so aged. "'It must be so, or how could he be so familiar with a history that is little known beyond my own family?' At length the youth observed, not ashamed to acknowledge how much he had been affected by unequivocally drying his own eyes. "'True,' echoed Paul, "'if you want any more evidence, I will swear to it. I know every word of it myself to be true as the gospel.' "'And yet we had long supposed him dead,' continued the soldier. "'My grandfather had filled his days with honor, and he had believed himself the junior of the two. "'It is not often that youth has the opportunity of thus looking down on the weakness of age,' the trapper observed, raising his head, and looking around him with composure and dignity. "'That I am still here, young man, is the pleasure of the Lord, who has spared me until I have seen fourscore long and laborious years for his own secret ends. That I am the man, I say, you need not doubt, for why should I go to my grave with so cheap a lie in my mouth? I do not hesitate to believe. I only marvel that it should be so. But why do I find you, venerable and excellent friend of my parents, in these wastes, so far from the comforts and safety of the lower country?' I have come into these plains to escape the sound of the axe, for here surely the chopper can never follow, but I may put the like question to yourself. Are you of the party which the States have sent into their new purchase, to look after the nature of the bargain they have made? I am not. Lewis is making his way up the river, some hundreds of miles from this. I come on a private adventure. Though it is no cause of wonder that a man whose strength and eyes have failed him as a hunter should be seen nigh the haunts of the beaver, using a trap instead of a rifle, it is strange that one so young and prosperous, and bearing the commission of the great father, should be moving among the prairies without even a camp cowerman to do his biddings. You would think my reasons sufficient did you know them, as know them you shall if you are disposed to listen to my story. I think you all are honest, and men who would rather aid than betray unbent unworthy object. Come, then, and tell us at your leisure, said the trapper, seating himself and beckoning to the youth to follow his example. The latter willingly complied, and after Paul and the doctor had disposed of themselves to their several likings, the newcomer entered into a narrative of the singular reasons which had led him so far into the deserts. End of chapter 10「ファイブアウトオブアイシックスアウトオブアイシックスアウトオブアイシックスアウトオブアイシックスアウトオブアイシックスアウトオブアイシイン・ミンタイン・ディ・インダストリアス・エン・イレクレイマブル・アワーズ・コンティニューデ・レイバーズ
The sun, which had been struggling through such masses of vapor throughout the day, fell slowly in a streak of clear sky, and thence sunk gloriously into the gloomy waste, as he is wont to settle into the waters of the ocean. The vast herds which had been grazing among the wild pastures of the prairies gradually disappeared, and the endless flocks of aquatic birds that were pursuing their customary annual journey from the virgin lakes of the north towards the Gulf of Mexico ceased to fan that air, which had now become loaded with dew and vapor. In short, the shadows of night fell upon the rock, adding the mantle of darkness to the other dreary accompaniments of the place. As the light began to fail, Esther collected her younger children at her side, and placing herself on a projecting point of her insulated fortress, she sat patiently awaiting the return of the hunters. Ellen Wade was at no great distance, seeming to keep a little aloof from the anxious circle, as if willing to mark the distinction which existed in their characters. "'Your uncle is, and always will be, a dull calculator now,' observed the mother, after a long pause in a conversation that had turned on the labors of the day. "'A lazy hand of figures and foreknowledge is that said Ishmael Bush. Here he sat lolloping about the rock from light till noon, doing nothing but scheme, 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 with seven as noble boys at his elbows as woman ever gave to man, and what's the upshot? Why, night is setting in, and his needful work not yet ended.' "'Is it not prudent, certainly, aunt?' Ellen replied, with a vacancy in her air that proved how little she knew what she was saying. "'And is it setting a very bad example to his sons?' "'Hoity-toity, girl! Who has reared you up as a judge over your elders? I, and your betters, too. I should like to see the man on the whole frontier who sets a more honest example to his children than this same Ishmael Bush. Show me, if you can, Miss Faultfinder, but not fault mender, a set of boys who will, on occasion, sooner chop a piece of logging and dress it for the crop than my own children, though I say it myself, who perhaps should be silent, or a cradler that knows better how to lead a gang of hands through the field of wheat, leaving a cleaner stubble in his track than my own good man. Then, as a father, he is as generous as a lord, for his sons have only to name the spot where they would like to pitch, and he gives them a deed of the plantation, and no charge for papers is ever made. As the wife of the squatter concluded, she raised a hollow, taunting laugh, and was echoed from the mouths of several juvenile imitators, whom she was training to a life as shiftless and lawless as her own, but which, notwithstanding its uncertainty, was not without its secret charms. "'Hola, old Esther!' shouted the well-known voice of her husband from the plain beneath. Are you keeping your junkets, while we are finding you in venison and buffalo beef? Come down, come down, old girl, with all your young, and lend us a hand to carry up the meat. Why, what frolic you are in, woman? Come down, come down, for the boys are at hand, and we have work here for double your number. Ishmael might have spared his lungs more than a moiety of the effort they were compelled to make in order that he should be heard. He had hardly uttered the name of his wife before the whole of the crouching circle rose in a body, and tumbling over each other, they precipitated themselves down the dangerous passes of the rock with ungovernable impatience. Esther followed the young fry with a more measured gait, nor did Ellen deem it wise or rather discreet to remain behind. Consequently, the whole were soon assembled at the base of the citadel on the open plain. Here the squatter was found, staggering under the weight of a fine, fat buck, attended by one or two of his younger sons. Abram quickly appeared, and before many minutes had elapsed, most of the hunters dropped in, singly and in pairs, each man bringing with him some fruits of his prowess in the field. "'The plain is free from redskins to-night, at least,' said Ishmael, after the bustle of reception had little subsided, "'for I have scoured the prairie for many long miles on my own feet.' and I call myself a judge of the print of an Indian moccasin. So, old woman, you can give us a few steaks of the venison, and then we will sleep on the day's work. I'll not swear that there are no savages near us, said Abram. I, too, know something of the trail of a redskin, and unless my eyes have lost some of their sight, I would swear, boldly, that there are Indians at hand. But wait till Asa comes in. He passes the spot where I found the marks, and the boy knows something of such matters, too. I, the boy, knows too much of many things, returned Ishmael gloomily. It would be better for him when he thinks he knows less. But what matters it, Hetty, if all the Sioux tribes west of the big river are within a mile of us, 
They will find it no easy matter to scale this rock in the teeth of ten bold men. Calm twelve at once, Ishmael, calm twelve, cried his termagant assistant, for if your moth-gathering, bug-hunting friend can be counted a man, I beg you will set me down as two. I will not turn my back to him with the rifle or the shotgun, and for courage, the yearling heifer, that them skulking devils the Teton stole, was the biggest coward amongst us all, and after her came the driveling doctor. Ah, Ishmael, you rarely attempt a regular trade, but you come out the loser, and this man, I reckon, is the hardest bargain among them all. Would you think it? The fellow ordered me a blister around my mouth, because I complained of a pain in the foot. It is a pity, Esther, the husband coolly answered, that you did not take it. I reckon it would have done considerable good. But, boys, if it should turn out as Abram thinks, that there are Indians near us, we may have to scamper up the rock, and lose our suppers after all. Therefore we will make sure of the game, and talk over the performances of the doctor when we have nothing better to do. The hint was taken, and in a few minutes the exposed situation in which the family was collected was exchanged for the more secure elevation of the rock. Here Esther busied herself, working and scolding with equal industry, until the repast was prepared when she summoned her husband to his meal in a voice as sonorous as that with which the emin reminds the faithful of a more important duty. When each had assumed his proper and customary place around the smoking viands, the squatters set the example by beginning to partake of a delicious venison steak, prepared like the hump of the bison, with a skill that rather increased than concealed its natural properties. A painter would gladly have seized the moment, to transfer the wild and characteristic scene to the canvas. The reader will remember that the citadel of Ishmael stood insulated, lofty, ragged, and nearly inaccessible. A bright flashing fire that was burning on the center of its summit, and around which the busy group was clustered, lent it the appearance of some tall pharaohs placed in the center of the deserts, to light such adventures as wandered through their broad waste. The flashing flame gleamed from one sunburnt countenance to another, exhibiting every variety of expression, from the juvenile simplicity of the children, mingled as it was with a shade of the wildness peculiar to their semi-barbarous lives, to the dull and immovable apathy that dwelt on the features of the squatter when unexcited. Occasionally a gust of wind would fan the embers, and as a brighter light shot upwards, the little solitary tent was seen as it were suspended in the gloom of the upper air. All beyond was enveloped, as usual at that hour, in an impenetrable body of darkness. "'It is unaccountable that Asa should choose to be out of the way at such a time as this,' Esther pettishly observed. "'When all is finished and two rights, we shall have the boy coming up, grumbling for his meal, and hungry as a bear after his winter's nap. His stomach is as true as the best clock in Kentucky, and seldom wants winding up to tell the time, whether of day or night. A desperate eater is Asa, when a-hungered by a little work." Ishmael looked sternly around the circle of his silent sons, as if to see whether there was any among them which presumed to say aught in favor of the absent delinquent. But now, when no exciting causes existed to arouse their slumbering tempers, it seemed to be too great an effort to enter on the defense of their rebellious brother. Abram, however, who, since the pacification, either felt or affected to feel a more generous interest in his late adversary, saw fit to express an anxiety to which the others were strangers. "'It will be well if the boy has escaped the Tetons,' he muttered. "'I should be sorry to have Asa, who is one of the stoutest of our party, both in heart and hand, fall into the power of the red devils. Look to yourself, Abram, and spare your breath, if you can use it only to frighten the woman and her huddling girls. You have whitened the face of Ellen Wade already. Who looks as pale as if she was staring today at the very Indians you name, when I was forced to speak to her through the rifle, because I couldn't reach her ears with my tongue? How was it, Nell? You have never given the reason of your deafness." The color of Ellen's cheek changed as suddenly as the squatter's piece had flashed on the occasion to which he alluded, the burning glow suffusing her features, until it even mantled her throat with its fine, healthful tinge. She hung her head abashed, but did not seem to think it necessary to reply. Ishmael, too sluggish to pursue the subject, or content with the appointed allusion he had just made, rose from his seat on the rock, and stretching his heavy frame, like a well-fed and fattened ox, 
he announced his intention to sleep. Among a race who lived chiefly for the indulgence of the natural wants, such a declaration could not fail of meeting with sympathetic dispositions. One after another disappeared, each seeking his or her rude dormitory, and before many minutes, Esther, who by this time had scolded the younger fry to sleep, found herself, if we accept the usual watchman below, in solitary possession of the naked rock. Whatever less valuable fruits had been produced in this uneducated woman by her migratory habits, the great principle of female nature was too deeply rooted ever to be entirely eradicated. Of a powerful, not to say fierce, temperament, her passions were violent and difficult to be smothered. But, however, she might and did abuse the accidental prerogatives of her situation. Love for her offspring, while it often slumbered, could never be said to become extinct. She liked not the protracted absence of Asa, too fearless herself to have hesitated an instant on her own account about crossing the dark abyss into which she now sat looking with longing eyes, her busy imagination, in obedience to this inextinguishable sentiment, began to conjure nameless evils on account of her son. It might be true, as Abram had hinted, that he had become a captive to some of the tribes who were hunting the buffalo in that vicinity or even a still more dreadful calamity might have befallen. So thought the mother, while silence and darkness lent their aid to the secret impulses of nature. Agitated by these reflections, which put sleep at defiance, Esther continued at her post, listening with that sort of acuteness which is termed instinct in the animals a few degrees below her in the scale of intelligence, for any of those noises which might indicate the approach of footsteps. At length, her wishes had an appearance of being realized, for the long-desired sounds were distinctly audible, and presently she distinguished the dim form of a man at the base of the rock. "'Now, Asa, richly, do you deserve to be left with an earthen bed this blessed night?' The woman began to mutter, with a revolution in her feelings, that will not be surprising to those who have made the contradictions that give variety to the human character a study. "'And a hard one, I have a mind it shall be. Why, Abner, Abner, you, Abner, do you sleep?' Let me not see you dare to open the hole till I get down. I will know who it is that wishes to disturb a peaceable, I, and an honest family, too, at such a time in the night as this. Woman! exclaimed a voice that intended to bluster while the speaker was manifestly a little apprehensive of the consequences. Woman! I forbid you on pain of the law to project any of your infernal missiles. I am a citizen and a freeholder and a graduate of two universities, and I stand upon my rights. Beware of malice propense, of chance medley, and of manslaughter. It is I, your amicus, a friend, an inmate, I, Dr. Obed Badius. Who? demanded Esther, in a voice that nearly refused to convey her words to the ears of the anxious listener beneath. Did you say it was not Asa? Nay, I am neither Asa, nor Absalom, nor any of the Hebrew princes, but Obed, the root and stock of them all. Have I not said, woman, that you keep one in attendance who is entitled to a peaceable as well as an honorable mission? Do you take me for an animal of the class amphibia, and that I can play with my lungs as a blacksmith does with his bellows? The naturalist might have expanded his breath much longer, without producing any desirable result, had Esser been his only auditor. Disappointed and alarmed, the woman had already sought her pallet, and was preparing, with a sort of desperate indifference, to compose herself to sleep. Abner, the sentinel below, however, had been aroused from an exceedingly equivocal situation by the outcry, and as he had now regained sufficient consciousness to recognize the voice of the physician, the latter was admitted with the least possible delay. Dr. Battius bustled through the narrow entrance with an air of singular impatience, and was already beginning to mount the difficult ascent, when catching a view of the porter, he paused to observe with an air that he intended should be impressively admonitory. Abner, there are dangerous symptoms of solemnity about thee. It is sufficiently exhibited in a tendency to hiation. It may prove dangerous not only to yourself, but to all thy father's family. You never made a greater mistake, doctor, returned the youth, gaping like an indolent lion. I haven't a symptom, as you call it, about any part of me. And as to father and the children, I reckon the smallpox and the measles have been thoroughly through the breed these many months ago. Content with his brief admonition, the naturalist had surmounted half the difficulties of the ascent before the deliberate Abner ended his justification. On the summit, Obed fully expected to encounter Esther, 
of whose linguacious powers he had too often been furnished with the most sinister reproofs, and of which he stood in all too solitary to covet a repetition of the attacks. The reader can foresee that he was to be agreeably disappointed, treading lightly and looking timidly over his shoulder, as if he apprehended a shower of something even more formidable than words, the doctor proceeded to the place which had been allocated to himself in the general disposition of the dormitories. Instead of sleeping, the worthy naturalist sat ruminating over what he had seen and heard that day, until the tossing and mutterings which proceeded from the cabin of Esther, who was his nearest neighbor, advertised him of the wakeful situation of his inmate. Perceiving the necessity of doing something to disarm this female Cerberus before his own purpose could be accomplished, the doctor, reluctant as he was to encounter her tongue, found himself compelled to invite a colloquial communication. "'You appear not to sleep, my very kind and worthy Mrs. Bush,' he said, determined to commence his applications with a plaster that was usually found to adhere. "'You appear to rest badly, my excellent hostess. Can I administer to your ailings?' "'What would you give me, man?' grumbled Esther. "'A blister to make me sleep? Say rather a cataplasm. But if you are in pain, here are some cordial drops, which, taken in a glass of my own cognac, will give you rest, if I know aught of the materia medica.' The doctor, as he very well knew, had assailed Esther on her weak side, and as he doubted not of the acceptable quality of his prescription, he sat himself at work, without unnecessary delay, to prepare it. When he made his offering, it was received in a snappish and threatening manner, but swallowed with a facility that sufficiently proclaimed how much it was relished. The woman muttered her thanks, and her leech reseated himself in silence to await the operation of the dose. In less than half an hour the breathing of Esther became so profound, and as the doctor himself might have termed it, so very abstracted, that had he not known how easy it was to ascribe this new instance of somnolency to the powerful dose of opium with which he had garnished the brandy, he might have seen reason to distrust his own prescription. With the sleep of the restless woman, the stillness became profound and general. Then Dr. Battius saw fit to arise with the silence and caution of the midnight robber, and to steal out of his own cabin, or rather kennel, for it deserved no better name, towards the adjoining dormitories. Here he took time to assure himself that all his neighbors were buried in deep sleep. Once advised of this important fact, he hesitated no longer, but commenced the difficult ascent which led to the upper pinnacle of the rock. His advance, though abundantly guarded, was not entirely noiseless, but while he was felicitating himself on having successfully effected his object, and he was in the very act of placing his foot on the highest ledge, a hand was laid upon the skirts of his coat, which as effectually put an end to his advance, as if the gigantic strength of Ishmael himself had pinned him to the earth. "'Is there sickness in a tent?' whispered a soft voice in his very ear. "'That Dr. Battius has called to visit at such an hour?' So soon as the heart of the naturalist had returned from its hasty expedition into his throat, as one less skilled than Dr. Battius in the formation of the animal would have been apt to have accounted for the extraordinary sensation with which he received this unlooked-for interruption, he found resolution to reply, using as much in terror as in prudence the same precaution in the indulgence of his voice. My worthy Nelly, I am greatly rejoiced to find it is no other than thee. Shush, child, shush! Should Ismail gain the knowledge of our plans, he would not hesitate to cast us both from this rock upon the plain beneath. Shush, Nelly, shush. As the doctor delivered his injunctions between the intervals of his ascent, by the time they were concluded, both he and his auditor gained the upper level. And now, Dr. Battius, the girl gravely demanded, may I know the reason why you have run so great a risk of flying from this place, without wings, and at the certain expense of your neck? Nothing shall be concealed from thee, worthy and trusty Nelly, but you are certain that Ishmael will not awake? No fear of him. He will sleep until the sun scorches his eyelids. The danger is from my aunt. Esther sleepeth, the doctor sententiously replied. Ellen, you have been watching on this rock to-day? I was ordered to do so. And you have seen the bison, and the antelope, and the wolf, and the deer, as usual? Animals of the orders, pecora, bellule, and ferre. I have seen the creatures you name in English, but I know nothing of the Indian languages. There is still an order that I have not named, which you have also seen. The primates, is it not true? I cannot say. I know no animal by that name. Nay, Ellen, you confer with a friend, 
of the genus Homo child. Whatever else I may have had in view, I have not seen the Vespertilio Aribi. Hush, Nelly! Thy vivacity will betray us. Tell me, girl, have you not seen certain bipeds called men, wandering about the prairies? Surely my uncle and his sons have been hunting the buffalo since the sun began to fall. I must speak in the vernacular to be comprehended. Ellen, I would say of this species, Kentucky. Though Ellen reddened like the rose, her blushes were concealed by the darkness. She hesitated an instant, and then summoned sufficient spirit to say decidedly, If you wish to speak in parables, Dr. Battius, you must find another listener. Put your questions plainly in English, and I will answer them honestly in the same tongue. I have been journeying in this desert, as thou knowest, Nelly, in quest of animals that have been hidden from the eyes of science until now. Among others, I have discovered a primates of the genus Homo, species Kentucky, which I term Paul. Shush! For the sake of mercy, said Owen, speak lower, doctor, or we shall be ruined. Hover, by profession a collector of the apes or bee, continued the other. Do I use the vernacular now? Am I understood? Perfectly, perfectly, returned the girl, breathing with difficulty in her surprise. But what of him? Did he tell you to mount this rock? He knows nothing himself for the oath I gave my uncle has shut my mouth. Ay, but there is one that has taken no oath, who has revealed all. I would that the mantle which is wrapped around the mysteries of nature were as effectually withdrawn from its hidden treasures. Ellen, Ellen, the man with whom I have unwittingly formed a compactum or agreement is sadly forgetful of the obligations of honesty. Thy uncle, child. You mean Ishmael Bush, my father's brother's widow's husband? returned the offended girl a little proudly. Indeed, indeed, it is cruel to reproach me with a tie that chance has formed, and which I would rejoice so much to break forever. The humble Ellen could utter no more, but sinking on a projection of the rock, she began to sob in a manner that rendered their situation doubly critical. The doctor muttered a few words which he intended as an apologetic explanation, but before he had time to complete his labored vindication, she rose and said with decision, I did not come here to pass my time in foolish tears, nor you to try to stop them. What then has brought you hither? I must see the inmate of that tent. You know what it contains? I am taught to believe I do, and I bear a letter which I must deliver with my own hands. If the animal prove a quadruped, Ishmael is a true man. If a biped, fledged or unfledged, I care not, he is false in our compactum at an end. Ellen made a sign for the doctor to remain where he was and to be silent. She then glided into the tent, where she continued many minutes, that proved exceedingly weary and anxious to the expectant without, but the instant she returned, she took him by the arm, and together they entered beneath the folds of the mysterious cloth. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of the Prairie by James Finnamore Cooper this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. Pray God, the Duke of York excuse himself. King Henry the Sixth. The mustering of the borderers on the following morning was silent, sullen, and gloomy. The repast of that hour was wanting in the inharmonious accompaniment with which Esther ordinarily enlivened their meals for the effects of the powerful opiate that doctor had administered still muddled her intellects. The young men brooded over the absence of their elder brother, and the brows of Ishmael himself were knit as he cast his scowling eyes from one to the other like a man preparing to meet and to repel an expected assault on his authority. In the midst of this family distrust, Ellen and her midnight confederate, the naturalist, took their usual places among the children without awakening suspicion or exciting comment. The only apparent fruits of the adventure in which they had been engaged were occasional uplifting of the eyes on the part of the doctor, which were mistaken by the observers for some of his scientific contemplations of the heavens, but which, in reality, were no other than furtive glances at the fluttering walls of the prescribed tent. At length the squatter, who had waited in vain for some more decided manifestation of the expected rising among his sons, resolved to make a demonstration of his own intentions. "'Assa shall account to me for this undutiful conduct,' he observed. 
Here has the lifelong night gone by, and he out lying on the prairie, when his hand and his rifle might have both been wanted in a brush with the Sioux, for any right he had to know the contrary. "'Spare your breath, good man,' retorted his wife. "'Be saving of your breath, for you may have to call long enough for the boy before he will answer.' "'It are a fact that some men be so womanish as to let the young master the old. But you, old Esther, should know better than to think such will ever be the nature of things in the family of Ishmael Bush.' "'Ah, you are a Hector with the boys, when need calls. I know it well, Ishmael, and one of your sons have you driven from you by your temper, and that too at a time when he is most wanted.' "'Father,' said Abner, whose sluggish nature had gradually been stimulating itself to the exertion of taking so bold a stand, the boys and I have pretty generally concluded to go out on the search of Asa. We are disagreeable about his camping on the prairie, instead of coming into his own bed, as we all know he would like to do. Shah, muttered Abram, the boy has killed a buck, or perhaps a buffalo, and he is sleeping by the carcass to keep off the wolves till day. We shall soon see him, or hear him, bawling for help to bring in his load. Tis little help that a son of mine will call for to shoulder a buck or to quarter your wild beef, returned the mother and you, Abram, to say so uncertain a thing. You who said yourself that the redskins have been prowling around this place no later than the yesterday. I, exclaimed her brother, hastily, as if anxious to retract an error. I said it then, and I say it now, and so you will find it to be. The Tetons are in our neighborhood, and happy will prove for the boy if he is well shut of them. It seems to me said Dr. Battius, speaking with the sort of deliberation and dignity one is apt to use after having thoroughly ripened his opinions by sufficient reflection. It seems to me a man but little skilled in the signs and tokens of Indian warfare, especially as practiced in these remote plains, but one who I may say without vanity has some insight into the mysteries of nature. It seems then to me thus humbly qualified that when doubts exist in a matter of moment, it would always be the wisest course to appease them. "'No more of your doctoring for me,' cried the grum Esser. "'No more of your quiddities in a healthy family, say I. Here was I doing well, only a little out of sorts with over-instructing the young, and you douse me with a drug that hangs about my tongue like a pound weight on a hummingbird's wing.' "'Is the medicine out?' dryly demanded Ishmael. It must be a rare dose that gives a heavy feel to the tongue of old Esther. Friend, continued the doctor, waving his hand for the angry wife to maintain the peace, that it cannot perform all that is said of it, the very charge of good Mrs. Bush is a sufficient proof. But to speak of the absent Asa, there is doubt as to his fate, and there is a proposition to solve it. Now, in the natural sciences, truth is always a desideratum and I confess it would seem to be equally so in the present case of domestic uncertainty, which may be called a vacuum where, according to the laws of physic, there should exist some pretty palpable proofs of materiality. "'Don't mind him! Don't mind him!' cried Esther, observing that the rest of his auditors listened with an intention which might proceed equally from acquiescence in his proposal or ignorance of its meaning. "'There is a drug in every word he utters!' Dr. Battius wishes to say, Ellen modestly interposed, that as some of us think Asa is in danger, and some think otherwise, the whole family might pass an hour or two in looking for him. Does he? interrupted the woman. Then Dr. Battius has more sense in him than I believe. She is right, Ishmael, and what she says shall be done. I will shoulder a rifle myself, and woe be tied, the redskin that crosses my path. I have pulled a trigger before today, I, and heard an Indian yell, too, to my sorrow. The spirit of Esther diffused itself like the stimulus which attends a war cry among her sons. They arose in a body, and declared a determination to second so bold a resolution. Ishmael prudently yielded to an impulse he could not resist, and in a few minutes the woman appeared, shouldering her arms, prepared to lead forth in person such of her descendants as chose to follow. Let them stay with the children that please, she said, and then follow me who are not chicken-hearted. Abram, it will not do to leave the huts without some guard, Ishmael whispered, glancing his eye upward. The man whom he addressed started and betrayed extraordinary eagerness in his reply. 
I will tarry and watch the camp. A dozen voices were instantly raised in objections to this proposal. He was wanted to point out the places where the hostile tracks had been seen, and his termagant sister openly scouted at the idea as unworthy of his manhood. The reluctant Abram was compelled to yield, and Ishmael made a new disposition for the defense of the place, which was admitted by every one to be all important to their security and comfort. He offered the post of commandant to Dr. Battius, who, however, preemptorily and somewhat haughtily declined the doubtful honor, exchanging looks of intelligence with Ellen as he did so. In this dilemma the squatter was obliged to constitute the girl herself Castellan, taking care, however, in deputing this important trust to omit no words of caution and instruction. When this preliminary point was settled, the young men proceeded to arrange certain means of defense and signals of alarm that were adapted to the weakness and character of the garrison. Several masses of rock were drawn to the edge of the upper level, and so placed as to leave it at the discretion of the feeble Ellen and her associates, to cast them or not as they might choose on the heads of any invaders who would of necessity be obliged to mount the eminence by the difficult and narrow passage already so often mentioned. In addition to this formidable obstruction, the barriers were strengthened and rendered nearly impassable. Smaller missiles that might be hurled even by the hands of the younger children, but which would prove from the elevation of the place exceedingly dangerous, were provided in profusion. A pile of dried leaves and splinters were placed as a beacon on the upper rock, and then, even in the jealous judgment of the squatter, the post was deemed competent to maintain a credible siege. The moment the rock was thought to be in a state of sufficient security, the party who composed what might be called the sortie sallied forth on their anxious expedition. The advance was led by Esther in person, who, attired in a dress half masculine and bearing a weapon like the rest, seemed no unfit leader for the group of wildly clad frontiersmen that followed in her rear. Now, Abram, cried the Amazon, in a voice that was cracked and harsh, for the simple reason of being used too often on a strained and unnatural key. Now, Abram, run with your nose low, show yourself a hound of the true breed, and do some credit to your training. You it was that saw the prince of the Indian moccasin, and it behooves you to let others be as wise as yourself. Come, come to the front, man, and give us a bold lead. The brother, who appeared at all times to stand in awe of his sister's authority, complied, though it was with a reluctance so evident as to excite sneers even among the unobservant and indolent sons of the squatter. Ishmael himself moved among his tall children like one who expected nothing from the search, and who was indifferent alike to its success or failure. In this manner the party proceeded until their distant fortress had sunk so low as to present an object no larger nor more distinct than a hazy point on the margin of the prairie. Hitherto their progress had been silent and somewhat rapid, for as swell after swell was mounted and passed, without varying or discovering a living object to enliven the monotony of the view, even the tongue of Esser was hushed in increasing anxiety. Here, however, Ishmael chose to pause, and casting the butt of his rifle from his shoulder to the ground, he observed, This is enough. Buffalo signs and deer signs are plenty. But where are thy Indian footsteps, Abram? Still farther west returned the other, pointing in the direction he named. This was the spot where I struck the tracks of the buck. It was after I took the deer that I fell upon the Teton trail. And a bloody piece of work you made of it, man, cried the squatter, pointing tauntily to the soiled garments of his kinsman, and then directing the attention of the spectators to his own, by the way of a triumphant contrast. Here have I cut the throats of two lively does, and a scampering fawn, without spot or stain while you, blundering dog as you are, have made as much work for Esther and her girls as though butchering was your regular calling. Come, boys, it is enough. I am too old not to know the signs of the frontiers. No Indian has been here since the last fall of water. Follow me, and I will make a turn that shall give us at least the beef of a fallow cow for our trouble. Follow me, echoed Esther, stepping undauntedly forward. I am leader today, and I will be followed." Who so proper let me know as a mother to head a search for her own lost child? Ishmael regarded his intractable mate with a smile of indulgent pity. Observing that she had already struck out a path for herself, different both from that of Abram and the one he had seen fit to choose, and being unwilling to draw the cord of authority too tight, 
Just at that moment he submitted himself to her will. But Dr. Battius, who had hitherto been a silent and thoughtful attendant on the woman, now saw fit to raise his feeble voice in the way of remonstrance. "'I agree with thy partner in life, worthy and gentle Mrs. Bush,' he said, "'in believing that some ignis fatuus of the imagination has deceived Abram in the signs of symptoms of which he has spoken.' "'Symptoms yourself!' interrupted the termagant. "'This is no time for bookish words, nor is this a place to stop and swallow medicines. If you are a leg-weary, say so, as a plain-speaking man should. Then seat yourself on the prairie, like a hound that is foot-sore, and take your natural rest.' "'I accord in the opinion,' the naturalist calmly replied, complying literally with the opinion of the deriding Esther, by taking his seat very coolly by the side of an indigenous shrub the examination of which he commenced on the instant in the order that science might not lose any of its just and important dues i honour your excellent advice mistress esther as you may perceive go thou in quest of thy offspring while i tarry here in pursuit of that which is better fees and insight into the arcana of nature's volume the woman answered with a hollow unnatural and scornful laugh and even her heavy sons, as they slowly passed the seat of the already abstracted naturalist, did not disdain to manifest their contempt in smiles. In a few minutes the train mounted the nearest eminence, and as it turned the rounded acclivity, the doctor was left to pursue his profitable investigations in entire solitude. Another half-hour passed, during which Esther continued to advance on her seemingly fruitless search. Her pauses, however, were becoming frequent and her looks wandering and uncertain, when footsteps were heard clattering through the bottom, and at the next instant a buck was seen to bound up the ascent, and to dart from before their eyes in the direction of the naturalist. So sudden and unlooked for had been the passage of the animal, and so much had he been favored by the shape of the ground, that before any one of the foresters had time to bring his rifle to his shoulder, it was already beyond the range of a bullet. "'Look out for the wolf!' shouted Abner shaking his head in vexation at being a single moment too late. A wolf's skin will be no bad gift in a winter's night. Ay, yonder the hungry devil comes. Hold! cried Ishmael, knocking up the level weapon of his too eager son. Tis not a wolf, but a hound of thorough blood and bottom. Ha! We have hunters nigh. There are two of them. He was still speaking when the animals in question came leaping on the track of the deer, striving with noble ardor to outdo each other. One was an aged dog, whose strength seemed to be sustained purely by generous emulation, and the other a pup, that gambled even while he pressed most warmly on the chase. They both ran, however, with clean and powerful leaps, carrying their noses high like animals of the most keen and subtle scent. They had passed, and in another minute they would have been running open mouth with the deer in view, had not the younger dog suddenly bounded from the course and uttered a cry of surprise. His aged companion stopped also, and returned panting and exhausted to the place where the other was whirling around in swift and apparently in mad evolutions, circling the spot in his own footsteps, and continuing his outcry in a short, snappish barking. But when the elder hound had reached the spot, he seated himself, and lifting his nose high in the air, he raised a long, loud, and wailing howl. "'It must be a strong scent!' said Abner, who had been with the rest of the family, an admiring observer of the movements of the dogs, that can break off two such creatures so suddenly from their trail. "'Murder them!' cried Abram. "'I'll swear to the old hound tis the dog of the trapper, whom we now know to be our mortal enemy.' Though the brother of Esser gave so hostile advice, he appeared in no way ready to put it in execution himself. The surprise which had taken possession of the whole party exhibited itself in his own vacant wondering stare as strongly as in any of the admiring visages by whom he was surrounded his denunciation therefore notwithstanding its dire import was disregarded and the dogs were left to obey the impulses of their mysterious instinct without let or hindrance it was long before any of the spectators broke the silence but the squatter at length so far recollected his authority as to take on himself the right to control the movements of his children "'Come away, boys! Come away, and leave the hounds to sing their tunes for their own amusement,' Ishmael said, in his coldest manner. "'I scorn to take the life of a beast because its master has pitched himself too nigh my clearing. Come away, boys! Come away! We have enough of our own work before us without turning aside to do that of the whole neighborhood.' 
Come not away! cried Esther, in tones that sounded like the admonitions of some sibyl. I say, come not away, my children! There is meaning and warning in this, and as I am a woman and a mother, will I know the truth of it all. So saying, the awakened wife brandished her weapon, with an air that was not without its wild and secret influence, and led the way towards the spot where the dogs still remained, filling the air with their long-drawn and piteous complaints. The whole party followed in her steps, some too indolent to oppose, others obedient to her will, and all more or less excited by the uncommon character of the scene. "'Tell me you, Abner, Abram, Ishmael!' the woman cried, standing over a spot where the earth was trampled and beaten, and plainly sprinkled with blood. "'Tell me, you who are hunters, what sort of animal has here met his death? Speak! Ye are men, and used to the signs of the plains. Is it the blood of a wolf or panther?' "'A buffalo, and a noble and powerful creature has it been,' returned the squatter, who looked down calmly on the fatal signs which so strangely affected his wife. Here are the marks of the spot where he has struck his hoofs into the earth, in the death struggle, and yonder he has plunged and torn the ground with his horns. I, a buffalo bull of wonderful strength and courage, has he been. And who has slain him? continued Esther. Man, where are the offals? Wolves! They devour the hide. Tell me, men and hunters, is this the blood of a beast? The creature has plunged over the hillock, said Abner, who had proceeded a short distance beyond the rest of the party. Ah! There you will find it, in yon swale of alders. Look, a thousand carrion birds are hovering above the carcass. The animal still has life in him, returned the squatter, or the buzzards would settle upon their prey. By the action of the dogs it must be something ravenous. I reckon it is the white bear from the upper falls. They are said to cling desperately to life. Let us go back, said Abram. There may be danger, and there can be no good in attacking a ravenous beast. Remember, Ishmael, t'will be a risky job and one of small profit. The young men smiled at this new proof of the well-known pusillanimity of their uncle. The oldest even proceeded so far as to express his contempt by bluntly saying, It will do the cage with the other animal we carry. Then we may go back double-handed into the settlements and set up for showmen around the courthouses and goals of Kentucky. The threatening frown which gathered on the brow of his father admonished the young man to forbear. Exchanging looks that were half rebellious with his brethren, he saw fit to be silent. But instead of observing the caution recommended by Abram, they proceeded in a body until they again came to a halt within a few yards of the matted cover of the thicket. The scene had now indeed become wild and striking enough to have produced a powerful effect on the minds better prepared than those of the unnurtured family of the squatter to resist the impressions of so exciting a spectacle. The heavens were, as usual at the season, covered with dark, driving clouds, beneath which interminable flocks of aquatic birds were again on the wing, holding their toilsome and heavy way towards the distant waters of the south. The wind had risen, and was once more sweeping over the prairie in gust, which it was often vain to oppose, and then again the blast would seem to mount into the upper air, as if to sport with the drifting vapor, whirling and rolling vast masses of the dusky and ragged volumes over each other in a terrific and yet grand disorder. Above the little break the flock of birds still held their flight, circling with heavy wings about the spot, struggling at times against a torrent of wind, and then favored by their position and height, making bold swoops upon the thicket, away from which, however, they never failed to sail, screaming in terror, as if apprised, either by sight or instinct, that the hour of their voracious dominion had not yet fully arrived. Ishmael stood for many minutes, with his wife and children clustered together, in an amazement, with which all was singularly mingled, gazing in death-like stillness on the sight. The voice of Esther at length broke the charm, and reminded the spectators of the necessity of resolving their doubts in some manner more worthy of their manhood than by dull and inactive observation. "'Call on the dogs,' she said. "'Call on the hounds, and put them in the thicket. There are men enough of ye, if ye had not lost the spirit with which I know ye were born, to tame the tempers of all the bears west of the big river. Call on the dogs, I say. You, Enoch, Abner, Gabriel, has wonder may ye deaf?' One of the young men complied and having succeeded in detaching the hounds from the place around which, until then, they had not ceased to hover, he led them down to the margin of the thicket. "'Put them in, boy, put them in,' continued the woman. "'And you, Ishmael and Abram, if anything wicked or harmful comes forth, show them the use of your rifles, like frontiermen. 
If ye are wanting in spirit, before the eyes of my children will I put ye both to shame. The youth, who until now had detained the hounds, let slip the thongs of skin by which they had been held, and urged them to the attack by their voices. But it would seem that the elder dog was restrained by some extraordinary sensation, or that he was much too experienced to attempt the rash adventure. After proceeding a few yards to the very verge of the break, he made a sudden pause, and stood trembling in all his aged limbs, apparently as unable to recede as to advance. The encouraging calls of the young men were disregarded, or only answered by a low and plaintive whining. For a minute the pup also was similarly affected, but less sage, or more easily excited. He was induced at length to leap forward, and finally to dash into the cover. An alarm the startling howl was heard, and at the next minute he broke out of the thicket, and commenced circling the spot in the same wild and unsteady manner as before. "'Have I a man among my children?' demanded Esther. "'Give me a trucer piece than a childish shotgun, and I will show ye what the courage of a frontier woman can do.' "'Stay, mother!' exclaimed Abner and Enoch. "'If you will see the creature, let us drive it into view.' This was quite as much as the youths were accustomed to utter, even on more important occasions, but having given a pledge of their intentions, they were far from being backward in redeeming it. Preparing their arms with the utmost care, they advanced with steadiness to the break. Nerves, less often tried than those of the young boarders, might have shrunk before the dangers of so uncertain an undertaking. As they proceeded, the howls of the dogs became more shrill and plaintive. The vultures and buzzards settled so low as to flap the bushes with their heavy wings, and the wind came hoarsely sweeping along the naked prairie, as if the spirits of the air had also descended to witness the approaching development. There was a breathless moment when the blood of the undaunted Esther flowed backward to her heart, as she saw her sons push aside the matted branches of the thicket and bury themselves in its labyrinth. A deep and solemn pause succeeded. Then arose two loud and piercing cries in quick succession, which were followed by a quiet, still more awful and appalling. "'Come back! Come back, my children!' cried the woman, the feelings of a mother getting the ascendancy. But her voice has hushed, and every faculty seemed frozen with horror, as at that instant the bushes once more parted, and the two adventurers reappeared pale and nearly insensible themselves, and laid at her feet the stiff and motionless body of the lost Asa, with the marks of a violent death but too plainly stamped on every pallid liniment. The dogs uttered a long and closing howl, and then breaking off together they disappeared on the forsaken trail of the deer. The flight of birds wheeled upward into the heavens, filling the air with their complaints at having been robbed of a victim which, frightful and disgusting as it was, still bore too much of the impression of humanity to become the prey of their obscene appetites. Chapter 13 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck A pickaxe and a spade, a spade, four and a shrouding sheet. Oh, a pit of clay for to be made, for such a guest is meet song in hamlet stand back stand off the whole of ye said esther hoarsely to the crowd which pressed too closely on the corpse i am his mother and my right is better than that of ye all who has done this tell me ishmael abram abner open your mouths and your hearts and let god's truth and no other issue from them who has done this bloody deed her husband made no reply, but stood, leaning on his rifle, looking sadly, but with an unaltered eye, at the mangled remains of his son. Not so the mother. She threw herself on the earth, and receiving the cold and ghastly head into her lap, she sat contemplating those muscular features on which the death agony was still horridly impressed, in a silence far more expressive than any language of lamentation could have proved. The voice of the woman was frozen in grief. In vain, Ishmael attempted a few words of rude consolation. She neither listened nor answered. Her sons gathered about her in a circle, and expressed, after their uncouth manner, their sympathy in her sorrow, as well as their sense of their own loss, but she motioned them away impatiently with her hand. At times her fingers played in the matted hair of the dead, 
and at others they lightly attempted to smooth the painfully expressive muscles of its ghastly visage, as the hand of the mother is seen lingering fondly about the features of her sleeping child. Then, starting from their revolting office, her hands would flutter around her, and seem to seek some fruitless remedy against the violent blow which had thus suddenly destroyed the child, in whom she had not only placed her greatest hopes, but so much of her maternal pride. While engaged in the latter incomprehensible manner, the lethargic Abner turned aside, and, swallowing the unwanted emotions which were rising in his own throat, he observed, "'Mother means that we should look for the signs that we may know in what manner Asa has come by his end.' "'We owe it to the accursed Sioux,' answered Ishmael. "'Twice have they put me deeply in their debt. The third time the score shall be cleared.' But, not content with this plausible explanation, and perhaps secretly glad to avert their eyes from a spectacle which awakened so extraordinary and unusual sensations in their sluggish bosoms, the sons of the squatter turned away in a body from their mother and the corpse, and proceeded to make the inquiries which they fancied the former had so repeatedly demanded. Ishmael made no objections, but though he accompanied his children while they proceeded in the investigation, it was more with the appearance of complying with their wishes, at a time when resistance might not be seemly, than with any visible interest in the result. As the boarders, notwithstanding their usual dullness, were well instructed in most things connected with their habits of life, an inquiry, the success of which depended so much on signs and evidences that bore so strong a resemblance to a forest trail, was likely to be conducted with skill and acuteness. Accordingly, they proceeded to the melancholy task with great readiness and intelligence. Abner and Enoch agreed in their accounts as to the position in which they had found the body. It was seated nearly upright, the back supported by a mass of matted brush, and one hand still grasping a broken twig of the alders. It was probably owing to the former circumstance that the body had escaped the rapacity of the carrion birds, which had been seen hovering above the thicket, and the latter proved that life had not yet entirely abandoned the hapless victim when he entered the brake. The opinion now became general, that the youth had received his death wound in the open prairie, and had dragged his enfeebled form into the cover of the thicket for the purpose of concealment. A trail through the bushes confirmed this opinion. It also appeared, on examination, that a desperate struggle had taken place on a very margin of the thicket. This was sufficiently apparent by the trodden branches, the deep impressions on the moist grounds, and the lavish flow of blood. "'He has been shot in the open ground and come here for a cover,' said Abram. "'These marks would clearly prove it. "'The boy has been set upon by the savages in a body, "'and has fought like a hero, as he was until they had mastered his strength "'and then drawn him into the bushes.' "'To this probable opinion there was now but one dissenting voice, "'that of the slow-minded Ishmael, "'who demanded that the corpse itself should be examined "'in order to obtain a more accurate knowledge of its injuries.' On examination, it appeared that a rifle bullet had passed directly through the body of the deceased, entering beneath one of his brawny shoulders and making its exit by the breast. It required some knowledge in gunshot wounds to decide this delicate point, but the experience of the boarders was quite equal to the scrutiny, and a smile of wild and certainly of singular satisfaction passed among the sons of Ishmael when Abner confidently announced that the enemies of Asa had assailed him in the rear. "'It must be so,' said the gloomy but attentive squatter. "'He was of too good a stock, and too well trained knowingly to turn the weak side to man or beast. "'Remember, boys, that while the front of manhood is to your enemy, let him be, who or what he may, you are safe from cowardly surprise. "'Why, Esther, woman, you are getting beside yourself with picking at the hair and the garments of the child. "'Little good you can do him now, old girl.' "'See,' interrupted Enoch, extricating from the fragments of cloth the morsel of lead, which had prostrated the strength of one so powerful. Here is the very bullet. Ishmael took it in his hand, and eyed it long and closely. There is no mistake, at length he muttered through his compressed teeth. It's from the pouch of that accursed trapper. Like many of the hunters he has a mark in his mold, in order to know the work of his rifle performs. And here you see it plainly, six little holes laid crossways. I'll swear to it, cried Abram, triumphantly. He showed me his private mark himself, and boasted of the number of deer he had laid upon the prairies with these very bullets. 
Now, Ishmael, will you believe me when I tell you the old knave is a spy of the Redskins? The lead passed from the hand of one to that of another, and unfortunately for the reputation of the old man, several among them remembered also to have seen the aforesaid private bullet marks during the curious examination which all had made of his accoutrements. In addition to this wound, however, were many others of a less dangerous nature, all of which were supposed to confirm the supposed guilt of the trapper. The traces of many different struggles were to be seen, between the spot where the first blood was spilt and the thicket to which it was now generally believed Asa had retreated as a place of refuge. These were interpreted into so many proofs of the weakness of the murderer, who would have sooner dispatched his victim had not even the dying strength of the youth rendered him formidable to the infirmities of one so old. The danger of drawing some others of the hunters to the spot by repeated firing was deemed a sufficient reason for not again resorting to the rifle after it had performed the important duty of disabling the victim. The weapon of the dead man was not to be found, and had doubtless, together with many other less valuable and lighter articles, that he was accustomed to carry about his person become a prize to his destroyer. But what, in addition to the tell-tale bullet, appeared to fix the ruthless deed with peculiar certainty on the trapper, was the accumulated evidence furnished by the trail, which proved notwithstanding his deadly hurt that the wounded man had still been able to make a long and desperate resistance to the subsequent efforts of his murderer. Ishmael seemed to press this proof with a singular mixture of sorrow and pride, sorrow at the loss of a son, whom in their moments of amity he highly valued, and pride at the courage and power he had manifested to his last and weakest breath. "'He died as a son of mine should die,' said the squatter, gleaning a hollow consolation from so unnatural an exultation. "'A dread to his enemy to the last, and without help from the law. Come, children, we have the grave to make, and then to hunt his murderer.' The sons of the squatter set about their melancholy office in silence and in sadness. An excavation was made in the hard earth at a great expense of toil and time, and the body was wrapped in such spare vestments as could be collected among the laborers. When these arrangements were completed, Ishmael approached the seemingly unconscious Esther and announced his intention to inter the dead. She heard him and quietly relinquished her grasp of the corpse rising in silence to follow it to its narrow resting-place. Here she seated herself again at the head of the grave, watching each movement of the youth with eager and jealous eyes. When a sufficiency of earth was laid upon the senseless clay of Asa to protect it from injury, Enoch and Abner entered the cavity and trod it into a solid mass by the weight of their huge frames with an appearance of a strange, not to say savage, mixture of care and indifference. This well-known precaution was adopted to prevent the speedy exhumation of the body by some of the carnivorous beasts of the prairie, whose instinct was sure to guide them to the spot. Even the rapacious birds appeared to comprehend the nature of the ceremony, for, mysteriously apprised that the miserable victim was now about to be abandoned by the human race, they once more began to make their airy circuits above the place, screaming, as if to frighten the kinsmen from their labor of caution and love. Ishmael stood with folded arms steadily watching the manner in which this necessary duty was performed, and when the whole was completed he lifted his cap to his sons to thank them for their services with a dignity that would have become one much better nurtured. Throughout the whole of a ceremony, which is ever solemn and admonitory, the squatter had maintained a grave and serious deportment. His vast features were visibly stamped with an expression of deep concern, but at no time did they falter until he turned his back as he believed forever on the grave of his firstborn. Nature was then stirring powerfully within him, and the muscles of his stern visage began to work perceptibly. His children fastened their eyes on his, as if to seek a direction to the strange emotions which were moving their own heavy natures, when the struggle in the bosom of the squatter suddenly ceased, and, taking his wife by the arm, he raised her to her feet as if she had been an infant, saying, in a voice that was perfectly steady, though a nice observer would have discovered that it was kinder than usual. Yes, sir, we have now done all that man and woman can do. We raised a boy, made him such as few others were like, on the frontiers of America, and we have given him a grave. Let us go our way. The woman turned her eyes slowly from the fresh earth, and laying her hands on the shoulders of her husband stood, looking him anxiously in the eyes. Ishmael, Ishmael, she said, 
You parted from the boy in your wrath. May the Lord pardon his sins freely, as I have forgiven him his worst misdeeds, calmly returned the squatter. Woman, go you back to the rock and read your Bible. A chapter in that book always does you good. You can read, Esther, which is a privilege I never did enjoy. Yes, yes, muttered the woman, yielding to his strength and suffering herself to be led, though with strong reluctance from the spot. I can read, and how have I used the knowledge? But he, Ishmael, he has not the sin of wasted learning to answer for. We have spared him that, at least. Whether it be in mercy or in cruelty, I know not. Her husband made no reply, but continued steadily to lead her in the direction of their temporary abode. When they reached the summit of the swell of land, which they knew was the last spot from which the situation of the grave of Asa could be seen, they all turned, as by common concurrence, to take a farewell view of the place. The little mound itself was not visible, but it was frightfully indicated by the flock of screaming birds, which hovered above. In the opposite direction a low, blue hillock, in the skirts of the horizon, pointed out the place where Esser had left the rest of her young, and served as an attraction to draw her reluctant steps from the last abode of her eldest born. Nature quickened in the bosom of the mother at the sight, and she finally yielded the rights of the dead to the more urgent claims of the living. The foregoing occurrences had struck a spark from the stern tempers of a set of beings so singularly molded in the habits of their uncultivated lives, which served to keep alive among them the dying embers of family affection. United to their parents by ties no stronger than those which use has created, there had been great danger, as Ishmael had foreseen, that the overloaded hive would swarm and leave him saddled with the difficulties of a young and helpless brood, unsupported by the exertions of those whom he had already brought to a state of maturity. The spirit of insubordination which emanated from the unfortunate Asa had spread among his juniors, and the squatter had been made painfully to remember the time when, in the wantonness of his youth and vigor, he had, reversing the order of the brutes, cast off his own aged and failing parents to enter into the world unshackled and free. But the danger had now abated, for a time at least, and if his authority was not restored with all its former influence, it was admitted to exist and to maintain its ascendancy a little longer. It is true that his slow-minded sons, even while they submitted to the impressions of the recent event, had glimmerings of terrible distrust as to the manner in which their elder brother had met with his death. There were faint and indistinct images in the minds of two or three of the oldest which portrayed the father himself as ready to imitate the example of Abraham without the justification of the sacred authority which commanded the holy man to attempt the revolting office. But then these images were so transient and so much obscured in intellectual mist as to leave no very strong impressions, and the tendency of the whole transaction, as we have already said, was rather to strengthen than to weaken the authority of Ishmael. In this disposition of mind, the party continued their route towards the place whence they had that morning issued on a search which had been crowned with so melancholy a success. The long and fruitless march which they had made under the direction of Abram, the discovery of the body, and its subsequent interment, had so far consumed the day that by the time their steps were retraced across the broad track of waste which lay between the grave of Asa and the rock, the sun had fallen far below his meridian altitude. The hill had gradually risen as they approached, like some tower, emerging from the bosom of the sea, and when, within a mile, the minuter objects that crowned its height came dimly into view. "'It will be a sad meeting for the girls,' said Ishmael, who from time to time did not cease to utter something which he contended should be consolatory to the bruised spirit of his partner. Asa was much regarded by the, all the young, and seldom failed to bring in from his hunts something that they loved. "'He did, he did,' murmured Esser. "'The boy was the pride of the family. My other children are as nothing to him.' "'Say not so, good woman,' returned the father, glancing his eye a little proudly at the athletic train which followed at no great distance in the rear. "'Say not so, old Esser, for few fathers and mothers have greater reason to be boastful than ourselves.' "'Thankful, thankful,' muttered the humbled woman. "'You mean thankful, Ishmael?' "'Then thankful let it be, if you like the word better, my good girl. But what has become of Nelly and the young? The child has forgotten the charge I gave her, and has not only suffered the children to sleep, but, I warrant you, is dreaming of the fields of Tennessee at this very moment. 
The mind of your niece is mainly fixed on the settlements, I reckon. Aye, she is not for us. I said it and thought it when I took her because death had stripped her of all other friends. Death is a sad worker in the bosom of families, Ishmael. Asa had a kind feeling to the child, and they might have come one day into our places had things been so ordered. Nay, she is not gifted for a frontier wife, if this is the manner she is to keep the house while the husband is on the hunt. Abner, let off your rifle, that they may know we are coming. I fear Nelly and the young are asleep. The young man complied with an alacrity that manifested how gladly he would see the rounded active figure of Ellen enlivening the ragged summit of the rock. But the report was succeeded by neither signal nor answer of any sort. For a moment the whole party stood in suspense, awaiting the result, and then a simultaneous impulse caused the whole to let off their pieces at the same instant, producing a noise which might not fail to reach the ears of all within so short a distance. "'Ah, there they come at last!' cried Abram, who was usually among the first to seize on any circumstance which promised relief from disagreeable apprehensions. "'It is a petticoat fluttering in the line,' said Esther. "'I put it there myself.' "'You are right. But now she comes. The jade has been taking her comfort in the tent.' "'It is not so,' said Ishmael, who usually inflexible features were beginning to manifest the uneasiness he felt. "'It is the tent itself blowing about loosely in the wind.' They have loosened the bottom, like silly children as they are, and unless care is had, the hole will come down. The words were scarcely uttered before a rushing blast of wind swept by the spot where they stood, raising the dust and little eddies in the progress, and then, as if guided by a master hand, it quitted the earth and mounted to the precise spot on which all eyes were just then riveted. The loosened linen felt its influence and tottered, but regained its poise, and for a moment it became tranquil. The clouds of leaves next played in circling revolutions around the place, and then descended with the velocity of a swooping hawk, and sailed away into the prairie in long straight lines, like a flight of swallows resting on their expanded wings. They were followed for some distance by the snow-white tent, which, however, soon fell behind the rock, leaving its highest peak as naked as when it lay in the entire solitude of the desert. "'The murderers have been here,' moaned Nesser. "'My babes! My babes!' For a moment even Ishmael faltered before the weight of so unexpected a blow. But shaking himself like an awakened lion, he sprang forward, and pushing aside the impediments of the barrier, as if they had been feathers, he rushed up the ascent with an impetuosity which proved how formidable a sluggish nature may become when thoroughly aroused. Chapter 14 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Whose party do the townsmen yet admit? King John In order to preserve an even pace between the incidents of the tale, it becomes necessary to revert to such events as occurred during the ward of Ellen Wade. For the first few hours the cares of the honest and warm-hearted girl were confined to the simple offices of satisfying the often repeated demands which her younger associates made on her time and patience, under the pretense of hunger, thirst, and all the other ceaseless wants of captious and inconsiderate childhood. She had seized a moment from their importunities to steal into the tent where she was administering to the comforts of one far more deserving of her tenderness when an outcry among the children recalled her to the duties she had momentarily forgotten. "'See, Nellie, see!' exclaimed half a dozen eager voices. "'Yonder are men, and Phoebe says they are Sioux Indians!' Ellen turned her eyes in the direction in which so many arms were already extended, and to her consternation beheld several men advancing manifestly and swiftly in a straight line towards the rock. She counted four but was unable to make out anything concerning their characters except that they were not any of those who of right were entitled to admission into the fortress. It was a fearful moment for Owen. Looking around at the juvenile and frightened flock that pressed upon the skirts of her garments, she endeavored to recall to her confused faculties some one of the many tales of female heroism with which the history of the western frontier abounded. In one, a stockade had been successfully defended by a single man, supported by three or four women, for days against the assaults of a hundred enemies. In another, the women alone had been able to protect the children and the less valuable effects of their absent husbands. 
and third was not wanting, in which a solitary female had destroyed her sleeping captors, and given liberty not only to herself, but to a brood of helpless young. This was the case most nearly assimilated to the situation in which Ellen now found herself, and, with flushing cheeks and kindling eyes, the girl began to consider and to prepare her slender means of defense. She posted the larger girls at the little levers that were to cast the rocks of the assailants. The smaller were to be used more for show than any positive service they could perform, while, like any other leader, she reserved her own person as a superintendent and encourager of the whole. When these dispositions were made, she endeavored to await the issue with an air of composure that she intended should inspire her assistance with the confidence necessary to ensure success. Although Ellen was vastly their superior in that spirit which emanates from moral qualities, she was by no means the equal of two eldest daughters of Esther in the important military property of insensibility to danger. Reared in the hardihood of a migrating life, on the skirts of society, where they had become familiarized to the sights and dangers of the wilderness, these girls promised fairly to become, at some future day, no less distinguished than their mother for daring, and for that singular mixture of good and evil, which, in a wider sphere of action, would probably have enabled the wife of the squatter to enroll her name among the remarkable females of her time. Esser had already on one occasion made good the log tenement of Ishmael against an inroad of savages, and on another she had been left for dead by her enemies, after a defense that, with a more civilized foe, would have entitled her to the honors of a liberal capitulation. These facts and sundry others of a similar nature had often been recapitulated with suitable exultation in the presence of her daughters, and the bosoms of the young Amazons were now strangely fluctuating between natural terror and the ambitious wish to do something that might render them worthy of being the children of such a mother. It appeared that the opportunity for distinction of this wild character was no longer to be denied them. The party of strangers was already within hundred rods of rock, either consulting their usual wary method of advancing, or admonished by the threatening attitudes of two figures who had thrust forth the barrels of as many old muskets from behind a stone entrenchment, the newcomers halted, under favor of an inequality in the ground where a growth of grass thicker than common offered the advantage of concealment. From this spot they reconnoitred the fortress for several anxious and to Ellen interminable minutes. Then one advanced singly, and apparently more in the character of a herald than of an assailant. "'Phoebe, do you fire?' "'And no, Hetty, you?' were beginning to be heard between the half-frightened and yet eager daughters of the squatter, when Ellen probably saved the advancing stranger from some imminent harm, if from no greater danger, by exclaiming, "'Lay down the muskets! It is Dr. Battius!' Her subordinates so far complied as to withdraw their hands from the locks through the threatening barrels still maintained the portentous levels. The naturalist, who had advanced with sufficient deliberation to note the smallest hostile demonstration of the garrison, now raised a white handkerchief on the end of his fusée, and came within speaking distance of the fortress. Then, assuming what he intended should be an imposing and dignified semblance of authority, he blustered forth, in a voice that might have been heard at much greater distance. "'What ho! I summon ye all, in the name of the Confederacy of the United Sovereign States of North America, to submit yourselves to the laws!' "'Doctor or no doctor, he is an enemy, Nellie. Hear him, hear him, he talks of the law!' "'Stop! Stay till I hear his answer!' said the nearly breathless Ellen pushing aside the dangerous weapons which were again pointed in the direction of the shrinking person of the herald. "'I admonish and forewarn ye all,' continued the startled doctor, "'that I am a peaceful citizen of the before-named Confederacy, or to speak with greater accuracy, Union, a supporter of the social compact, and a lover of good order and amity.' Then, perceiving that the danger was at least temporarily removed, he once more raised his voice to the hostile pitch. I charge ye all, therefore, to submit to the laws. I thought you were a friend, Ellen replied, and that you travel with my uncle in virtue of an agreement. It is void. 
I have been deceived in the very premises, and I hereby pronounce a certain compactum entered into and concluded between Ishmael Bush, squatter, and Obed Badius, M.D., to be incontinently null and of none effect. Nay, children, to be null is merely a negative property, and is fraught with no evil to your worthy parent, so lay aside the firearms and listen to the admonitions of reason. I declare it vicious, null, abrogated. As for thee, Nelly, my feelings towards thee are not at all given to hostility. Therefore listen to that which I have to utter, nor turn away thine ears in the wantonness of security. Thou knowest the character of the man with whom thou dwellest, young woman, and thou knowest the danger of being found in evil company. Abandon, then, the trifling advantages of thy situation, and yield the rock peaceably to the will of those who accompany me a legion, young woman, I do assure you, an invincible and powerful legion. Render, therefore, the effects of this lawless and wicked squatter. Nay, children, such disregard of human life is frightful in those who have so recently received the gift in their own persons. Point those dangerous weapons aside, I entreat you, more for your own sakes than for mine. Hetty, Hast thou forgotten who appeased thine anguish, when thy auricular nerves were tortured by the coals and damps of the naked earth? And thou, Phoebe, ungrateful, forgetful Phoebe, but for this very arm, which you would prostrate with an endless paralysis, thy incisors would still be giving thee pain and sorrow. Lay then aside thy weapons, and hearken to the advice of one who has always been thy friend. And now, young woman, still keeping a jealous eye on the muskets, which the girl had suffered to be diverted a little from their aim. And now, young woman, for the last and therefore the most solemn asking, I demand of thee the surrender of this rock without delay or resistance in the joint names of power, of justice, and of the law, he would have added, but recollecting that this ominous word would again provoke the hostility of the squatter's children, he succeeded in swallowing it in good season and concluded that with the less dangerous and more convertible term of reason. This extraordinary summons failed, however, of producing the desired effect. It proved utterly unintelligible to his young listeners, with the exception of the few offensive terms already sufficiently distinguished, and though Ellen better comprehended the meaning of the herald, she appeared as little moved by his rhetoric as her companions. At those passages which he intended should be tender and affecting, the intelligent girl, though tortured by painful feelings, had even manifested a disposition to laugh, while to the threats she turned an utterly insensible ear. "'I know not the meaning of all you wish to say, Dr. Battius,' she quietly replied, when he had ended, "'but I am sure if it would teach me to betray my trust, it is what I ought not to hear. I caution you to attempt no violence, for let my wishes be what they may, you see, I am surrounded by a force that can easily put me down, and you know, or ought to know, too well the temper of this family, to trifle in such a manner with any of its members. Let them be of what sex or age they may. I am not entirely ignorant of human character, returned the naturalist, prudently receding a little from the position which he had, until now, stoutly maintained at the very base of the hill. But here comes one who may know its secret winding still better than I. Ellen! Ellen Wade! cried Paul Hover, who had advanced to his elbow without betraying any of that sensitiveness which had so manifestly discomposed the doctor. I didn't expect to find an enemy in you. Nor shall you, when you ask that which I can grant without treachery. You know that my uncle has trusted his family to my care, and shall I so far betray the trust as to let in his bitterest enemies to murder his children, perhaps, and to rob him of the little which the Indians have left? Am I a murderer? Is this old man, this officer of the States? Pointing to the trapper and his newly discovered friend, both of whom by this time stood at his side. Is either of these likely to do the things you name? What is it then you ask of me? said Owen, wringing her hands in excessive doubt. The beast! Nothing more nor less than the squatter's hidden, ravenous, dangerous beast! Excellent young woman! commenced the young stranger, who had so lately joined himself to the party on the prairie, but his mouth was immediately stopped by a significant sign from the trapper, who whispered in his ear, Let the lad be our spokesman. Nature will work in the bosom of the child, and we shall gain our object in good time. The whole truth is out, Ellen, Paul continued. 
and we have lined the squatter into his most secret misdoings. We have come to right the wrong and to free the imprison. Now, if you are the girl of the true heart, as I have always believed, so far from throwing straws in our way, you will join in the general swarming, and leave old Ishmael and his hive to the bees of his own breed. I have sworn a solemn oath. A compactum, which is entered into through ignorance or in duress, is null in the sight of all good moralists, cried the doctor. Hush, hush, again the trapper whispered. Leave it to all nature and the lad. I have sworn the sight, and by the name of him, who is the founder and ruler of all that is good, whether it be in morals or in religion, Ellen continued, neither to reveal the contents of that tent, nor to help its prisoner to escape. We are both solemnly, terribly sworn. Our lives, perhaps, have been the gift we receive for the promises. It is true you are masters of the secret, but not through any means of ours, nor do I know that I can justify myself for even being neutral while you attempt to invade the dwelling of my uncle in this hostile manner. I can prove beyond the power of refutation, the naturalist eagerly explained, by Paley, Berkeley, I even by the immortal Binkershuk, that a compactum concluded, while one of the parties, be it state or be it an individual, is in durance. You will ruffle the temper of the child with your abusive language, said the cautious trapper, while the lad, if left to human feelings, will bring her down to the meekness of a fawn. Ah, you are like myself, little knowing in the nature of hidden kindness. "'Is this the only vow you have taken, Ellen?' Paul continued in a tone which, for the gay, light-hearted bee-hunter, sounded dolorous and reproachful. "'Have you sworn only to this? Are the words which the squatter says to be as honey in your mouth, and all other promises like so much useless comb?' The paleness, which had taken possession of the usually cheerful countenance of Ellen, was hid in a bright glow that was plainly visible even at the distance at which she stood. She hesitated a moment, as if struggling to repress something very like resentment, before she answered with all her native spirit. "'I know not what right any one has to question me about oaths and promises which can only concern her who has made them, if, indeed, any of the sort you mention have ever been made at all. I shall hold no further discourse with one who thinks so much of himself, and takes advice merely of his own feelings.' "'Now, old trapper, do you hear that?' said the unsophisticated bee-hunter, turning abruptly to his aged friend. The meanest insect that skims the heavens when it has got its load flies straight and honestly to its nest or hive, according to its kind. But the ways of a woman's mind are as naughty as a gnarled oak, and more crooked than the windings of the Mississippi. "'Nay, nay, child,' said the trapper good-naturedly, interfering in behalf of the offending paw. "'You are to consider that youth is hasty.' and not overgiven to thought. But then a promise is a promise, and not to be thrown aside and forgotten like the hoofs and horns of a buffalo. "'I thank you for reminding me of my oath,' said the still resentful Ellen, biting her pretty nether lip with vexation. "'I might else have proved forgetful.' "'Ah, female nature is awakened in her,' said the old man, shaking his head in a manner to show how much he was disappointed in the result. "'But it manifests itself against the true spirit.' "'Ellen!' cried the young stranger, who until now had been an attentive listener to the parley. "'Since Ellen is the name by which you are known, they often add it to another. I am sometimes called by the name of my father.' "'Call her Nellie Wade at once,' muttered Paul. "'It is her rightful name, and I care not if she keeps it forever.' "'Wade, I should have added,' continued the youth. "'You will acknowledge that, though bound by no oath myself, I at least have known how to respect those of others.' You are a witness yourself, and I have forborne to utter a single call, while I am certain it could reach those ears it would gladden so much. Permit me, then, to ascend the rock singly. I promise a perfect indemnity to your kinsman against any injury his effects may sustain. Ellen seemed to hesitate, but catching a glimpse of Paul, who stood leaning proudly on his rifle, whistling, with an appearance of the utmost indifference, the air of a boating song, she recovered her recollection in time to answer. I have been left captain of the rock, while my uncle and his sons hunt, and captain will I remain till he returns to receive back the charge. This is wasting moments that will not soon return, and neglecting an opportunity that may never occur again, the young soldier gravely remarked. The sun is beginning to fall already, and many minutes cannot elapse before the squatter and his savage brood will be returning to their huts. 
Dr. Battius cast a glance behind him, and took up the discourse by saying, Perfection is always found in maturity, whether it be in the animal or in the intellectual world. Reflection is the mother of wisdom, and wisdom the parent of success. I propose that we retire to the discreet distance from this impregnable position, and there hold a convocation or council to deliberate on what manner we may sit down regularly before the place, or perhaps by postponing the siege to another season, gain the aid of auxiliaries from the inhabited countries, and thus secure the dignity of the laws from any danger of a repulse. A storm would be better. The soldier smilingly answered, measuring the height and scanning all its difficulties with a deliberate eye. "'Twould be but a broken arm or a bruised head at the worst.' "'Then have at it!' shouted the impetuous bee-hunter, making a spring that at once put him out of danger from shot, by carrying him beneath the projecting ledge on which the garrison was posted. "'Now do your worst, young devils of a wicked breed. You have but a moment to work your mischief.' "'Paul! Rash Paul!' shrieked Owen. Another step and the rocks will crush you. They hang by but a thread, and these girls are ready and willing to let them fall. Then drive the accursed swarm from the hive, for scale the rock I will, though I find it covered with hornets. Let her if she dare, tauntingly cried the eldest of the girls, brandishing a musket with a mien and resolution that would have done credit to her Amazonian dom. I know you, Nelly Wade. You are with the lawyers in your heart, and if it come to a foot nigher, you shall have frontier punishment. Put in another pry, girls. In with it. I should like to see the man of them all that dare come up into the camp of Ishmael Bush without asking leave of his children. Stir not, Paul. For your life, keep beneath the rock. Ellen was interrupted by the same bright vision, which on the preceding day had stayed another scarcely less portentous tumult by exhibiting itself on the same giddy height where it was now seen. In the name of him who commandeth all, I implore you to pause, both you who so madly incur the risk, and you who so rashly offer to take that which you never can return, said a voice in a slightly foreign accent that instantly drew all eyes upwards. Inez, cried the officer, do I again see you? Mine shall you now be, though a million devils were posted on this rock. Push up, brave woodsman, and give room for another. The sudden appearance of the figure from the tent had created a momentary stupor among the defendants of the rock, which might, with suitable forbearance, have been happily improved. But startled by the voice of Middleton, the surprised Phoebe discharged her musket at the female, scarcely knowing whether she aimed at the life of a mortal or at some being which belonged to another world. Ellen uttered a cry of horror and then sprang after her alarmed or wounded friend, she knew not which, into the tent. During this moment of dangerous by-play, the sounds of a serious attack were very distinctly audible beneath. Paul had profited by the commotion over his head to change his place so far as to make room for Middleton. The latter was followed by the naturalist, who, in a state of mental aberration produced by the report of the musket, had instinctively rushed towards the rocks for cover. The trapper remained where he was last seen, an unmoved but close observer of the several proceedings. Though averse to enter into actual hostilities, the old man was, however, far from being useless. Favored by his position, he was enabled to apprise his friends of the movements of those who plotted their destruction above, and to advise and control their advance accordingly. In the meantime, the children of Esther were true to the spirit they had inherited from their redoubtable mother. The instant they found themselves delivered from the presence of Ellen and her unknown companion, they bestowed an undivided attention on their more masculine and certainly more dangerous assailants, who by this time had made a complete lodgment among the crags of the citadel. The repeated summons to surrender, which Paul uttered in a voice that he intended should strike terror into the young bosoms, were as little heeded as were the calls of the trapper to abandon a resistance, which might prove fatal to some among them without offering the smallest probability of eventual success. Encouraging each other to persevere, they poised the fragments of rocks, prepared the lighter missiles for immediate service, and thrust forward the barrels of the muskets with business-like air and a coolness that would have done credit to men practice in warfare. "'Keep under the ledge,' said the trapper, pointing out to Paul the manner in which he should proceed. "'Keep in your foot more, lad. Ah, you see the warning was not amiss.' Had the stone struck it, the bees would have had the prairies to themselves. 
Now, namesake of my friend, Uncas, in name and spirit, now, if you have the activity of Le Cerf Agile, you may make a far leap to the right, and gain twenty feet without danger. Beware the bush, beware the bush, t'will prove a treacherous hold. Ah, he has done it. Safely and bravely has he done it. Your turn comes next, friend. That follows the fruits of nature. Push you to the left, and divide the attention of the children. Nay, girls, fire! My old ears are used to the whistling of lead, and little reason have I to prove a doe heart with fourscore years on my back. He shook his head with a melancholy smile, but without flinching in a muscle as the bullet, which the exasperated Hetty fired, passed innocently at no great distance from the spot where he stood. It is safer keeping in your track than dodging when a weak finger pulls the trigger, he continued, but it is a solemn sight to witness how much human nature is inclined to evil in one so young. Well done, my man of beast and plants. Another such leap, and you may laugh at all the squatter's bars and walls. The doctor has got his temper up. I see it in his eye, and something good will come of him. Keep closer, man, keep closer. The trapper, though he was not deceived as to the state of Dr. Battis's mind, was, however, greatly in error as to the exciting cause. While imitating the movements of his companions, and toiling his way upwards with the utmost caution, and not without great inward tribulation, the eye of the naturalist had caught a glimpse of an unknown plant a few yards above his head, and in a situation more than commonly exposed to the missiles which the girls were unceasingly hurling in the direction of the assailants. Forgetting, in an instant, everything but the glory of being the first to give this jewel to the catalogues of science, he sprang upward at the prize with the avidity with which the sparrow darts upon the butterfly. The rocks, which instantly came thundering down, announced that he was seen, and for a moment, while his form was concealed in the cloud of dust and fragments which followed the furious descent, the trapper gave him up for lost. But the next instant he was seen safely seated in a cavity formed by some of the projecting stones which had yielded to the shock, holding triumphantly in his hand the captured stem which he was already devouring with delighted and certainly not unskillful eyes. Paul profited by the opportunity. Turning his course with the quickness of thought, he sprang to the post which Obed thus securely occupied, and unceremoniously making a footstool of his shoulder, as the latter stooped over his treasure, he bounded through the breach left by the fallen rock, and gained the level. He was followed by Middleton, who joined him in seizing and disarming the girls. In this manner, a bloodless and complete victory was obtained over that citadel, which Ishmael had vainly flattered himself might prove impregnable. Chapter 15 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck So smile the heavens upon this holy act, That after hours with sorrow chide us not. Shakespeare it is proper that the course of the narrative should be stayed, while we revert to those causes which have brought in their train of consequences the singular contest just related. The interruption must necessarily be as brief as we hope it may prove satisfactory to that class of readers who require that no gap should be left by those who assume the office of historians for their own fertile imaginations to fill. Among the troops sent by the government of the United States to take possession of its newly acquired territory in the West was a detachment led by a young soldier who has become so busy an actor in the scenes of our legend. The mild and indolent descendants of the ancient colonists received their new compatriots without distrust, well knowing that the transfer raised them from the condition of subjects to the more enviable distinction of citizens in a government of laws. The new rulers exercised their functions with discretion, and wielded their delegated authority without offense. In such a novel intermixture, however, of men born and nurtured in freedom, and the compliant minions of absolute power, the Catholic and the Protestant, the active and the indolent, some little time was necessary to blend the discrepant elements of society. In attaining so desirable an end, woman was made to perform her accustomed and grateful office. 
The barriers of prejudice and religion were broken through by the irresistible power of the master passion, and family unions, ere long, began to cement the political tie which had made a forced conjunction between people so opposite in their habits, their educations, and their opinions. Middleton was among the first of the new possessors of the soil, who became captive to the charms of a Louisiana lady. In the immediate vicinity of the post he had been directed to occupy, dwelt the chief of one of those ancient colonial families which had been content to slumber for ages among the ease, indolence, and wealth of the Spanish provinces. He was an officer of the crown, and had been induced to remove from the Floridas, among the French of the adjoining province, by a rich succession of which he has become the inheritor. The name of Don Augustin de Certavales was scarcely known beyond the limits of the little town in which he resided, though he found a secret pleasure himself in pointing it out, in large scrolls of musty documents, to an only child, as enrolled among the former heroes and grandees of old and of new Spain. This fact, so important to himself, and of so little moment to anybody else, was the principal reason that while his more vivacious Gallic neighbors were not slow to open a frank communion with their visitors, he chose to keep aloof, seemingly content with the society of his daughter, who was a girl just emerging from the condition of childhood into that of a woman. The curiosity of the youthful Inez, however, was not so inactive. She had not heard the martial music of the garrison, melting on the evening air, nor seen the strange banner which fluttered over the heights that rose at no great distance from her father's extensive grounds, without experiencing some of those secret impulses which are thought to distinguish the sex. Natural timidity, and that retiring and perhaps peculiar lassitude which forms the very groundwork of female fascination in the tropical provinces of Spain, held her in their seemingly indissoluble bonds and it is more than probable that had not an accident occurred in which Middleton was of some personal service to her father, so long a time would have elapsed before they met, that another direction might have been given to the wishes of one who was just of an age to be alive to all the power of youth and beauty. Providence, or, if that imposing word is too just to be classical, fate had otherwise decreed. The haughty and reserved Don Augustine, was by far too observant of the forms of that station, on which he so much valued himself to forget the duties of a gentleman. Gratitude, for the kindness of Middleton, induced him to open his doors to the officers of the garrison, and to admit of a guarded but polite intercourse. Reserve gradually gave way before the propriety and candor of their spirited young leader, and it was not long ere the influent planter rejoiced as much as his daughter whenever the well-known signal at the gate announced one of these agreeable visits from the commander of the post. It is unnecessary to dwell on the impression which the charms of Inez produced on the soldier, or to delay the tale, in order to write a wire-down account of the progressive influence that elegance of deportment, manly beauty, and undivided assiduity and intelligence were likely to produce on the sensitive mind of a romantic, warm-hearted, and secluded girl of sixteen. It is sufficient for our purpose to say that they loved, that the youth was not backward to declare his feelings, that he prevailed with some facility over the scruples of the maiden, and with no little difficulty over the objections of her father, and that before the province of Louisiana had been six months in the possession of the states, the officer of the latter was the affianced husband of the richest heiress on the banks of the Mississippi. Although we have presumed the reader to be acquainted with the manner in which such results are commonly attained, it is not to be supposed that the triumph of Middleton, either over the prejudices of the father or over those of the daughter, was achieved without difficulty. Religion formed a stubborn and nearly irremovable obstacle with both. The devoted man patiently submitted to a formidable essay Father Ignatius was deputed to make in order to convert him to the true faith. The effort on the part of the worthy priest was systematic, vigorous, and long-sustained. A dozen times it was at those moments when glimpses of the light, sylph-like, from Inez flitted like some fairy being past the scene of their conferences. The good father fancied he was on the eve of a glorious triumph over infidelity, but all his hopes were frustrated by some unlooked-for opposition on the part of the subject of his pious labors. 
So long as the assault on his faith was distant and feeble, Middleton, who was no great proficient in polemics, submitted to its effects with the patience and humility of a martyr. But the moment the good father, who felt such concern in his future happiness, was tempted to improve his vantage ground by calling in the aid of some of the peculiar subtilities of his own creed, the young man was too good a soldier not to make head against the hot attack. He came to the contest, it is true, with no weapons more formidable than common sense, and some little knowledge of the habits of his country as contrasted with that of his adversary. But with these home-bred implements he never failed to repulse the father with something of the power with which a nervous cudgel player would deal with a skilful master of the rapier, setting at naught his passados by the direct and unanswerable arguments of a broken head and a shivered weapon. Before the controversy was terminated, an inroad of Protestants had come to aid the soldier. The reckless freedom of such among them, as thought only of this life, and the consistent and tempered piety of others, caused the honest priest to look about him in concern. The influence of example on one hand, and the contamination of too free an intercourse on the other, began to manifest themselves even in that portion of his own flock, which he had supposed to be th too thoroughly folded in spiritual government ever to stray. It was time to turn his thoughts from the offensive, and to prepare his followers to resist the lawless deluge of opinion, which threatened to break down the barriers of their faith. Like a wise commander, who finds he has occupied too much ground for the amount of his force, he began to curtail his outworks. The relics were concealed from profane eyes. His people were admonished not to speak of miracles before a race that not only denied their existence, but who had even the desperate hardihood to challenge their proofs and even the Bible itself was prohibited with terrible denunciations for the triumphant reason that it was liable to be misinterpreted. In the meantime it became necessary to report to Don Augustine the effects his arguments and prayers had produced on the heretical disposition of the young soldier. No man is prone to confess his weakness at the very moment when circumstances demand the utmost efforts of his strength. By a species of pious fraud, for which no doubt the worthy priest found his absolution in the purity of his motives, he declared that, while no positive change was actually wrought in the mind of Middleton, there was every reason to hope the entering wedge of argument had been driven to its head, and that in consequence an opening was left, through which it might rationally be hoped the blessed seeds of a religious fruitification would find their way, especially if the subject was left uninterruptedly to enjoy the advantage of Catholic communion. Don Augustine himself was now seized with the desire of proselyting. Even the soft and amiable Inez thought it would be a glorious consummation of her wishes to be a humble instrument of bringing her lover into the bosom of the true church. The offers of Middleton were promptly accepted, and while the father looked forwardly impatiently to the day assigned for the nuptials as to the pledge of his own success, the daughter thought of it with feelings in which the holy emotions of her faith were blended with the softer sensations of her years and situation. The sun rose, the morning of her nuptials, on a day so bright and cloudless that Inez hailed it as a harbinger of future happiness. Father Ignatius performed the offices of the church in a little chapel attached to the estate of Don Augustine, and long ere the sun had begun to fall, Middleton pressed the blushing and timid young Creole to his bosom his acknowledged and unalienable wife. It had pleased the parties to pass the day of the wedding in retirement, dedicating it solely to the best and purest affections, aloof from the noisy and heartless rejoicings of a compelled festivity. Middleton was returning through the grounds of Don Augustine from a visit of duty to his encampment, at that hour in which the light of the sun begins to melt into the shadows of the evening, when a glimpse of a robe, similar to that in which Inez had accompanied him to the altar, caught his eye through the foliage of a retired arbor. He approached the spot with a delicacy that was rather increased than diminished by the claim she had perhaps given him to intrude on her private moments but the sounds of her soft voice, which was offering up prayers, in which he heard himself named by the dearest of all appellations, overcame his scruples, and induced him to take a position where he might listen without the fear of detection. It was certainly grateful to the feelings of a husband to be able in this manner to lay bare the spotless soul of his wife, and to find out his own image lay enshrined amid its purest and holiest aspirations. 
His self-esteem was too much flattered not to induce him to overlook the immediate object of the petitioner. While she prayed that she might become the humble instrument of bringing him into the flock of the faithful, she petitioned for forgiveness on her own behalf. If presumption or indifference to the counsel of the church had caused her to set too high a value on her influence, and led her into the dangerous error of hazarding her own soul by espousing a heretic. There was so much of fervent piety mingled with so strong a burst of natural feeling, so much of the woman blended with the angel in her prayers, that Middleton could have forgiven her had she termed him a pagan, for the sweetness and interest with which she petitioned in his favor. The young man waited until his bride arose from her knees, and then he joined her as if entirely ignorant of what had occurred. "'It is getting late, my Inez,' he said, "'and Don Augustine would be apt to reproach you with inattention to your health in being abroad at such an hour. What then am I to do, who am charged with all his authority and twice his love?' "'Be like him in everything,' she answered, looking up in his face with tears in her eyes, and speaking with emphasis. "'In everything. Imitate my father, Middleton, and I can ask no more of you.' "'Nor for me, Inez. I doubt not that I should be all you can wish, were I to become as good as the worthy and respectable Don Augustine. But you are to make some allowances for the infirmities and habits of a soldier. Now let us go and join this excellent father.' "'Not yet.' said his bride, gently extricating herself from the arm that he had thrown around her slight form, while he urged her from the place. I still have another duty to perform, before I can submit so implicitly to your orders, soldier though you are. I promise the worthy Inesella, my faithful nurse, she who, as you heard, has so long been a mother to me, Middleton, I promise her a visit at this hour. It is the last, as she thinks, that she can receive from her own child, and I cannot disappoint her. Go you then to Don Augustine. In one short hour I will rejoin you. Remember, it is but an hour. One hour, repeated Inez, as she kissed her hand to him, and then, blushing, ashamed at her own boldness, she darted from the arbor, and was seen for an instant gliding towards the cottage of her nurse, in which at the next moment she disappeared. Middleton returned slowly and thoughtfully to the house, often bending his eyes in the direction in which he had last seen his wife, as if he would fain trace her lovely form in the gloom of the evening, still floating through the vacant space. Don Augustine received him with warmth, and for many minutes his mind was amused by relating to his new kinsman plans for the future. The exclusive old Spaniard listened to his glowing but true account of the prosperity and happiness of those states of which he had been an ignorant neighbor half his life, partly in wonder, and partly with that sort of incredulity with which one attends to what he fancies are the exaggerated descriptions of a too partial friendship. In this manner the hour for which Enos had conditioned passed away, much sooner than her husband could have thought possible in her absence. At length his looks began to wander to the clock, and then the minutes were counted, as one rolled by after another, and Enos did not appear. The hand had already made half of another circuit around the face of the dial, when Middleton arose and announced his determination to go and offer himself as an escort to the absentee. He found the night dark, and the heavens charged with threatening vapor, which in that climate was the infallible forerunner of a gust. Stimulated no less by the unpropitious aspect of the skies than by his secret uneasiness, he quickened his pace, making long and rapid strides in the direction of the cottage of Inesella. Twenty times he stopped, fancying that he caught glimpses of the fairy form of Inez, tripping across the grounds, on her return to the mansion-house, and, as often, he was obliged to resume his course in disappointment. He reached the gate of the cottage, knocked, opened the door, entered, and even stood in the presence of the aged nurse, without meeting the person of her he sought. She had already left the place, on her return to her father's house. Believing that he must have passed her in the darkness, Middleton retraced his steps to meet with another disappointment. Enos had not been seen. Without communicating his intention to anyone, the bridegroom proceeded with a palpitating heart to the little sequestered harbor, where he had overheard his bride offering up those petitions for his happiness and conversion. Here, too, he was disappointed, and then all was afloat in the painful incertitude of doubt and conjecture. 
For many hours a secret distrust of the motives of his wife caused Middleton to proceed in the search with delicacy and caution. But as day dawned, without restoring her to the arms of her father or her husband, reserve was thrown aside, and her unaccountable absence was loudly proclaimed. The inquiries after the lost Inez were now direct and open, but they proved equally fruitless. No one had seen her or heard of her from the moment she left the cottage of her nurse. Day succeeded day, and still no tidings rewarded the search that was immediately instituted, until she was finally given over, by most of her relations and friends, as irretrievably lost. An event of so extraordinary a character was not likely to be soon forgotten. It excited speculation, gave rise to an infinity of rumors, and not a few inventions. The prevalent opinion among such of those immigrants who were overrunning the country, as had time, in the multitude of their employments, to think of any foreign concerns, was the simple and direct conclusion that the absent bride was no more nor less than a philo de se. Father Ignatius had many doubts and much secret compunction of conscience, but, like a wise chief, he endeavored to turn the sad event to some account in the impending warfare of faith. Changing his battery, he whispered in the ears of a few of his oldest parishioners that he had been deceived in the state of Middleton's mind, which he was now compelled to believe was completely stranded on the quicksands of heresy. He began to show his relics again, and was even heard to allude once more to the delicate and nearly forgotten subject of modern miracles. In consequence of these demonstrations, on the part of the venerable priest, it came to be whispered among the faithful, and finally it was adopted as part of the parish creed, that Enos had been translated to heaven. Don Augustine had all the feelings of a father, but they were smothered in the lassitude of a creole. Like a spiritual governor, he began to think that they had been wrong in consigning one so pure, so young, so lovely, and above all so pious, to the arms of a heretic. And he was fain to believe that the calamity which had befallen his age was a judgment on his presumption and want of adherence to established forms. It is true that as the whispers of the congregation came to his ears, he found present consolation in their belief. But then nature was too powerful and had too strong a hold of the old man's heart not to give rise to the rebellious thought that the succession of his daughter to the heavenly inheritance was a little premature. But Middleton, the lover, the husband, the bridegroom, Middleton was nearly crushed by the weight of the unexpected and terrible blow. Educated himself under the dominion of a simple and rational faith, in which nothing is attempted to be concealed from the believers, he could have no other apprehensions for the faith of Inez than such as grew out of his knowledge of the superstitious opinions she entertained of his own church. It is needless to dwell on the mental tortures that he endured, or all the various surmises, hopes, and disappointments that he was fated to experience in the first few weeks of his misery. A jealous distrust of the motives of Inez, and a secret, lingering hope that he should yet find her, had tempered his inquiries, without, however, causing him to abandon them entirely. But time was beginning to deprive him even of the mortifying reflection that he was intentionally, though perhaps temporarily, deserted, and he was gradually yielding to the more painful conviction that she was dead when his hopes were suddenly revived in a new and singular manner. The young commander was slowly and sorrowfully returning from an evening parade of his troops to his own quarters, which stood at some little distance from the place of the encampment, and on the same high bluff of land, when his vacant eyes fell on the figure of a man who, by the regulations of the place, was not entitled to be there at that forbidden hour. The stranger was meanly dressed, with every appearance about his person and countenance, of squalid poverty and of the most dissolute habits. Sorrow had softened the military pride of Middleton, and, as he passed the crouching form of the intruder, he said, in tones of great mildness, or, rather, of kindness, You will be given a night in the guardhouse, friend, should the patrol find you here. There is a dower. Go, and get a better place to sleep in, and something to eat. I will swallow all my food, Captain, without chewing, returned the vagabond, with a low exultation of an accomplished villain, as he eagerly seized the silver. Make this Mexican twenty, and I will sell you a secret. Go, go, said the other, with a little of his soldier's severity, returning to his manner. Go, before I order the guard to seize you. Well, go, I will. But if I do go, Captain, I shall take my knowledge with me, and then you may live a widower, betwitched till the tattoo of life is beat off. 
"'What mean you, fellow?' exclaimed Middleton, turning quickly towards the wretch, who was already dragging his diseased limbs from the place. "'I mean to have the value of this dollar in Spanish brandy, and then to come back and sell you my secret for enough to buy a barrel.' "'If you have anything to say, speak now,' continued Middleton, restraining with difficulty the impatience that urged him to betray his feelings. "'I am dry, and I can never talk with elegance when my throat is husky, Captain. How much will you give to know what I can tell you? Let it be something handsome, such as one gentleman can offer to another.' "'I believe it would be better justice to order the drummer to pay you a visit, fellow. To what does your boasted secret relate?' "'Matrimony. A wife and no wife. A pretty face and a rich bride.' Do I speak plain now, Captain? If you know anything relating to my wife, say it at once. You need not fear for your reward. Ay, Captain, I have drove many a bargain in my time, and sometimes I have been paid in money, and sometimes I have been paid in promises. Now the last are what I call pinching food. Name your price. Twenty. No, damn it, it's worth thirty dollars if it's worth a cent. Here, then, is your money, but remember, if you tell me nothing worth knowing, I have a force that can easily deprive you of it again, and punish your insolence in the bargain." The fellow examined the bank bills he received with a jealous eye, and then pocketed them, apparently well satisfied of their being genuine. "'I like a northern note,' he said very coolly. "'They have a character to lose like myself. No fear of me, Captain. I am a man of honor, and I shall not tell you a word more, nor a word less than I know of my own knowledge to be true. Proceed, then, without further delay or I may repent, and order you to be deprived of all your gains, the silver as well as the notes. Honor, if you die for it, returned the miscreant, holding up a hand in affected horror at so treacherous a threat. Well, Captain, you must know that gentlemen don't all live by the same calling. Some keep what they've got, and some get what they can. You've been a thief. I scorn the word. I have been a humanity hunter. Do you know what that means? Ay, it has many interpretations. Some people think the woolly heads are miserable, working on hot plantations under a broiling sun, and all such sorts of inconveniences. Well, Captain, I have been in my time a man who has been willing to give them the pleasures of variety, at least, by changing the scene for them. You understand me? You are in plain language a kidnapper. Have been, my worthy Captain, have been, but just now a little reduced, like a merchant who leaves off selling tobacco by the hogshead, to deal in it by the yard. I have been a soldier, too, in my day. What is said to be the great secret of our trade, can you tell me that?" "'I know not,' said Middleton, beginning to tire of the fellow's trifling. "'Courage!' "'No. Legs. Legs to fight with, and legs to run away with. And therein you see my two callings agreed. My legs are none of the best just now, and without legs a kidnapper would carry on a losing trade. But then there are men enough left, better provided than I am. Stolen groaned the horror-struck husband. Honor travels, as sure as you are standing still. Villain, what reason have you for believing a thing so shocking? Hands off, hands off, do you think my tongue can do its work for the better for a little squeezing of the throat? Have patience, and you shall know it all. But if you treat me so ungenteely again, I shall be obliged to call in the assistance of the lawyers. Say on, but if you utter a single word more or less than the truth, expect instant vengeance. Are you fool enough to believe what such a scoundrel as I am tells you, Captain, unless it has probability to back it? I know you are not, therefore. I will give my facts and my opinions, and then leave you to chew on them, while I go and drink of your generosity. I know a man who is called Abram White. I believe the knave took the name to show his enmity to the race of blacks. But this gentleman is now, and has been for years, to my certain knowledge, a regular translator of the human body from one state to another. I have dealt with him in my time, and a cheating dog he is. No more honor in him than meat in my stomach. I saw him here in this very town, the day of your wedding. He was in company with his wife's brother, and pretended to be a settler on the hunt for a new land. A noble set they were, to carry on business, seven sons, each of them as tall as your sergeant with his cap on. Well, the moment I heard that your wife was lost, I saw at once that Abram had laid his hands on her. Do you know this? Can this be true? What reason have you to fancy a thing so wild? Reason enough. I know Abram White. Now, will you add a trifle, just to keep my throat from parching? Go, go. You are stupefied with drink already, miserable man, and know not what you say. 
Go, go, and beware the drummer. Experience is a good guide. The fellow called after a retiring Middleton, and then turning with a chuckling laugh, like one well satisfied with himself, he made the best of his way towards the shop of the sutler. A hundred times in the course of that night did Middleton fancy that the communication of the miscreant was entitled to some attention, and as often did he reject the idea as too wild and visionary for another thought. He was awakened early on the following morning, after passing a restless and nearly sleepless night, by his orderly, who came to report that a man was found dead on the parade, at no great distance from his quarters. Throwing on his clothes, he proceeded to the spot, and beheld the individual with whom he had held the preceding conference, in the precise situation in which he had first been found. The miserable wretch had fallen a victim to his intemperance. This revolting fact was sufficiently proclaimed by his obtruding eyeballs, his bloated countenance, and the nearly insufferable odors that were even then exhaling from his carcass. Disgusted with the odious spectacle, the youth was turning from the sight, after ordering the corpse to be removed, when the position of one of the dead men's hands struck him. On examination, he found the forefinger extended, as if in the act of writing in the sand, with the following incomplete sentence, nearly illegible, but yet in the state to be deciphered. Captain, it is true, as I am a gentle. He had either died, or fallen into a sleep, the forerunner of his death, before the latter word was finished. Concealing this fact from the others, Middleton repeated his orders and departed. The pertinacity of the deceased and all the circumstances united induced him to set on foot some secret inquiries. He found that a family answering the description which had been given him had in fact passed the place the day of his nuptials. They were traced among the margin of the Mississippi for some distance until they took boat and ascended the river to its confluence with the Missouri. Here they had disappeared like hundreds of others in pursuit of the hidden wealth of the interior. Furnished with these facts, Middleton detailed the small guard of his most trusty men, took leave of Don Augustine without declaring his hopes or his fears, and having arrived at the indicated point, he pushed into the wilderness in pursuit. It was not difficult to trace a train like that of Ishmael until he was well assured its object lay far beyond the usual limits of the settlements. This circumstance in itself quickened his suspicions and gave additional force to his hopes of final success. After getting beyond the assistance of verbal directions, the anxious husband had recourse to the usual signs of a trail in order to follow the fugitives. This he also found a task of no difficulty until he reached the hard and unyielding soil of the rolling prairies. Here, indeed, he was completely at fault. He found himself at length compelled to divide his followers appointing a place of rendezvous at a distant day, and to endeavor to find a lost trail by multiplying, as much as possible, the number of his eyes. He had been alone a week, when accident brought him in contact with the trapper and the bee-hunter. Part of their interview had been related, and the reader can readily imagine the explanations that succeeded the tale he recounted, and which led, as has already been seen, to the recovery of his bride. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. These likelihoods confirm her flight from hence. Therefore, I pray you, stay not to discourse, but mount you presently. Shakespeare. An hour had slid by in hasty and nearly incoherent questions and answers, before Middleton, hanging over his recovered treasure with that sort of jealous watchfulness with which a miser would regard his hoards, closed the disjointed narrative of his own proceedings by demanding, "'And you, my Inez, in what manner were you treated?' "'In everything but the great injustice they did in separating me so forcibly from my friends, as well, perhaps, as the circumstances of my captors would allow.' I think the man, who is certainly the master here, is but a new beginner in wickedness. He quarreled frightfully in my presence, with the wretch who sees me, and then they made an impious bargain, to which I was compelled to acquiesce, and to which they bow me as well as themselves by oaths. Ah, Middleton, I fear the heretics are not so heedful of their vows as we who are nurtured in the bosom of the true church. Believe it or not, these villains are of no religion. Did they forswear themselves? No, 
not perjured, but was it not awful to call upon the good God to witness so sinful a compact? And so we think, Inez, as truly as the most virtuous cardinal of Rome. But how did they observe their oath, and what was its purport? They conditioned to leave me unmolested, and free from their odious presence, provided I would give a pledge to make no effort to escape, and that I would not even show myself until a time that my master saw fit to name. And that time? demanded the impatient Middleton, who so well knew the religious scruples of his wife. That time? It is already past. I was sworn by my patron saint, and faithfully did I keep the vow, until the man they called Ishmael forgot the terms by offering violence. I then made my appearance on the rock, for the time, too, was past. Though I even think Father Ignatius would have absolved me from the vow, on account of the treachery of my keepers. If he had not, muttered the youth between his compressed teeth, I would have absolved him forever from his spiritual care of your conscience. You, Middleton? returned his wife, looking up into his flushed face, while a bright blush suffused her own sweet countenance. You may receive my vows, but surely you can have no power to absolve me from their observance. No, 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 Inez, you are right. I know but little of these conscientious subtilities, and I am anything but a priest. Yet tell me, what has induced these monsters to play this desperate game to trifle thus with my happiness? You know my ignorance of the world, and how ill I am qualified to furnish reasons for the conduct of beings so different from any I have ever seen before. But does not love of money drive men to acts even worse than this? I believe they thought that an aged and wealthy father could be tempted to pay them a rich ransom for his child, and perhaps, she added, stealing an inquiring glance through her tears, at the attentive Middleton, they counted something on the fresh affections of a bridegroom. They might have extracted the blood from my heart, drop by drop. Yes, resumed his young and timid wife, instantly withdrawing the stolen look she had hazarded, and hurriedly pursuing the train of the discourse, as if glad to make him forget the liberty she had just taken. I have been told there are men so base as to perjure themselves at the altar, in order to command the gold of ignorant and confiding girls, and if love of money will lead to such baseness, we may surely expect it will hurry those who devote themselves to gain into acts of lesser fraud. It must be so. And now, Inez, though I am here to guard you with my life, and we are in possession of this rock, our difficulties, perhaps our dangers, are not ended. You will summon all your courage to meet the trial, and prove yourself a soldier's wife, my Inez. I am ready to depart this instant. The letter you sent by the physician had prepared me to hope for the best, and I have everything arranged for flight at the shortest warning. Let us then leave this place and join our friends. Friends? interrupted Inez, glancing her eyes around the little tent in quest of the form of Owen. I, too, have a friend who must not be forgotten, but who is pledged to pass the remainder of her life with us. She is gone. Middleton gently led her from the spot, as he smilingly answered, She may have had, like myself, her own private communications for some favored ear. The young man had not, however, done justice to the motives of Ellen Wade, the sensitive and intelligent girl had readily perceived how little her presence was necessary in the interview that had just been related, and had retired with that intuitive delicacy of feeling, which seems to belong more properly to her sex. She was now to be seen seated on a point of the rock, with her person so entirely enveloped in her dress as to conceal her features. Here she had remained for near an hour, no one approaching to address her, and as it appeared to her own quick and jealous eyes, totally unobserved. In the latter particular, however, even the vigilance of the quick-sighted Owen was deceived. The first act of Paul Hover, on finding himself the master of Ishmael's citadel, had been to sound the note of victory after the quaint and ludicrous manner that is so often practiced among the borders of the West. Flapping his sides with his hands, as the conquering gamecock is wont to do with his wings, he raised a loud and laughable imitation of the exultation of this bird. A cry, which might have proved a dangerous challenge had any one of the athletic sons of the squatter been within hearing. "'This has been a regular knock-down and drag-out,' he cried, "'and no bones broke. How now, old trapper? You have been one of your training, platoon, rank, and file soldiers in your day, and have you seen forts taken and batteries stormed before this? Am I right?' "'Aye, aye, that have I,' 
answered the old man, who still maintained his post at the foot of the rock, so little disturbed by what he had just witnessed, as to return the grin of Paul, with a hearty indulgence in his own silent and peculiar laughter. You have gone through the exploit like men. Now tell me, is it not in rule to call over the names of the living and to bury the dead after every bloody battle? Some did, and others some didn't. When Sir William pushed the German Dieskau throw the defiles at the foot of the hoary, your Sir William was drawn to Sir Paul, and knew nothing of regularity. So here begins the roll call. By and by, old man, what between bee-hunting and buffalo humps, and certain other matters? I have been too busy to ask your name, for I intend to begin with my rear guard, well knowing that my man in front is too busy to answer. Lord, lad, I have been called in my time by as many names as there are people among whom I have dwelt. Now the Delawares name me for my eyes, and I was called after the far-sighted hawk. Then, agent, the settlers in the Otsego Hills christened me anew, from the fashion of my leggings, and various have been the names by which I have gone through life, but little will it matter when the time shall come that all are to be mustered face to face by what titles a mortal has played his part. I humbly trust I shall be able to answer to any of mine in a loud and manly voice." Paul paid little or no attention to this reply, more than half of which was lost in the distance, but pursuing the humor of the moment, he called out in a stentorian voice to the naturalist to answer to his name. Dr. Battius had not thought it necessary to push his success beyond the comfortable niche which accident had so opportunely formed for his protection, and in which he now reposed from his labors, with a pleasing consciousness of security added to great exultation at the possession of the botanical treasure already mentioned. Mount, mount, my worthy mole-catcher, come and behold the prospect of skirting Ishmael. Come and look nature boldly in the face, and not go sneaking any longer among the prairie grass and mullen tops, like a gobbler nibbling for grasshoppers. The mouth of the light-hearted and reckless bee-hunter was instantly closed, and he was rendered as mute as he had just been boisterous and talkative by the appearance of Ellen Wade. When the melancholy maiden took her seat on the point of the rock as mentioned, Paul affected to employ himself in conducting a close inspection of the household effects of the squatter. He rummaged the drawers of Esther with no delicate hands, scattered the rustic finery of her girls on the ground, without the least deference to its quality or elegance, and tossed her pots and kettles here and there, as though they had been vessels of wood instead of iron. All this industry was, however, manifestly without an object. He reserved nothing for himself, not even appearing conscious of the nature of the articles which suffered by his familiarity. When he had examined the inside of every cabin, taken a fresh survey of the spot where he had confined the children, and where he had thoroughly secured them with cords, and kicked one of the pails of the women, like a football fifty feet into the air, in sheer wantonness, he returned to the edge of the rock, and thrusting both his hands through his wampum belt, he began to whistle the Kentucky Hunters as diligently as if he had been hired to supply his auditors with music by the hour. In this manner he passed the remainder of the time, until Middleton, as has been related, led Enos forth from the tent, and gave a new direction to the thoughts of the whole party. He summoned Paul from his flourish of music, tore the doctor from the study of his plant, and as acknowledged leader gave the necessary orders for immediate departure. In the bustle and confusion that were likely to succeed such a mandate, there was little opportunity to indulge in complaints or reflections. As the adventurers had not come unprepared for victory, each individual employed himself in such offices as were best adapted to his strength and situation. The trapper had already made himself master of the patient Asinus, who was quietly feeding at no great distance from the rock, and he was now busy in fitting his back with the complicated machinery that Dr. Battius saw fit to term a saddle of his own invention. The naturalist himself seized upon his portfolios, herbals, and collection of insects, which he quickly transferred from the encampment of the squatter to certain pockets in the aforesaid ingenious invention, and which the trapper, as uniformly, cast away the moment his back was turned. Paul showed his dexterity in removing such light articles as Enos and Ellen had prepared for their flight to the foot of the citadel, while Middleton, after mingling threats and promises, in order to induce the children to remain quietly in their bondage, assisted the females to descend. As time began to press upon them, and there was great danger of Ishmael's returning, these several movements were made with singular industry and dispatch. 
The trapper bestowed such articles as he conceived were necessary to the comfort of the weaker and more delicate members of the party, in those pockets from which he had so unceremoniously expelled the treasures of the unconscious naturalist, and then gave way for Middleton to place Inez in one of those seats which he had prepared on the back of the animal for her and her companion. "'Go, child,' the old man said, motioning to Ellen to follow the example of the lady, and turning his head a little anxiously to examine the waist behind him. "'It cannot be long afore the owner of this place will be coming to look after his household, and he is not a man to give up his property, however obtained, without complaint.' "'It is true,' cried Middleton. "'We have wasted moments that are precious, and have the utmost need for industry.' "'Ay, ay, I thought it, and would have said it, Captain, but I remembered how your grandfather used to love to look upon the face of her he led away for a wife in the days of his youth and his happiness.' "'Tis nature, tis nature, and tis wiser to give way little before its feelings than to try to stop a current that will have its course." Ellen advanced to the side of the beast, and seizing Inez by the hand, she said with heartfelt warmth, after struggling to suppress an emotion that nearly choked her, "'God bless you, sweet lady. I hope you will forget and forgive the wrongs you have received from my uncle.' The humbled and sorrowful girl could say no more her voice becoming entirely inaudible in an ungovernable burst of grief. "'How is this?' cried Middleton. "'Did you not say, Inez, that this excellent young woman was to accompany us, and to live with us for the remainder of her life, or at least until she found some more agreeable residence for herself?' "'I did, and I still hope it. She has always given me reason to believe that after having shown so much commiseration and friendship in my misery, she would not desert me, should happier times return.' "'I cannot, I ought not,' continued Owen, getting the better of her momentary weakness. "'It has pleased God to cast my lot among these people, and I ought not to quit them. It would be adding the appearance of treachery to what will already seem bad enough with one of his opinions. He has been kind to me, an orphan, after his rough customs, and I cannot steal from him at such a moment.' "'She is just as much a relation of skirting Ishmael as I am a bishop,' said Paul, with a loud hem, as if his throat wanted clearing. If the old fellow has done the honest thing by her, in giving her a morsel of venison now and then, or a spoon around his hominy dish, hasn't she paid him in teaching the young devils to read their Bible, or in helping old Esser to put her finery in shape and fashion? Tell me that a drone has a sting, and I'll believe you as easily as I will, that this young woman is a debtor to any of the tribe of Bush. It is but little matter who owes me, or where I am in debt. There are none to care for a girl who is fatherless and motherless and whose nearest kin are the offcasts of all honest people. No, no, go, lady, and heaven forever bless you. I am better here in this desert, where there are none to know my shame. Now, old trapper, retorted Paul, this is what I call knowing which way the wind blows. You are a man that has seen life, and you know something of fashions. I put it to your judgment plainly. Isn't it in the nature of things for the hive to swarm when the young get their growth? And if children will quit their parents, ought one who is of no kith or ken? Ish, interrupted the man he addressed. Hector is discontented. Say it out plainly, pup. What is it, dog? What is it? The venerable hound had risen, and was scenting the fresh breeze, which continued to sleep heavily over the prairie. At the words of his master, he growled and contracted the muscles of his lips, as if half disposed to threaten with the remnants of his teeth. The younger dog, who was resting after the chase of the morning, also made some signs that his nose detected a taint in the air, and then the two resumed their slumbers as if they had done enough. The trapper seized the bridle of the ass and cried, urging the beast onward. There are no time for words. The squatter and his brood are within a mile or two of this blessed spot. Middleton lost all recollection of Owen in the danger which now so imminently beset his recovered bride nor is it necessary to add that Dr. Battius did not wait for a second admonition to commence his retreat. Following the route indicated by the old man, they turned the rock in a body, and pursued their way as fast as possible across the prairie under the favor of the cover it afforded. Paul Hover, however, remained in his tracks, sullenly leaning on his rifle. Near a minute had elapsed before he was observed by Ellen, who had buried her face in her hands to conceal her fancied desolation from herself. "'Why do you not fly?' the weeping girl exclaimed, the instant she perceived she was not alone. "'I'm not used to it.' "'My uncle will soon be here. You have nothing to hope from his pity.' 
nor from that of his niece, I reckon. Let him come. He can only knock me on the head. Pa, pa, if you love me, fly. Alone? If I do, may I be, if you value your life, fly. I value it not, compared to you. Pa. Ellen? She extended both her hands, and burst into another and still more violent flood of tears. The bee-hunter put one of his sturdy arms around her waist, and in another moment he was urging her over the plain in rapid pursuit of their flying friends. End of chapter 16、Chapter 17 of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Approach the chamber, and destroy your sight, with a new gorgon do, not bid me speak. See, and then speak yourselves. Shakespeare The little run, which supplied the family of the squatter with water, and nourished the trees and bushes that grew near the base of the rocky eminence, took its rise at no great distance from the latter, in a small thicket of cottonwood and vines. Hither, then, the trapper directed the flight, as to the place affording the only available cover in so pressing an emergency. It will be remembered that the sagacity of the old man, which, from long practice in similar scenes, amounted nearly to an instinct in all cases of sudden danger, had first induced him to take this course, as it placed the hill between them and the approaching party. Favored by this circumstance, he succeeded in reaching the bushes in sufficient time, and Paul Hover had just hurried the breathless Ellen into the tangled bush, as Ishmael gained the summit of the rock in the manner already described, where he stood like a man momentarily bereft of sense, gazing at the confusion which had been created among his shadows, or at his gagged and bound children, who had been safely bestowed, by the forethought of the bee-hunter, under the cover of a bark roof, in a sort of irregular pile. A long rifle would have thrown a bullet from the height on which the squatter now stood, into the very cover where the fugitives, who had wrought all this mischief, were clustered. The trapper was the first to speak, as the man on whose intelligence and experience they all depended for counsel, after running his eye over the different individuals who gathered about him, in order to see that none were missing. "'Ah, nature is nature!' and has done its work, he said, nodding to the exulting paw with a smile of approbation. I thought it would be a hard for those who had so often met in fair and foul, by starlight and under the clouded moon, to part at last in anger. Now there is little time to lose in talk, and everything to gain by industry. It cannot be long afore some of the yonder brood will be nosing along the earth for our trail, and should they find it, as find it they surely will, and should they push us to a stand on our courage, the dispute must be settled with the rifle. Which may he in heaven forbid. Captain, can you lead us to the place where any of your warriors lie? For the stout sons of the squatter will make a manly brush of it, or I am but a little of a judge in warlike dispositions. The place of rendezvous is many leagues from this, on the banks of La Platte. It is bad, it is bad. If fighting is to be done, it is always wise to enter on it on equal terms. But what has one so near his time to do with ill blood and hot blood at his heart? Listen to what a gray head and some experience have to offer, and then, if any among you can point out a wiser fashion for a retreat, we can just follow his design and forget that I have spoken. This thicket stretches for near a mile, as it may be slanting from the rock, and leads towards the sunset instead of the settlements. "'Enough, enough!' cried Middleton, too impatient to wait until the deliberative and perhaps loquacious old man could end his minute explanation. "'Time is too precious for words. Let us fly!' The trapper made a gesture of compliance, and turning in his tracks, he led Asinus across the trembling earth of the swale, and quickly emerged on the hard ground on the side opposite to the encampment of the squatter. "'If old Ishmael gets a squint at that highway through the brush,' cried Paul, casting, as he left the place, a hasty glance at the broad trail the party had made through the thicket. He'll need no fingerboard to tell him which way his road lies, but let him follow. I know the vagabond would gladly cross his breed with a little honest blood, but if any son of his ever gets to be the husband of— "'Hush, Paul, hush!' said the terrified young woman, who leaned on his arm for support. 
your voice might be heard. The bee hunter was silent, though he did not cease to cast ominous looks behind him, as they flew along the edge of the run which sufficiently betrayed the belligerent condition of his mind. As each one was busy for himself, but a few minutes elapsed before the party rose a swell of the prairie, and descending without a moment's delay on the opposite side, they were at once removed from every danger of being seen by the sons of Ishmael, unless the pursuers should happen to fall upon their trail. The old man now profited by the formation of the land to take another direction, with a view to elude pursuit, as a vessel changes her course in fogs and darkness, to escape from the vigilance of her enemies. Two hours passed in the utmost diligence enabled them to make a half-circuit around the rock, and to reach a point that was exactly opposite to the original direction of their flight. To most of the fugitives their situation was as entirely unknown as is that of a ship in the middle of the ocean to the uninstructed voyager. But the old man proceeded at every turn, and through every bottom, with a decision that inspired his followers with confidence, as it spoke favorably of his own knowledge of the localities. His hound, stopping now and then to catch the expression of his eye, had preceded the trapper throughout the whole distance, with as much certainty as though a previous and intelligible communion between them had established the route by which they were to proceed. But, at the expiration of the time, just named, the dog suddenly came to a stand, and then seating himself on the prairie, he snuffed the air a moment, and began a low and piteous whining. "'Ay, pup, ay!' I know the spot, I know the spot, and reason there is to remember it well," said the old man, stopping by the side of his uneasy associate, until those who followed had time to come up. Now, yonder is a thicket before us, he continued, pointing forward, where we may lie till tall trees grow on these naked fields, afore any of the squatter's kin will venture to molest us. This is the spot where the body of the dead man lay cried Middleton, examining the place with an eye that revolted at the recollection. The very same, but whether his friends have put him in the bosom of the ground or not remains to be seen. The hound knows the scent, but seems to be a little at loss too. It is therefore necessary that you advance, friend bee-hunter, to examine, while I tarry to keep the dogs from complaining in too loud a voice. I exclaimed Paul, thrusting his hand into his shaggy locks, like one who thought it prudent to hesitate before he undertook so formidable an adventure. Now hark ye, old trapper, I've stood in my thinnest cottons in the midst of a many a swarm that has lost its queen bee, without winking, and let me tell you, the man who can do that is not likely to fear any living son of skirting Ishmael, but as to meddling with dead men's bones, why it is neither my calling nor my inclination. So, after thanking you for the favor of your choice, as they say, when they make a man a corporal in Kentucky, I decline serving. The old man turned a disappointed look towards Middleton, who was much too occupied in solacing Inez to observe his embarrassment, which was, however, suddenly relieved from a quarter whence, from previous circumstances, there was little reason to expect such a demonstration of fortitude. Dr. Battius had rendered himself a little remarkable throughout the whole of the preceding retreat, for the exceeding diligence with which he had labored to effect that desirable object. So very conspicuous was his zeal, indeed, as to have entirely gotten the better of all his ordinary predilections. The worthy naturalist belonged to that species of discoverers who make the worst possible traveling companions to a man who has reason to be in a hurry. No stone, no bush, no plant is ever suffered to escape the examination of their vigilant eyes, and thunder may mutter, and rain fall, without disturbing the abstraction of their reveries. Not so, however, with the disciple of Linnaeus, during the momentous period that it remained a mooted point at the tribunal of his better judgment, whether the stout descendants of the squatter were not likely to dispute his right to traverse the prairie in freedom. The highest-blooded and best-trained hound, with his new game in view, could not have run with an eye more riveted than that with which the doctor had pursued his curvilinear course. It was perhaps lucky for his fortitude that he was ignorant of the artifice of the trapper in leading them around the citadel of Ishmael, and that he had imbibed the soothing impression that every inch of prairie he traversed was just so much added to the distance between his own person and the detested rock. Notwithstanding the momentary shock he certainly experienced, 
when he discovered this error, he now boldly volunteered to enter the thicket in which there was some reason to believe the body of the murdered Asa still lay. Perhaps the naturalist was urged to show his spirit on this occasion by some secret consciousness that his excessive industry in the retreat might be liable to misconstruction, and it is certain that, whatever might be his peculiar notions of danger from the quick, his habits and his knowledge had placed him far above the apprehension of suffering harm from any communication with the dead. "'If there is any service to be performed, which requires the perfect command of the nervous system,' said the man of science, with a look that was slightly blustering, "'you have only to give a direction to his intellectual faculties, and here stands one on whose physical powers you may depend.' "'The man is given to speak in parables,' muttered the single-minded trapper. "'But I conclude there is always some meaning hidden in his words, "'though it is as hard to find sense in his speeches "'as to discover three eagles on the same tree. "'It will be wise, friend, to make a cover, "'lest the sons of the squatter should be out skirting on our trail. "'And as you well know, there is some reason to fear yonder a thicket contains a sight that may horrify a woman's mind. "'Are you man enough to look death in the face?' or shall I run the risk of the hounds raising an outcry and go in myself? You see the pup is willing to run with an open mouth already. Am I man enough? Venerable trapper, our communications have a recent origin, or thy interrogatory might have a tendency to embroil us in angry disputation. Am I a man enough? I claim to be the class Mammalia, Order, Primates, Genus, Homo. Such are my physical attributes. Of my moral properties, let posterity speak. It becomes me to be mute. Physic may do for such as relish it. To my taste and judgment it is neither palatable nor healthy. But morals never did harm to any living mortal, be it that he was a sojourner in the forest, or a dweller in the midst of glazed windows and smoking chimneys. It is only a few hard words that divide us, friend, for I am of opinion that, with use and freedom, we should come to understand one another, and mainly settle down into the same judgments of mankind, and of the ways of the world. Quiet, Hector, quiet. What ruffles your temper, pup? Is it not used to the scent of human blood? The doctor bestowed a gracious but commiserating smile on the philosopher of nature, as he retrograded a step or two from the place whither he had been impelled by his excess of spirit, in order to reapply with less expenditure of breath, and with a greater freedom of air and attitude. A homo is certainly a homo, he said, stretching forth an arm in an argumentative manner. So far as the animal functions extend, there are the connecting links of harmony, order, conformity, and design, between the whole genus. But there the resemblance ends. Man may be degraded to the very margin of the line which separates him from the brute, by ignorance. Or he may be elevated to a communion with the great master spirit of all, by knowledge. Nay, I know not if time and opportunity were given him, but he might become the master of all learning, and consequently equal to the great moving principle. The old man, who stood leaning on his rifle in a thoughtful attitude, shook his head as he answered with a native steadiness that entirely eclipsed the imposing air which his antagonist had seen fit to assume. This is neither more nor less than mortal wickedness. Here have I been a dweller in the earth for fourscore and six changes of the seasons, in all that time have I looked at the growing and dying trees, and yet do I not know the reasons why the bud starts under the summer sun, or the leaf falls when it is pinched by the frost. Your larning, though it's a man's boast, is folly in the eyes of him who sits in the clouds and looks down in sorrow at the pride and vanity of his creatures. Many is the hour that I've passed, lying in the shades of the woods, or stretched upon the hills of these open fields, looking up into the blue skies, where I could fancy the Great One had taken his stand, and was solemnizing on the waywardness of man and brute, below, as I myself had often looked at the ants tumbling over each other in their eagerness, though in a way in a fashion more suited to his mightiness and power. Knowledge! It is his plaything. Say, you who think it is easy to climb into judgment a seat above, can you tell me anything of this beginning and the end? Nay! You're a dealer in ailings and cures. What is life, and what is death? Why does the eagle live so long, and why is the time of the butterfly so short? Tell me a simpler thing. Why is this hound so uneasy, while you, who have passed your days of looking into books, can see no reason to be disturbed? The doctor, who had been a little astounded by the dignity and energy of the old man, 
drew a long breath, like a sullen wrestler who was just released from the throttling grasp of his antagonist, and seized on the opportunity of the pause to reply, "'It is his instinct.' "'And what is the gift of instinct?' "'An inferior gradation of reason, a sort of mysterious combination of thought and matter. And what is that which you call thought?' Venerable, venerator, this is a method of reasoning which sets at naught the uses of definitions, and such as I do assure you is not at all tolerated in the schools. Then is there more cunning in your schools than I had thought, for it is a certain method of showing them their vanity, returned the trapper, suddenly abandoning a discussion from which the naturalist was just beginning to anticipate great delight by turning to his dog, whose restlessness he attempted to appease by playing with his ears. This is foolish, Hector, more like an untrained pup than a sensible hound, one who has got his education by hard experience, and not by nosing over the trails of other dogs, as a boy in the settlements follows on the track of his masters, be it right or be it wrong. Well, friend, you who can do so much, are you equal to looking into the thicket, or must I go in myself? The doctor again assumed his air of resolution, and, without further parlance, proceeded to do as desired. The dogs were so far restrained by the remonstrances of the old man as to confine their noise to low but often repeated whinings. When they saw the naturalist advanced, the pup, however, broke through all restraint and made a swift circuit around his person, scenting the earth as he proceeded, and then, returning to his companion, he howled aloud. "'The squatter and his brood have left a strong scent on the earth.' said the old man, watching as he spoke for some signal from his learned pioneer to follow. "'I hope yonder school-bred man knows enough to remember the errand on which I have sent him.' Dr. Battius had already disappeared in the bushes, and the trapper was beginning to betray additional evidences of impatience, when the person of the former was seen retiring from the thicket backwards, with his face fastened on the place he had just left, as if his look was bound in the thraldom of some charm. "'Here is something scary by the wilderness of the creature's countenance,' exclaimed the old man, relinquishing his hold of Hector, and moving stoutly to the side of the totally unconscious naturalist. "'How is it, friend? Have you found a new leaf in your book of wisdom?' "'It is a basilis, muttered the doctor, whose altered visage betrayed the utter confusion which beset his faculties. "'An animal of the order serpents. I had thought its attributes were fabulous.' but mighty nature is equal to all that man can imagine. What is it? What is it? The snakes of the prairies are harmless, unless it be now, and then an angered rattler, and he always gives you notice with his tail, afore he works his mischief with his fangs. Lord, Lord, what a humbling thing is fear! Here is one who in common delivers words too big for a humble mouth to hold, so much beside himself that his voice is as shrill as the whistle of the whippoorwill. Courage! What is it, man? What is it? A prodigy, a lucis naturae, a monster that nature has delighted to form, in order to exhibit her power. Never before have I witnessed such an utter confusion in her laws, or a specimen that so completely bids defiance to the distinctions of class and genera. Let me record its appearance, fumbling for his tablets with hands that trembled too much to perform their office. While time and opportunity are allowed, eyes enthralling color, various, complex, and profound. One would think the man was crazed, with his enthralling looks and piebald colors, interrupted the discontented trapper, who began to grow a little uneasy that his party was at all this time neglecting to seek the protection of some cover. If there is a reptile in the brush, show me the creature, and should it refuse to depart peaceably, why, there must be a quarrel for the possession of the place. There! said the doctor, pointing into a dense mass of the thicket, to a spot within fifty feet of that where they both stood. The trapper turned his look, with perfect composure, in the required direction, but the instant his practiced glance met the object which had so utterly upset the philosophy of the naturalist, he gave a start himself, threw his rifle rapidly forward, and as instantly recovered it, as if a second flash of thought convinced him he was wrong. Neither the instinctive movement nor the sudden recollection was without a sufficient object. At the very margin of the thicket, in an absolute contact with the earth, lay an animate ball that might easily, by the singularity and fierceness of its aspect, have justified a disturbed condition of the naturalist's mind. 
it were difficult to describe the shape or colors of this extraordinary substance except to say in general terms that it was nearly spherical and exhibited all the hues of the rainbow intermingled without reference to harmony and without any very ostensible design the predominant hues were a black and bright vermilion with these however the several tints of white yellow and crimson were strangely and wildly blended had this been all it would have been difficult to have pronounced that the object was possessed of life for it lay motionless as any stone but a pair of dark glaring and moving eyeballs which watched with jealousy the smallest movement of the trapper and his companion sufficiently established the important fact of its possessing vitality your reptile is a scouter or i'm no judge of indian paints and indian deviltries muttered the old man dropping the butt of his weapon to the ground and gazing with a steady eye at the frightful object as he leaned on its barrel in an attitude of great composure he wants to face us out of sight and reason and make us think the head of a redskin is a stone covered with the autumn leaf or he has some other devilish artifice in his mind is the animal human demanded the doctor of the genus homo i had fancied it a nondescript it's as human and as mortal too as a warrior of these prairies is ever known to be i have seen a time when a redskin would have shown a foolish daring to peep out of his ambushment in that fashion on a hunter i could name but who is too old now and too near his time to be anything better than a miserable trapper it will be well to speak to the imp and to let him know he deals with men whose beards are grown come forth from your cover friend he continued in the language of the extensive tribes of the dakotas there is room on the prairie for another warrior the eyes appeared to glare more fiercely than ever but the mass which according to the trapper's opinion was neither more nor less than a human head shorn as usual among the warriors of the west of its hair still continued without motion or any other sign of life it is a mistake exclaimed the doctor the animal is not even of the class mammalia much less a man so much for your knowledge returned the trapper laughing with great exultation so much for the learning of one who has looked into so many books that his eyes are not able to tell a moose from a wildcat now my hector here is a dog of education after his fashion and though the meanest primer in the settlements would puzzle his information you could not cheat the hound in a matter like this as you think the object no man you shall see his whole formation and then let an ignorant old trapper who never willingly passed a day within the reach of a spelling book in his life know by what name to call it mind i mean no violence but just to start the devil from his ambushment the trapper very deliberately examined the priming of his rifle taking care to make as great a parade as possible of his hostile intentions in going through the necessary evolutions with the weapon when he thought the stranger began to apprehend some danger he very deliberately presented the piece and called aloud now friend i am all for peace or all for war as you may say no well it is no man as the wiser one here says and there can be no harm in just firing into the bunch of leaves the muzzle of the rifle fell as he concluded and the weapon was gradually settling into a steady and what would easily have proved a fatal aim when a tall indian sprang from beneath the bed of leaves and brush which he had collected about his person at the approach of the party and stood upright uttering the exclamation wah End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the prairie by james fenimore cooper this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by William Peck My visor is Philemon's roof. Within the house is Jove. Shakespeare The trapper, who had meditated no violence, dropped his rifle again, and laughing at the success of his experiment, with great seeming self-complacency, he drew the astounded gaze of the naturalist from the person of the savage to himself, by saying, the imps will lie for hours like sleeping alligators brooding their deviltries and dreams and other craftiness until such time as they see some real danger is at hand and then they look to themselves the same as other mortals but this is a scouter in his war-paint 
There should be more of his tribe at no great distance. Let us draw the truth out of him, for an unlucky war party may prove more dangerous to us than a visit from the whole family of the squatter. It is truly a desperate and dangerous species, said the doctor, relieving his amazement by a breath that seemed to exhaust his lungs of air. A violent race, and one that it is difficult to define or class within the usual boundaries of definitions. Speak to him, therefore, but let thy words be strong in amity. The old man cast a keen eye on every side of him, to ascertain the important particular whether the stranger was supported by any associates, and then, making the usual signs of peace, by exhibiting the palm of his naked hand, he boldly advanced. In the meantime, the Indian betrayed no evidence of uneasiness. He suffered the trapper to draw nigh, maintaining by his own mien and attitude a striking air of dignity and fearlessness. Perhaps the wary warrior also knew that, owing to the difference in their weapons, he should be placed more on an equality by being brought nearer to the strangers. As a description of this individual may furnish some idea of the personal appearance of a whole race, it may be well to detain the narrative in order to present it to the reader in our hasty and imperfect manner. Would the truant eyes of Alston or Greenall turn, but for a time, from their gaze at the models of antiquity to contemplate this wrong and humble people, little would be left for such inferior artists as ourselves to delineate. The Indian in question was in every particular a warrior of fine stature and admirable proportions. As he cast aside his mask, composed of such party-colored leaves as he had hurriedly collected, his countenance appeared in all the gravity, the dignity, and, it may be added, in the terror of his profession. The outlines of his lineaments were strikingly noble, and nearly approaching to Roman though the secondary features of his face were slightly marked with the well-known traces of his Asiatic origin. The peculiar tint of the skin, which in itself is so well designed to aid the effect of a martial expression, had received an additional aspect of wild ferocity from the colors of the war-paint. But, as if he disdained the usual artifices of his people, he bore none of those strange and horrid devices with which the children of the forest are accustomed like the more civilized heroes of the mustache, to back their reputation for courage, contenting himself with a broad and deep shadowing of black that served as a sufficient and an admirable foil to the brighter gleamings of his native swarthiness. His head was, as usual, shaved to the crown, where a large and gallant scalp-lock seemed to challenge the grasp of his enemies. The ornaments that were ordinarily pendant from the cartilages of his ears had been removed on account of his present pursuit. His body, notwithstanding the lateness of the season, was nearly naked, and the portion which was clad bore a vestment no warmer than a light robe of the finest dressed deerskin, beautifully stained with the rude design of some daring exploit, and which was carelessly worn, as if more in pride than from any unmanly regard to comfort. His leggings were of bright scarlet cloth, the only evidence about his person that he had held communion with the traitors of the pale-faces. But, as if to have furnished some offset to this solitary submission to a womanish vanity, they were fearfully fringed, from the garb knee to the bottom of the moccasin, with the hair of human scalps. He leaned lightly with one hand on a short hickory bow, while the other rather touched than sought support from the long, delicate handle of an ashen lance. A quiver made of the cougar's skin from which the tail of the animal depended as a characteristic ornament was slung at his back, and a shield of hides quaintly emblazoned with another of his warlike deeds was suspended from his neck by a thong of sinews. As the trapper approached, this warrior maintained his calm, upright attitude, discovering neither an eagerness to ascertain the character of those who advanced upon him, nor the smallest wish to avoid a scrutiny in his own person an eye, that was darker and more shining than that of the stag, was incessantly glancing, however, from one to the other of the stranger party, seemingly never knowing rest for an instant. "'Is my brother far from his village?' demanded the old man in the Pawnee language, after examining the paint, 
and those other little signs by which a practiced eye knows the tribe of the warrior he encounters in the American deserts, with the same readiness and by the same sort of mysterious observation as that by which the seaman knows the distant sail. "'It is farther to the towns of the Big Knives,' was the laconic reply. "'Why is a Pawnee loop so far from the fork of his own river, without a horse to journey on, and in a spot empty as this?' Can the woman and children of a pale face live without the meat of the bison? There was hunger in my lodge. My brother is very young to be already the master of a lodge, returned the trapper, looking steadily into the unmoved countenance of the youthful warrior. But I dare say he is brave, and that many of a chief has offered him his daughters for wives. But he has been mistaken, pointing to the arrow, which was dangling from the hand that held the bow in bringing a loose and barbed arrowhead to kill the buffalo. Do the Pawnees wish the wounds they give their game to rankle? It is good to be ready for the Sioux, though not in sight a bush may hide him. The man is a living proof of the truth of his words, muttered the trapper in English, and a close-jointed and gallant-looking lad he is, but far too young for a chief of any importance. It is wise, however, to speak him fair for a single arm thrown into either party, if we come to blows with the squatter and his brood, may turn the day. You see my children are weary, he continued in the dialect of the prairies, pointing as he spoke to the rest of the party, who by this time were also approaching. We wish to camp and eat. Does my brother claim this spot? The runners from the people on the big river tell us that your nation have traded with the tawny faces who live beyond the salt lake and that the prairies are now the hunting grounds of the big knives it is true as i hear also from the hunters and the trappers on la platte though it is with the frenchers and not with the men who claim to own the mexicos that my people have bargained and warriors are going up the long river to see that they have not been cheated in what they have bought ay that is partly true too i fear and it will not be long before an accursed band of choppers and loggers will be following on their heels to humble the wilderness which lies so broad and rich on the western banks of the mississippi and then the land will be a peopled desert from the shores of the main sea to the foot of the rocky mountains filled with all the abominations and craft of man and stripped of the comforts and loveliness it received from the hands of the lord and where were the chiefs of the Pawnee Loops when the bargain was made? Suddenly demanded the youthful warrior, a look of startling fierceness gleaming at the same instant, athwart his dark visage. Is a nation to be sold like the skin of a beaver? Right enough, right enough. And where were truth and honesty also? But might is right, according to the fashions of the earth, and what the strong choose to do, the weak must call justice. If the law of the Wakanda was as much hearkened to Pawnee as the laws of the Long Knives, your right to the prairies would be as good as that of the greatest chief in the settlements to the house which covers his head. The skin of the traveler is white, said the young native, laying a finger impressively on the hard and wrinkled hand of the trapper. Does his heart say one thing and his tongue another? The Wakanda of a white man has ears, and he shuts them to a lie. Look at my head. It is like a frosted pine, and must soon be laid in the ground. Why, then, should I wish to meet the great spirit face to face, while his countenance is dark upon me? The Pawnee gracefully threw his shield over one shoulder, and placing a hand on his chest, he bent his head in deference to the gray locks exhibited by the trapper, after which his eye became more steady and his countenance less fierce. Still, he maintained every appearance of a distrust and watchfulness that were rather tempered and subdued than forgotten. When this equivocal species of amity was established between the warrior of the prairies and the experienced old trapper, the latter proceeded to give his directions to Paul concerning the arrangements of the contemplated halt. While Inez and Ellen were dismounting, and Middleton and the bee-hunter were attending to their comforts, the discourse was continued, sometimes in the language of the natives, but often, as Paul and the doctor mingled their opinions with the two principal speakers, in the English tongue. There was a keen and subtle trial of skill between the Pawnee and the trapper, 
in which each endeavored to discover the objects of the other, without betraying his own interest in the investigation. As might be expected, when the struggle was between adversaries so equal, the result of the encounter answered the expectations of neither. The latter had put all the interrogatories his ingenuity and practice could suggest, concerning the state of the tribe of the Loops, their crops, their store of provisions for ensuing winter, and their relations with the different warlike neighbors without extorting any answer, which, in the slightest degree, elucidated the cause of his finding a solitary warrior so far from his people. On the other hand, while the questions of the Indian were far more dignified and delicate, they were equally ingenuous. He commented on the state of the trade in peltries, spoke of the good or ill success of many white hunters whom he had either encountered or heard named, and even alluded to the steady march which the nation of his great father, as he cautiously termed the government of the states, was making towards the hunting grounds of his tribe. It was apparent, however, by the singular mixture of interest, contempt, and indignation that were occasionally gleaming through the reserved manner of this warrior, that he knew the strange people who were thus trespassing on his native rights much more by report than by actual intercourse. This personal ignorance of the whites was as much betrayed by the manner in which he regarded the females as by the brief but energetic expressions which occasionally escaped him. While speaking to the trapper, he suffered his wandering glances to stray towards the intellectual and nearly infantile beauty of Inez, as one might be supposed to gaze upon the loveliness of an ethereal being. It was very evident that he now saw, for the first time, one of those females of whom the fathers of his tribe so often spoke, and who were considered of such rare excellence as to equal all that savage ingenuity could imagine in the way of loveliness. His observation of Ellen was less marked, but notwithstanding the warlike and chastened expression of his eye, there was much of the homage which man is made to pay to woman, even in the more cursory look he sometimes turned on her mature and perhaps more animated beauty. This admiration, however, was so tempered by his habits, and so smothered in the pride of a warrior, as completely to elude every eye but that of the trapper, who was too well skilled in Indian customs, and was too well instructed in the importance of rightly conceiving the character of the stranger, to let the smallest trait or the most trifling of his movements escape him. In the meantime, the unconscious Ellen herself moved about the feeble and less resolute Inez, with her accustomed assiduity and tenderness, exhibiting in her frank features those changing emotions of joy and regret which occasionally beset her, as her active mind dwelt on the decided step she had just taken, with the contending doubts and hopes, and possibly with some of the mental vacillation that was natural to her situation and sex. Not so, Paul, conceiving himself to have obtained the two things dearest to his heart, the possession of Ellen, and a triumph over the sons of Ishmael, he now enacted his part in the business of the moment, with as much coolness as though he was already leading his willing bride from solemnizing their nuptials before a border magistrate to the security of his own dwelling. He had hovered around the moving family during the tedious period of their weary march, concealing himself by day, and seeking interviews with his betrothed as opportunities offered in the manner already described until fortune and his own intrepidity had united to render him successful, at the very moment when he was beginning to despair, and he now cared neither for distance, nor violence, nor hardships. To his sanguine fancy and determined resolution all the rest was easily to be achieved. Such were his feelings, and such in truth they seemed to be. With his cap cast on one side, and whistling a low air, he thrashed among the bushes, in order to make a place suitable for the females to repose on, while, from time to time, he cast an approving glance at the agile form of Ellen, as she tripped past him, engaged in her own share of the duty. "'And so the wolf-tribe of the Pawnees have buried the hatchet with their neighbors, the Kanzas," said the trapper, pursuing a discourse which he had scarcely permitted to flag, though it had been occasionally interrupted by the different directions with which he occasionally saw fit to interrupt it. The reader will remember that while he spoke to the native warrior in his own tongue, he necessarily addressed his white companions in English. The loops and the light-faced redskins are again friends. Doctor, 
This is a tribe of which I'll engage you have often read, and of which many a round lie has been whispered in the ears of the ignorant people who live in the settlements. There was a story of a nation of Welshers that lived here away in the prairies, and how they came into the land afore the easy-minded man who first led in the Christians to rob the heathens of their inheritance, had ever dreamt that the sun set on a country as big as that it rose from, and how they knew the white ways, and spoke with the white tongues, and a thousand other follies and idle conceits. "'Have I not heard of them?' exclaimed the naturalist, dropping a piece of jerked bison's meat, which he was rather roughly discussing at the moment. "'I should be greatly ignorant not to have often dwelt with delight on so beautiful a theory, and one which so triumphantly establishes two positions, which I have often maintained are unanswerable, even without such living testimony in their favor. Viz, that this continent can claim a more remote affinity with civilization than the time of Columbus, and that color is the fruit of climate and condition, and not a regulation of nature. Propound the latter question to this Indian gentleman, venerable hunter. He is of a reddish tint himself, and his opinion may be said to make us masters of the two sides of the disputed point. Do you think a Pawnee is a reader of books and a believer of printed lies like the eithers in the towns? retorted the old man, laughing. But it may be as well to humor the likings of the man, which, after all, it is quite possible are neither more nor less than his natural gift, and therefore to be followed, although they may be pitied. What does my brother think? All whom he sees here have pale skins, but the Pawnee warriors are red. Does he believe that man changes with the season, and that the son is not like his father? The young warrior regarded his interrogator for a moment with a steady and deliberating eye. Then, raising his finger upward, he answered with dignity, The Wakanda pours the rain from his clouds. When he speaks, he shakes the lulls and the fire, which scorches the trees, is the anger of his eye. But he fashioned his children with care and thought, what he has thus made never alters. Aye, tis in the reason of nature that it should be so, doctor, continued the trapper, when he had interpreted this answer to the disappointed naturalist. The Pawnees are a wise and a great people, and all engaged they abound in many a wholesome and honest tradition. The hunters and trappers that I sometimes see speak of a great warrior of your race. My tribe are not women. A brave is no stranger in my village. Ay, but he they speak of most is a chief far beyond the renown of common warriors, and one that might have done credit to that once mighty but now fallen people, the Delawares of the hills. Such a warrior should have a name. They call him Hardheart, from the stoutness of his resolution. And well is he named, if all I have heard of his deeds be true. The stranger cast a glance, which seemed to read the guileless soul of the old man, as he demanded, has the pale-face seen the partisan of my people? Never. It is not with me now, as it used to be some forty years ago, when warfare and bloodshed were my calling and my gifts. A loud shout from the reckless paw interrupted his speech, and at the next moment the bee-hunter appeared, leading an Indian war-horse from the side of the thicket opposite to the one occupied by the party. Here is a beast for a redskin to straddle he cried, as he made the animal go through some of its wild paces. There's not a brigadier in all Kentucky that can call himself master of so sleek and well-jointed a nag. A Spanish saddle, too, like a grandee of the Mexicos, and look at the mane and tail, braided and plaited down with little silver balls, as if it were Ellen herself getting her shining hair ready for a dance or a husking frolic. Isn't this a real trotter, old trapper, to eat out of the manger of a savage? Softly, lad, softly. The loops are famous for their horses, and it is often that you will see a warrior on the prairies far better mounted than the congressmen in the settlements. But this, indeed, is a beast that none but a powerful chief should ride. The saddle, as you rightly think, has been set upon in its day by a great Spanish captain, who has lost it in his life together, in some of the battles which this people often fight against the southern provinces. I warrant me, I warrant me, the youngster is the son of a great chief maybe of the mighty Hardheart himself. During this rude interruption to the discourse, the young Pawnee manifested neither impatience nor displeasure. But when he thought his beast had been the subject of sufficient comment, he very coolly, and with the air of one accustomed to have his will respected, 
relieved Paul of the bridle, and throwing the reins on the neck of the animal, he sprang upon his back with the activity of a professor of the equestrian art. Nothing could be finer or firmer than the seat of the savage. The highly wrought and cumbrous saddle was evidently more for show than use. Indeed it impeded rather than aided the actions of limbs which disdained to seek assistance or admit of restraint from so womanish inventions as stirrups. The horse, which immediately began to prance, was, like its rider, wild and untutored in all his motions, but while there was so little of art, there was all the freedom and grace of nature in the movements of both. The animal was probably indebted to the blood of Araby for its excellence. Through a long pedigree that embraced the steed of Mexico, the Spanish barb, and the Moorish charger, the rider, in obtaining his steed from the provinces of Central America, had also obtained that spirit and grace in controlling him, which unite to form the most intrepid and perhaps the most skilful horseman in the world. Notwithstanding this sudden occupation of his animal, the Pawnee discovered no hasty wish to depart. More at his ease, and possibly more independent, now he found himself secure of the means of retreat, he rode back and forth, eyeing the different individuals of the party with a far greater freedom than before. But at each extremity of his ride, just as the sagacious trapper expected to see him profit by his advantage and fly, he would turn his horse, and pass over the same ground, sometimes with the rapidity of the flying deer, and at others more slowly, and with greater dignity of mien and attitude. Anxious to ascertain such facts as might have an influence on his future movements, the old man determined to invite him to a renewal of their conference. He therefore made a gesture expressive at the same time of his wish to resume the interrupted discourse, and of his own pacific attentions. The quick eye of the stranger was not slow to note the action, but it was not until a sufficient time had passed to allow him to debate the prudence of the measure in his own mind that he seemed willing to trust himself again so near a party that was so much superior to himself in physical power, and consequently one that was able, at any instant, to command his life or control his personal liberty. When he did approach nigh enough to converse with facility, it was with a singular mixture of haughtiness and of distrust. It is far to the village of the Loops, he said, stretching his arm in a direction contrary to that in which the trapper well knew the tribe dwelt. And the road is crooked. What has the big knife to say? I crooked enough, muttered the old man in English, if you are set out on your journey by that path, but not half so whining as the cunning of an Indian's mind. Say, my brother, do the chiefs of the Pawnees love to see strange faces in their lodges? The young warrior bent his body gracefully, though but slightly, over the saddle bow, as he replied. When have my people forgotten to give food to the stranger? If I leave my daughters to the doors of the loops, will the women take them by the hand, and will the warriors smoke with my young men? The country of the pale faces is behind them. Why do they journey so far towards the setting sun? Have they lost the path? or are these the women of the white warriors that I hear are wading up the river of the troubled waters? Neither. They who wade the Missouri are the warriors of my great father, who has sent them on his message. But we are peace-runners. The white men and the red are neighbors, and they wish to be friends. Do not the Omahas visit the loops, when the tomahawk is buried in the path between the two nations? The Omahas are welcome and the Yanktons and the Burtwood Tetons, who live in the elbow of the river with muddy water. Do they not come into the lodges of the loops and smoke? The Tetons are liars, exclaimed the other. They dare not shut their eyes in the night. No, they sleep in the sun, see? He added, pointing with fierce triumph to the frightful ornaments of his leggings. Their scalps are so plenty that the Pawnees tread on them. Go, let us Sioux live in the banks of snow. The plains and the buffaloes are for men. "'Ah, the secret is out,' said the trapper to Middleton, who was an attentive but a deeply interested observer of what was passing. "'This good-looking young Indian is scouting on the track of the Sioux. You may see it by his arrowheads and his paint, ay, and by his eye, too. For a redskin lets his nature follow the business he is on, be it for peace or be it for war. "'Quiet, Hector, quiet. Have you never centered a Pawnee afore, pup? Keep down, dog.' Keep down. 
My brother is right. The Sioux are thieves. Men of all colors and nations say it of them, and say it truly. But the people from the rising sun are not Sioux, and they wish to visit the lodges of the Loops. The head of my brother is white, returned the Pawnee, throwing one of those glances at the trapper, which were so remarkably expressive of distrust, intelligence, and pride, and then pointing, as he continued, towards the eastern horizon. And his eyes have looked on many things. Can he tell me the name of what he sees yonder? Is it a buffalo? It looks more like a cloud peeping above the skirt of the plain with the sunshine lighting its edges. It is the smoke of the heavens. It is a hill of the earth, and on its top are the lodges of pale faces. Let the woman of my brother wash their feet among the people of their own color. The eyes of the Pawnee are good if he can see a white skin so far. The Indian turned slowly towards the speaker, and after a pause of a moment he sternly demanded, Can my brother hunt? Alas, I claim to be no better than a miserable trapper. When the plain is covered with the buffaloes, can he see them? No doubt, no doubt, it is far easier to see than to take a scampering bull. And when the birds are flying from the cold, and the clouds are black with their feathers, can he see them too? Ay, ay, it is not hard to find a duck or a goose when millions are darkening the heavens. When the snow falls and covers the lodges of the long knives, can the stranger see flakes in the air? My eyes are none of the best now, returned the old man, a little resentfully. But the time has been when I had a name for my sight. The redskins find the big knives as easily as strangers see the buffalo or the traveling birds or the falling snow. Your warriors think the master of life has made the whole earth white. They are mistaken, they are pale, and it is their own faces they see. Go, a Pawnee is not blind, that he need look long for your people. The warrior suddenly paused, and bent his face aside, like one who listened with all his faculties absorbed in the act. Then turning the head of his horse, he rode to the nearest angle of the thicket, and looked intently across the bleak prairie, in a direction opposite to the side on which the party stood. Returning slowly from this unaccountable and to his observer's startling procedure, he riveted his eyes on Inez, and paced back and forth several times, with the air of one who maintained a warm struggle on some difficult point, in the recesses of his own thoughts. He had drawn the reins of his impatient steed, and was seemingly about to speak, when his head again sunk on his chest, and he resumed his former attitude of attention. Galloping like a deer to the place of his former observations, he rode for a moment swiftly in short and rapid circles, as if still uncertain of his course, and then darted away like a bird that has been fluttering around its nest before it takes a distant flight. After scouring the plain for a minute, he was lost to the eye behind a swell of the land. The hounds, who had also manifested great uneasiness for some time, followed him for a little distance, and then terminated their chase by seating themselves on the ground, and raising their usual low, whining, and warning howls. End of chapter 18「Nineteen of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck. How, if he will not stand? Shakespeare. The several movements, related in the close of the preceding chapter, had passed in so short a space of time that the old man, while he neglected not to note the smallest incident, had no opportunity of expressing his opinion concerning the stranger's motives. After the Pawnee had disappeared, however, he shook his head and muttered, while he walked slowly to the angle of the thicket that the Indian had just quitted. There are both scents and sounds in the air, though my miserable senses are not good enough to hear the one or to catch the taint of the other. There is nothing to be seen, cried Middleton, who kept close at his side. My eyes and my ears are good, and yet I can assure you that I neither hear nor see anything. Your eyes are good, and you are not deaf, returned the other with a slight air of contempt. No, lad, no. They may be good to see across a church or to hear a town bell, but afore you had passed a year in these prairies, you would find yourself taking a turkey for a buffalo, or conceding fifty times that the roar of a buffalo bull was the thunder of the Lord. 
There is a deception of nature in these naked plains in which the air throws up the images like water, and then it is hard to tell the prairies from a sea. But yonder is a sign that a hunter never fails to know. The trapper pointed to a flight of vultures that were sailing over the plain at no great distance, and apparently in the direction in which the Pawnee had riveted his eye. At first Middleton could not distinguish the small dark objects that were dotting the dusky clouds, but as they came swiftly onward, first their forms, and then their heavy waving wings, became distinctly visible. Listen, said the trapper, when he had succeeded in making Middleton see the moving column of birds. Now you hear the buffaloes or bisons, as your knowing doctor sees fit to call them, though buffaloes is their name among the hunters of these regions, and I conclude that a hunter is a better judge of a beast and of its name he added, winking to the young soldier, than any man who has turned over the leaves of a book, instead of traveling over the face of the earth, in order to find out the nature of its inhabitants. "'Of their habits I will grant you,' cried the naturalist, who rarely missed an opportunity to agitate any disputed point in his favorite studies. "'That is, provided always, deference is had to the proper use of definitions, and that they are contemplated with scientific eyes.' "'Eyes of a mole!' as if man's eyes were not as good for names as the eyes of any other creature. Who named the works of his hand? Can you tell me that, with your books and college wisdom? Was it not the first man in the garden? And is it not a plain consequence that his children inherit his gifts? That is certainly the mosaic account of the event, said the doctor, though your reading is by far too literal. My reading? Nay, if you suppose that I have wasted my time in schools— you do such a wrong to my knowledge as one mortal should never lay to the door of another without sufficient reason. If I have ever craved the art of reading, it has been that I might better know the sayings of the book you name, for it is a book which speaks in every line according to human feelings, and therein according to reason. And do you then believe, said the doctor, a little provoked by the dogmatism of his stubborn adversary, and perhaps secretly too confident in his own more liberal, though scarcely as profitable, attainments. Do you then believe that all these beasts were literally collected in a garden, to be enrolled in the nomenclature of the first man? Why not? I understand your meaning, for it is not needful to live in towns to hear all the devilish devices that the conceit of man can invent to upset his own happiness. What does it prove, except indeed it may be said to prove that the garden— he made was not after the miserable fashions of our times thereby directly giving the lie to what the world calls its civilizing no no the garden of the lord was the forest then and is the forest now where the fruits do grow and the birds do sing according to his own wise ordering now lady you may see the mystery of the vultures there come the buffaloes themselves and a noble herd it is I warrant me that Pawnee has a troop of his people in some of the hollows nigh by, and as he has gone scampering after them, you are about to see glorious chase. It will serve to keep the squatter and his brood under cover, and for ourselves there is little reason to fear. A Pawnee is not apt to be a malicious savage. Every eye was now drawn to the striking spectacle that succeeded. Even the timid Inez hastened to the side of the Middleton to gaze at the sight and Paul summoned Ellen from her culinary labors to become a witness of the lively scene. Throughout the whole of those moving events which it has been our duty to record, the prairies had lain in the majesty of perfect solitude. The heavens had been blackened with the passage of the migratory birds, it is true, but the dogs of the party and the ass of the doctor were the only quadrupeds that had enlivened the broad surface of the waste beneath. There was now a sudden exhibition of animal life, which changed the scene, as it were by magic, to the very opposite extreme. A few enormous bison bulls were first observed, scouring along the most distant roll of the prairie, and then succeeded long files of single beasts, which, in their turns, were followed by a dark mass of bodies, until the dun-colored herbage of the plain was entirely lost, in the deeper hue of their shaggy coats. The herd, as the column spread and thickened, was like the endless flocks of the smaller birds, who extended flanks, beep, 
whose extended flanks are so often seen to heave up out of the abyss of the heavens until they appear as countless as the leaves in those forests over which they wing their endless flight. Clouds of dust shot up in little columns from the center of the mass as some animal, more furious than the rest, ploughed the plain with his horns, and from time to time a deep hollow bellowing was borne along on the wind, as if a thousand throats vented their plaints in a discordant murmuring. A long and musing silence reigned in the party, as they gazed on this spectacle of wild and peculiar grandeur. It was at length broken by the trapper, who, having been long accustomed to similar sights, felt less of its influence, or rather, felt it in a less thrilling and absorbing manner than those to whom the scene was more novel. "'There go ten thousand oxen in one drove, without keeper or master, except him who made them, and gave them these open plains for their pasture. Aye, it is here that man may see the proofs of his wantonness and folly. Can the proudest governor in all the states go into his fields, and slaughter a nobler bullock that is here offered to the meanest hand? And when he has gotten his sirloin or his steak, can he eat it with as good a relish as he who has sweetened his food with wholesome toil, and earned it according to the law of nature, by honestly mastering that which the Lord hath put before him? If the plary platter is smoking with a buffalo's hump, I answer, no, interrupted the luxurious bee-hunter. Ay, boy, you have tasted, and you feel the genuine reasoning of the thing. But the herd is heading a little this away, and it behooves us to make ready for their visit. If we hide ourselves altogether, the horned brutes will break through the place and trample us beneath their feet like so many creeping worms. So we will just put the weak ones apart and take post, as becomes men and hunters in the van. As there was but little time to make the necessary arrangements, the whole party set about them in good earnest. Inez and Owen were placed in the edge of the thicket on the side farthest from the approaching herd. Asenus was posted in the center, in consideration of his nerves, and then the old man, with his three male companions, divided themselves in such a manner as they thought would enable them to turn the head of the rushing column, should it chance to approach too nigh their position. By the vacillating movements of some fifty or a hundred bulls that led the advance, it remained questionable for many moments what course they intended to pursue. But a tremendous and painful roar, which came from behind the cloud of dust that rose in the center of the herd, and which was hardly answered by the screams of the carrion birds that were greedily sailing directly above the flying drove, appeared to give a new impulse to their flight, and at once to remove every symptom of indecision. As if glad to seek the smallest signs of the forest, the whole of the affrighted herd became steady in its direction, rushing in a straight line toward the little cover of bushes which has already been so often named. The appearance of danger was now, in reality, of a character to try the stoutest nerves. The flanks of the dark, moving mass were advanced in such manner as to make a concave line of the front, and every fierce eye that was glaring from the shaggy wilderness of hair in which the entire heads of the males were enveloped was riveted with mad anxiety on the thicket. It seemed as if each beast strove to outstrip his neighbor in gaining this desired cover, and as thousands in the rear pressed blindly on those in front, there was the appearance of an imminent risk that the leaders of the herd would be precipitated on the concealed party, in which case the destruction of every one of them was certain. Each of our adventurers felt the danger of his situation in a manner peculiar to his individual character and circumstances. Middleton wavered. At times he felt inclined to rush through the bushes, and, seizing Inez, attempt to fly. Then, recollecting the impossibility of outstripping the furious speed of an alarmed bison, he felt for his arms, determined to make head against the countless drove. The faculties of Dr. Battius were quickly wrought up to be very summit of mental delusion. The dark forms of the herd lost their distinctness, and then the naturalist began to fancy he beheld a wild collection of all the creatures of the world, rushing upon him in a body, as if to revenge the various injuries which in the course of a life of indefatigable labor in behalf of the natural sciences he had inflicted on their several genera. The paralysis it occasioned in his system was like the effect of the incubus. Equally unable to fly or to advance, he stood riveted to the spot until the infatuation became so complete that the worthy naturalist was beginning, by a desperate effort of scientific resolution, even to class the different specimens. On the other hand, Paul shouted, 
and called on Ellen to come and assist him in shouting, but his voice was lost in the bellowings and trampling of the herd. Furious and yet strangely excited by the obstinacy of the brutes and the wildness of the sight, and nearly maddened by sympathy and a species of unconscious apprehension, in which the claims of nature were singularly mingled with concern for his mistress, he nearly split his throat in exhorting his aged friend to interfere. "'Come forth, old trapper!' he shouted. "'With your prairie inventions, or we shall be all smothered under a mountain of buffalo humps!' The old man, who had stood all this while leaning on his rifle, and regarding the movements of the herd with a steady eye, now deemed it time to strike his blow. Leveling his piece at the foremost bull, with an agility that would have done credit to his youth, he fired. The animal received the bullet on the matted hair between his horns, and fell to his knees. But shaking his head, he instantly arose, the very shock seeming to increase his exertions. There was now no longer time to hesitate. Throwing down his rifle, the trapper stretched forth his arms, and advanced from the cover with naked hands, directly towards the rushing column of the beast. The figure of a man, when sustained by the firmness and steadiness that intellect can only impart, rarely fails of commanding respect from all the inferior animals of the creation. The leading bulls recoiled, and for a single instant there was a sudden stop to their speed, a dense mass of bodies rolling up in front, until hundreds were seen floundering and tumbling on the plain. Then came another of those hollow bellowings from the rear, and set the herd again in motion. The head of the calm, however, divided. The immovable form of the trapper, cutting it, as it were, into two gliding streams of life. Middleton and Paul instantly profited by his example, and extended the feeble barrier by similar exhibition of their own persons. For a few moments the new impulse given to the animals in front served to protect the thicket, but as the body of the herd pressed more and more upon the open line of its defenders, and the dust thickened so as to obscure their persons, there was at each instant a renewed danger of the beast breaking through. It became necessary for the trapper and his companions to become still more and more alert, and they were gradually yielding before the headlong multitude when a furious bull darted by Middleton so near as to brush his person, and at the next instant swept through the thicket with the velocity of the wind. "'Close and die for the ground!' shouted the old man, "'or a thousand of the devils will be at his heels!' All their efforts would have proved fruitless, however, against the living torrent, had not Asinus, whose domains had been so rudely entered, lifted his voice in the midst of the uproar. The most sturdy and furious of the bulls trembled at the alarming and unknown cry, and then each individual brute was seen madly pressing from the very thicket, which, the moment before, he had endeavored to reach, with the eagerness with which the murderer seeks the sanctuary. As the stream divided, the place became clear, the two dark calms moving obliquely from the copse to unite again at the distance of a mile on its opposite side. The instant the old man saw the sudden effect which the voice of Asinus had produced, he coolly commenced reloading his rifle, indulging at the same time in a heartfelt fit of his silent and peculiar merriment. There they go, like dogs, with so many half-filled shot pouches dangling at their tails, and no fear of their breaking their order. For what the brutes in the rear didn't hear, with their own ears, though conceit they did, besides, if they change their minds, it may be no hard matter to get the jack to sing the rest of his tune. "'The ass has spoken, but Balaam is silent,' cried the beet-hunter, catching his breath after a repeated burst of noisy mirth, that might possibly have added to the panic of the buffaloes by its vociferation. "'The man is as completely dumbfounded as if a swarm of young bees had settled on the end of his tongue, and he's not willing to speak for fear of their answer.' "'How now, friend?' continued the trapper, addressing the still motionless and entranced naturalist. "'How now, friend, are you who make your livelihood by booking the names and natures of the beasts of the fields and the fowls of the air, frightened at a herd of scampering buffaloes? Though perhaps you are ready to dispute my right to call them by a word that is in the mouth of every hunter and trader on the frontier.' The old man was, however, mistaken in supposing he could excite the benumbed faculties of the doctor by provoking a discussion. From that time henceforth he was never known, except on one occasion, to utter a word that indicated either the species or the genus of the animal. He obstinately refused the nutritious food of the whole ox family, 
and even to the present hour, now that he is established in all the scientific dignity and security of a savant in one of the maritime towns, he turns his back with a shudder on those delicious and unrivaled viands that are so often seen at the suppers of the craft, and which are unequalled by anything that is served under the same name at the boasted chop-houses of London or at the most renowned of the Parisian restaurants. In short, the distaste of the worthy naturalist for beef was not unlike that which the shepherd sometimes produces by first muzzling and fettering his delinquent dog, and then leaving him as a stepping-stone for the whole flock to use in its transit over a wall, or through the opening of a sheepfold, a process which is said to produce in the culprit a species of surfeit on the subject of mutton for ever after. By the time Paul and the trapper saw fit to terminate the fresh bursts of merriment, which the continued abstraction of their learned companion did not fail to excite, he commenced breathing again, as if the suspended action of his lungs had been renewed by the application of a pair of artificial bellows, and was heard to make use of the ever afterwards prescribed term on that solitary occasion to which we have just alluded. "'Bows, Americani, Haridi!' exclaimed the doctor, laying great stress on the latter word, after which he continued mute, like one who pondered on strange and unaccountable events. "'I horrid eyes enough, I will willingly allow,' returned the trapper, "'and altogether the creature has a frightful look to one unused to the sights and bustle of a natural life. But then the courage of the beast is in no way equal to its countenance. Lord, man, if you should ever once get fairly beset by a brood of grizzly bears, as happened to Hector and I at the great falls of the Miss. Ah, here comes the tail of the herd, and yonder goes a pack of hungry wolves ready to pick up the sick, or such as get a disjointed neck by a tumble. Ha! There are mounted men on their trail, or I am no sinner. Here, lad, you may see them here away, just where the dust is scattering afore the wind. They are hovering around a wounded buffalo, making an end of the surly devil with their arrows. Middleton and Paul soon caught a glimpse of the dark group that the quick eye of the old man had so readily detected. Some fifteen or twenty horsemen were, in truth, to be seen riding in quick circuits about a noble bull, which stood at bay, too grievously hurt to fly, and yet seeming to disdain to fall, notwithstanding his hard body had already been the target for a hundred arrows. A thrust from the lance of a powerful Indian, however, completed his conquest, and the brute gave up his obstinate hold of life with a roar, that passed bellowing over the place where our adventures stood, and reaching the ears of the affrighted herd, added a new impulse to their flight. "'How well the Pawnee knew the philosophy of a buffalo hunt,' said the old man, after he had stood regarding the animated scene for a few moments, with evident satisfaction. "'You saw how he went off like the wind before the drove. It was in order that he might not taint the air, and that he might turn the flank and join. Ha! How is this? Yonder redskins are no Pawnees. The feathers in their heads are from the wings and tails of owls.' Ah, as I am but miserable, half-sighted trapper, it is a band of the accursed Sioux. To cover, lads, to cover. A single cast of an eye this away would strip us of every rag of clothes, as surely as the lightning scorches the bush, and it might be that our very lives would be far from safe. Middleton had already turned from the spectacle to seek that which pleased him better, the sight of his young and beautiful bride. Paul seized the doctor by the arm, and as the trapper followed with the smallest possible delay, the whole party was quickly collected within the cover of the thicket. After a few short explanations concerning the character of this new danger, the old man, on whom the whole duty of directing their movements was devolved, in deference to his great experience, continued his discourse as follows. This is a region, as you must all know, where a strong arm is far better than the right, and where the white law is as little known as needed. Therefore does everything now depend on judgment and power. If, he continued, laying his finger on his cheek, like one who considered deeply all sides of the embarrassing situation in which he found himself, if an invention could be framed which would set these Sioux and the brood of the squatter by the ears, then might we come in, like the buzzards after a fight atween the beast, and pick up the gleanings on the ground. There are Pawnees nigh us, too. It is a certain matter— for yonder lad is not so far from his village without an errand. Here are, therefore, four parties within the sound of a cannon, not one of whom can trust the other. 
all which makes movement a little difficult in a district where covers are far from plenty. But we are three well armed, and I think I may see three stout hearted men. Four, interrupted Paul. Anon, said the old man, looking up simply at his companion. Four, repeated the bee hunter, pointing to the naturalist. Every army has its hangers on and idlers, rejoined the blunt border man. Friend, it will be necessary to slaughter this ass. To slay Asinus? Such a deed would be an act of supererogatory cruelty. I know nothing of your words which hide their meaning and sound, but that is cruel which sacrifices a Christian to a brute. This is what I call the reason of mercy. It would be just as safe to blow a trumpet as to let the animal raise his voice again, inasmuch as it would prove a manifest challenge to the Sioux. I will answer for the discretion of a sinus who seldom speaks without a reason. They say a man can be known by the company he keeps, retorted the old man. And why not a brute? I once made a forced march, and went through a great deal of jeopardy with a companion who never opened his mouth but to sing, and trouble enough and great concern of mine did the fellow give me. It was in that very business with your grandfather, Captain. But then he had a human throat, and well did he know how to use it. On occasion, though, he didn't always stop to regard the time and seasons fit for such outcries. Ah's me, if I was now as I was then, it wouldn't be a band of thieving Sioux that should easily drive me from such a lodgment as this. But what signifies boasting when sight and strength are both failing? The warrior that the Delawares once saw fit to call after the hawk, for the goodness of his eyes, would now be better turned the mole. In my judgment, therefore, it will be well to slay the brute. There's argument and good logic in it, said Paul. Music is music, and it is always noisy, whether it comes from a fiddle or a jackass. Therefore I agree with the old man and say, kill the beast. Friends, said the naturalist, looking with a sorrowful eye from one to another of his bloodily disposed companions. Slay not his sinners. He is a specimen of his kind, of whom much good and little evil can be said, hardy and docile for his genus, abstemious and patient, even for his humble species. We have journeyed much together, and his death would grieve me. How would it trouble thy spirit, venerable venerator, to separate in such an untimely manner from your faithful hound? The animal shall not die, said the old man, suddenly clearing his throat, in a manner that proved he felt the force of the appeal but his voice must be smothered. Bind his jaws with the halter, and then I think we may trust the rest of Providence. With this double security for the discretion of Asinus, for Paul instantly bound the muzzle of the ass in the manner required, the trapper seemed content, after which he proceeded to the margin of the thicket to reconnoitre. The uproar which attended the passage of the herd was now gone, or rather it was heard rolling along the prairie at the distance of a mile. The clouds of dust were already blown away by the wind, and a clear range was left to the eye in that place where ten minutes before there existed a scene of so much wildness and confusion. The Sioux had completed their conquest, and apparently satisfied with this addition to the numerous previous captures they had made, they now seemed content to let the remainder of the herd escape. A dozen remained around the carcass, over which a few buzzards were balancing themselves with steady wings and greedy eyes while the rest were riding about in quest of such further booty as might come in their way on the trail of so vast a drove. The trapper measured the proportions and scanned the equipments of such individuals as drew nearer to the side of the thicket with careful eyes. At length he pointed out one among them to Middleton as Wooka. Now know we not only who they are, but their errand, the old man continued, deliberately shaking his head. They have lost the trail of the squatter, and are on its hunt. These buffaloes have crossed their path, and in chasing the animals, bad luck has led them in open sight of the hill on which the brood of Ishmael have harbored. Do you see yon birds watching for the offals of the beast they have killed? Therein is a moral which teaches the manner of a prairie life. A band of Pawnees are outlying for these very Sioux, as you see the buzzards looking down for their food, and it behooves us, as Christian men who have so much at stake, to look down upon them both. Ha! What brings yonder two skirting reptiles to a stand? As you live, they have found the place where the miserable son of the squatter met his death. The old man was not mistaken. Wooka, and a savage who accompanied him, had reached that spot which has already been mentioned as furnishing the frightful evidences of violence and bloodshed. 
There they sat on their horses, examining the well-known signs with the intelligence that distinguishes the habits of the Indians. Their scrutiny was long, and apparently not without distrust. At length they raised a cry that was scarcely less piteous and startling than that which the hounds had before made over the same fatal signs, and which did not fail to draw the whole band immediately around them, as the fell bark of the jackal is said to gather his comrades to the chase. End of chapter 19「Twenty of the Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Welcome, Ancient Pistol. Shakespeare It was not long before the trapper pointed out the commanding person of Matori as the leader of the Sioux. This chief, who had been among the last to obey the vociferous summons of Wuka, no sooner reached the spot where his whole party was now gathered, than he threw himself from his horse, and proceeded to examine the marks of the extraordinary trail, with that degree of dignity and attention which became his high and responsible station. The warriors, for it was but too evident that they were to a man of that fearless and ruthless class, awaited the result of his investigation with patient reserve. None but a few of the principal braves, presuming even to speak, while their leader was thus gravely occupied. It was several minutes before Matori seemed satisfied. He then directed his eyes along the ground to those several places where Ishmael had found the same revolting evidences of the passage of some bloody struggle, and motioned to his people to follow. The whole band advanced in a body towards the thicket, until they came to a halt within a few yards of the precise spot where Esther had stimulated her sluggish sons to break into the cover. The reader will readily imagine that the trapper and his companions were not indifferent observers to so threatening a movement. The old man summoned all who were capable of bearing arms to his side, and demanded in very unequivocal terms, though in a voice that was suitably lowered, in order to escape the ears of their dangerous neighbors, whether they were disposed to make a battle for their liberty, or whether they should try the milder expedient of conciliation. As it was a subject in which all had an equal interest, he put the question as to the council of war, not without some slight exhibition of the lingering vestiges of a nearly extinct military pride. Paul and the doctor were diametrically opposed to each other in opinion, the former declaring for an immediate appeal to arms, and the latter was warmly espousing the policy of pacific measures. Middleton, who saw that there was great danger of a hot verbal dispute between two men, who were governed by feelings so diametrically opposed, saw fit to assume the office of arbiter, or rather to decide the question, his situation making him a sort of umpire. He also leaned to the side of peace, for he evidently saw that, in consequence of the vast superiority of their enemies, violence would irretrievably lead to their destruction. The trapper listened to the reasons of the young soldier with great attention, and, as they were given with the steadiness of one who did not suffer apprehension to blind his judgment, they did not fail to produce a suitable impression. "'It is rational,' rejoined the trapper, when the other had delivered his reasons. "'It is very rational, for what man cannot move his strength he must circumvent with his wits. It is reason that makes him stronger than the buffalo, and swifter than the moose. Now stay you here, and keep yourselves close. My life and my traps are but little value, when the welfare of so many human souls are concerned. And, moreover, I may say that I know the windings of Indian cunning. Therefore will I go alone upon the prairie. It may so happen that I can yet draw the eyes of a Sioux from this spot, and give you time and room to fly." As if resolved to listen to no remonstrance, the old man quietly shouldered his rifle, and moving leisurely through the thicket, he issued on the plain at a point whence he might first appear before the eyes of the Sioux, without exciting their suspicions that he came from its cover. The instant that the figure of a man, dressed in the garb of a hunter, and bearing the well-known and much dreaded rifle, appeared before the eyes of the Sioux, there was a sensible though a suppressed sensation in the band. The artifice of the trapper had so far succeeded, as to render it extremely doubtful whether he came from some point on the open prairie, or from the thicket. 
though the Indians still continued to cast frequent and suspicious glances at the cover. They had made their halt at the distance of an arrow flight from the bushes, but when the stranger came sufficiently nigh to show that the deep coating of red and brown, which time and exposure had given to his features, was laid upon the original color of a pale face, they slowly receded from the spot until they reached the distance that might defeat the aim of firearms. In the meantime the old man continued to advance until he had got nigh enough to make himself heard without difficulty. Here he stopped, and dropping his rifle to the earth, he raised his hand with the palm outward in a token of peace. After uttering a few words of reproach to his hound, who watched the savage group with eyes that seemed to recognize them, he spoke in the Sioux tongue. "'My brothers are welcome,' he said cunningly, constituting himself the master of the region in which they had met, and assuming the offices of hospitality. "'They are far from their villages, and are hungry. Will they fall to my lodge to eat and sleep?' No sooner was his voice heard than the yell of pleasure which burst from a dozen mouths convinced the sagacious trapper that he also was recognized. Feeling that it was too late to retreat, he profited by the confusion which prevailed among them while Wooka was explaining his character to advance until he was again face to face with the redoubtable Matori. The second interview between these two men, each of whom was extraordinary in his way, was marked by the usual caution of the frontiers. They stood for nearly a minute, examining each other without speaking. "'Where are your young men?' sternly demanded the Teton chieftain, after he found that the immovable features of the trapper refused to betray any of their master's secrets under his intimidating look. "'The long knives do not come in bands to trap the beaver. I am alone. Your head is white, but you have a forked tongue. Matari has been in your camp.' He knows that you are not alone. Where is your young wife and the warrior that I found upon the prairie? I have no wife. I have told my brother that the woman and her friend were strangers. The words of a gray head should be heard and not forgotten. The Dakotas found travelers asleep, and they thought they had no need of horses. The women and children of a pale-face are not used to go far on foot. Let them be sought where you left them. The eyes of the Teton flashed fire as he answered, "'They are gone! But Matori is a wise chief, and his eyes can see a great distance!' "'Does the partisan of the Tetons see men on these naked fields?' retorted the trapper, with great steadiness of mien. "'I am very old, and my eyes grow dim. Where do they stand?' The chief remained silent a moment, as if he disdained to contest any further the truth of a fact concerning which he was already satisfied. Then, pointing to the traces of the earth, he said, with a sudden transition to mildness in his eye and manner, "'My father has learnt wisdom in many winters. Can he tell me whose moccasin has left this trail? There have been wolves and buffaloes on the prairies, and there may have been cougars, too.' Matori glanced his eye at the thicket, as if he thought the latter suggestion not impossible. Pointing to the place, he ordered his young men to reconnoitre it more closely, cautioning them at the same time with a stern look at the trapper, to beware of treachery from the big knives. Three or four half-naked, eager-looking youths lashed their horses at the word, and darted away to obey the mandate. The old man trembled a little for the discretion of Paul, when he saw this demonstration. The Tetons encircled the place two or three times, approaching nigher and nigher at each circuit, and then galloped back to their leader to report that the copse seemed empty. Notwithstanding the trapper watched the eye of Matori to detect the inward movements of his mind, and if possible to anticipate, in order to direct his suspicions, the utmost sagacity of one so long accustomed to study the cold habits of the Indian race, could, however, detect no symptom or expression that denoted how far he credited or distrusted this intelligence. Instead of replying to the information of his scouts, he spoke kindly to his horse, and motioning to a youth to receive the bridle, or rather halter, by which he governed the animal, he took the trapper by the arm, and led him a little apart from the rest of the band. "'Has my brother been a warrior?' said the wily Teton, in a tone that he intended should be conciliating. "'Do the leaves cover the trees in the season of fruits? Go!' The Dakotas have not seen as many warriors living as I have looked on in their blood. 
but what signifies idle remembrancing he added in english when limbs grow stiff and sight is failing the chief regarded him a moment with a severe look as if he would lay bare the falsehood he had heard but meeting in the calm eye and steady mien of the trapper a confirmation of the truth of what he said he took the hand of the old man and laid it gently on his head in token of the respect that was due to the other's years and experience why then do the big knives tell their red brethren to bury the tomahawk he said when their own young men never forget that they are braves and meet each other so often with bloody hands my nation is more numerous than the buffaloes on the prairies or the pigeons in the air their quarrels are frequent yet their warriors are few none go out on the war-path but they who are gifted with the qualities of a brave and therefore such see many battles it is not so my father is mistaken returned Matori, indulging in a smile of exulting penetration at the very instant he corrected the force of his denial in deference to the years and services of one so aged the big knives are very wise and they are men all of them would be warriors they would leave the redskins to dig roots and hoe the corn but a dakota is not born to live like a woman he must strike the pawnee and the omaha or he will lose the name of his fathers the master of life looks with an open eye on his children who die in a battle that is fought for the right but he is blind and his ears are shut to the cries of an indian who is killed when plundering or doing evil to his neighbor my father is old said Matori, looking at his aged companion with an expression of irony that sufficiently denoted he was one of those who overstepped the trammels of education and who are perhaps a little given to abuse the mental liberty they thus obtain he is very old has he made a journey to the far country and has he been at the trouble to come back to tell the young men what he has seen teton returned the trapper throwing the breech of his rifle to the earth with startling vehemence and regarding his companion with steady serenity i have heard that there are men among my people who study their great medicines until they believe themselves to be gods and who laugh at all faith except in their own vanities it may be true it is true for i have seen them when man is shut up in towns and schools with his own follies it may be easy to believe himself greater than the master of life but a warrior who lives in a house with the clouds for its roof where he can at any moment look at both the heavens and at the earth and who daily sees the power of the great spirit should be more humble a dakota chieftain ought to be too wise to laugh at justice the crafty Matori, who saw that his free thinking was not likely to produce a favorable impression on the old man instantly changed his ground by alluding to the more immediate subject of their interview laying his hand gently on the shoulder of the trapper he led him forward until they both stood within fifty feet of the margin of the thicket here he fastened his penetrating eyes on the other's honest countenance and continued the discourse if my father has hid his young men in the bush let him tell them to come forth you see that a dakota is not afraid matori is a great chief a warrior whose head is white and who is about to go to the land of spirits cannot have a tongue with two ends like a serpent dakota i have told no lie since the great spirit made me a man i have lived in the wilderness or on these naked plains without lodge or family i am a hunter and go on my path alone my father has a good carbine let him point it in the bush and fire the old man hesitated a moment and then slowly prepared himself to give this delicate assurance of the truth of what he said without which he plainly perceived the suspicions of his crafty companion could not be lulled as he lowered his rifle his eye although greatly dimmed and weakened by age ran over the confused collection of objects that lay embedded amid the party-colored foliage of the thicket until it succeeded in catching a glimpse of the brown covering of the stem of a small tree with this object in view he raised the piece to a level and fired the bullet had no sooner glided from the barrel than a tremor seized the hands of the trapper which had it occurred a moment sooner would have utterly disqualified him for so hazardous an experiment a frightful silence succeeded the report 
during which he expected to hear the shrieks of the females, and then, as the smoke whirled away in the wind, he caught a view of the fluttering bark, and felt assured that all his former skill was not entirely departed from him. Dropping the piece to the earth, he turned again to his companion, with an air of the utmost composure, and demanded, "'Is my brother satisfied?' "'Matori is a chief of the Dakotas,' returned the cunning Teton, laying his hand on his chest in acknowledgment of the other's sincerity. "'He knows that a warrior who has smoked at so many council fires, until his head has grown white, would not be found in wicked company. But did not my father once ride on a horse like a rich chief of the Pale Faces, instead of traveling on foot like a hungry Kanza? "'Never. The Wakanda has given me legs, and he has given me resolution to use them.' For sixty summers and winters did I journey in the woods of America, and ten tiresome years have I dwelt on these open fields, without finding need to call often upon the gifts of the other's creatures of the Lord to carry me from place to place. If my father has so long lived in the shade, why has he come upon the prairies? The sun will scorch him. The old man looked sorrowfully about for a moment, and then turning with a confidential air to the other, he replied, I passed the spring, summer, and autumn of life among the trees. The winter of my days had come, and found me where I loved to be, in the quiet, I, and in the honesty of the woods. Teton, then I slept happily, where my eyes could look up through the branches of the pines and the beeches, to the very dwelling of the good spirit of my people. If I had need to open my heart to him, while his fires were burning above my head, the door was open and before my eyes. But the axes of the choppers awoke me. For a long time my ears heard nothing but the uproar of clearings. I bore it like a warrior and a man. There was a reason that I should bear it, but when that reason was ended, I bethought me to get beyond the accursed sounds. It was tying to the courage and to the habits, but I had heard of these vast and naked fields, and I came hither to escape the wasteful temper of my people. Tell me, Dakota, have I not done well? The trapper laid his long, lean finger on the naked shoulder of the Indian as he ended, and seemed to demand his felicitations on his ingenuity and success, with a ghastly smile in which triumph was singularly blended with regret. His companion listened intently, and replied to the question by saying, in sententious manner of his race, "'The head of my father is very gray. He has always lived with men, and he has seen everything.' What he does is good, what he speaks is wise. Now, let him say, is he sure that he is a stranger to the big knives, who are looking for their beasts on every side of the prairies, and cannot find them? Dakota, what I have said is true. I live alone, and never do I mingle with men whose skins are white if— His mouth was suddenly closed by an interruption that was as mortifying as it was unexpected. The words were still on his tongue when the bushes on the side of the thicket where they stood opened, and the whole of the party whom he had just left, and in whose behalf he was endeavouring to reconcile his love of truth to the necessity of prevaricating, came openly into view. A pause of mute astonishment succeeded this unlooked-for spectacle. Then Matari, who did not suffer a muscle or a joint to betray the wonder and surprise he actually experienced, motioned towards the advancing friends of the trapper with an air of assumed civility, and a smile that lighted his fierce, dark visage as the glare of the setting sun reveals the volume and load of the cloud that is charged to bursting with the electric fluid. He, however, disdained to speak or to give any other evidence of his intentions than by calling to his side the distant band, who sprang forward at his beck with the alacrity of willing subordinates. In the meantime, the friends of the old man continued to advance. Middleton himself was foremost, supporting the light and aerial-looking figure of Inez, on whose anxious countenance he cast such occasional glances of tender interest as, in similar circumstances, a father would have given to his child. Paul led Ellen, close in their rear, but while the eye of the bee-hunter did not neglect his blooming companion, it scowled angrily, resembling more the aspect of the sullen and retreating bearer than the soft intelligence of a favored suitor. Obed and Asinus came last, the former leading his companion with a degree of fondness that could hardly be said to be exceeded by any other of the party. 
The approach of the naturalist was far less rapid than that of those who preceded him. His feet seemed equally reluctant to advance or to remain stationary, his position bearing a great analogy to that of Mohammed's coffin, with the exception that the quality of repulsion, rather than that of attraction, held him in a state of rest. The repulsive power in his rear, however, appeared to predominate, and by a singular exception, as he would have said himself, to all philosophical principles, it rather increased than diminished by distance. As the eyes of the naturalist steadily maintained a position that was the opposite of his route, they served to give a direction to those of the observers of all these movements, and at once furnished a sufficient clue by which to unravel the mystery of so sudden a debauchment from the cover. Another cluster of stout and armed men was seen at no great distance, just rounding a point of the thicket, and moving directly, though cautiously, towards the place where the band of Sioux was posted, as a squadron of cruisers is often seen to steer across the waste of waters towards the rich but well-protected convoy. In short, the family of the squatter, or at least such among them as were capable of bearing arms, appeared in view, on the broad prairie, evidently bent on revenging their wrongs. Matori and his party slowly retired from the thicket, the moment they caught a view of the strangers, until they halted on a swell that commanded a wide and unobstructed view of the naked fields on which they stood. Here the Dakota appeared disposed to make his stand and to bring matters to an issue. Notwithstanding this retreat, in which he compelled the trapper to accompany him, Middleton still advanced, until he too halted on the same elevation and within speaking distance of the warlike Sioux. The borderers, in their turn, took a favorable position, though at a much greater distance. The three groups now resembled so many fleets at sea, lying with their topsails to the mass, with the commendable precaution of reconnoitering, before each could ascertain who among the strangers might be considered as friends, and who as foes. During this moment of suspense, the dark, threatening eye of Matari rolled from one of the strange parties to the other, in keen and hasty examination, and then it turned its withering look on the old man, as the chief said, in a tone of high and bitter scorn, "'The big knives are fools. It is easier to catch the cougar asleep than to find a blind Dakota. Did the white head think to ride on the horse of a Sioux?' The trapper, who had found time to collect his perplexed faculties, saw at once that Middleton, having perceived Ishmael on the trail by which they had fled, preferred trusting to the hospitality of the savages than to the treatment he would be likely to receive from the hands of the squatter. He therefore disposed himself to clear the way for the favorable reception of his friends, since he found that the unnatural coalition became necessary to secure the liberty, if not the lives, of the party. "'Did my brother ever go on a warpath to strike my people?' he calmly demanded of the indignant chief, who still awaited his reply. The lowering aspect of the Teton warrior so far lost its severity as to suffer a gleam of pleasure and triumph to lighten its ferocity, as sweeping his arm in an entire circle around his person, he answered, "'What tribe or nation has not felt the blows of Dakotas? Matari is their partisan.' "'And has he found the Big Knives woman, or has he found them men?' A multitude of fierce passions were struggling in the tawny countenance of the Indian. For a moment, inextinguishable hatred seemed to hold the mastery, and then a nobler expression, and one that better became the character of a brave, got possession of his features and maintained itself until, first throwing aside his light robe of pictured deerskin, and pointing to the scar of a bayonet in his breast, he replied, It was given as it was taken, face to face. It is enough. My brother is a brave chief, and he should be wise. Let him look. Is that a warrior of the pale faces? Was it one such as that who gave the great Dakota his hurt? The eyes of the Matori followed the direction of the old man's extended arm until they rested on the drooping form of Inez. The look of the Teton was long, riveted, and admiring. Like that of the young Pawnee, it resembled more the gaze of a mortal on some heavenly image than the admiration with which man is wont to contemplate even the loveliness of a woman. Starting, as if suddenly self-convinced of forgetfulness, the chief next turned his eyes on Ellen, where they lingered an instant with a much more intelligible expression of admiration, and then pursued their course until they had taken another glance at each individual of the party. "'My brother sees that my tongue is not forked,' 
continued the trapper, watching the emotions the other betrayed with a readiness of comprehension little inferior to that of the Teton himself. The big knives do not send their women to war. I know that the Dakotas will smoke with the strangers. Matari is a great chief. The big knives are welcome, said the Teton, laying his hand on his breast with an air of lofty politeness that would have done credit to any state of society. The arrows of my young men are in their quivers. The trapper motioned to Middleton to approach, and in a few moments the two parties were blended in one, each of the males having exchanged friendly greetings after the fashions of the prairie warriors. But, even while engaged in this hospitable manner, the Dakota did not fail to keep a strict watch on the more distant party of white men, as if he still distrusted an artifice or sought further explanation. The old man, in his turn, perceived the necessity of being more explicit, and of securing the slight and equivocal advantage he had already obtained. While affecting to examine the group, which still lingered at the spot where it had first halted, as if to discover the characters of those who composed it, he plainly saw that Ishmael contemplated immediate hostility. The result of a conflict on the open prairie between a dozen resolute bordermen and the half-armed natives even though seconded by their white allies, was in his experienced judgment a point of great uncertainty, and though far from reluctant to engage in the struggle on account of himself, the aged trapper thought it far more worthy of his years and his character to avoid than court the contest. His feelings were, for obvious reasons, in accordance with those of Paul and Middleton, who had lives still more precious than their own to watch over and protect. In this dilemma the three consulted on the means of escaping the frightful consequences which might immediately follow a single act of hostility on the part of the borderers. The old man, taking care of their communication, should, in the eyes of those, who noted the expression of their countenances with jealous watchfulness, bear the appearance of explanations as to the reason why such a party of travelers was met so far in the deserts. I know that the Dakotas are a wise and great people. At length the trapper commenced, again addressing himself to the chief. But does not their partisan know a single brother who is base? The eye of Matari wandered proudly around his band, but rested a moment reluctantly on Wuka as he answered. The master of life has made chiefs, and warriors, and women. Conceiving that he thus embraced all the gradations of human excellence from the highest to the lowest. And he has also made pale faces who are wicked, such as they whom my brother sees yonder. Do they go on foot to do wrong? demanded the Teton, with a wild gleam from his eyes that sufficiently betrayed how well he knew the reason why they were reduced to so humble an expedient. Their beasts are gone, but their powder and their lead and their blankets remain. Do they carry their riches in their hands, like miserable Kansas? Or are they brave, and leave them with the women, as men should do, who know where to find what they lose? My brother sees a spot of blue across the prairie. Look, the sun has touched it for the last time today. Matori is not a mole. It is a rock. On it are the goods of the big knives. An expression of savage joy shot into the dark countenance of the Teton as he listened. Turning to the old man, he seemed to read his soul, as if to assure himself he was not deceived. Then he bent his look on the party of Ishmael, and counted its number. "'One warrior is wanting,' he said. "'Does my brother see the buzzards? There is his grave. Did he find blood on the prairie? It was his.' "'Enough! Matari is a wise chief. Put your women on the horses of the Dakotas. We shall see.' for our eyes are open very wide. The trapper wasted no unnecessary words in explanation. Familiar with the brevity and promptitude of the natives, he immediately communicated the result to his companions. Paul was mounted in an instant, with Ellen at his back. A few more moments were necessary to assure Middleton of the security and ease of Inez. While he was thus engaged, Matori advanced to the side of the beast he had allotted to this service, which was his own and manifested an intention to occupy his customary place on its back. The young soldier seized the reins of the animal, and glances of sudden anger and lofty pride were exchanged between them. "'No man takes this seat but myself,' said Middleton sternly in English. "'Matori is a great chief. 
retorted the savage, neither comprehending the meaning of the other's words. "'The Dakota will be too late,' whispered the old man at his elbow. "'See, the big knives are afraid, and they will soon run.' The Teton chief instantly abandoned his claim, and threw himself on another horse, directing one of his young men to furnish a similar accommodation for the trapper. The warriors who were dismounted got up behind as many of their companions. Dr. Battius bestrode Asinus, and, notwithstanding the brief interruption, and half the time we have taken to relate it, the whole party was prepared to move. When he saw that all were ready, Matori gave the signal to advance. A few of the best mounted of the warriors, the chief himself included, moved a little in front and made a threatening demonstration, as if they intended to attack the strangers. The squatter, who was in truth slowly retiring, instantly halted his party and showed a willing front. Instead, however, of coming within reach of the dangerous aim of the western rifle, the subtle savages kept wheeling about the strangers, until they had made a half-circuit, keeping the latter in constant expectation of an assault. Then, perfectly secure of their object, the Tetons raised a loud shout and darted across the prairie in a line for the distant rock with the directness and nearly the velocity of the arrow that has just been shot from its bow. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 21 of The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Peck Dally not with the gods, but get thee gone. Shakespeare Matore had scarcely given the first intimation of his real design, before a general discharge from the borders proved how well they understood it. The distance and the rapidity of the flight however, rendered the fire harmless. As a proof how little he regarded the hostility of their party, the Dakota chieftain answered the report with a yell, and flourishing his carbine above his head, he made a circuit on the plain, followed by his chosen warriors, in scorn of the impotent attempt of his enemies. As the main body continued the direct course, this little band of the elite, in returning from its wild exhibition of savage contempt, took its place in the rear, with a dexterity and a concert of action that showed the maneuver had been contemplated. Volley swiftly succeeded volley, until the enraged squatter was reluctantly compelled to abandon the idea of injuring his enemies by means so feeble. Relinquishing his fruitless attempt, he commenced a rapid pursuit, occasionally discharging a rifle in order to give the alarm to the garrison, which he had prudently left under the command of the redoubtable Esther herself. In this manner the chase was continued for many minutes, the horsemen gradually gaining on their pursuers, who maintained the race, however, with an incredible power of foot. As the little speck of blue rose against the heavens, like an island issuing from the deep, the savages occasionally raised a yell of triumph. But the mists of evening were already gathering along the whole of the eastern margin of the prairie, and before the band had made half of the necessary distance, the dim outline of the rock it had melted into the haze of the background. Indifferent to this circumstance, which rather favored than disconcerted his plans, Matori, who had again ridden in front, held on his course with the accuracy of a hound of the truest scent, merely slackening his speed a little, as the horses of his party were by this time thoroughly blown. It was at this stage of the enterprise that the old man rode up to the side of Middleton and addressed him as follows in English. Here is likely to be a thieving business, and one in which I must say I have but little wish to be a partner. What would you do? It would be fatal to trust ourselves in the hands of the miscreants in our rear. Tut for miscreants, be they red or be they white. Look ahead, lad, as if we are talking of our medicines or perhaps praising the Teton beasts. For the knaves love to hear their horses commended, the same as a foolish mother in the settlements is fond of hearing the praises of her willful child. So, pat the animal, and lay your hand on the gee-gaws, with which the redskins have ornamented his mane, giving your eye, as it were, to one thing, and your mind to another. Listen, if matters are managed with judgment, we may leave these tetons as the night sets in. A blessed thought! 
exclaimed Middleton, who retained the painful remembrance of the look of admiration with which Matori had contemplated the loveliness of Inez, as well of his subsequent presumption in daring to wish to take the office of her protector on himself. "'Lord, Lord, what a weak creature is, man, when the gifts of nature are smothered in bookish knowledge and womanly manners. Such another start would tell these imps at our elbows that we were plotting against them, just as plainly as if it were whispered in their ears by a Sioux tongue. Ay, ay, I know the devils. They look as innocent as so many frisky fawns, but there is not one among them all that has not an eye on our smallest motions. Therefore, what is to be done and is to be done in wisdom, in order to circumvent their cunning? That is right. Pat his neck and smile, as if you praised the horse, and keep the ear on my side open to my words. Be careful not to worry your beast, for though but little skilled in horses, reason teaches that breath is needful in a hard push, and that a weary leg makes a dull race. Be ready to mind the signal, when you hear a whine from old Hector. The first will be to make ready, the second to edge out of the crowd, and the third to go. Am I understood? Perfectly, perfectly, said Middleton, trembling in his excessive eagerness to put the plan in instant execution, and pressing the little arm which encircled his body to his heart. Perfectly, hasten, hasten! Ay, the beast is no sloth continued the trapper in the Teton language, as if he continued the discourse edging cautiously through the dusky throng at the same time until he found himself riding at the side of Paul. He communicated his intentions in the same guarded manner as before. The high-spirited and fearless bee-hunter received the intelligence with delight, declaring his readiness to engage the whole of the savage band should it become necessary to effect their object. When the old man drew off from the side of this pair also, he cast his eyes about him to discover the situation occupied by the naturalist. The doctor, with infinite labor to himself and Asinus, had maintained a position in the very center of the Sioux, so long as there existed the smallest reason for believing that any of the missiles of Ishmael might arrive in contact with his person. After this danger had diminished, or rather disappeared entirely, his own courage revived while that of his steed began to droop. To this mutual but very material change was owing the fact that the rider and the ass were now to be sought among that portion of the band who formed the sort of rear guard. Hither, then, the trapper contrived to turn his steed without exciting the suspicions of any of his subtle companions. Friend, commenced the old man, when he found himself in a situation favorable to discourse, should you like to pass a dozen years among the savages with a shaved head and a painted countenance? with, perhaps, a couple of wives and five or six children of her half-breed, to call you father? Impossible! exclaimed the startled naturalist. I am nim disposed to matrimony in general, and more especially to all admixture of the varieties of species, which only tend to tarnish the beauty and to interrupt the harmony of nature. Moreover, it is a painful innovation on the order of all nomenclatures. Ay, ay, you have reason enough for your distaste to such a life. But should these Sioux get you fairly into their village, such would be your luck, as certain as the sun rises and sets at the pleasure of the Lord. Marry me to a woman who is not adorned with the comeliness of the species, responded the doctor. Of what crime have I been guilty that so grievous a punishment should await the offense? To marry a man against the movements of his will is to do a violence to human nature. Now that you speak of nature, I have hopes that the gift of reason has not altogether deserted your brain, returned the old man with a covert expression playing about the angles of his deep-set eyes, which betrayed he was not entirely destitute of humor. Nay, they may conceive you a remarkable subject for their kindness, and for that matter marry you to five or six. I have known in my days favored chiefs who had numberless wives. But why should they meditate this vengeance? demanded the doctor, whose hair began to rise, as if each fiber was possessed of sensibility. What evil have I done? It is the fashion of their kindness. When they come to learn that you are a great medicine, they will adopt you in the tribe, and some mighty chief will give you his name and perhaps his daughter, or it may be a wife or two of his own, who have dwelt long in his lodge, and of whose value he is a judge by experience. The governor and founder of Natural Harmony protect me, ejaculated the doctor. I have no affinity to a single consort, much less to duplicates and triplicates of the class. 
I shall certainly essay a flight from their abodes before I mingle in so violent a conjunction. There is reason in your words, but why not attempt the race you speak of now? The naturalist looked fearfully around, as if he had an inclination to make an instant exhibition of his desperate intention, but the dusky figures, who were riding on every side of him, seemed suddenly tripled in number, and the darkness that was already thickening on the prairie appeared in his eyes to possess the glare of high noon. "'It would be premature, and reason forbids it,' he answered. "'Leave me, venerable venerator, to the counsel of my own thoughts, and when my plans are properly classed, I will advise you of my resolutions.' "'Resolutions?' repeated the old man, shaking his head a little contemptuously, as he gave the rein to his horse, and allowed him to mingle with the steeds of the savages. "'Resolution is a word that is talked of in the settlements, and felt on the borders. Does my brother know the beast on which the pale-face rides?' he continued, addressing a gloomy-looking warrior in his own tongue, and making a motion with his arm that at the same time directed his attention to the naturalist and the meek Asinus. The Teton turned his eyes for a minute on the animal, but disdained to manifest the smallest portion of that wonder he had felt, in common with all his companions, on first viewing so rare a quadruped. The trapper was not ignorant that while asses and mules were beginning to be known to those tribes who dwelt nearest the Mexicos, they were not usually encountered so far north as the waters of La Platte. He therefore managed to read the mute astonishment that lay so deeply concealed in the tawny visage of the savage, and took his measures accordingly. "'Does my brother think that the rider is a warrior of the pale-faces?' he demanded, when he believed that sufficient time had elapsed for a full examination of the pacific mien of the naturalist. The flash of scorn which shot across the features of the Teton was visible, even by the dim light of the stars. "'Is a Dakota a fool?' was the answer. They are a wise nation, whose eyes are never shut. Much do I wonder that they have not seen the great medicine of the big knives. Wah! exclaimed his companion, suffering the whole of his amazement to burst out of his dark, rigid countenance at the surprise, like a flash of lightning illuminating the gloom of midnight. The Dakota knows that my tongue is not forked. Let him open his eyes wider. Does he not see a very great medicine? The light was not necessary to recall to the savage each feature in the really remarkable costume and equipage of Dr. Battius. In common with the rest of the band, and in conformity with the universal practice of the Indians, this warrior, while he had suffered no gaze of idle curiosity to disgrace his manhood, had not permitted a single distinctive mark which might characterize any one of the strangers to escape his vigilance. He knew the air, the stature, the dress, and the features even to the color of the eyes and of the hair, of every one of the big knives whom he had thus strangely encountered, and deeply had he ruminated on the causes which could have led a party so singularly constituted into the haunts of the rude inhabitants of his native waste. He had already considered the several physical powers of the whole party, and had duly compared their abilities with that he supposed might have been their intentions. Warriors they were not for the big knives, like the Sioux, left their women in their villages when they went out on the bloody path. The same objections applied to them as hunters and even as traders, the two characters under which the white men commonly appeared in their villages. He had heard of a great council, at which the Manahasha, or Long Knives, and the Washio Mantica, or Spaniards, had smoked together, when the latter had sold to the former their incomprehensible rights over these vast regions through which his nation had roamed in freedom for so many ages. His simple mind had not been able to embrace the reasons why one people should thus assume a superiority over the possessions of another, and it will readily be perceived that at the hint just received from the trapper he was not indisposed to fancy that some of the hidden subtility of that magical influence of which he was so firm a believer was about to be practiced by the unsuspecting subject of their conversation in furtherance of these mysterious claims. Abandoning, therefore, all the reserve and dignity of his manner, under the conscious helplessness of ignorance, he turned to the old man, and stretching forth his arms, as if to denote how much he lay at his mercy, he said, let my father look at me. I am a wild man of the prairies. My body is naked, my hands empty, my skin red. I have struck the Pawnees, the Kansas, the Omahas, the Osages, and even the Long Knives. I am a man amid warriors, but a woman among the conjurers. Let my father speak. 
The ears of a Teton are open. He listens like a deer to the step of the cougar. Such are the wise and unsearchable ways of one who alone knows good from evil, exclaimed the trapper in English. To some he grants cunning, and on others he bestows the gift of manhood. It is humbling, and it is afflicting to see so noble a creature as this, who has fought in many a bloody fray, truckling before his superstition like a beggar asking for the bones you would throw to the dogs. The Lord will forgive me for playing with the ignorance of the savage, for he knows I do it in no mockery of his state, or an idle vaunting of my own, but in order to save mortal life, and to give justice to the wrong, while I defeat the deviltries of the wicked. Teton, speaking again in the language of the listener, I ask you, is not that a wonderful medicine? If the Dakotas are wise, they will not breathe the air he breathes, nor touch his robes. They know that the Wakanshika, bad spirit, loves his own children, and will not turn his back on him that does them harm. The old man delivered this opinion in an ominous and sententious manner, and then rode apart as if he had said enough. The result justified his expectations. The warrior to whom he had addressed himself was now slow to communicate his important knowledge to the rest of the rear guard, and, in a very few moments, the naturalist was the object of general observation and reverence. The trapper, who understood that the natives often worshipped, with a view to propitiate the evil spirit, awaited the workings of his artifice with the coolness of one who had not the smallest interest in its effects. It was not long before he saw one dark figure after another, lashing his horse and galloping ahead into the center of the band, until Wooka alone remained nigh the persons of himself and Obed. The very dullness of this groveling-minded savage, who continued gazing at the supposed conjurer with a sort of stupid admiration, opposed now the only obstacle to the complete success of his artifice. Thoroughly understanding the character of this Indian, the old man lost no time in getting rid of him also. Riding to his side, he said in an affected whisper, "'Has Wooka drunk of the milk of the big knives today? "'Hugh!' exclaimed the savage, every dull thought instantly recalled from heaven to earth by the question. "'Because the great captain of my people who rides in front has a cow that is never empty, I know it will not be long before he will say, "'Are any of my red brethren dry?' The words were scarcely uttered before Wooka, in his turn, quickened the gait of his beast, and was soon blended with the rest of the dark group, who were riding at a more moderate pace a few rods in advance. The trapper, who knew how fickle and sudden were the changes of a savage mind, did not lose a moment in profiting by this advantage. He loosened the reins of his own impatient steed, and in an instant he was again at the side of Obed. Do you see the twinkling star that is maybe the length of four rifles above the prairie? Here away to the north, I mean. Ay, it is of the consolation. A tut for your consolations, man. Do you see the star, I mean? Tell me, in the English of the land, yes or no? Yes. The moment my back is turned, pull upon the rein of your ass, until you lose sight of the savages. Then take the Lord for your dependence, and yonder star for your guide turn neither to the right hand nor to the left, but make diligent use of your time, for your beast is not quick of foot, and every inch of prairie you gain is a day added to your liberty, or to your life. Without waiting to listen to the queries which the naturalist was about to put, the old man again loosened the reins of his horse, and presently he too was blended with the group in front. Obed was now alone. Asinus willingly obeyed the hint which his master soon gave, rather in desperation than with any very collected understanding of the orders he had received, and checked his pace accordingly. As the Tetons, however, rode at a hand gallop, but a moment of time was necessary, after the ass began to walk, to remove them effectually from before the vision of his rider. Without plan, expectation, or hope of any sort, except that of escaping from his dangerous neighbors, the doctor first feeling, to assure himself that the package, which contained the miserable remnants of his specimens and notes, was safe at his crupper, turned the head of the beast in the required direction, and kicking him with a species of fury, he soon succeeded in exiting the speed of the patient animal into a smart run. He had barely time to descend into a hollow, and ascend the adjoining swell of the prairie, before he heard, or fancy he heard, his name shouted in good English from the throats of twenty Tetons. 
The delusion gave a new impulse to his ardor, and no professor of the sultan art ever applied himself with greater industry than the naturalist now used his heels on the ribs of Asinus. The conflict endured for several minutes without interruption, and to all appearances it might have continued to the present moment had not the meek temper of the beast become unduly excited. Borrowing an idea from the manner in which his master exhibited his agitation, Asinus so far changed the application of his own heels as to raise them simultaneously with a certain indignant flourish into the air, a measure that instantly decided the controversy in his favor. Obed took leave of his seat as of a position no longer tenable, continuing, however, the direction of his flight, while the ass, like a conqueror, took possession of the field of battle, beginning to crop the dry herbage as the fruits of victory. When Dr. Battius had recovered his feet and rallied his faculties, which were in a good deal of disorder from the hurried manner in which he had abandoned his former situation, he returned in quest of his specimens and of his ass. Asinus displayed enough of magnanimity to render the interview amicable, and thenceforth the naturalist continued the required route with very commendable industry, but with a much more tempered discretion. In the meantime, the old trapper had not lost sight of the important movements that he had undertaken to control. Obed had not been mistaken in supposing that he was already missed and sought though his imagination had corrupted certain savage cries into the well-known sounds that composed his own Latinized name. The truth was simply this. The warriors of the rear-guard had not failed to apprise those in front of the mysterious character with which it had pleased the trapper to invest the unsuspecting naturalist. The same untutored admiration, which on the receipt of this intelligence had driven those in the rear to the front, now drove many of the front to the rear. The doctor was of course absent, and the outcry was no more than the wild yells which were raised in the first burst of savage disappointment. But the authority of Matori was prompt to aid the ingenuity of the trapper in suppressing these dangerous sounds, when order was restored, and the former was made acquainted with the reason why his young men had betrayed so strong a mark of indiscretion, the old man, who had taken a post at his elbow, saw with alarm the gleam of keen distrust that flashed in his swarthy visage. "'Where is your conjurer?' demanded the chief, turning suddenly to the trapper, as if he meant to make him responsible for the reappearance of Obed. "'Can I tell my brother the number of the stars? The ways of a great medicine are not like the ways of other men.' "'Listen to me, Greyhead, and count my words,' continued the other, bending on his rude saddle-bow, like some chevalier of a more civilized race, and speaking in the haughty tones of absolute power, the Dakotas have not chosen a woman for their chief. When Matori feels the power of a great medicine, he will tremble. Until then he will look with his own eyes, without borrowing sight from a pale-face. If your conjurer is not with his friends in the morning, my young men shall look for him. Your ears are open. Enough! The trapper was not sorry to find that so long a respite was granted. He had before found reason to believe that the Teton partisan was one of those bold spirits who overstep the limits which use and education fix to the opinions of man in every state of society, and he now saw plainly that he must adopt some artifice to deceive him, different from that which had succeeded so well with his followers. The sudden appearance of the rock, however, which hove up a bleak and ragged mass out of the darkness ahead, put an end for the present to the discourse. Matori, giving all his thoughts to the execution of his designs on the rest of the squatter's movables, a murmur ran through the band as each dark warrior caught a glimpse of a desired haven, after which the nicest ear might have listened in vain to catch a sound louder than the rustling of feet among the tall grass of the prairie. But the vigilance of Esser was not easily deceived. She had long listened anxiously to these suspicious sounds which approached the rock across the naked waste, nor had the sudden outcry been unheard by the unwearied sentinels of the rock. The savages, who had dismounted at some little distance, had not time to draw around the base of the hill in their customary, silent, and insidious manner, before the voice of the Amazon was raised, demanding, "'Who is beneath? Answer for your lives! Sue or devils, I fear ye not!' No answer was given to this challenge, every warrior halting where he stood confident that his dusky form was blended with the shadows of the plain. It was at this moment that the trapper determined to escape. He had been left with the rest of his friends under the surveillance of those who were assigned to the duty of watching the horses, 
and as they all continued mounted, the moment appeared favorable to his project. The attention of the guards was drawn to the rock, and a heavy cloud driving above them at that instant obscured even the feeble light which fell from the stars. Leaning on the neck of his horse, the old man muttered, Where is my pup? Where is it? Hector, where is it? Dog? The hound caught the well-known sounds, and answered by a whine of friendship, which threatened to break out into one of his piercing howls. The trapper was in the act of raising himself from this successful exploit, when he felt the hand of Wooka grasping his throat, as if determined to suppress his voice by the very unequivocal process of strangulation. Profiting by the circumstance, he raised another low sound, as in the natural effort of breathing, which drew a second responsive cry from the faithful hound. Wooka instantly abandoned his hold of the master in order to wreak his vengeance on the dog. But the voice of Esther was again heard, and every other design was abandoned in order to listen. "'I whine and deform your throats as you may, ye imps of darkness,' she said with a cracked but scornful laugh. "'I know ye. Tarry, and ye shall have light for your misdeeds. Put in the coal, Phoebe, put in the coal. Your father and the boys shall see that they are wanted at home to welcome their guest.' As she spoke, a strong light, like that of a brilliant star, was seen on the very pinnacle of the rock. Then followed a forked flame, which curled for a moment amid the windings of an enormous pile of brush, and flashing upward in a united sheet, it wavered to and fro in the passing air, shedding a bright glare on every object within its influence. A taunting laugh was heard from the height in which the voices of all ages mingled, as though they triumphed at having so successfully exposed the treacherous intentions of the Tetons. The trapper looked about him to ascertain in what situations he might find his friends. True to the signals, Middleton and Paul had drawn a little apart, and now stood ready, by every appearance, to commence their flight at the third repetition of the cry. Hector had escaped a savage pursuer, and was again crouching at the heels of his master's horse. But the broad circle of light was gradually increasing in extent and power, and the old man, whose eye and judgment so rarely failed him, patiently awaited a more propitious moment for his enterprise. Now, Ishmael, my man, if sight and hand are true as ever, now is the time to work upon these redskins, who claim to own all your property, even to wife and children. Now, my good man, prove both breed and character. A distant shout was heard in the direction of the approaching party of the squatter, assuring the female garrison that succor was not far distant. Esther answered to the grateful sounds by a cracked cry of her own lifting her form in the first burst of exultation above the rock in a manner to be visible to all below. Not content with this dangerous exposure of her person, she was in the act of tossing her arms in triumph when the dark figure of Matori shot into the light and pinioned them to her side. The forms of the three warriors glided across the top of the rock, looking like naked demons flitting among the clouds. The air was filled with the brands of the beacon, and a heavy darkness succeeded, not unlike that of the appalling instant when the last rays of the sun are excluded by the intervening mass of the moon. A yell of triumph burst from the savages in their turn, and was rather accompanied than followed by a long, loud whine from Hector. In an instant the old man was between the horses of Middleton and Paul, extending a hand to the bridle of each, in order to check the impatience of their riders. "'Softly, softly,' he whispered, their eyes are as marvelously shut for the minute as if the Lord had stricken them blind, but their ears are open. Softly, softly, for fifty rods at least we must move no faster than a walk. The five minutes of doubt that succeeded appeared like an age to all but the trapper. As their sight was gradually restored, it seemed to each that the momentary gloom which followed the extinction of the beacon was to be replaced by as broad a light as that of noonday. Gradually the old man, however, suffered the animals to quicken their steps, until they had gained the center of one of the prairie bottoms. Then, laughing in his quiet manner, he released the reins and said, "'Now let them give play to their legs, but keep on the old fog to deaden the sounds.' It is needless to say how cheerfully he was obeyed. In a few more minutes they ascended and crossed the swell of the land, after which the flight was continued at the top of their horse's speed, keeping the indicated star in view, as the laboring bark steers for the light which points the way to a haven and security. End of chapter 21
Chapter 